Diary entry number one. Past is prologue. Los Angeles, California is known by many monikers. The City of Angels, City of Flowers and Sunshine, a Big Orange, and Hollywood's Tinseltown. The City of Hot Weather, Hot Cars, and Hot Girls. The City of Dreams, where hometown girls like Marilyn Monroe can be discovered and made into Hollywood stars. The City of Opportunity, where immigrants of all cultures can settle and begin new lives living the American dream. And the City of High Fashion, Rodeo Drive boutiques, and all the beautiful people. Who would not want to live in such an oasis of wealth and glamour, and where fun in the sun is not just an expression, but a way of life? The truth is, however, that there is a dark side to Los Angeles. No, it's not about the over 66,000 homeless that litter the city's streets and parks, or the more than 350 murders that took place in the city last year, or the looming threats of the big one, a devastating earthquake that every resident knows is surely inevitable, but is better kept in the back of their minds in a perpetual state of denial. Rather, it is a subculture of perversion and depravity, existing as the seedy underbelly of the city. The sordid face of the city emerges when the sun goes down and the well-tanned, bikini-clad surfer girls of Malibu Beach go home and are replaced by dead-end girls in high heels and halter tops who begin their nocturnal strolls. And when those of other proclivities go in search for the baby-faced boys who have stalked out their own claim along Santa Monica Boulevard, the nights where the young girl, a runaway from her meager trailer park existence in some backwater small town, eagerly gets off the arriving Greyhound bus, ready for fame and stardom, only to find an unwelcome audition on a love-stained casting couch. The nights where the pretty co-ed from USC leaves the nightclub with the most charming and handsome guy she ever met, not aware of the fillet knife in the small of his back, or the roll of duct tape in his car. The nights when the cheap call girl desperate for her heroin fix arrives at the infamous Cecil Hotel to render her services to the middle-aged, pot-bellied husband cheating on his wife. As Jim Morrison crooned in his album, L.A. Woman, Are you a lucky little angel in the city of light? Or just another lost angel in the city of night? The night when the addicts look to score, the Johns seek their own fix, and the predators and psychopaths roam the night for their human prey. The city's history is replete with examples of human monsters at work. The Black Dahlia, whose mutilated and bisected corpse and unsolved case still haunts the collective memories of the LAPD 75 years later. The Lonely Hearts Killer, the Scoreboard Killer, the Trash Bag Killer, the Freeway Killer, the Skid Row Slasher, the Hillside Stranglers, and the Night Stalker. All names synonymous with pure evil. And yet, I can attest that the city's nights hide even worse things. Much worse. Worse than you can possibly imagine. Over the course of a three-day nightmare, when I was just twenty years old, I learned this in the most unexpected way. It was when I met the ultimate evil face to face, and the encounter changed the course of my life forever. It was October 31st, 1981, a few minutes after midnight. The moon was full and the night air was hot and foreboding. I gave a quiet curse. The Santa Ana winds were blowing strong tonight. The hot, dry winds were infamous for being the precursors to wildfires. They would come down to the mountain passes like the devil's hot breath. They would fuck up people's sinuses, exacerbate allergies, and promote migraines. We Los Angelinos also call them the devil winds, because when they blew, there was an increase in irritability, suicides, and crime. Scientifically, the winds contain an excess of positive ions, promoting an electrical charge that can cause horses' tails to stand out like thick brushes. Whatever the case, people became edgy. A little more tense, a little more irritable. The baby frets, the boss is less understanding, 
The teacher has less patience. The boyfriend is more jealous. The mild-mannered housewife puts the carving knife to her husband's neck. The disgruntled clerk decides to blow out the brains of a few of his co-workers. We Angelinos know this was the time that bad things happened. I had just left my place of work a small gambling casino called the Passage Club, located on a hilltop along the Santa Susana Pass, and was heading down the pass towards Simi Valley. I always hated driving the twists and turns of the isolated and dimly lit canyon road late at night. The thought of passing by the burnt-out ruins of the old Spawn movie ranch, where the Manson family had called home only a little more than a decade before, always gave me the willies especially since it had only been three years previously that they had finally found Donald Shorty Shay's bones a-moldering in the ground of the now deserted property. I shivered. God only knows how many of Manson's victims were still buried around there and undiscovered, I thought. To add fuel to the fire, the area was replete with accounts. Some true, some, maybe urban legends, of horrifying and strange incidents that took place in the desolate canyon over the decades. One such story was that of a local taxi driver, whose decapitated body was found in his taxi late one night, abandoned along the side of the nearby Box Canyon Road. When I heard that one, I couldn't help but conjure up the image of that taxi, with the hapless driver in the front seat, his torso sitting erratic and hands on the wheel, but with just a stump of a neck where his head used to be. The most frightening aspect, however, was that supposedly the crime had never been solved, and that would mean the killer was never caught. I knew it was childish, but in the back of my mind I always had a bit of dread that, on a particularly dark and moonless night, I could come out of one of those hairpin turns along the pass and come across a hitchhiker, arm out and thumb in the air, standing there, where no harmless individual had a right to be. To lighten up my mood, I decided to turn on the radio. To my disgust, the station was playing Shake Your Booty by KC and the Sunshine Band. Christ, I muttered. First, the English invasion fucked up American early rock and roll. Now we have this disco shit. Thank God disco was on its way out, I thought. Although I was 20, I was not a fan of the disco craze that had dominated much of the airwaves during the 70s. I was a die-hard, fully-fledged rock and roller. In case you hadn't figured it out from my intro, I was really heavily into the doors. Yeah, those hometown boys from right here in Los Angeles. Although Jim Morrison had been dead for a decade, his popularity had never waned. Indeed, I felt a kindred spirit to the Lizard King who, like me, attended the UCLA film school. It's not so well understood that Jim was first and foremost an artist and a poet. Who would have thought that a poetical recital on a beach in 1965 between Jim and a fellow UCLA classmate, Ray Manzarek, would lead to the formation of one of the most dark, raunchy, and influential bands in the history of popular music? In his tribute, several of my classmates and I would get together periodically to smoke a few joints while listening to Jim's Oedipus epic, the end. In my opinion, the only way to really appreciate the enigmatic lyrics of that song is when you're stoned out of your mind. In about ten minutes, I descended from the canyon pass onto the better-lit roads of Simi Valley. The plan was to link up with my friends at a nearby housing construction site. This was our customary thing to do after we all finished our late-night swing shifts. We would meet up at one of the half-finished homes to drink, smoke, and have a musical jam session. The construction sites didn't seem to ever have a security guard, which allowed us free access, so it was a convenient place to party, even if it didn't have all the amenities. After a few more turns, I arrived at the site, which was a subdivision of close to 100 homes under development. It was amazing to me how quickly Simi Valley was growing. I grew up in North Hollywood in the San Fernando Valley, which was one valley over. A lot of history there, but it was stagnant, with very little room left to grow. Simi Valley, on the other hand, seemed younger, but more vibrant, and contemporary. And with more of those subdivisions under development, it was obviously the housing market was doing well. I made my way to the house where we agreed to meet. 
It looked nearly completed, except for the missing glass in the windows and no doors. I had no sooner pulled into the as-yet-unpaid driveway when I was met by Michael, my oldest and closest friend. After climbing out of the car, Mike gave me a big bear hug. We had been running buddies since the first grade and had all shared experiences from our childhood and adolescence. Neither of us had any siblings, and so we had the same bond as natural brothers. We were so inseparable and always seen together that our school friends had nicknamed us Frick and Frack in jest. I was Frick, and Mike was identified as Frack. If one of us got into trouble, the other was usually not far away. As much time as I had spent over at Mike's house while growing up, his parents were like a second set of parents to me, and mine to Mike. He was older than me, however, by about ten months, and he was taller, broader, and heavier, having been the captain of our high school football team. In that sense, he was like an older brother to me. Mike attended class at nearby Cal State Northridge, but unlike me, he had received no college scholarship, and as a result had to get a near full-time gig working at a blockbuster video store in Simi Valley. Of late, he sported a wide-collar open-necked shirt, which showed off a mix of gold neck chains and wore his dark hair in the style of John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever, all of which he knew irked me to no end. With his sparky blue eyes and ruggedly handsome features, he always seems to have a revolving door of girlfriends. Jack, Mike exclaimed. It's about time you got here. Everyone's been waiting. You're holding up all our creative energies. Hey, bro, I lamented. I work up in the canyon, remember? And I can't leave until the last player leaves. I'm the valet. And besides, you guys live right here in the valley. Of course you'd make it here first. Mike gave me his customary smirk and said, Yeah, yeah, cry me a river, man. Come on, I got a cold beer with your name on it. I smiled and reached into the back seat grabbed my guitar case, and followed Mike inside. We walked into the house, using flashlights since the house still did not have electricity connected. I noticed that the concrete flooring had still not been finished and was littered with used glue canisters and paint cans. After passing through the main entrance, we entered into what appeared to be the future family room, as it has an unfinished fireplace and sets of large bay windows. The room had already been set up with some candles that radiated a welcoming light. I immediately saw my next closest friend, Steve, who was sitting on top of some discarded spackle containers. He already had his guitar out and was beginning his tuning. Steve looked up, showed his famous scap tooth grin, and yelled, Hey everyone, the director's arrived. An obvious dig at my recent acceptance into UCLA film school. No red carpet in this dive, bro. Grab a beer and let's get this party started. Mike and I first met Steve while still in grade school. With his long blonde hair, lean athletic body with dark golden tan, Steve was the pure perfectionist of a Southern California surfer boy. His parents, it turned out, were part of the 1960s surfer culture and practically raised Steve on the beaches of Laguna and Malibu to the tunes of Jan and Dean and the Beach Boys. Supposedly, Steve's parents were extras in those famous 1960s beach movies like Muscle Beach Party, Bikini Beach, and Beach Blanket Bingo. Steve liked to claim that, as a young kid, he was also in one of those movies, but Mike and I were never able to prove or disprove that assertion. Steve's laid-back demeanor often fooled those who first met him, and yes, he had more than his fair share of days ditching high school classes to get to the beach. But in actuality, Steve was well-read, with a love of politics and history, and I seldom saw him without a book in his hand when he wasn't riding the waves. Sitting across the room was the fourth wheel of our brotherhood. Dale, accompanied by his girlfriend, Kate. Dale had joined our circle a bit late, arriving at our high school in Chatsworth after transferring in from somewhere back east. In many ways, Dale was the direct antithesis to Steve's carefree, live-for-the-moment lifestyle. Unlike the rest of our families, Dale's family was blue-collar, and as a result, while growing up, 
he had to learn creative and innovative ways to make money. He started out with the usual teen jobs like mowing and delivering papers, but soon things like washing cars turned into a lucrative automotive detailing sideline. Next came a business helping to expand the advertising of local merchants. Then there was his very successful errand-running business, catering to the movie moguls in Hollywood. By the time we graduated from high school, Dale was a self-made entrepreneur. So far, he elected not to go to college, but seems to be content in developing his various business schemes. Mike, Steve, and I really didn't know everything Dale had his finger into, but it seems to be paying off. Since it was usually Dale that brought the very fine Cincimella weeds to our jam sessions, I didn't ask too many questions. If there was ever a poster child for the stereotypical spoiled and entitled Valley Girl, it was Kate. First off, well, she was legit born and raised in the San Fernando Valley. Not that all girls from the valley are airheads, but from my dating experience, many were. And sadly, Kate exemplified all the ditziness one would expect. She was only focused on her social status and physical appearance. Her Farrah Fawcett-style feathered blonde mane was always impeccably blown back. She would only shop at the best fashion boutiques on Melrose Avenue. She had a greater interest in conspicuous consumption than any intellectual or personal accomplishment. Mike and Steve couldn't understand why Dale kept her around, especially since she obviously used Dale for his money, and probably the weed, too. I figured it had to be the sex, whenever she managed to take those wayfarers off, anyway. She already looked uncomfortable sitting on some of the discarded construction cartons. Doubtless, she was afraid her Calvin Klein jeans were going to get dirty. After giving Dale and Kate a wave, I leaned down to take out a beer from the cooler that each person took turns in bringing to these get-togethers. I was pleased to see they had stocked it with my favorite, Henry Weinhard's Private Reserve. I took a long pull. Then, in what would change the course of all of our lives forever, I heard Mike say, Jack, I'd like to introduce you to my new friend, Alexandria. To this day, I often think of how lives and destinies can change in a microsecond. One second you are leading a happy and normal life, but when fate intercedes, it may forever lead to torment, regret, and despair. When I reached for that cold beer, I was a happy college student, surrounded by friends, a bright future ahead, and with no cares in the world. When I looked up, with a very chilled Henry's in hand, my world would never be the same. It's going to be hard to describe what happens next. I think every man has, at least once in his life, seen a woman that is so wantonly beautiful, so sexy, that she literally takes his breath away. I've had this happen later in my life, when meeting other women, but in this instance, it was much, much different, and much more intense. Strangely, it was not because Alexandria was in any sense model material. She was very pretty, but not beautiful, perhaps even a little bit masculine. Her mesomorph body clearly showed off her toned muscles. Her brunette hair was worn in a short shag, and her dark brown eyes were set in a lean and somewhat hawkish face. With a tomboy demeanor accented by her black t-shirt and blue jeans, she could have been the twin sister of one of my favorite rock idols, Joan Jett, the sexy, bad reputation girl. As I locked eyes with Alexandria, she smiled and I was suddenly jolted with wave after wave of some hot, sensual energy. It was like she radiated some pure eroticism that gripped me like a vice. Almost instantly, I was completely hard. A feeling of power and virility flooded my entire body. My head swam with dark thoughts of forbidden and perverted activities that I never thought I was capable of. I wanted to have her in any way possible. I couldn't believe it. I was suddenly standing there, meeting a person that was obviously my best friend's new girlfriend, and I was hard as a rock. What the fuck was happening? 
I surely stared for a bit too long without offering any form of greeting, as Mike gave me a quizzical look and said, Hey man, you all here tonight? Did you do a bit of weed at the club? Mike knew I sometimes took a few hits with the casino's kitchen crew. The dishwashers were all potheads. I stammered out some sort of denial, and as I averted my eyes from Alexandria's, I managed to get out a glad to meet you. I was too embarrassed and ashamed to even look at Mike. He laughed and turned to Alexandria and said, Babe, this is my friend Jack that I told you about. He's a bit of a nerd, but he's the smartest guy I know. I finally got my wits about me and extended my hands to Alexandria. She grasped my hand firmly and said in a seductive voice, Oh yes, Jack, I've heard so much about you. I'm happy to meet you at last. Her hand was cold, like she had been holding one of the iced bottles of beer too long. Odd, I thought, considering how hot she was making me. I desperately hoped Mike couldn't see the bulge in my pants, and I was both shocked and embarrassed at myself. Alexandria, for her part, simply smiled. Did she know the effect that she caused with her gaze? Mike seemed normal, and Steve and Dale never seemed to give Alexandria a second glance. So what the fuck was happening? Still a bit befuddled, I took a seat across from Mike and Steve, flanked by Dale, so that we more or less formed a circle. We had been jamming like this for a few years now. My dad had been a guitarist in a rock and roll band in the 1950s, and I was raised with a love for rock music. Especially when played by a mean axe. My dad's slang for an electric guitar. When Mike, Steve, and I were just kids, my dad gave us all lessons a couple days a week after school. Mike and Steve dived into it full force, and frankly, I think they were much better players than I. Mike could really shred a piece, and Steve was the master of riffs and licks. Dale had taken his own lessons as a kid, uh, he wasn't bad either. During our jams, Mike and Steve usually took turns playing lead guitar and vocals, and Dale and I accompanied with the rhythm. Our sessions always kicked off with a toast to my dad, who, after having the kindness and generosity to give those guitar lessons to his son and all his rowdy friends, died three years previous in a random car pile-up on the 101 freeway. His tragic death left my mother to take care of my younger sister and I, but with Mike and Dale at my side, I got through the tough times okay. Hey, Earth the Jack, I heard Mike say. You with us? I had zoned out, still rattled by Alexandria. I looked up and saw that Mike, Steve, and Dale had tuned up their guitars and were ready. I slugged back the Henrys, desperately needing something stronger. As if reading my mind, Steve passed over a bottle of peppermint schnapps, which he knew was my favorite with a beer chaser. I casually glanced back over to Alexandria, but she seems to have eyes only for Mike now. My hard-on had finally dissipated, either from the effects of the alcohol or because Alexandria's eyes were no longer drilling into mine. I wasn't sure, but I was very grateful. After I had tuned up, and everyone joined in for the toast to my dad, we were ready to rock. For the next three hours or so, things went pretty uneventful. We all enjoyed the songs, the booze, and the joints that were passed around rather liberally. With the Santa Anas picking up speed outside, we could hear the lonesome howl of the winds as they cascaded through the construction site. Mike, Steve, and Dale traded places improvising guitar solos as we all were vamping on tunes, songs, and chord progressions. Mike and Steve took turns with lead vocals and was joined by Kate, who had a beautiful melodic voice, something I always thought incongruent with her sometimes selfish demeanor. Laughing and in high spirits, we all ended up singing to Credence, The Rolling Stones, and You Got It, The Doors. Eventually, I fell into a good high and mellowed out. As the night wore on, all seemed normal again in the world. During the break in sets, Mike relayed to the group how he had met Alexandria. He had only met her a few days previously. They had bumped into each other at a nightclub in Woodland Hills, and 
as Mike put it, the chemistry was great between us. I didn't doubt it. However, it surprised me to learn that she had already moved into his apartment. Apparently, she had just moved to L.A. and had no friends or family in the area. In the back of my mind, I began to wonder why things had moved so fast. Mike liked his freedom of movement, and I hadn't known him to ever have a live-in girlfriend. For her part, Alexandria seemed very clingy on Mike, never leaving his side through the night. In fact, while I didn't have any rules against public displays of affection, I couldn't help but notice Alexandria seemed overly demonstrative, rubbing her hand along Mike's back and occasionally his inner thighs. I half expected her to start rubbing Mike's crotch. In between that, she would steal a kiss from him during the breaks in sets. From time to time, I could see Kate giving Alexandria a withering glance. Knowing Kate, she probably looked down at Alexandria's antics as cheap and uncultured. Mike, for his part, didn't seem to mind at all. A little after three in the morning, it was time to break things up. Both Mike and I needed to get some sleep before going to afternoon classes, and Steve and Mike needed to do their thing. Reluctantly, we called it a night. We packed our things up and cleaned up the room a bit to remove the traces of our presence from the construction crew. We all started heading out of the house, but as we did so, we passed by a shiny steel cabinet with a padlock, obviously a tool chest of some sort used by the building crew. In the glare of the flashlight, I could make out the reflection of our group as we passed by. Just as Steve stopped at the front door, taking a look outside to make sure no one was around, I glanced closer at the reflection. Then, I saw it. Or didn't see it, depending on your point of view. Although Alexandria was standing directly in front of me and behind Mike in line, in the reflection, she did not appear. It was only a brief moment in passing, as the group quickly passed by the cabinet and everyone headed outside. For the second time that night, I doubted my perceptions. I knew I had a good buzz going on, but I had never seen something that wasn't there. Or, more frightening, not seen something that was. Outside, as everyone started to agree that we'd all link up again on the weekend, I clumsily grabbed Mike and sputtered. Mike, you gotta... Uh, uh, Alexandria, she wasn't there. I couldn't see her. I must have sounded like a lunatic. Everyone turns to look as I continued to rant. Everyone had a confused look on their face. But when I looked at Alexandria, who was standing behind Mike, she just smiled. But not a smile of amusement. Oh no. It seemed more like a smile of knowing. I eventually stopped babbling, realizing what I thought I saw made no sense, not even to myself. And as a result, my friends were just growing more frightened at my behavior. Mike looked into my face, concerned, and said, Bro, are you okay? Did you have something other than the weed? I shakily replied, Yeah, guys, I'm fine. Just pretty tired after working all day. I didn't mean to wig out. To that, Steve asked. Hey, dude, you gonna be okay driving back home? I assured everyone that I would. With Alexandria continuing to stand there with that strange smile. I just wanted to get the fuck out of her presence as soon as I could. Mike finally let go and said, Okay, bro, but... Call me tomorrow after class, okay? I told him I would, and then hurriedly got in the car and pulled out of the driveway. As I was starting to head down the street, I took one last glance out the side window, and what I saw chilled me to the bone. Alexandria was still smiling, and she gave me a wave. There was no way in hell I was going to drive home using my usual route, going back along the dark and deserted Santa Susana Pass. I was too spooked, and was still on autopilot as I jumped on the 118 freeway towards the San Fernando Valley. Any buzz that I had was gone. I felt stone-cold sober. 
The more I thought about it, I knew I hadn't imagined things. First, that strange jolt of animalistic sexual arousal after first seeing Alexandria, and then not seeing her reflection. The latter worried me the most. I grew up in North Hollywood, around the motion picture industry. I knew what that meant in about every horror movie ever made. But it couldn't be. Was Alexandria a fucking vampire? No, that, that was completely insane. It took me about 45 minutes to get home. Arriving a bit after four in the morning, I walked up the steps of my small economy apartment just off of Victory Boulevard and put my key in the lock. The inside of the apartment was dark. I didn't turn on any lights as I felt my way to my bedroom. Then, from the darkened corner, I heard a sultry voice purr. Oh, hi babe, you're here. I let out a small scream, and for an instant I had a visage of Alexandria curled in my bed, still with that hideous smile, this time displaying an open mouth full of long, sharp teeth, reaching towards me with bony, clawed hands. Then the lights snapped on, revealing not a monstrous vampire, but a rather startled, albeit slim and pretty girl. Her full breasts and muscular legs were visible through her rather revealing nightgown. It was Bethany, my girlfriend. God, I had forgotten I had given her a key to the apartment a few days ago. Oh my god, Jack! Bethany exclaimed. Are you okay? I'm sorry if I scared you. I guess I should have called you to say I was coming over. I thought I'd surprise you. Then, with a seductive smile, a little something to relax the workday tension, you know? What could I say at that point? Bethany and I had been going together for almost a year. We had met one evening at a local UCLA watering hole. I was smitten with her almost immediately. Beth was a psych major, attending classes down the road at USC. After dating a succession of bimbo beach girls throughout high school, I found her a breath of fresh air. During our conversations, I discovered she was a patient listener always saw the good in things, and had a great deal of empathy and compassion. I knew she would do extremely well in her chosen profession, as she had the qualities to provide understanding and support, a cornerstone of successful psychotherapy. And as it turned out, Beth's bookish glasses completely belied the femininity that laid underneath. At five feet eight, 110 pounds, Slim waist with long blonde hair that hung down like fine silk, and gorgeous sapphire blue eyes, she was the perfect dream. Our class schedules had made it impossible to get together except for the evenings, but since meeting, we had managed to have dinner almost every night. And the sex. It was fucking great. To no surprise, as Bethany pulled me into the bed, my worries about Mike and Alexandria soon dissipated, like smoke on a windy night. Afterwards, in our coital glow, I traced the outline of a pink hibiscus flower Beth had tattooed above her right shoulder blade, one that always intrigued me because it was superimposed over two crossed daggers. I hadn't gotten around to asking her its meaning. I briefly debated about telling her about Alexandria, if anyone was firmly anchored to rational thought, it was Beth. I knew she would be able to provide some reasonable explanation for what I saw, but I had to get at least some shut-eye before tomorrow's classes. As I drifted off to sleep, I resolved to give Mike a call to make sure he was doing okay. I slept like the dead, straight through till my alarm went off at ten in the morning, not surprisingly, the bed was empty. Beth had morning classes, so I knew she must have taken off before dawn. I got up, took a quick shower, and grabbed a quick breakfast roll before I headed out the door. The drive from my apartment in North Hollywood to the UCLA campus took about 45 minutes. I was able to arrive in the nick of time before my 1 p.m. class at the film school. The class was one of my favorites. American television history, but I barely listened to the lecture. As soon as I was free, I walked to a payphone that was in the student union. I dialed Mike's number, but got no answer. 
He should have been home, as I knew he didn't have classes at Cal State Northridge on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and Thursday was also his night off from Blockbuster. I continued to call him during the breaks between my next three classes. Each time, no answer. I didn't like it. Not one bit. I regretted not speaking to Bethany about it so I could get her sanity check. Now I felt compelled to make sure Mike was okay. I realized I had no other choice but to drive over to Simi Valley and check on him, even though I knew I'd be smack dab in the evening rush hour on the 405 freeway. I had no choice. Southern California is best known for its freeways. They are considered by many a cultural touchstone. One of my rites of passage came when my father gave me his old 1969 Mustang when I got my driver's license at 17. With the proviso, I got a job to pay for my gas and insurance. With its 302 Windsor engine, it was a real boss car to drive on the LA freeways. Riders on the storm, baby. Unfortunately, there was nothing sexy about being stuck in the evening traffic flowing north from downtown LA over the hill to the San Fernando Valley and beyond. The drive to Mike's apartments took nearly an hour. The sun had already set as I arrived at Mike's apartment complex. I saw his firebird in the parking lot and was relieved to know he was home. I realized I was going to have to explain my sudden visit. If I brought up my concerns about Alexandria, what would be his reaction? Hey Mike, I think your new girlfriend is a vampire. What do you think? Yeah, right. At worst, he thinks I'm deranged. At best, he'd have a great laugh at my expense, and I'd never live it down. Decisions, decisions. Mike's apartment was on the upper tier of the motel-style complex, so I climbed the outside steps to the second floor. When I got to his door, I was about to knock, but I heard voices inside. Loud voices. It took me a few seconds to ascertain that they were coming from both a man and a woman. Then, I heard Mike's voice exclaim. No, please. Please stop. I can't. I can't. Before I thought further, I grabbed the door handle, and, thank God, the door was unlocked. I entered what was the living room slash kitchenette. I barely had time to register what I saw. The room had been ransacked. Either it had been tossed by someone searching for something, or there had been one hell of a fight. Hearing Mike's distressed voice, I figured the latter. I quickly followed the sounds to the bedroom. I could still hear Mike's feeble protestations, saying, No, but please stop, I don't want to. To what I now felt sure was his attacker. But in those split seconds before I reached the open bedroom door, I heard something that didn't quite make sense. I definitely heard a woman's voice, but she sounded like she was in ecstasy. Praying to God I wasn't stumbling into some weird sex play between Mike and one of his girlfriends, I steeled myself and looked into the room. I was prepared for anything, but the scene before me was so shocking, so depraved, I was momentarily stunned. Alexandria was buck naked and riding Mike like one of those mechanical bulls in an El Paso honky tonk. She was bucking back and forth in obvious pleasure. Come on, Mike, she moaned. You know you like it, and we have all night. The fun has just begun. No, Mike cried. I'm hurt. Please stop. But this sight was not what chilled me to the bone. It was the blood. It was everywhere. All over the bed, all over Mike, and all over Alexandria. The blood looked to be from a gash in Mike's neck. He was bleeding profusely. Alexandria had blood on her face and smeared all over her breasts. I must have gasped or cried out because Alexandria turned her head towards the door. There was a flicker of surprise at seeing me, but then she smiled. Oh look, Mike, it's Jack. Come to join us. The more the merrier. Join the party, Jack. She purred. For a few moments, I once again felt those familiar, intense waves of carnal desire wash over me. My head swooned. Alexandria was so erotic, 
and so sexy, I wanted desperately to give in. The desire was overpowering. I wanted to rub the blood all over her body and all over mine. Before I was aware of what I was doing, I took several steps forward. I started to unbutton my shirts in willingness to join the depraved trilogy of ecstasy. Yes, come to me, Jack. Alexandria panted, grinding and groaning, seemingly close to climax atop Mike. Then, from somewhere within, my mind screamed to stop. Mike was dying, and I knew I had to get the bitch off of him. I reached down into my inner psyche and willed myself to resist my cardinal impulses. Trying to focus, I reached my hand out and grappled for the nearest thing from the nightstand. My fingers curled around one of Mike's sports trophies. I picked it up and blindly threw it right at her. It hit her on the side of the head, which forced her to lose stride, but otherwise didn't seem to do much. She opened her mouth in a snarl. There was no longer any denying it. Her beautiful mouth opened unnaturally wide, revealing rows of serrated teeth, looking more like a monstrous shark than the Hollywood Dracula. Her eyes flashed red, and for a moment, her irises resembled that of a pit viper. I knew for sure then. Alexandria was a fucking vampire. Or a succubus. Or both. I didn't know. All I knew then was that I was in serious trouble. Jack, she hissed. That's very naughty. You should better respect your elders. I think it's time I schooled you properly, and the teacher is now in. In a flash, she was off of Mike and had her hands on my throat. Her strength was incredible. She shoved me against the wall and her grip tightened. My feet were hanging a foot off the ground. I had no leverage to fight, nor anything close by to use as a weapon. I began to see stars in my vision. Alexandria leaned in towards me, her open maw dripping saliva. Jack, she cooed. Your blood is going to taste so sweet. Her breath was fetid and stank of death. Her tongue rolled out and licked the nape of my neck. Suddenly, with a scream, Alexandria released me, and I fell to the floor in a heap. She stepped back, and began to wildly reach behind her back. As she turned, I could see the image of a cross burned into her neck. Smoke was rising from the wound, and the smell of burning flesh permeated the room. I looked beyond Alexandria, and could see Mike holding a wooden crucifix. He must have had it in the drawer, I thought weakly. Good for Mike. He gave the monster a taste of her own medicine. Alexandria whirled on Mike, hissing. You. I'm going to. Her threat was cut short as Mike raised up the crucifix and thrust it towards her face. She screamed again. She staggered back, raising her arms up in an attempt to shield the vision of the cross. She exclaimed to Mike, it's not going to save you. Then, turning to me, she said with true venom, Oh, Jack, you and I will meet again soon. We have unfinished business. Then you will be mine as well. Mine as well, I thought. What the fuck did that mean? Then, before my eyes, Alexandria disappeared. But not exactly. She morphed into something else. Could it have been a bat? I couldn't tell. It happened so quickly. And then she was gone. Mike collapsed back on the bed. He said, weakly, Sorry, bro. I fucked up. No, no. I cried, holding him in my arms. It's okay. You're okay. But I have to get you to the hospital. Mike was really looking pale, and I knew we didn't have much time. He had lost a lot of blood. I grabbed Mike in a fireman's carry, which wasn't easy since he had probably twenty pounds on me. I think I was running on pure adrenaline at that point. I managed to get Mike to my car, 
as other tenants of the apartment complex began to come out to gawk. I supposed seeing a stranger carrying the bloodied body of one of their neighbors didn't look good. I didn't care. I got Mike in the car, and we took off. I got Mike over to the Adventist Health Hospital in record time. I figured it being a faith-based hospital was all the better. I pulled up to the emergency room and ran in and screamed for help. Soon, Mike was on a gurney, taken into a trauma room. All I could do at that point was wait. I prayed for Mike and prayed for myself. I was legit scared for both of our lives, and I knew I had to get some sort of game plan on what to do next. I knew there was no way I could tell anyone the truth, that we were attacked by some sex-fiend vampire girl. If I did, I'd probably end up in a hospital as well, but the kind with padded walls. First, I called Mike's parents, Larry and Ida. They were hysterical, as could be expected. I simply said it looked like Mike had been bitten by some animal, maybe a dog, and that he was in surgery. Then I called my mom, who was relieved to know that I was okay. Last, I called Steve and Dale. Within the hour, everyone had joined me in the waiting room. In answer to all their questions, I kept the story as it happened, minus Alexandria. I explained that I stopped by to see Mike after finishing classes, found the door unlocked, and went in to find Mike on the bed, bleeding. Around midnight, one of the doctors came out to inform us that Mike had gotten out of surgery and was stable. He said it was lucky that his jugular had not been punctured, but that the wound itself had caused a serious amount of blood loss. In fact, the doctor announced, if I had not found him when I did, Mike certainly would have bled out. The wound had been cleaned and stitched up, and some samples taken for testing. Mike had been given a rabies shot as a precaution. The doctor admitted that, at present, they couldn't tell exactly what type of animal had been involved. They had speculated initially it might have been from a coyote that somehow found its way down from the canyon, or perhaps some wild dog. The doctor admitted that it was the neatest bite he had ever seen, more of a set of puncture wounds, not a ripping-type wound, and so we should all consider Mike extremely lucky. It could have been much worse. I almost laughed at that. I knew it was as bad as it could get. After getting the doctor's reports, Mike's parents stayed at the hospital while the rest of us took off. I worried for Mike and almost considered asking the nurse to make sure a crucifix was placed on the wall above Mike's bed, but I really didn't know if that would be enough. My mother asked if I wanted to come home with her for the night, but I told her that I was fine, and that I needed to go to class in the morning. In reality, I had no such intention. I knew I had to start preparing for an inevitable reunion with Alexandria, and I knew it wouldn't be pleasant. I got back to my apartment around 2 a.m. This time I wasn't surprised to find Bethany waiting for me. Before I knew what I was doing, I hugged her like there was no tomorrow, tears streaming down my face like the summer rain. She held me tightly, silently, and didn't prompt me to explain the angst that was clearly racking my body. After a few minutes, I leaned back and looked into her eyes. She simply said, I want to help. Tell me what it is. And I did. Everything. I started with the get-together at the construction site, sheepishly admitting to Beth about my physical reaction when I first met Alexandria. She squeezed my hand, encouraging me to go on. I continued telling her about the second encounter with Alexandria, my near death at her hands, and the race to get Mike in the hospital after being savagely attacked by the vampire thing. During my revelation, Bethany didn't laugh. She didn't contradict. She didn't doubt. Instead, she again squeezed my hand, looked me in the eyes, and said, Jack, there are creatures in this world that are often spoke of in legends. But all legends have their basis in fact. As with everything, some of these beings are good, some are evil. I believe you have encountered a truly evil monster. A monster that feeds on blood, sex, and violence. 
With that, she hugged me and whispered in my ear, You are good, Jack. You have it in you to fight. And I'm right here with you. I couldn't have loved Beth more in that moment. Hearing those words was like a huge weight taken off my shoulders. I felt I was no longer alone. Afterwards, we made love. To this day, I don't believe I had ever made love, or received the same from any woman, as strong and passionate as I did with Beth that night. I woke up just before noon, having miraculously slept peacefully, soundly, and untroubled. Bethany had already left for her early classes. I myself had afternoon classes, but I had no intention of making them. The first thing I needed to do was go to the nearest Catholic church, get some holy water, and find as many crucifixes as possible, and some wooden stakes. I figured I could find some sturdy tree stakes that would suffice at the nearest Ace Hardware. I was about to head out the door when I got the call. It was from Larry, Mike's dad. Jack, he said, his voice cracking. Mike's gone. He died just before dawn. The doctors aren't sure what happened. He was doing fine, and then he just died. I was stunned. I didn't expect it. Mike was a fighter. He wouldn't give up. And he was stable last night. How could he have just died? Larry continued, crying now. Jack, Ida was with Mike at the end. She swears the last thing Mike said was, Tell Jack, the devil's mouth. I don't know what he meant, he said, sobbing. He was delirious at the end, but I wanted you to know. The rest of the call was a blur. Larry told me they would make arrangements and let me know. I murmured in acknowledgement, and we ended the call. I hung up the phone. At that moment, I could have, and should have, broken down in tears at the loss of my closest friend in the world. But then, my head spun, and I collapsed to my knees. It seemed like the room became encompassed with a bright light, forcing me to shield my eyes by bowing my head. Suddenly, a level of rage began to course through my body that I never thought I could muster. It was almost like my soul itself was on fire. I was never a religious person, but in that moment, I felt an insight, an understanding of what I needed to do, what needed to be done. I knew I was joining a fight that had taken place through the millennia, the fight between good and evil. I felt a sense of deja vu that many before me had also faced this same challenge. That bitch Alexandria was the devil's spawn and had to face her day of reckoning. I suddenly felt a sense that she was an ancient being who had walked on this earth for centuries past, preying on the kind and the innocent. I had to kill her. I'd drive a stake through her black heart. I had no idea if I would live through the encounter. All I knew about vampires was what I saw in movies. Would a wooden stake even work? The only thing I was sure of was at twenty years old, I didn't want to die, but I knew Mike would have done the same for me, and he would have died trying. I wasn't naive enough to think I could fight the undead all by myself. Other than Bethany, I had no one to turn to for help except for Steve and Dale. I knew they would have done anything for Mike, but would they even believe me, and would they be willing to also put their lives at risk? I resolved to go see them that evening and lay all my cards on the table. I spent the afternoon making the rounds, checking off my laundry list of vampire fighting tools as I went along. It took me three churches before I found one with filled reservoirs of holy water. To be double sure, I asked the resident priest to bless the water once again. Maybe he took pity on me, and probably had his doubts, but he gave another blessing to the water after being placed in several plastic jugs. I later divided the water into several vials that could be easily carried in my pockets. 
By late afternoon, I returned to my apartment. I had just gotten out of my car when a guy with jowls that could make a Mississippi hound's dog proud walked up to me and asked, Are you Jack Walker? Yeah, I replied, taking a closer look at him. He looked to be in his early forties and was sporting a flat top, making him look like the spitting image of Jack Webb's Joe Friday. I knew instantly he was a cop. He introduced himself as Detective Tom Schmidt of the Simi Valley PD, and he showed me his badge. Mr. Walker, Schmidt started. I'm investigating the death of Michael Thompson. I'm sorry for your loss of your friend. An autopsy's pending to determine his specific cause of death, but clearly that odd wound in his throat is a contributing factor. The doc says some sort of animal attack. You brought him in, right? I need to know what happened to him, Schmidt said. I knew I couldn't tell Schmidt a thing about Alexandria. The police would be powerless to combat her, and the end results would be me being further detained or committed when I needed to be out looking for her. So I kept the story as it happened, minus Alexandria. I told Schmidt I stopped by to see Mike after finishing classes, found the door unlocked, and went in to find Mike on the bed, bleeding. So how do you think he got the neck wound? Schmidt asked. I shrugged and replied that Mike must have been attacked by a dog and made it back into his apartment. Schmidt studied me closely for several seconds, which I found a bit unnerving. Then he said, What I don't get is, if your friend was attacked by an animal outside, why all the breakage throughout the front room seems to indicate some form of struggle that took place inside the apartment. Crap. I thought. Schmidt was pretty good. I'd have to give more thought to my answer. Well, the door was open, I said. Maybe the dog, or whatever it was, made its way into the apartment and attacked Mike there. Schmidt looked at me again, then went on. Yeah, but there's none of your friend's blood in the living room. Not even a drop. One would think the dog would have drawn blood there, considering all the damage to the room. Instead, all the blood's in the bedroom, on the bed and the walls. Any idea how that could have happened? Wow, I thought. Who is this guy? Detective Columbo. He's just baiting me to see what I say. I... I replied, out of ideas on any potential lie. I suppose he didn't get wounded until the bedroom. That studied look again. I knew something else was coming. Then. See, the thing is, Jack, uh, can I call you Jack? We found a lot of fluid on your friend's bed. Seminal fluid. Also, fluids from a female. A lot. What do you make of that? I knew my face was probably reddening, and that Schmidt could see it. There was a shoe to drop, and both he and I knew it. Well, Mike had a lot of girlfriends. I suppose he'd been with one earlier, I sputtered. Schmidt leaned closer, and once again prefaced his question with an annoying, See, the thing is, Jack, followed by a pause, then, Tests show the fluids were fresh, and mixed in with the blood, so it wasn't from an older encounter. It seems to indicate Mike was having sex when he was bitten. So, there it was. Christ, Joe Friday had already figured it out. It's amazing what modern forensics can reveal. Mercifully, Schmidt didn't wait for an answer. So you can see why this really perplexes me, Jack. Tests are still pending on what type of animal caused the wound, but no matter what it was, how could it have made it into Mike's bedroom? And oddly, while he was in the middle of coitus... I... coitus? I stammered. Sex, Jack. Schmidt gave me a pitying look like I was myself a virgin. And who was the woman who was there? That's the $64,000 question. She holds the key to what happened, he explained. So, Jack, Schmidt concluded, with his eyes drilling into mine. Do you know who the woman could be? I've never been a good liar, 
and I prayed that my answer would be as nonchalant as I hoped. I replied, Detective, as I said before, Mike was popular with girls, but I frankly didn't keep up with whom he was dating. All I know is, when I found him, he was alone. With one last withering look, Schmidt finally said, Okay, Jack, we'll interview his neighbor and your other friends to see if we can figure out who he was seeing. Here's my card. Call me if you think of anything else I need to know. I watched Schmidt drive off. I breathed a sigh of relief. I was afraid there for a bit that he would notice all the shopping bags in the back seat of my car. It would not have been fun if I had to explain to him what I was doing with all the vampire-fighting paraphernalia that I had obtained that afternoon. A few hours later, I left to go see Steve and Dale. After picking up a Tommy's burger, I jumped on the 405 to head first to Steve's. I figured that of the two of them, Steve would be more open to what I had to say. While Dale was a consistent pragmatist, one who liked stability while seeing the world through black and white prisms, Steve thrived on living outside the box, moments to moments, not shying away from the unknown and the mysterious. Our group was well aware of Steve's reading interests in the occult and the unexplained, and that he was a self-avowed conspiracy nut who believed in the second shooter on the grassy knoll, the woman in the polka dot dress, and James Earl Ray's mysterious Rowell. Oh, and we definitely never wanted to get him going on the Trilateral Commission and its implementation of a new world order. About an hour later, I was there. The King of the Beach Bums had an apartment on top of a roadhouse in Santa Monica. Living there gave Steve central access to the top surfing sites on Malibu and Zuma beaches to the west, and Manhattan and Hermosa beaches to the south. I could see the evening crowd was already sitting along the sidewalk tables in front of the tavern. I walked up the stairs to Steve's place. He answered after the first knock. He looked terrible. Hey, dude, he said, giving me a big hug. I can't believe Mike's gone. I didn't go to class today. I couldn't even go to the beach, man. I've been here all day. I just can't believe it. Then, taking a step back, he gave me an uncharacteristically serious look. Jack, I had a visit from some cop today. Guy looked like Joe Friday. He asked a lot of questions, especially about any woman Mike had known or dated recently. I thought Mike was attacked by some animal. Why do the cops care about some girl? Okay, I replied. So what did you tell him? Well, Steve said. I told him about Mary, of course. Mary was one of our fellow high school classmates, and Mike had been steady with her for almost two years. They broke up when Mary went off to college in Virginia. And also, that bartender Cindy he dated a few months back. But, of course, the detective was more interested in that weird chick, Alexandria, that Mike had brought to our jam session especially since we saw her with him just two days before his accident. Great, I thought. I deliberately didn't tell Schmidt about Alexandria. I didn't consider what Steve or Dale would say. Now Schmidt would wonder why I didn't mention her. I wouldn't be looking forward to our next encounter. Steve, I said, take a seat. I have something to tell you, and I need your help. An hour later, Steve was packing a bag of clothes and other things necessary for an extended stay at my place. I had told him the whole story, beginning with my perverse reaction when first meeting Alexandria at the construction site, to her transforming into a fucking bat after attacking Mike and me. Throughout it all, I expected many reactions from Steve, but he listened quietly, intently, and then simply said, Okay, let's go find the bitch. We agreed that we needed to go see Dale next, although we had no illusions it was going to be a tough sell. We called Dale's home phone, but there was no answer. We figured by the time we drove there, he would likely be back in. Steve jumped in my car, and we headed back up the 405. 
It was late evening and traffic was good. Dale had a nice condo in Woodland Hills, not far from Topanga Canyon Boulevard. The last time I was there was a few months previous, when Dale threw a hell of a party celebrating the grand opening of one of his new business ventures. Steve and I noticed Dale's car in his reserved parking space, but when we knocked on the door repeatedly, there was no answer. Steve and I looked at each other. This did not look good, especially when Steve turned the door handle and found the door unlocked. Dale, the ever-cautious, follow-the-book guy, was not likely to leave his door unsecured. I nodded, and Steve opened the door. Dale, uh, hey, Dale, uh, this is Jack and Steve, I yelled. The door was unlocked. Uh, we're coming in, okay? No response. We walked down the entrance hallway and made our way into the living room. Nothing looked out of place. We continued past the dining room, noticing that there were two sets of plates with half-eaten food. It appeared Dale had company, and something had interrupted the dinner. We continued towards the rear of the condo, the dread building up inside me step by step. Christ, Steve, I whispered. I don't like this. Alexandra told me she was going to come for me. Do you think she might harm Dale, too? I don't know, dude. But if the bitch is here, we didn't bring anything from your bag of tricks, he replied, in obvious reference to our stash of vampire fighting tools. Okay, too late now, I lamented. We gotta check out the bedrooms. There were two guest rooms. We checked them one by one. Both were empty and the beds made. One last room to go. The master bedroom. The door was closed. I had a terrible sense of deja vu. Was I going to look inside to find Alexandria molesting another of my friends in one of her perverted orgies? I hesitated for a moment. Then Steve gave me a reassuring nod. I flung the door open. The room was empty. The bed was still made. This is really strange, Steve. I said. Dale's car is outside. Where the fuck is he? We proceeded to go back to the house. Once in the kitchen, I again took notice of the half-eaten food on the table. Whatever happened, it must have been without warning, I thought. Then my eye caught the doors to the kitchen pantry. I knew it was rather spacious, and Dale had many of his wine racks in there. We hadn't checked it yet. Thinking it was another bust, I casually walked over and opened the door. Kate was draped over a storage cabinet that held breads, crackers, and pastas. Her blood dripping over bags of rigatoni like splashes of spaghetti sauce. Her eyes were wide open, staring straight at us, and her face was frozen in a hideous, rictus grin that almost seemed to mock us. It was quite obvious that she wouldn't be shopping for any more designer purses on Rodeo Drive. The gaping wound on the left side of her neck made sure of that. My god, Jack, you were fucking right, exclaimed Steve. I never doubted you, man, but still. His voice trailed off. Yeah, I said. That's Alexandria's handiwork. She's been here. Looks like she left Kate as some kind of warning. She must have Dale. God help him. I was about to reach for Dale's home phone when Steve grabbed my hand and hissed. Jack, what are you doing? We have to call the police, I said. No way, dude, Steve replied. Think about it. Do you want to explain to that detective how you just happened to be at the sites of two different deaths in almost as many days? At best, you'll be tied up with the cops for days. Both of us, probably. We need to try to find Dale, and we need to deal with Alexandria. We have to get out of here, now. I nodded. I knew it was wrong to leave a scene of a crime, but Steve was right. So far, I had been a step behind Alexandria, and I needed to get ahead of things quickly. 
getting tied up with the cops would be the worst thing to do at the moment. We left Dale's condo as surreptitiously as possible, careful to not bump into anyone, and drove back to my apartment in North Hollywood. It was near midnight. Bethany had been waiting for me. As soon as I stepped inside, she gave me a tight hug. After the terror and death I had just witnessed, her comforting hug was so reassuring. She gave me a knowing look. Tell me everything that has happened, she said. Steve stepped in, carrying in our bags of wooden stakes and holy water, and gave Bethany a wave. He had only met her a handful of times, since Beth's class schedule at USC allowed her only to make it to my place in the San Fernando Valley in the evenings. But just last week, Beth and I hosted dinner with Mike, Dale, Kate, and Steve. It had been a great evening, full of fun and reverie. Seemed like a lifetime ago. Now, two, probably three, of my friends are dead. The three of us sat down, and I filled Bethany in the day's events. When I told her about Kate, she raised a hand to her mouth, gasped, and said, My God, it's really gone this far? You got it, replied Steve. It's war now. I think we all have to be concerned for our safety. If Alexandria got to Dale, then she can come for any of us next. Yeah, I said, but we have at least one thing going for us. What's that? Bethany asked. We have some vampire fighting tools in our toolkit, I said, giving a nod to the large bag we had brought in. She looked at the bag, but did not open it. Some of that will work, she mused, but you can't always believe what you see in movies. Steve and I gave each other a glance, which Beth picked up on. What I mean is, don't be overly confident in all that stuff will work, she said confidently. Sure, said Steve, but Jack found out that Alexandria and Crosses definitely don't go together. Hmm, right, said Beth. But was there anything special about the crucifix that was in Mike's bedroom? After some consideration, I said, Well, yeah, actually. It was a crucifix that Mike was given during his catechism classes back in high school. Right, said Beth. So it had come from a holy place, and was not just a run-of-the-mill crucifix brought from the store. Her leading question caused an epiphany in both Steve and I at the same time causing us to exclaim, Oh, Christ! Simultaneously. I never thought about those differences, I said. It's so much for the thirty dollars I spent today. Well, Beth said, I've read a lot about ancient mythology and legends. I've always found the link between the occult and aberrant behavior and deviant psychology fascinating, especially the topic of vampirism. Do you know that one of the earliest accounts of vampires is found in an ancient Sumerian and Babylonian myth, dating to 4000 BC? The story describes Ikumo, or Edimo, uh, one who is snatched away. The Ikimo is a type of Uruku, or Ukuta, a spirit or demon who is not buried properly and returned as a vengeful spirit to suck the life out of the living. The fact that vampires are the oldest and most widespread myth in the world seems to lend more credence to the story. Cultures that never had any contact with each other, separated by thousands of miles and thousands of years, all recount some form of undead that returns to suck the blood of the living. But my point is, different folklore recount different ways to kill a vampire. It doesn't help that modern-day vampire fiction has thrown in several other so-called ways to kill Nosferatu, like the wooden stake through the heart. And Hollywood movies only serve to probe further misinformation while almost glamorizing the vampire. A pause. Then Bethany continued. What I'm trying to say is, you can't be too overconfident about how to fight this Alexandria. She will use her sexual prowess to make you powerless. She'll use sex as a narcotic to hypnotize you. And she likes it, too. It's a two-way street. She's insatiable. To her, blood is her food. But sex is her existence. 
Steve and I gave each other another glance. Sounds like a succubus. Opined Steve. Beth gave an understanding nod. Unfortunately, she continued, mankind is likely to fit those creatures into neat categories. In some myths, they've been referred to as vampires, other times as succubi. The reality is that they are one and the same. They feed on blood, violence, and sex. Evidence of the vampire's sexual nature, particularly in the folklore of the gypsies and their neighbors, the southern Slavs. For example, corpses dug up as suspected vampires occasionally were reported to have an erection. Gypsies thought of the vampire as a sexual entity. The male vampire was believed to have such an intense sex drive that his sexual need alone was sufficient to bring him back from the grave. His first act usually was a return to his widow, with whom he engaged in sexual intercourse. Nightly visits could ensue and continue over a period of time, with the wife being exhausted and emaciated. The folklore of Russia also described the vampire as a sexual being. Among the ways in which it made itself known was to appear in a village as a handsome young stranger. Circulating among the young people in the evening, the vampire lured unsuspecting women to their doom. The Langsuyar of Malaysia was also a sexual being, a female vampire. She was often pictured as a desirable young woman who could marry and bear children. Langsuyars were believed to be able to live somewhat normally in a village for many years, revealed only by their inadvertent involvement in an activity that disclosed their identity. Most vampires are like this. They have learned to blend in, to adapt, to coexist among humans. But then there are the rogues, the ones who thirst on violence and fear. This, Alexandria, I believe she is one of the devil's spawn. I looked at Bethany in a whole new light. I knew she was well read, but to be so knowledgeable on the lore of the vampire, it was something I couldn't have expected especially now when we are facing the real thing. As usual, she picked up quickly on the quizzical look on my face. About a year ago, she explained, while doing some of my research, I was fortunate to have stumbled upon a private collector of books in the occult. I believe he is only one of three people in the world who have the most rare and scarce books on demonology and the history of Homo Nosferatu Vampiris, the vampire. The book dates from the 16th century, and was commissioned by the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Over an entire decade, a group of Catholic Church vampirologists scoured all of Europe and the Far East, compiling all information ever known or collected on the vampire, ranging from ancient scripts, myths, and folklore, to oral history from contemporary sources. Supposedly, the church scholars were even able to capture and interrogate an actual vampire, a soldier that was killed but did not die on one of the battlefields of Europe. As you can imagine, this provided invaluable first-hand information on how the creatures are created, how they live amongst us, and how they may be killed. These books were reportedly stored in a vault in the Vatican Library, but apparently were lost to history. At least they have never been acknowledged by the Vatican. However, as I mentioned, one collector managed to obtain one of the books. I can't reveal who he is, but I can say he lives in Europe. I was very fortunate to have a few days to study the text, and trust me, I needed every bit of that time in order to translate it with my limited Latin. She chuckled. So, from everything I've studied, the bottom line is this, Bethany continued. We're facing a rogue vampire. There may be others from her clan here in Los Angeles, but probably not. Vampires are isolationists, and tends to be very territorial and protective of their feeding grounds. But she may be surrounding herself with others she has turned. She would use them to protect her and to do her bidding. She is confined to coming out only at night. As an evil entity, she can be warded away or killed only by God's grace through the holy relics blessed or sanctified in the eyes of God. As you learned, a crucifix that has been consecrated, or a splash of holy water. 
Unlike in Hollywood, you can't kill her with a wooden stake alone, unless it has been blessed or sanctified with holy water. Last points. Destroying the creature's heart will render it powerless, but it will never be killed unless its head is separated from the body. Only then is Homo Nosferatu Vampiris fully destroyed. Okay, got that. So, what's our next step? I asked. We have to find Alexandria, and Dale, if he's still alive. Yeah, Steve agreed. But don't forget poor Kate. You know that detective will be knocking on your door to ask questions, sure as we're sitting here. Christ, I muttered. That's all we need. We can't afford to get tied up with the cops. I stood up and paced the room. Okay, I said. We have one starting point. I don't know if it means anything, but Mike's dad told me this morning that Mike's last words were directed to me, and he uttered the words, The Devil's Mouth. It didn't mean anything to Larry, and there's no reason it would. I think what Mike was trying to say was, The Devil's Maw. The Devil's Maw? exclaimed Steve. You mean the abandoned train tunnel we used to dare each other to go into when we were kids? Right, I said. For Bethany's benefits, I explained the history to her. The Maw was a railroad tunnel that was begun in the 1890s to connect the Simi and San Fernando Valleys. But having a tunnel through Simi Hills and Santa Susana Mountains, it would save considerable time and distance for trains traveling to and from San Francisco and Los Angeles. Legend has it that construction of the tunnel was plagued with problems from the start. Demolitions on the hillside went wrong and cost five workers their lives. Then, later, when the tunnel was several thousand feet in, there was a partial collapse which killed six others. By that point, the railroad has found another point that would make for a shorter route, running beneath the Santa Susana Pass. This eventually became the Santa Susana Tunnel, which was completed in 1904, and is still used today as part of the Union Pacific Railroad coastline. The original tunnel was left derelict for decades, but in the 1950s, a local teenage boy went missing, and after weeks of fruitless searching, they had found his badly decomposed remains in the tunnel. Much of it had been eaten or carted away by predators. From what they could ascertain, he had been sexually assaulted, stabbed, and strangled. To this day, I don't believe the case was ever solved. Anyway... Uh, that was enough for the authorities, who have already been under pressure for years to do something about the safety risks posed by the deteriorating tunnel. No one wanted the site to become some sick destination for the morbidly curious. So, they had the tunnel bulldozed and filled in with earth. Over the years, the tunnel has been largely forgotten and is now overgrown with sagebrush and cactus. People drive past it on the freeway every day, not knowing it's even there. The thing is, I concluded, over time the filled-in entrance had one portion collapse inwards, providing a small access way into the tunnel. It's only large enough to allow someone on their hands and knees to get inside. From the outside, it's just a black hole, and even shining a flashlight reveals nothing but darkness, hence the nickname The Devil's Maw. As locals, Steve, Dale, and myself had first heard of it back in middle school, and we would sometimes go out there to take a look at it. As kids do, we would dare each other to go in, but thank God we had enough common sense to never try it. One of the kids, I think Kevin was his name, claimed he went in. He said after several feet of crouching down, he came out into the tunnel. Black as spades, he said, even with the flashlight. He saw old mining equipment and some lanterns littering the tunnel. He was going to go in a bit further, he said but then got worried about rattlesnakes or other desert creatures that might make the tunnel their home, so he left. And that's all I know about it. Well, what a perfect place for a vampire den, Bethany said. Dark, dry, secluded, and relatively free of any danger from prying eyes. Jack, I think Mike must have been trying to give you a clue on how to find Alexandria. I nodded in agreement. Yeah. I said. I'm not sure how he knew. He liked hiking the area, so maybe he was poking around there and discovered her. 
but that's got to be our first stop tomorrow. We'll get a start at first light, before Schmidt comes around and pays us a visit. I looked at Beth. Babe, I'm not going to let you come with us. From what you're saying, we should be fine since it'll be daylight. But I don't know what we'll face once in the tunnel, or whether Alexandria will be asleep in there. I'm not going to risk anything happening to you. You've given us the knowledge, but it'll be up to Steve and I to face Alexandria alone. No way in hell I'm going to place you in danger. Please don't argue with me on this. Beth looked at me, and for a moment, I thought she was going to fight me on the issue. But then she just squeezed my hand and nodded. It was after midnight, so we decided to get some sleep. Steve took his usual place on the couch, where he'd enjoyed many a previous night after having a few too many drinks during my parties. Although I was physically and mentally exhausted, I once again had a feeling of intense peace and calm when Bethany held me tight. We ended up making love. We took our time, and it was slow and passionate. Afterwards, as we lay spooning, I again admired Beth's pink hibiscus tattoo with the two crossed daggers. Babe, I muttered. Hmm? Beth said, stretching. I've been meaning to ask you, I went on. This tattoo, it's beautiful and unique. Why did you get it? I mean, what does it symbolize? Beth turned around to face me. Oh, you could say it's a family tradition. My father has one like this, as did his father. To honor them, I got mine when I turned 18. I think it brings me luck. Well, I said, just before drifting off. I like it. I'm glad, Beth said, and I could hear the smile in her voice as she squeezed my hand. I was jolted awake by some loud sound. My mind was foggy from sleep, and I wasn't sure if I had been dreaming or if it had been a sound coming from within the house. I could hear the Santa Anas had picked up and were blowing against the side of the house. Maybe the wind. I waited for nearly a minute, and then I heard it again. This time, there was no doubt. Knocking, but slow knocking like one rap every five seconds. And it sounded like the front door. My heart started to pound. I sat upright and looked at the clock. It was 3 a.m. Whatever it was, it couldn't be good. I reached in the nightstand and took out a 38 Smith & Weston Chief Special Revolver. Bethany had started to stir, and I told her to stay in the room. I grabbed my robe and started down the hallway towards the front door. When I reached the end of the hallway and entered the living room, I saw that Steve had already gotten up and was standing with his hand on the doorknob. I managed to say, Wait, Steve, I don't think that's a good... When he yanked open the door. The porch light was not on, but the dim glow from the small living room lamp still managed to illuminate the figure standing on the stoop. I heard Steve gasp. It was Dale. And he was safe. Oh my god, dude, exclaimed Steve. We thought you were dead. What happened? Where have you been? Dale simply smiled and said, May I come in? There was something in the way he asked that that didn't sound right. It didn't sound like our jovial friend, but almost like there was a hint of malice behind it. The tone of voice a serial killer would use when asking a housewife if it was okay to come in to use her phone. The hair on the back of my neck started to stand up. Then, just as I heard Steve say, Dude, why so formal? You know Jack's casa is su casa. I noticed that Dale wasn't standing on the front door. Fuck no, I thought. It must have been a trick of the light. I stepped closer. Oh my god, I whispered, as I realized Dale was indeed not standing in the open door. He was floating. His shoes were a good two inches off the concrete. Dale smiled wider, looked at Steve, and asked again. 
May I come in, Steve? It's cold out here. Before the words could come out of my mouth, Steve laughed and exclaimed, Of course, dude. Get your skinny ass in here. No, Steve, I yelled. It's not Dale. Before I could react further, Dale took a step inside the house. Or should I say, he glided in. His features abruptly changed from the handsome young man we all knew to a ghoul-like rendition of Max Shrek's Count Orlov. Dale's eyes sank back into his head, and his irises shined red with a predatory glare. His ears elongated into pointed, bat-like lobes. His face spread into a maniacal grin, unfurling a set of snake-like curved incisors, which dripped frothy spittle down his chin. In a now deeper, raspy voice, sounding like it was coming from the depths of hell, Dale cooed. Hi, guys. Ready for the best jam session we ever had. Steve belatedly realized his mistake. A vampire cannot enter a home without an invitation. He took a step forward in an attempt to grab Dale. His reward was a backhand from the Dale thing that sent him flying six feet into the wall. Steve impacted with a sickening crunch and hard enough to punch a crater into the drywall. As he slid forward, I was sure he was dead. Steve, I screamed. Dale then turns to me. I raised my thirty-eight and fired twice, point-blank, into his chest. He grabbed me by the throat. I managed one more wild shot, this one into his left cheek and blowing out through the right side of his head. Dale didn't skip a beat. His strength was inhuman, easily lifting me, kicking and screaming off of the floor. He then threw me like a rag doll. I sailed over the living room table, knocking off several candlestick holders and several vases in a parody of a drunken carrier landing. After hitting the floor on the other side, Dale once again was on me. His fists pummeled my face, and I could feel something warm trickling down the back of my head. After regaining more blows upon me, he picked me up by the hair. I screamed as stars swam before my eyes. As I dangled in the air, Dale leered into my face. I could smell his fetid breath, reeking of death and decay. His brains were oozing out the exit wound on the side of his head. Jack, he hissed. I hated you the most. Always so annoying. Mr. Smarty Pants, always thinking you were entitled to everything, while the rest of us had to work hard to try to get ahead. Little snot-nosed whiner, always getting what you want, but not this time. Oh no. With an evil cackle, they all flung me hard against the wall. Alexandria wants you for herself. She's developed a thing for you. A fixation. She'll be angry with me for killing you. But I don't care. I'm going to enjoy having your blood washed down my throat. And then I'm going to go to your family's house and fuck your sister. Make her my little sex slave. Sweet Sixteen. I'll break her in real good. How's that sound, Jackie boy? Blood was coursing into my eyes from a gash on my forehead. But I stared hard at the Dale thing, smiled, and said, I don't know about that, Dale. Your pecker was small even when you were alive. That's why Kate would call me when she needed a little satisfying. With a snarl, Dale started towards me. I figured this was it. Dale would kill me for sure. Suddenly, I saw a blur rush up behind him, and the next thing I heard was a <sighs> come out of Dale's mouth as a pointed end of a long kitchen knife popped out of the front of his chest like one of those baby creatures in Alien. Dale stood there for a moment, stock still, with a look of bewilderment on his face. The shit-eating grin was gone. Wherever the knife protruded, the edges of the wound smoked and simmered like bacon in a fry pan. From behind Dale's shoulder, I could now see Bethany holding the knife. She leaned closer, and I could hear her whisper in Dale's ear. Do you feel God's holy water on the knife, you monster? With another thrust, 
she incanted some phrase in Latin. Adjure te, spiritus nesquieme, per diem omino pentem. Then, within moments, the Dale Thing's eyes sunk back into his skull. His skin blackened and withered, and a blackish fluid began pouring out of his gaping mouth. Bethany pulled out the knife as he crumpled to the floor. Without skipping a beat, she then bent over the blackened corpse. I lay shocked, watching as my sweet and loving girlfriend calmly put the knife to Dale's neck and began decapitating him. For those unlucky enough to have ever witnessed such a sight, a head does not come off easily, nor cleanly. It takes a few minutes of sawing to cut through the tough tendons and vertebrae within the neck. I was transfixed watching the horrific scene as Bethany completely severed the head from what was left of Dale's body. What was left of him nearly disintegrated, leaving nothing but a pile of ash and bone. I knew what Dale had become, with the evil inside him, and knew he had to be put down. But it was so hard for me to see the corpse of my childhood friend be desecrated in such a way. When she was done, Beth looked up, her eyes sympathetic and filled with sadness, and I could see a tear roll down her cheek. I'm so sorry, Jack, she simply said. I nodded and gave her a small smile to show her I understood. A groan from across the room caught both of our attentions. Steve was apparently alive and was sitting up, wiping off some blood from where he had bit his lip. Christ, he groaned. Anyone get the license plate number of the fucking truck that hit me? Beth and I gave a sound of relief, and I couldn't help but retort. I knew your hard head would come in handy someday, surfer boy. We all had a chuckle as I helped Steve to his feet. I'm sorry, man. Steve directed to me. I made a huge mistake opening that fucking door and inviting that fucker in. I thought that shit was only in movies. And Dale looked so normal. I was so happy he was alive and, well... His voice trailed off. I gave Steve an encouraging slap on the back and said, Don't feel bad. We're learning this shit as we go along. There's no official guidebook on how to fight and kill vampires. With that, I turned to Beth. And how did you know you could kill Dale with a kitchen knife? I thought it had to be a wooden stake. Holy water is the key, Jack, she said. A knife is obviously better than a stake. Just wash it with holy water first. Just don't forget the incantation before removing the head. I, uh, yeah, I replied, my stomach still churning over the image of Bethany sawing through Dale's neck. We were all too wound up to go back to bed. Dale had mentioned that Alexandria wanted me for herself. A sort of fixation, he had said. There was no way I could go back to sleep while it was still dark, and risk her paying me a visit. I could tell this fact did not please Bethany very much either. Imagine that. Beth almost seemed to sulk. Some kind of perverted vampire crush. Fuck that bitch. I could definitely detect a hint of jealousy on Beth's part, which, despite being scared shitless, had to make me smile. Bethany ended up leaving just before dawn, so she could go back to her apartment and pick up some books she needed to read for class. She promised to get back in a few hours and wait at my apartment. Before she left, she hugged me tightly, gave me a kiss, saying, Be careful, Jack. Don't forget the power of your blessed artifacts and your own convictions. About an hour later, Steve and I were heading out the door. After our lesson in vampire killing from Bethany, we resolved to stop by our local church to have the priest bless our crucifixes and obtain more holy water. We also packed up several kitchen knives and a Bible my mother had given me after my church baptism several years previous. Anticipating the darkness of the tunnel, I scoured the apartment for every available flashlight and extra batteries. Also, several coils of rope and some spray paint, in case we had to mark our way. Lastly, 
I tucked my reloaded 38 in my waistband. At this point, I had become a very distrusting soul. I was getting ready to lock the door when the phone rang. I didn't know who would be calling at this early hour, so I decided to go back in and answer it. Jack, hello. It was Mike's father, Larry. His voice sounded old and very tired. I'm sorry to bother you so early. I hope it's okay. I just wanted to see if you'd like to come over this morning to discuss our service for Mike. Ida and I have been working with the funeral home, and we have the service set for the 7th. We thought you'd like to come over and maybe go over things if you'd like to make a eulogy for Mike at the ceremony. I hesitated for a moment as I tried to think things through. There was no way I could refuse Larry's request. I would have to put off my plans to go confront Alexandria. Maybe, I thought, it would only take me an hour or two and we would still have time to get to the tunnel. Larry, sure, of course, I said. I'll be there within the hour. With that, I hung up and explained the call to Steve. Steve, I told him, I'm going to drive to Chadsworth to see Mike's parents. They want to go over this service and eulogy. It'll probably take an hour or two. I'll call you, and then you can drive over there and meet me at the tunnel. Meanwhile, go to the church and get the stuff we need, okay? Sure, dude. Steve drawled. But don't be too late. We have to get in there before sunset. Then a pause, and in a sadder tone said, And so Larry and I did to hang in there, and that we're thinking of him. I know, I replied. It's going to be tough not being straight with them, but probably the less they know the better. It shouldn't take me long. Little did I know then how wrong I was. It was a beautiful fall California day as I drove to Larry and Ida's. The Santa Anas were still blowing strong. About the only good thing, I mused, as the winds had helped to blow the usual yellow-brown smog out of the L.A. basin. As a result, the sky was an emerald blue, clear and sunny, without a cloud in sight. I turned on the radio. There was still euphoria over the Los Angeles Dodgers' win over the New York Yankees in the 1981 World Series just a few days previous. Gotta love that Fernando Valenzuela. The boy can't speak a lick of English, but he sure can pitch. Well, I thought, score one piece of good news for the City of Angels. At that, I had to give a wry laugh. I didn't think there were many angels left. Not with Alexandria on the loose. And I was really worried about seeing Larry and Ida. It sounded like they hadn't heard about Dale's disappearance or Kate's murder. I knew I couldn't mention it to them, or it would tip my hands that I was there. So it was with some trepidation that I pulled up to their place by around nine that morning. Their condo was tucked up in the mountains, off of Topanga Canyon and the 118 freeway. It actually wasn't far from the Santa Susana Pass and the gambling casino where I worked. I had to laugh. I was supposed to work the swing shift tonight, and I wasn't going to make it. The boss lady would probably fire me, but I didn't give a shit. I pressed the doorbell and Larry opened the door. I was shocked by his appearance. His eyes were wide and he looked like he was at the end of his rope. As he reached out and grabbed me, he exclaimed, My God, Jack, it's terrible. Why would they do such a thing? Larry then broke into tears and I followed him inside. He was babbling, and I wasn't sure what he was talking about. I followed Larry into the living room, and then I froze. Hello, Mr. Walker, I heard an all too familiar voice say. Good to see you again. There, sitting on the couch next to Mike's mom, was Detective Schmidt. Fuck me, I thought. This guy's like a bad case of the clap. He keeps popping up at the worst times. Schmidt had a smirk on his face, which told me he had a curveball coming. Both Larry and Ida were obviously distraught, and something was wrong. I took a seat in the easy chair across from them, which put me in the uncomfortable position of having them all look directly at me. Uh, Larry, Ida, 
I stammered. What's wrong? What's happening? I asked. Jack. Larry sniffed. After we called you, the detective came over with terrible news. Really terrible. How could someone be so cruel? Schmidt then leaned in and gave me a hawkish stare. I knew that he wouldn't be here for no good reason, so I braced myself for what he was about to say. He took a deep breath and said, Jack, I had to come here this morning to tell Mr. and Miss Tompkins that sometime last night their son's body was taken from the county morgue. You mean it was stolen? I gasped. For once, I didn't have to put on an act with Schmidt. I was dumbfounded. I felt like I was kicked in the stomach. Yes, said Schmidt. The body's gone. No one on duty heard a thing. One of the nightly orderlies found the door to the uh, refrigerator door hanging open. And also the door to the back loading dock. No one saw a thing. Fortunately, there are security cameras in the morgue. So once we look at the tapes, we should be able to see how he was taken. I suddenly became giddy as I had a terrible realization. I thought, oh yeah, Schmidt, you'll be in for a real surprise when you see the freezer door slowly come open and Mike comes rolling out on the drawer. And when he opens his eyes, flexes his muscles, and maybe shows off a set of unusually long teeth. And certainly, when he gets up and shambles down the hallway and out the door into the night, it's going to be real fucking hilarious. I pictured the look on Schmidt's face when he saw his suspected murder victim come back to life. I inadvertently let out a crazy laugh, which must have made me sound like a madman. I earned a shocked look from Larry and Ida. Schmidt just looked at me all the closer and asked bluntly, Jack. Would you have any idea who would have taken Mike? Of course not, I retorted. Why would I? That's ridiculous. Well, you and I need to talk, Schmidt replied. It also seems your friend Dale has disappeared, and we found his girlfriend, and uh, not in a good state. Upon hearing that, Larry and Ida gasped. I tried to play it cool, but I could feel a trickle of sweat rolling down my forehead. God damn that Schmidt. He'll probably pick up on it. I don't know what you mean, I said. Dale's not at home? A pause. Then. I'm afraid not, Schmidt said. He missed some key appointments and someone went to check on him. Seems he's been missing since sometime yesterday. When officers went inside, they found his girlfriend, Miss Winters. Dead. Upon hearing this, Ida gave out a cry, and I cursed Schmidt for bringing up Kate's murder in front of Mike's parents. That's terrible, is all I could manage to say. Yeah, said Schmidt, it is. So the way I see it, we have two mysterious deaths of your friend in the same number of days, and a third one is missing. There's something going on, and I don't like it. I'm going to need you to come down to the station so we can go over everything. Now. I had no choice. I told Larry and Ida I would try to get back to them later in the day to go over Mike's service. I assured them I would be honored to give the eulogy for the closest friend I ever had. They nodded their heads, but gave me an odd look I had never seen from them before. With Mike and I growing up together, Larry and Ida were like my second set of parents. For the first time, however, I could detect a look in their eyes. A look of disappointment. Or, worse yet, a look of suspicion. This made me extremely sad as Schmidt and I made our way out of the house. My fear, stress, and personal grief all came to a head at that point. I whirled on Schmidt when we got into our cars. You know, Schmidt... You're a real prick. You could have spared Mike's parents from that news about Dale and Kate. They already had enough grief with the loss of their son, and it's bad enough you have to tell them his body has disappeared. But then you throw out there that one of his friends is missing, and another murdered? You're a real piece of work, a real asset to the Simi Valley PD. You probably get awards all the time for your sensitivity. Hell, when you retire someday, you should get a job as a grief counselor. 
You'd be real fucking good at it. I was near yelling by that point. I knew I was losing my cool, but I had enough. I wanted to give that smug bastard a piece of my mind. Strangely, though, I didn't seem to evoke the reaction from Schmidt that I was looking for. Instead of looking contrite or apologetic, his hawkish glare only intensified. Murdered, he said. What? I stammered. Yeah, in your little rant you alluded to the fact Miss Winters was murdered, smiled Schmidt. Although in the house, I just said she was found dead. She could have died from natural causes, or an accident. Could have fallen down the stairs. But you know she was murdered. How is that, Jack? I realized that I'd fucked up. Fucked up bad. Schmidt baited me, and I fell right into his trap. I needed to make a course correction real fast. I just surmised that's what you meant, I said. When you said Dale was gone, and you found Kate not in a good way, those were your words. I came to the conclusion she might have been killed, and then Dale took off. That's all. I didn't like the pleading tone in my voice. I sounded like an eight-year-old making lame excuses after being caught cheating on a test. Hmm, replied Schmidt. Well, we'll get to the bottom of this when we have our chat at the station. You can follow me. I was hit with a small wave of relief. At least he's not arresting me, I thought. Not yet. So I got in my car and started to follow. As I pulled away, I took one last glance at Mike's family home. Larry and Ida were watching me from the window. I had a few minutes to myself as I followed Schmidt. I took stock of the current situation, and it sure as shit wasn't good. One friend turned into a vampire, and now dead. One friend was dead, but now likely a vampire. And one friend bled dry and left for dead. Correction, for all the fuck I knew, Kate might be coming back as a vampire as well. On top of all of that, my best friend's parents now think I have something to do with their son's death. This realization made me heavy with sadness. Worst of all, I thought, is that I'm in serious danger of being arrested by Joe Friday. And I couldn't afford that. I had to get to the tunnel with Steve before dark, or we would lose another night. Another night that Alexandria is allowed to roam the streets of Los Angeles. Or, most likely, coming to see me. After getting to the police station, I was escorted into one of the interrogation rooms. I felt like a nervous virgin on her wedding night, not knowing what was going to come next. As a teen, I never had any brushes with the law, but I had seen enough cop shows to know Schmidt would let me sit there and sweat a while. That a while turned out to be nearly two hours. That bastard, I thought, and I didn't have access to a payphone to give Steve a call. It will probably be a couple hours yet till he wonders what is holding me up. I needed to get out of the station as soon as possible. I cursed my earlier slip-up with Schmidt, but I figured my best course of action was to deny knowing anything about Dale and Kate, and hope to Christ there were no witnesses who saw Steve and I around the apartment. Finally, Schmidt made his entrance. He seemed to have a spring in his step. He gave me a smile of triumph as he threw down a folder on the table. Okay, Mr. Walker, this file contains everything we know about you and the attack on your friend Mike, resulting in his death, as well as the subsequent theft of his corpse. Also, evidence linking you to your friend Dale's disappearance and the murder of his girlfriend, Miss Winners. It's all here. What do you have to say? At first, I was stunned processing everything Schmidt had just said. He almost had me believing I was guilty. Then I recalled a conversation I had once with one of my father's friends, a detective with LAPD robbery homicide. He explained how one of the classic cop interrogation techniques was for the interrogator to throw a thick file in front of the suspect and allude to the fact that they have uncovered far more evidence than they actually had, in the hopes of having the suspect decide the jig is up and come clean, handing the cops a neat confession. Well, I wasn't going to give Schmidt the satisfaction. 
I figured the file contained nothing but blank paper. For the next three hours, I let Schmidt grill me while I patiently answered his questions and politely countered all his accusations. I stuck to my original story about finding Mike after the surmised dog attack and completely denied knowing anything about the disappearance of his body. Further, I feigned ignorance about anything to do with what happened with Dale and Kate. It soon became obvious that Schmidt had nothing on Steve and I visiting Dale's condo. In fact, he had nothing on me at all. It was all a fishing expedition. Schmidt didn't look very happy at the end, but he realized he had nothing to hold me on. At last, he slid his chair back with a disgusted sigh, stood up, and said, All right, Jack, you're free to go, but I know you're holding something back. All these pieces are connected, and I think you're the center of it. People around you are dying or disappearing. I'd hate to be your friend. That's all I can say. Oh, and by the way, tell your friend Steve I'll probably want to speak with him tomorrow. Anyway, we're all done for now. But you can bet your ass I'll be keeping my eye on you. I gave Schmidt a nod of acknowledgement and walked out of the room. The first thing I did was walk out to the lobby and find a payphone. I called my apartment and Steve answered. Jesus Christ, Jack. Steve exclaimed upon hearing my voice. Why haven't you called? I called over to Mike's parents a few hours ago, and they told me that detective had taken you away. We're fucked, dude. I made the rounds to the churches to get what we need, but it's going to be dark in an hour. There's no way we're going to have time to get over to the tunnel tonight. I looked at the clock on the wall. Shit. You're right, Steve. Schmidt really fucked us up. Okay, you sit tight. I'm coming back, and we'll set up our defense for tonight. Steve acknowledged, and I hung up. After leaving the police station, I headed towards the on-ramp for the 118 freeway to head back to North Hollywood. It would take me right past the area where the old tunnel was, and I had a bad feeling about wanting to go there until the next day, but I knew it would probably be suicide going in there at night. As I got off the freeway at Topanga Canyon... I realized I'd be going right past Larry and Ida's house. I felt bad about the way I had to leave their place, with Schmidt making me look like I had some role in their son's body disappearing, or worse yet, something to do with his death. I knew I had to stop by and set things right. I had to do it in person, not with a phone call. Five minutes later, I was pulling up in front of their place. It was dusk and the pressure system had the Santa Anas blowing back in prime form. The palm trees along the streets were swaying and rustling in the wind. Other than that, the street was ghostly quiet. I walked up the pathway and rang the bell. After a moment, I heard a woman's voice say, Come on around back, Jack. We're out by the pool. Ida, I thought. I left the porch and started walking around the side of the house. Larry and Ida had a nice pool and outside bar in the back. I knew it well from the hundreds of parties us kids had enjoyed out there over the years. Just as I turned around the corner towards the back of the home, I had a sudden thought. If Larry and Ida were out here on the patio, then how did they know it was me ringing the bell? I barely had enough time to register this thought when a blur suddenly crossed my vision and I was knocked off my feet. Something that felt like sharp talons dug into my skin, and the next thing I knew, I was flying across the empty patio towards the pool. With a huge splash, I stomach flopped into the pool like a drunken sailor. Shocked and stunned, it seemed like an eternity until I came back up to the surface. Gasping for breath, I looked back at the patio to see what had hit me. The patio was empty. Larry! Ida! I yelled. There was no answer. All I could hear was the howl of the wind and the sound of the pool water lapping against the sides. But then, I had the realization I was not alone in the water. The pool lights were off, but I could vaguely see a shape moving at the bottom of the pool. I turned and started moving towards the ladder as fast as I could. I was almost there when a head popped up out of the water between me and the possible escape. 
with her dark, wet hair hanging over her face. Alexandria looked like a sweat-soaked Joan Jett at the end of one of her concerts. She gave me a wide, mischievous smile. Hello, Jack. I'm so happy to see you again. Oh, look. You've made me all wet. She purred. She threw her head back and gave a hideous laugh. As she swam towards me, I could see she was completely nude. Her full breasts were bobbing in the water, and those lips were so full and inviting. Her dark eyes looked so wanting, so lustful, and I felt them drilling into my soul. She was so beautiful, so wantonly sexy. I felt that flush again, that animalistic urge to rot like a mad dog. In the pool, right there, I had to have her. I reached out, grabbed her thin waist, and pulled her towards me. I felt her pubic bone grind into me. Do me now, Jack, she whispered into my ear. She put her mouth over mine eagerly. As she kissed me, my mind was filled with the most forbidden, perverted thoughts. My mind swam with images of violent sex, dominance, sadism, and torture. I had a burning desire to kill, fueled by unmitigated lust and violence. At that point, I surely would have been lost forever, my mind and soul completely ensnared by Alexandria's hypnotic power. There would have been no turning back. But then, I heard a familiar voice exclaim, Hey, what's going on here? Who are you guys? Where's Larry and Ida? I jerked my head around and saw Marty Fengold, Larry and Ida's next-door neighbor, standing next to the pool with his hands on his hips. I'd known Marty since Mike and I were kids. Nice enough guy, but he could never seem to keep any of his three previous wives. As a result, he lived alone and became sort of the friendly neighborhood busybody. He prided himself on knowing what everyone else on the block was up to. Poor bastard, I thought. He just stumbled into something he never could have imagined. In this case, curiosity really was going to kill the cat. Before I knew it, Alexandria had splashed over to the edge of the pool and looked up at Marty. She flashed him a wide, flirtatious smile and said, Oh, hello there. Larry and Ida are inside. I'm an old friend. While still treading the water, she used her hands to squeeze her bobbing breasts. I really needed to get in the pool. I was just so hot. I just had to cool off. Marty stood there, like a deer in the headlights, frozen and transfixed. For once, I was an observer to her powerful sexual charms, and I could see from the glossy look in Marty's eyes that he was fully under her spell. You can have me, I heard Alexandria say seductively, in any which way you want. I barely had time to yell out, No, no, don't listen to her! When Marty fell to his knees on the edge of the pool, panting and almost chanting in a mantra, Yes, yes, you are so beautiful. I want you, need you. In one fluid motion, Alexandria reached up and grabbed him by the shirt and yanked him into the pool. Marty showed no shock or surprise, gave no resistance, but simply put his arms around Alexandria as if in an embrace, in preparation for his lover's kiss. Then, to my horror, she turns to me, gave me a sly smile, and laughed. You know, Jack, I don't give a damn about my reputation. A girl can do whatever she wants to do, and that's what I'm gonna do. Lyrics straight out of the Joan Jett Bad Reputation album. How the fuck did she know of my fantasy of her as Joan Jett? I wondered. She laughed knowingly, then opened her mouth to reveal rows of needle-sharp teeth, dwarfed by two wickedly long incisors. As I watched helplessly, she turned and sank her teeth into Marty's inviting neck. He continued to smile, 
with a look of sensual pleasure. And as she began to suck out his life juices, as Marty's eyes rolled back into his head in what unbelievably looked like ecstasy, I could hear Alexandria murmur, Oh, so succulent, so tasty. That was enough for me. With her spell on me broken, I jumped out of the pool. I was closer to the patio doors than the walkway from whence I came, so I ran into the house. I could still hear Alexandria's sucking sound as she got her fill. That I didn't see the footstool to Larry's easy chair, and I tripped over it and went flying. I crashed into the sofa, and my cheek made contact with something wet. I could now make out a coppery smell in the air. I looked again, trying to catch my breath. In the dim light, I could make out what I had feared the most. Alexandria had told Marty the truth. Larry and Ida were indeed inside the house. Just not alive. They were sitting together on the sofa, almost appearing to be holding hands as the high school sweethearts they once were. I could tell from the gashes on their necks that Alexandria had not just been satisfied with just killing Mike. She had to destroy those he loved as well. Choking on sobs, stumbling off the sofa and trying to regain my footing. Feeling my way, I half ran down the darkened hallway and towards the front door. I came out into the living room, where the large bay windows allowed the moonlight to freely enter and cast its ancient glow. I found the front door, fumbled with the locks, and opened it. I half expected Alexandria to be standing there to greet me, but she was not. Instead, it was the second to last person I ever wanted to see. But now, I could have kissed him. Detective Schmidt pushed his way inside, already drawing his service revolver. What the fuck is going on, Walker? Why are you soaking wet? Where are the Thompsons? I stammered. Detective, Mike's parents are dead. She's here. She'll kill us. We have to get out. We have to get out now. Dead? Schmidt asked, now leveling his revolver directly at me. I had a feeling I needed to tail you. So, I followed you here. I was in the car until I noticed the house was mostly dark. Then I realized something was wrong. I'm going to ask you one more time. Where are Mr. and Miss Thompson? I finally could think coherently. God damn it, Schmidt. They were killed by Alexandria, a vampire. She killed Mike and Kate and probably Dale as well. I continued, my confession now spilling out. I saw her kill Mike the day I went to his apartment. Since then, she's been after me. My friend Steve and my girlfriend have been planning a way to track her down and destroy her. But she was here when I came to see Larry and Ida. They're dead in the family room. And she just killed the neighbor out back by the pool, feasting on his blood right now. But she'll probably be done any minute, Schmidt. She won't let me live. We have to get out of here, now. There was a look of indecision on Schmidt's face. And for a fraction of a second... I thought he believed me. But really, who possibly could? Let's go, Schmidt said, gesturing with the gun towards the hallway. Take me to the bodies and then we'll talk. I knew I had no choice but to listen to him, but I had to try to make him prepared. Listen, Schmidt, I tried to warn him. If you see Alexandria, she's a young girl, very attractive. You don't know how much so, but you can't fall for her charms. You must fight her. She's more dangerous than you will ever know. Uh-huh, Schmidt replied. A real looker, I'm sure. I think I've got the killer right here. Keep your hands where I can see him. Move, he commanded. We made our way back into the family room where the doors of the patio and pool were still open wide. Schmidt turned on one of the lamps. There on the sofa, were Mike's parents, hand in hand, as I had last seen them. Holy fuck, exclaimed Schmidt. You're one sick bastard, Jack. You're gonna fucking fry for this. Damn it, I didn't do this, I yelled. These people were practically my second parents. 
It was her, Alexandria. Schmidt, resolutely pointing his gun at me, gave me a look of contempt. You really expect me to swallow your vampire story, Walker? I've been a policeman for 20 years. If there's one thing I'm sure of, this world is indeed full of monsters. But only human monsters like you. There are no such thing as vampires. Are you sure about that, detective? Came a surly voice off to our right. Schmidt and I abruptly swung our eyes towards the open door to the back patio. Alexandria, still nude and dripping water, stood in the doorway. She gave her usual disarming smile, her shark-like teeth now gone once again. Marty's blood was smeared all over her face and body. As I watched, she ran her hand across her breasts and then licked her black-painted fingernails. Schmidt didn't seem to notice. He was already captivated by Alexandria's evil sexual charms. She took a few steps forward. You know, detective, she purred. I always had a thing for older men. Young studs, like Jack here, are sometimes too quick to pull the trigger, if you know what I mean. I like a man who's been around and really knows how to please a woman. She said that while giving me a glance and sending me a wink. Bitch, I thought. Yeah, I know what you mean, mumbled Schmidt, now clearly under her spell. I can satisfy you. I will satisfy you. Oh, I know you will, crooned Alexandria. As she rubbed her breasts, further smearing Marty's blood all over, making them slick and inviting. Nude, it was impossible not to lust over her lean and athletic body, her flat, hard stomach, toned biceps, long and well-muscled legs, and that ever-so-inviting promise of nirvana that lay between them. I knew that laying with her would be pure ecstasy, the best sex a man could have. The ultimate experience. Bethany could never fulfill me on that level. Who needed her? She was dead weight. Alexandria was who I needed. She would fulfill my every sexual fantasy and then introduce me to ones I never knew existed. Suddenly, an inner voice screamed out so loud it physically hurt. It was as if someone had used an air horn and blasted my eardrums. It forced me to cry out as I bent over and grasped my head. The voice was female and seemed oddly familiar. Very clearly, the voice yelled, Wake up, Jack. You have the power from within. Seize it. Use it. You can resist. Fight, Jack. And then the voice told me what I needed to do. I looked up and saw Alexandria now ignoring Schmidt as she gave me a perplexed look, almost a look of worry. What just happened, Jack? she asked. Was there a voice? What did you hear? The voice had jolted me back to the present, and I'd snapped out from under Alexandria's sexual hypnotism. I didn't hesitate. I grabbed the first thing that made a decent weapon, which was one of Larry's bowling trophies on the wall shelf. I threw it with all my strength, and it made contact directly with Alexandria's face. As her nose pancaked and blood flew everywhere, she staggered back and then fell over, the threshold back onto the patio. I only had a few seconds. I quickly grabbed Schmidt, who was beginning to come around, and shoved him down the hallway towards Ida's sewing room. I could already hear Alexandria shrieking behind me as she started to scramble back into the family room. I got to the sewing room, pushed Schmidt inside, and slammed the door. Schmidt, quick, give me a hand, I yelled, as I started moving a chest of drawers away from the wall. Schmidt quickly recovered his senses and helped me move the heavy chest over in front of her. Jack, oh my god, Schmidt cried. What just happened? That girl, so attractive, I was going to, I wanted to, never had those feelings. I'm so ashamed. What is she, Jack? 
She's a fucking vampire, Schmidt, I replied. I first met her at Halloween night at a party with my friends. I had doubts about her then. She had no reflection. I was worried and went to see Mike. That's when I saw her seducing and trying to kill him. I hit her with a crucifix, but she later got to Dale and killed Kate. Dale became a vampire and tried to kill me in my own home. I knew you'd never believe me, so I didn't tell you the truth. I'm sorry I lied to you, Schmidt, but you see now, don't you? I don't know, Jack, Schmidt said, now regaining some of his composure. She's using some hypnotic drug or something. Maybe a cultist. Another Manson thing. She's just a girl, Jack. But no doubt dangerous if she really killed the Thompsons. She did kill the Thompsons, you fucking idiot! I yelled. I was getting pissed all over again. And she's going to get in here and get us. But the voice told me to come get this. I said, and I made my way over to a desk at the far wall. Voice? Schmidt managed to ask, before we both froze in fear. From the other side of the door, we heard Alexandria whisper, Oh, Jack, you're going to pay for this dearly. I was going to let you die with a smile on your face, in an ultimate orgasm, but now I'm going to make you die horribly and painfully. I'll drink your blood slowly, so it will take you 30 minutes to die. You'll feel your life force slowly draining out while making me stronger. Your vision will get darker and darker and your limbs colder and colder. The last sensation you'll ever know is when I rip your jugular right out of your throat. Jesus Christ, muttered Schmidt. She's a psycho. Hey you, he said loudly. Alexandria, or whatever your name is. I'm a cop, and I'm armed. If you come in here, I'm going to shoot to kill. We could hear Alexandria give a maniacal laugh. I think Jack can tell you how well that will work out for you. You don't believe in vampires, detective. Well, in a few moments, I don't think you'll doubt our existence. For as long as you live, which, unfortunately for you, won't be much longer. Another cruel and sadistic laugh. Suddenly, the door exploded in splinters of wood and paint. The chest of drawers pinwheeled across the room like it was a child's toy box. If either Schmidt or I would have been standing directly in front of the door, we probably would have been killed right then. The nude and beautiful Alexandria stood in the doorway. But as she spoke... Her body began morphing into something as of yet unidentified. It's the same old story with you mortals, never believing in something your puny minds cannot comprehend. My kind has been around you for millennia, living amongst you, feeding on you, yet you relegate us to the stories of folk tales and legends and pretend to be scared of our ridiculous Hollywood personas. But that's how we continue to exist, because your kind scoffs at our existence as too wild to believe. Our only true enemy is a section of our own kind, a clan of vampires that believes in coexisting with the human race, who blend in and find other ways to feed. This turncoat clan is also sometimes aided by humans who know the truth, and willingly join the clan as so-called vampire slayers. As she pontificated, Alexandria's ears elongated into bat-like appendages, twitching and moving in tandem. The pupils of her eyes became serpent-like slits, ringed by irises that took on the reddish glow of a nightmare predator. Rows of wickedly serrated teeth grew in elongated mouth, resembling those of a monstrous anglerfish. Two prominent incisors slid downwards, resembling one-inch pointed daggers. She gave a hideous smile and outstretched her arms. As Schmidt and I stood, transfixed in horror, her arms elongated and her hands grew several more fingers, forming the ribs over which grew a thin membrane that extended down and attached to her sides. Once her transformation was complete, Alexandria fully opened her hideous bat-like wings. She turned from side to side, 
strutting in a warped parody of a supermodel on the fashion runway. Behold, now you see the real me, she hissed. My god, cried Schmidt. What the fuck are you? The bat thing smiled, radiating pure malevolence, and spoke. The real Alexandria. A name I took for myself millennia ago, when I was a young girl living in that ancient port town on the Mediterranean. My father was a merchant in grain and cotton, who did well for himself, trading along the maritime routes between our city and the rest of the ancient world. I was a good girl, honest and pure, who worked for my father's business and had hopes of soon being married to a suitor who had received my father's blessing. But then came the Battle of Alexandria between the Romans Octavian and Mark Anthony, when our beautiful city came under siege. One night, while I was out fetching some water from a nearby well, I was attacked by a Roman soldier. I was defiled, and I remember clearly the moment he bit deeply into my neck, and I felt my life's blood being sucked out in earnest. My father found me the next morning and took me home. Later that day, while still hearing the sounds of the fighting outside, I died. My family, of course, thought I died of my injuries. With the siege still going on, they placed my body in a back room until they could arrange for burial. I woke up that first night, and I still remember the feeling of being reborn as one of the undead. I knew immediately I was just one member of an ancient clan, a group of creatures blessed and sanctified by Lucifer, what you know as vampires. I could sense others like me not far away, and I could feel the evil coursing through my veins, the embracing of sin, decadence, depravity, moral corruption. I wanted to relish in sexual pleasure, pain, torture, and death. All those feelings and emotions came flooding into me, and I first set up and looked at my surroundings. But above all, I had the thirst the sudden craving for blood. It was all consuming, and I knew where I could find it. So, I got up and walked to my younger brother's room. His astonishment at seeing his dead sister approach his bed was priceless. Without hesitation, I jumped him. Then Alexandria gave Schmidt and I a melancholy smile, like she was reminiscing a very fond memory. But what she said next chilled our bones to ice. I had my way with him, with my own brother. It was exhilarating. To break all taboos, to know no limits to what I could do. When I was done, I tore his throat out. Oh, his blood was so delicious. I greedily gulped down every spurt that timed to the beat of his heart. The pleasure was so intense, I had the best orgasm of my young life. To this day, my first kill was the best. I guess you could say I popped my cherry. Alexandria cackled like the demented demon she was. After that, I went down the hall and killed my parents. I no longer had any feelings for them, their lives, or my family. I had a new family, a family fathered by the Prince of Darkness, a family that kills at will to satisfy their lust and thirst, all with no more thought than swatting a fly. You're one sick fuck, spit Schmidt. And one ugly motherfucker too. Let's see you walk away from this, you bitch. I watched as Schmidt pulled out his service revolver a Smith & Weston Model 27, and fired point-blank at Alexandria's head. He did a double tap, and two round holes appeared on her forehead. As she staggered back, he fired four more of the 357 Magnum rounds into her chest, emptying his cylinder. It was a valiant effort, but I had no illusions that the bullets would actually inflict any damage. 
Behind my back, I tightly clutched the item I had retrieved from Ida's desk. It wasn't much, but I hoped to God it might save our lives. Just a few seconds later, while my ears were still ringing from the gunfire, Alexandria flew forward and gave Schmidt a backhanded slap that sent him flying. He sailed across the room and hit the wall with a crash. Pitiful human, she sneered. How many of your kind have tried to destroy me over the centuries, only to die at my hand? I am immortal, you fool. Schmidt coughed up some blood, and with hooded eyes, raised his middle finger, and responded with a, Bite me, you bitch. At that moment, my heart swelled, and I groggily had to respect that by-the-book son of a bitch. I could see Alexandria's incisors grow longer and slide out like a pit viper, ready to strike, and I knew Schmidt would be dead in seconds if I hesitated. I pulled out the Bible that was behind my back. Ida had mentioned the Bible from time to time in our family get-togethers. It was several hundred years old, originating from the old country in Eastern Europe, where Ida's family had immigrated from. Ida's great-great-grandfather had been a priest in the Catholic Church during the old Austrian-Hungary Empire. The Bible had been blessed and was used during the 1867 coronation of Austrian Emperor King Franz Joseph as the King of Hungary, creating the dual monarchy of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Later, it had been passed down through the family for generations and had been used in countless religious ceremonies, from births, baptisms, weddings, and funerals. Ira's father had eventually brought the Bible to America, and it had at last been used during Mike's baptism. The Bible was a religious relic, infused with the righteousness of several generations of the faithful. I kissed the Bible, said a silent prayer, and slapped the book against Alexandria's head as hard as I could. Alexandria gave a screech that nearly broke my eardrums. As she reeled back, I could see the side of her head was caved in where I hit her. Her short hair was on fire, and her scalp was black and sizzling with smoke. Her right eye had melted, and the fluid was leaking down her face. Without hesitation, I whacked her again with the Bible, hitting her squarely in the chest. I lost grip of the Bible, and it fell to the floor. Alexandria collapsed to her knees, smoke protruding from her chest wound. It was obvious she was severely hurt. I scrambled for the book so I could hit her with it again, but she used one of her bat wings to swipe me away. I fell back and struggled to regain my footing. Unfortunately, I tripped over Schmidt's leg and fell to the floor. As I struggled to get up, I could see Alexandria was standing over me. Blackish blood was streaming down from the wounds to her face, and I could see inside her chest where the Bible had hit her. She was obviously badly wounded, but she wasn't dead yet. Jack, she hissed. I've seriously misjudged you. A worthy adversary, the best in centuries, in fact. But you can't kill me. You have failed. Now, I'm going to rip your fucking heart out and take a bath in your blood. Close your eyes, Jack. I will make it quick. As she leaned over me, I knew that I was going to die. My only regret was I would never see Beth again. I loved her so much, and I wasn't sure I really told her. I only hoped that she would remain safe and never go looking for Alexandria. She reached out and grabbed me by the neck. Within seconds, I couldn't breathe, and she continued to squeeze. I saw stars, and I began to get tunnel vision. Goodbye, Jack. I heard Alexandria whisper as her fangs brushed the nape of my neck. With my last coherent thought, I saw her suddenly snap her head up, apparently seeing something outside the room's window. Even with her bat-like face, I could see the fear and shock on her face. You! I heard her exclaim. Suddenly, she left my side, and I heard breaking glass as she jumped through the window. Then, I blacked out.
That could have been out minutes, or it could have been hours. Someone was gently shaking me. Jack. Jack, baby, wake up. Please, honey, wake up. I slowly opened my eyes. I knew it was still night because the moon was shining through the broken window. I looked up at the face of an angel. I smiled. I must be dead, I murmured. Only in heaven can there be someone so beautiful. The angel smiled and bent down and kissed my lips. Glad to see you still have a sense of humor, said Bethany. Although you have a hell of a mark around your neck. And that detective, uh, what, Schmidt? He's still out cold. You're both lucky to be alive. I found two bodies in the other room and one out by the pool. What a massacre. Was it Alexandria? <sighs> Damn, you're both lucky to be alive. Yeah, I said, now sitting up. I had some help. I can't explain it exactly, but thank God for this Bible here. I reached over and picked up Ida's Bible, still intact, and surprisingly not the worse for wear, despite having taken off half of the vampire's face. I was never going to let that book out of my sight. But I still don't know why Alexandria didn't kill me. She was just about to bite me when she saw someone outside the window, and she took off like a bat out of hell. Uh, sorry for the pun. Well, thank God, said Bethany. You can fill us in back at your place. Steve is waiting for us there. We'll bring Schmidt along with us. Wait, I said, suddenly thinking clearer. How did you know I was even here? I just suddenly decided to swing by after I left the police station. Steve and I got worried when you didn't show up, Beth said simply. And I figured you might have stopped by to speak with Mike's parents again. As soon as I drove by and saw your car... I came inside and found you. Right. Uh, okay, I said. Good thinking. I reached down and picked up Schmidt's gun. Well, let's get out of here. It's still dark, and we don't need another encounter with Alexandria in case she changes her mind and comes back. It took a bit of effort, but together, Beth and I managed to get Schmidt out of my car. He could afford to lay off a few of the donuts, I thought. I told Beth I would follow her back to my place in North Hollywood. It was around two in the morning, and the roads in the valley were nearly empty of traffic. The Santa Anas were still blowing their dry winds, and as we headed south on Topanga, a lonely tumbleweed made its way across the road. With the car in motion, Schmidt started to come to. Oh Christ, my head, he moaned. I feel like I did a rumble in the jungle with Muhammad Ali. Yeah, you took a pretty good backhand, Schmidt, I said. Christ, did you think you were fucking Wyatt Earp or something? I told you Alexandria was a vampire. You saw her change. All your bullets did was piss her off. You're damn lucky to be alive. We both are. But I'll give you credit. You stood your ground. I had a thought and gave a laugh. You kind of looked like Dirty Harry. You're one badass, Schmidt. Schmidt chuckled and replied. Well, kid, you got some big cojones, too. You've been facing her virtually alone for days now. And all that time, you had me on your back. I apologize. And I'm very sorry I actually believed you would have killed your best friend. And now both his parents dead, too. Jesus, what a tragedy. You were just doing your job, Schmidt. I said, and no sane person would ever have believed me anyway. It's something you have to see to believe. Totally agree with you there, replied Schmidt. I'm on board. So what's the plan? There's no way in hell we let that bitch live. Two thousand years walking this earth is long enough. We're heading to my place, I replied. Steve and my girlfriend Bethany both know the deal. She's the one who found us back there, by the way. Our plan is to try to get to Alexandria during the day. We were supposed to go to what we believe is her lair yesterday, but then you pulled me in and we lost the daylight. I went on to fill Schmidt in on the clues Mike had left before he died, 
and our theory that Alexandria may be holding up in the abandoned Devil's Maw tunnel during daylight. Okay, said Schmidt. That sounds like our best lead. It's just us, I guess. I don't think any of my colleagues would believe me any more than I believed you. We're on our own. Well, glad to have you on the team, Schmidt. I smiled. Hey, kid, he said. All my friends call me Tom. I laughed. All right, Tom, let's do this. We lapsed into a silence for a while, each of us contemplating our inner thoughts. A few minutes later, we were cruising down Victory Boulevard. At the cross streets of Victory and Van Nuys, we could see a few die-hard hookers on the prowl, their short skirts blowing in the wind, still trying for one last trick of the night. I worked vice for a few years, offered Tom, before getting to homicide. The world's oldest profession. Prostitutes have been around longer than even Alexandria, and now I know why so many women disappeared every year and are never accounted for. Sure, many are killed by the human predators. God knows there are enough of them. But there are just too many that disappear without a trace, with no remains ever found. What a perfect feeding ground for the likes of Alexandria. They can kill to their heart's content, and no one really gives a damn. Tom was silent for a moment, then asked, Which begs the question, how many of these creatures are actually among us? How many just in the city? In the caves, the tunnels, in the sewers, all the abandoned buildings? Christ, it's a terrifying thought. I don't know, Tom, I replied, but it looks like they can multiply fairly quickly. One thing about the legends is right. If allowed to die from a bite, the person comes back as a vampire. Tom gave me a sad look. And your friend Mike got up and walked out of the morgue. He's out there, somewhere. I'm sorry. I nodded, unable to say anything further. Tom knew that I knew that sooner or later, I'd have to kill my best friend. When we got to my place, Steve was standing in the front door and looked more wired than I had ever seen him. Before I could say a word, he grabbed me and gave me a tight hug. Jesus Christ, Jack. I was worried sick. He began to rant. I've been pacing the fucking floor all day. I thought you were coming back after you called from the station. I guess Beth found you. Ever heard of a fucking telephone, man? I've been freaking out. Kept expecting another fucking vampire to knock on the door and ask to be invited in. Man, it's good to see you. What the fuck happened anyway? You look like shit, dude. Christ, I'm rambling, aren't I? Then Steve looked over my shoulder and saw Tom. Oh, uh, hi there, uh, officer. I had to smile. Although they had never met, Steve's fun-loving and juvenile ways had equipped him with a highly developed cop radar. He could spot one a mile away. Steve, I said. Me, Detective Schmidt. Don't worry, he's on our side. Call him Tom. He and I just had a very upfront and personal encounter with Alexandria. Both the Joan Jett version and the monthly version, which you'll never want to see. Trust me. Uh, sure, real nice to meet you, Steve said, thrusting out his hand to shake Tom's. I should have recognized you. Jack described you as an asshole. I froze not believing even Steve would have the audacity for such an insult. But Tom just smirked, taking Steve's hand and retorting. A title well-deserved, I suppose. And you're a Jack Surfer friend. You look quite a bit like my old friend George Greeno. I imagine you heard of him. The cocky smile left Steve's face immediately. Uh, Greeno? He stammered. Y you mean... Yeah, George Greeno. Tom smiled. We grew up together in Santa Barbara, spent most of our days on the waves. He's been credited for the design of the modest surf fin, as well as influencing modern surfers' more radical maneuvers. I could see Steve's eyes take on a dreamy look. Uh, yeah, Steve exclaimed. 
and he was the first surfer to film the inside of the tube while riding a keyboard. His moves are legendary, They're totally radical, man. Well, said Tom, let me get cleaned up, and I'll tell you some stories of our time surfing together at Hollister Ranch. But you'll have to call me Tom, okay? Steve nodded vigorously, saying, Oh, yeah, dude. That's super bitchin'. Uh, I, I mean, sure, Tom. That'd be really cool. Steve excitedly ushered Tom inside, without even sparing Bethany and I a second glance. On his way in, Tom turned around and gave me a wink. Beth and I looked at each other in amazement. Steve and Tom were as different as any two people could be, yet they had one common denominator. Surfing. Go figure, I thought. I went straight to the kitchen and took out a cold Henry's out of the fridge. I held the cold bottle against my forehead. I desperately needed some relief from the raging headache that was hitting my head like a jackhammer. Christ, it had been a rough day. I felt like a fucking failure. Mike's parents were dead, and I'd failed to protect them. It was bad enough I couldn't save my best friend. But why hadn't I seen it coming? that Alexandria might pay his parents a visit. I should have been better prepared. Stupid. Stupid. I thought. I felt tears silently stream down my cheek as I rolled the cold bottle from side to side of my forehead. On top of my nagging guilt, I needed sleep. Badly. But there was a lot to plan for before dawn broke in the morning. I felt arms slip around my waist, and Beth placed her head on my shoulder. Jack, she whispered. You did good today. Really. Mike's parents were already gone before you arrived. There was nothing you could have done. But you reacted quickly and protected yourself. You're the key to all of this, Jack. It's very important that you survive to fight another day. You're the one who can end this. To end Alexandria. Jack. And you save the cop, Tom. He will play a role too. You, Steve, and Tom. The three of you together have the power. In your righteous mights, you will all prevail against the Vampire King. I didn't know how Bethany knew all the things she was saying, but her words were strangely comforting. I wasn't sure exactly why but I had faith in her ability to comprehend things beyond my own understanding. She took my hand, and we walked out into the living room. A few minutes later, after Steve and Tom had their own beers in hand, we proceeded to sit down and wargame our entry into the Devil's Maw in the morning. We knew we had to check out the old abandoned tunnel first and foremost, there's no guarantee we'll find Alexandria in there. I cautioned everyone. We're going on the assumption Mike was trying to tell us something. He could have just been rambling before he died. I don't think so, Jack, Bethany said. It's too much of a coincidence that Mike would reference a dark, below-ground, forgotten tunnel. An environment perfect for hiding the vampire during their day's sleep. Yeah, and besides, Tom chimed in, it's our only lead. No choice but to follow it up. Steve laughed and slapped Tom on the back. Spoken like a true cop, dude. I agree with Tom. Let's hit the tunnel at first light. All right, I concluded. So, let's go over our inventory of what we're going to need. First, our cave exploration items. I got it all covered, man, smiled Steve. While you were tied up with Tom yesterday... I went out and did a bit of shopping to add to the stuff we scrounged up earlier. Hold on, he said, as he left the table. After returning with several bags, he inventoried each item as he placed them on the table. Okay, said Steve. I got three sets of miner's carbide headlamps. Apart from providing a bit of hard hat protection, I figured these would be much more convenient as our main source of light. I got three in case Bethany came with us. No, she's not coming, I said a bit quickly. Beth gave me one of her looks. Look, I know you're perfectly capable of protecting yourself, and Steve and I both saw what quick work you did on Dale, 
but you have studied vampirism better than any of us. And if something goes wrong in the tunnel, you need to be left standing to figure out what to do next. You are the least expendable of all of us. Are you okay with that? Beth smiled at me, and I had no doubt she saw through my subterfuge. Knowing I was trying to protect her, she simply said, Yes, Jack, I'm fine. But don't get killed. I'd hate to have to put a stake through your heart. Got it? She gave me a good punch in the arm. I reached out and squeezed her hand, in silent acknowledgement. Our attention turned back to Steve, who continued on. Right, okay. So I also got six halogen flashlights. Step up from those old incandescent flashlights you had in the house, Jack. Also picked up a couple boxes of glow sticks, and just in case we need them, two packs of 50 feet lengths of heavy-duty climbing rope. And I brought these pair of high-rise boots, just in case there are any rattlesnakes in there, and a sweatshirt in case of spiders. I really don't like anything that crawls, slithers, or jumps. Tom laughed. What a fucking pussy you are, Steve. But I admit, probably very prudent. And great planning on your part. Looks like you got the cave exploration items covered. Now, what the fuck do we do when we find Alexandria? Or anything else that's not alive? Steve pulled out another large bag. Jack will recognize a lot of these vampire fighting items that he put together previously. But I went out today and added a few more things. The best thing are the rosaries I found at a Catholic charity store down on Sunset. They're from the Vatican and are guaranteed to have been blessed by none other than the Pope John Paul II. Can't get any better than that. I figured we could wear them around our necks to give us the last line of protection. I also got three of them for a... Uh, well... Steve looked at me sheepishly. No, it was a good decision, Steve, I said. We got Tom on the team now, so it's fortuitous you got the extras. Great, Steve said, and then continued. You've gotten the blessed holy water and some vials, Jack, but I had the idea it would be very useful to have some sort of projection capability. The kid in me had a simple solution. These squirt guns, he said as he reached into the bag. Three squirt pistols. I tested them, and they can shoot water out twenty feet. But best of all, I also found these water rifles. When pumps to compress the air, it can shoot out nearly fifty feet. I'd like to see Alexandria's face when you shoot her right between the eyes with this. I could see Tom giving Steve an admiring look. But not to be outdone, Steve reached back into the bag, and pulled out several boxes that contained what looked like plastic eggs, only they were olive green in color. These I got from the same outdoor adventure store as the water guns. They're used in outdoor combat games. They're basically, water grenades. Normally, one fills them up with colored water, or even paint, and they split open upon impact. But in our case... The sentence was finished by Tom, who cut in and said... We're going to fill them with holy water. Fucking A Christ. Steve, what a brilliant idea. Now we've got some real firepower. You can be on my team any time. He complimented. I could see Steve was enjoying Tom's praises. Jeez, I thought. Those guys had really become a mutual admiration society. Okay, guys. Bethany interjected. I picked up something that's probably the most important weapon you're going to need. The holy water, blessed rosaries, and the sanctified crucifixes and Bibles will offer you some protection, and you can inflict temporary injury and pain on the vampire, but you're going in there to kill her, remember? She reached onto the table and pulled a small wooden chest on the table. The chest was square with a rounded lid that had a small lock. The wood looked ancient, worn smooth from centuries of use. She opened the box. Sitting on a ruby, colored velvet cushion was a long knife. Bethany took it out and placed the box back on the floor. After she placed the knife on the table, we all leaned over to take a closer look. The blade was about seven or eight inches long. One side was razor sharp and curled up to a very nasty pointed tip. 
while the other had wicked-looking serrated edges. It looked a lot like a Marine Corps K-Bar combat knife. One side for sticking and slicing, the other for sawing. There were two main differences between Beth's knife and the K-Bar, however. This knife had a bright silver blade, and the handle appeared to be made from ivory. Etched into the blade was the Latin inscription, Deus Lux Mea Est. The ivory handle was slightly curved, and had indentions for the fingers. It was obviously designed so the user could grasp it firmly with as little slippage as possible. The knife was beautiful, but obviously an instrument for some serious killing. What does the inscription mean? asked Tom. It's Latin for God is my light, said Bethany. It's a real beauty, he admired. It's more than 500 years old, she explained. Used by an esoteric wing of the Catholic Church dedicated to hunting down and killing vampires. Lost to time and generations. Eventually obtained by the European collector of the occult and vampirism that I mentioned before. He understood the threat of the vampire, that they indeed live among us. Before I left my studies with him, he gave it to me. In the events I discovered in my research, any investation of the vampire in America. Something to me just wasn't making sense with what Bethany was saying. In the back of my mind, I had already been having a growing doubt as to how she had gained her vast knowledge of vampirism. And this supposed study abroad in Europe, with a private collector of rare artifacts dealing with the occult. Who does that? And why would this collector let someone like her have access to such a secret, and perhaps even illegal, collection he had obtained from around the world? And now this knife, obviously a rare artifact, and one only used in killing vampires. Why would he give it up to her? I had so many unanswered questions, many of which I should have asked sooner. But I had been overtaken by events with everything moving so quickly. I just haven't had the time to sit down with Beth to ask. And even now, I was so tired. For now, I just had to trust what she was telling us. I loved her, and I knew she loved me. She would never lead us to danger. I knew it. If she said the knife is what we needed to kill Alexandria, then I believed her. The knife blade is pure silver, and it has been blessed by a long lineage of Catholic clergy continued Bethany. Nevertheless, before you enter the tunnel, or even periodically thereafter, make sure that you dip the blade into your fresh holy water. This will make the blade extremely potent. Just as you saw with Dale, such a blade through the vampire's hearts will render them powerless and near death. What you must do then, without hesitation, is to take the blade and decapitate the vampire, and very, very important... As you do this, incite the holy words, Adjure te, spiritus nesquissime, per diem omnipotentum. Say it correctly, and say it with true conviction. Only then, with the head removed, will the vampire be truly dead. Steve nodded. I remember it from some of my readings that discussed the history of exorcisms performed by the Catholic Church. The translation is, I adjure thee, the most evil spirit, by Almighty God. Exorcism rituals often begin with that phrase, he said. Yes, Bethany replied. That's exactly right. It is one of the earliest incantations of the church used to exorcise the evil in the world. Either a demon in possession of a live body, or the vampire, in essence, a demon in the possession of a dead one. And there's one more thing, she said. Once you're in the Devil's Maw, don't expect to find Alexandria sleeping in some nice coffin like in a Hollywood movie. That's total BS. Vampires don't sleep as we know it, but they must hide up in dark and cool places to hold up in during the day that will protect them from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. However, they do rest of sorts and for some time may not be immediately aware of the presence of any intruders, sort of like bats in a cave, 
resting, but not necessarily asleep. The more surreptitious you are, the better your element of surprise. And, like a bat, she may not be lying on the tunnel floor, but could possibly be hanging from the ceiling. So keep your eyes out, and look all around. Stay in a tight group, and keep your rosaries displayed outside of your clothes. All right, I concluded. Does everyone agree that we have what we need? If so, then let's go over what we do when we get there, and what contingencies we may face. For the next half hour, we wargamed the various scenarios we might expect to encounter in the tunnel. It was agreed that each of us, in addition to the rosaries around our necks, would carry one other blessed crucifix, one water pistol filled with holy water, five water grenades, two extra flashlights and batteries, and extra rope. In addition to the required load, Tom would carry the water rifle. I would carry Bethany's knife and Ida's Bible, and Steve would carry the extra rope, glow sticks, and a can of spray paint. By three in the morning, we felt we had covered everything we could possibly plan for or foresee. The rest would play out in whichever way it would. We could only pray for the best, and that we would ultimately walk out of the tunnel tomorrow alive. We all said our good nights and agreed to get up at dawn. I was so exhausted, I fell asleep as soon as my head hit the pillow. I barely mumbled a good night to Bethany. I should have said more. I should have told her how much I loved her, because I would never have the chance again. I woke up with knocking on my bedroom door, then Steve's voice. Jack, it's dawn. Time we get moving. You awake? Yeah, Steve, I replied groggily. I'm moving. Be out soon. I could see the bed was empty. Had Bethany already left? I wasn't sure if she had been upset that I wasn't going to take her to the tunnel. After all, she was the student of occultism and vampires. Was she disappointed I was robbing her of actually having the opportunity to enter a vampire's den? It would be a lifetime opportunity. Or had she just left for school? I knew she had some dissertations scheduled for this week. I wasn't sure, but either way, at least I knew she would not be in danger. A half an hour later, we were ready to roll. We decided to take one car. We were going to have to park in a discreet place off of the Santa Susana Pass, and then hike a bit to get out to the tunnel. We loaded a my Mustang and headed down Victory Boulevard towards the 405 freeway. It was a typical California fall day, comfortably warm and sunny. The Santa Anas had pushed most of the usual smog out of the valley. The sky was a beautiful blue, and nary a cloud to be seen. It was a great day to be alive. Only problem was, I wondered if we would live to see the end of it. In the car, we were all quiet, as we each addressed our individual thoughts. Thirty minutes later, we passed Spawn Ranch and pulled off into a small two-track that led off of the Santa Susana Pass. We took it to the end of the path and stopped the car. Sometimes there were hikers who made their way up here, but for the moment, there were no other cars parked in the area. After getting out of the car, I glanced up and across the canyon. I could see the passage club up on one of the hilltops. I was no doubt fired from my job by now, but I guess unemployment was still a more positive prospect than being dead. We took out our backpacks and set out. We walked for about twenty minutes through the sagebrush and the yucca. As we got closer, we could see no clear path, which was a good sign, as most people had forgotten about the Devil's Maw, and thus the area was not highly trafficked. Eventually, we came to the base of the mountain pass. Although we had come to this spot as kids, we could not immediately find the tunnel entrance. We walked another five minutes around the base, and eventually spotted an area well overgrown by yucca and a few Joshua trees. We had to push our way in a bit, picking up a few nettles and thorns as we went, and there we found it. The entrance to Devil's Maw. 
After the tunnel was filled in, it was always hard to distinguish, even when we were kids. Now, a decade later, with erosion and the ceaseless growth of the desert flora, nobody would know it was there. The only clue was a three-foot hole into the side of the mountain. This is it, gentlemen, I announced. The entrance into the Devil's Maw. Tom shook his head. Are you sure, Jack? This fucking hole looks barely large enough for a jackrabbit to get into. And now it is, said Steve. I remember it when we were kids. And look, he pointed to the soft dirt around the base of the hole. These are drag marks, and those look like handprints. With the rains, these would have had to have been made in the past day or two. Somebody dragged him or herself into this hole recently. Tom took a closer look. Christ, I do believe you're right, he said. You'd make a good detective, Steve. I guess this is it, then. There's no reason anyone will be squeezed into that hole. Unless there were urban explorers who knew about this place, I said. But that's pretty unlikely. Only one way to find out. I took out my headlamp, switched it on, and took off my backpack. I held it in front of me and proceeded to push my way into the opening. We'll be right behind you, I heard Steve say. Passageway was tight, and I ended up crawling more on my belly than on my hands and knees. The backpack served to push some dirt out of the way, and I also figured it might serve as a buffer if, God forbid, there were any rattlesnakes in the cramped space. As I pushed forward, the carbide headlamp shone bright, yet with the backpack in front, I couldn't really see much ahead of me. After a few feet in, I felt like a sluggish newborn in some dark birth canal. After about twenty feet in, I'm starting to feel a bit claustrophobic. I began to have the awful thoughts of what would happen if the passageway became further constricted and I suddenly became stuck, unable to move forwards or backwards or worse yet, suddenly caved in, entombing me under thousands of feet of rock. Just when I felt I might start hyperventilating, I felt Steve slap the bottom of my boot, and I heard him say, Right behind you, Jack. Just like being in the bonsai pipeline in Hawaii, man. I couldn't help but laugh out loud. Tube surfers know the bonsai pipeline is also called the world's deadliest wave, because the reefs hide in shallow water, and with the heights that these waves reach, anyone hiding out onto the North Shore waters is at risk, possibly fatal risk, if they don't hit their marks perfectly. I hope he didn't have any plans to be a motivational speaker, asshole, I said back. But it did the trick, and I once again regained my control. Suddenly, out of the blue, my backpack dropped from my hands. I could hear it drop to the floor of the tunnel below. When I reached the edge, my headlamp illuminated the large cavern of the tunnel ahead. The passageway entered at only about four feet above the tunnel floor. I extended my arms and allowed myself to fall out of the passage and plop to the floor. I moved out of the way, and a few seconds later, Steve dropped in. Right on his rear was Tom. I almost felt like I was going to get stuck in there, he wheezed. Well, if you lost a few pounds, that might fucking help, I opined. We all stood. We were there. In the Devil's Maw. I took a quick assessment of the tunnel. It was smaller than I imagined. It was about fifteen feet of open, circular space. I suppose large enough for the train track and several feet of trackside access on each side. The floor of the tunnel was littered with miscellaneous trash and paper, obviously stuff left from hikers before the tunnel was closed off. I could spot a few of those old 1930s green glass Coca-Cola bottles, and lying against one of the walls was a very dilapidated copy of the horror pulp fiction magazine Weird Tales. The cover was dated 1944, and ominously, depicted an illustration of a scantily clad, red-headed vixen surrounded by flying bats. The caption read, The Kiss of the Vampire. With a shiver, I turned away. 
I put a finger to my lips and gave Steve and Tom the signal to stay as quiet as possible as we moved forward. Tom took the lead, carrying the water rifle. Our headlamps illuminated a fair distance down the tunnel, but the light seems to almost get sucked away by the darkness. From there, we could not see the end of the tunnel. We shuffled forward cautiously, constantly scanning the floor, sides, and ceiling of the tunnel. Tom stopped at one point and turned to look at me. He whispered, Wind. And after a second, I picked up on what he was saying. I could detect a slight breeze of air, seeming to indicate there might be some other vents or access to the tunnel. I nodded, and we continued moving. After about twenty more feet, we started seeing an interval of ancient kerosene lanterns, a few still remaining on the wall of the tunnel, but most on the floor, where they had fallen, surrounded by shards of broken glass. We also started spotting some miner's tools, pickaxes, and the like, long neglected and severely corroded. We kept moving. Then, when we were a few hundred feet into the tunnel, it happened. Tom was walking slightly ahead of us, Steve in the center, and I was a few feet behind, but close to the left side of the tunnel. I was glancing up at the roof when I felt the floor of the tunnel somehow give way. One minute I was walking, the next I felt myself falling. There was an intense sharp pain in my right elbow as I hit the floor as my body fell through. Then, before I knew it, I landed hard. My wind was knocked out, and for a few moments, I lay there in a state of shock. I looked up and could see the hole in the ceiling where I had fallen through. Suddenly, I realized I had fallen through some subterranean cavern that was under the actual tunnel. My headlamp had fallen off, but illuminated my surroundings. I had fallen nearly twenty feet, and as I assessed any damage I may have suffered, I could see I fortunately hadn't landed on any jagged rocks or protrusions. Other than my right elbow, I felt no pain or injury. I was lucky. I saw Steve's head poke through the hole above. Hey Jack, my god, are you okay? He called out. Yeah, Steve. I croned. I think so. It was a hell of a drop, but I don't think anything's broken. Okay, he replied. Hold on, we'll get the rope out and get down to you. I gave Steve an acknowledgement and shakily got to my feet. My ankle felt sprained, but I could walk. I picked up my headlamp and took a look around. It seemed to be an underground cavern of sorts, or a cave that was directly under the excavation they had done for the train tunnel. Its full dimensions far exceeded what was illuminated by my lamp. It could go on for miles, as far as I knew. Then, from somewhere down in the blackness, I heard a sound. I strained to hear it again, but all was quiet. The only sounds were Steve and Tom up above, apparently trying to rig up the rope. But then, I heard it again. This time... It sounded like someone shuffling. I wanted to move, to do something, but fear gripped me like a vice. The worst was that I couldn't see what was coming. Then I heard a rock get kicked and skitter along the floor. Whatever it was, it was getting closer. I looked up to the hole. Steve! Tom! I yelled. Get me the fuck out of here! I'm about to have company! At this point, I didn't care about keeping our voices to a whisper. I knew our element of surprise was long gone. Okay, man. Steve yelled down. We almost got the line together. I turned around, and my blood ran cold. I could now see a shape emerging from the darkness. My God. I whispered. It was my worst nightmare come true. I would have gladly given my soul to have had it be my nemesis, Alexandria, the queen of the vampires herself. It would have been infinitely preferable to the horror standing now twenty feet away from me. 
Jack, what an unexpected pleasure to see you. It's so nice of you to, well, drop in. The thing before me chuckled and broadly smiled, revealing his new set of sharp incisors, dripping with foamy saliva. His eyes shone red, resembling those of a hungry wolf, ready to devour its prey. His hair was unkempt, and his face and body were smeared with dirt and soil from living underground. He was naked, the sheet from the morgue having long fallen off. Oh, Mike, I said, with tears streaming down my face. What have they done to you? The vampire took another step forward. You got it all wrong, Jack. It's the best thing that could ever happen to me. I owe it all to Alexandria. Before I met her, I was just one of the billions of mindless sheep roaming this planet without a purpose. Just a slab of mortal flesh, already dying from the day I was born, destined to eventually rot in the grave. Her gift to me is immortality and powers unimagined by mortal men. No longer am I a sheep without a purpose. Now I hunt the sheep and I take what I need. It's a thrill, Jack. The thrill of the hunt. The thrill of taking down prey. The thrill of having their salty blood coursing through my body. It's the best thing in the world, Jack. You can't imagine. But you'll know soon enough. We'll be a team again, Jack. You and me. Together, we can rule this city. Alexandria is moving on soon. She always does. We'll be free to do what we wish. All those lost angels in the city of night, Jack. Think of it. It's the perfect feeding ground. When we're done, we'll make all the previous Los Angeles serial killers. Bonin, Bono, Corona, Kearney, Greenwood, and Manson look like amateurs. What do you say, Jack? Let me help you break on through to the other side. Let's break on through the doors of reception. I looked at the man I once thought as close as a brother, and it was incomprehensible to me that he could now be capable of having such evil thoughts and planning such vile murders and mayhem. His soul was clearly gone. The thing standing before me was nothing more than a hideous effigy of his former self. I felt a terrible sense of loss, almost as if a piece of me had died as well. Your parents are dead, Mike. Killed by Alexandria. Did you know that? I asked. I had hoped to get some reaction, to see some sense of humanity from my old friend. It was not to be. Not by a long shot. Fuck them, Mike spat. They were weak. Their righteousness was their undoing. They wouldn't have understood or appreciated the dark powers that could have been made available to them. They were barely alive when they were still alive. He gave a hideous laugh. Alexandria turned me and Dale. She wanted you too, but you resisted. I have to admit, she's quite upset with you, Jack. She thinks you don't have what it takes. So give in to me, Jack, and prove she's wrong. Mike stretched out his hand. Just then, I heard shouting from above the hole in the roof of the cavern. It was Steve and Tom. They were in a fight. I could make out the screams. Shoot. Throw it. And watch out. Uh-oh. The Mike thing cackled. I think Stevie Boy and that stupid cop have their hands full. They must have met Charlie and Trish. They're my new friends. They're a very nice couple that bonded in their mutual love of urban exploration. They got more than they ever imagined when they bumped into Alexandria one night when they were exploring the old abandoned Murphy Ranch down in L.A. Steve! Tom! I yelled as I looked up towards the hole. What's going on? Are you all right? I wasn't going to get an answer. I could still hear yelling and the sounds of scuffling. 
I turned back towards Mike and was alarmed to see he had moved even closer to me. He was now ten feet away. How did he manage to move that fast without me hearing? Oh, don't fret too much over Steve. He was always the loser in our group. The boy's got no ambition, no drive. Fifty years from now, he'll still be hanging out on the beach in Malibu, fat and penniless, sucking down cheap margaritas, and still trying to score with the girls. He's a fucking bum and oxygen thief. He deserves to die. Good riddance, I say. I knew the real Mike loved Steve like a brother. And what Mike always respected in Steve was his independence and non-conformity to the usual norms. There was no way Mike would have ever looked down on Steve as a loser. And when we were all twelve years old, Mike got caught in a riptide off the shore of Santa Barbara. There were no lifeguards, but Steve fought the tides to reach Mike. For a few minutes, I thought they were both gone. But Steve managed to keep Mike above the surface, and eventually was able to break free of the tide and get Mike safely back to shore. If it wasn't for Steve, Mike would have drowned that day. The soulless creature standing before me didn't give a shit about that. His heart was black as coal, and as cold as ice. I resolved then and there that I would never let him get out of that tunnel. I had to kill him. Really kill him. I wondered then why Mike hadn't killed me already. He had gotten close, but had still kept his distance. He seemed more intent on trying to talk me into giving in to him. I didn't know vampires could be that fucking talkative. It didn't seem like the usual vampire approach. Then, suddenly, it hit me. The rosary. It was still around my neck. It was working. It was like wearing a talisman or a clove of garlic. And it was definitely keeping Mike at arm's length. But arm's length was all I needed. I'm sorry, Mike, I said, my voice cracking. He gave me a perplexed look, not understanding my apologetic tone. Without warning, I took out my water gun, which had been under my jacket in a makeshift holster. I pointed it at Mike's face and pulled the trigger. The pistol had been well pumped, and the holy water came out in a high-pressure stream. The water hit him between the eyes, and within seconds drilled a hole right into Mike's forehead. The effect was equivalent to me shooting him between the eyes with a hollow-point handgun round. The back of Mike's head exploded, and what was left of his brain liquefied and sprayed out to the rear. The remainder flowed out of his ears, nose, and mouth in a sizzling torrent. His bulging eyes had only a moment to register shock and surprise before they popped out of their sockets. Within moments, the flesh of Mike's face started to slow off, revealing his skull, surrounded by disintegrated muscle and cartilage. I could hear him gurgle something, no doubt a curse, as he began to stagger blindly around. I knew I had a limited amount of time before Mike reconstituted himself. Without hesitation, I stepped forward, withdrew Bethany's dagger, sprayed it with holy water, and plunged it into Mike's heart. Even with his face nearly gone, Mike produced a horrendous wail that echoed all through the cavern. His knees buckled, and he collapsed to the floor. Black ichor poured out of his ruined mouth. I pulled the knife out of Mike's chest and raised it to my eyes. It dripped with what was left of Mike's heart. Please, God, I whispered. Take Mike's soul into your gentle care. He was a good man who didn't deserve this. Crying, I bent over and began to saw off Mike's head. The knife was small, but it was incredibly sharp. Still, it took a few moments of gruesome work until I managed to cut through the vertebrae. As I made the final stroke, I evoked the sacred words. Ajurite, spiritus nequisime, per diem omnipotentem. I kneeled there, at Mike's side, my hands and arms slick with his thick ichor, and gently placed his head on top of his chest. 
It was done. I was suddenly jolted back to the present. Jack! Jack! I heard Steve shouting, his voice in a near panic. Are you alright? Jack! I had no idea how long he had been calling my name. Yeah, Steve! I yelled back. I'm fine! I heard fighting up there. Are you and Tom okay? Yeah, we're all right, Jack, came Tom's voice. We were jumped by two goons, a man and a woman. Had us on the defense there for a sec, but in the end, they lost their heads. Hey, Jack, came Steve again. We checked out the end of the train tunnel. It goes back another couple hundred feet, but then it ends. Looks like the cave in that killed those workers. It's solid. No way for anything to get in or out. All we found was some old bedding where these two goons may have been holding up. But no Alexandria. There's a huge cavern down here. I yelled back. It looks like it goes a lot further. I'll have to check it out. I already had company, so there may be more of them down here. All right, said Steve. Then hang tight. We're coming down. No, I yelled back. Someone needs to stay up there to watch the line. If someone threw the rope down after us, we'd never get out of here. I'll stay. Tom volunteered. He probably knew full well it would be fruitless preventing Steve from joining me. It was agreed he'd give the water rifle to Steve so we'd have the additional firepower. Five minutes later, after they had secured the rope line, Steve lowered himself down to where I was sitting, now nursing my throbbing ankle. He gave me a quick once-over, eyeing the now coagulating blood that covered most of my extremities. Christ, Jack. What the fuck happened? I simply pointed over to where Mike's body lay. Steve turned and illuminated the ruined corpse with his headlamp. Mike's near fleshless skull looked back at us, the long incisors clearly visible, flashing in the light. Is it... Steve whispered. My silence was all the acknowledgement needed. Oh, Mike. Steve choked as he dropped to his knees alongside the body, sobbing. I knew it would be hard on Steve. I knew that up to now, he really hadn't come to grips that Mike had been lost to us, that he had become one of the undead. I could only thank God that Steve hadn't heard all the vile things the vampire had said. For now, the best I could do was to just let him suffer his grief in silence. I didn't like leaving Tom alone, but we had little choice. After confirming with him that we would try to return in one hour, Steve and I started walking further into the cavern. I could see then that it was naturally formed having existed under the train tunnel but never discovered. The 19th century excavators had been digging the tunnel, never knowing about it. It probably was the cause of the tunnel collapse, with the floor of the tunnel caving into part of the cavern below. Within a few minutes of walking, the initial cavern narrowed into a corridor of sorts, made what felt like a 45 degree turn, and then opened up into what can only be described as a massively large cavern. It was obviously not under the tunnel, as the ceiling went up hundreds of feet. Stalactites dripped down from the ceiling like icicles on a winter day. Hundreds of stalagmites rose up from the cavern floor to greet them. In the light of our headlamps, they shimmered in vibrant colors, some almost translucent, reflective of the rich mineral deposits that made up the desert earth. As I looked around, I could see small pools of water shimmering green in our lights. I was in awe at the majestic and undisturbed beauty all around us. It seemed so out of place to the horrors that were no doubt lurking in the shadows. Steve, I whispered, I think we're the first humans to have ever stepped foot in this place, at least in thousands of years. This cavern would be a speleologist's dream, I thought and we'd be credited with discovering it, if we lived, that was. We continued to move forward through the cavern, looking for any sign of visitation, carefully casting out lights behind every stalagmite and boulder. 
After several minutes of traversing the cavern, we saw nothing. There was only one other corridor that led out. I looked at Steve. He gave me a nod and whispered, It's a good thing we have extra flashlights. If we ended up in total darkness, we'd never find our way out of here. We walked in, and after a few minutes, I noticed the floor had about a 10% slope. We were going deeper underground. At a few moments, the corridor narrowed to just a few feet across, and in one instance, we had to turn sideways to squeeze through the gap. At another location, the roof lowered to a point where we had to bend over to proceed. I realized then that we probably wouldn't get back to Tom before our hour limit. If there was one guy who had no patience, it was him. I could only hope he wouldn't try to come down after us. At last, we came out into another large cavern. Watch it, Steve, I warned, pointing to the floor. On the other side of the pathway were open crevices, some deep enough that my light couldn't detect any bottom. If one of us fell down in one of those, we'd be dead for sure. We continued along, zigzagging around the many stalagmites jutting up all around us. Their matching stalactites loomed downwards, the pointed tips dripping water. The whole scene gave the illusion that we were walking through a giant mouth full of teeth. With the top incisors dripping, glistening wet in anticipation. The cavern felt wrong, somehow, and I could tell Steve was thinking the same thing. The further in we walked, the more my sense of dread heightened. This was amplified by a smell now wafting through the chamber. Not the normal smell of earth and minerals one encounters in a cave, but something sour, the odor of death and decay. I knew we were getting close. As we came around to the rear of one very large stalactite, I heard Steve take a sharp inhale of breath. I immediately turned to see what had shocked him. There, just feet away, was a man. He was on his side, fetus-like, curled between three smaller stalagmites. He looked to be in his early mid-twenties, with long, dark hair and an athletic build. Definitely Alexandria's type, I thought, and probably a white-collar worker. He was dressed in slacks and dress shirts, and still wore a sports coat. His penny loafers had the remainder of a shine to them. He couldn't have been turned very long. I took out the dagger and walked over to the man. As Steve took out his crucifix, he covered me with his water pistol. I poured holy water on the knife and plunged it down into the vampire's heart. Simultaneously, I clamped my other hand tight over his mouth. His eyes immediately flew open, first in shock, then in pain as I twisted the knife from left to right. His hands flailed at my face in a vain attempt to stop me, but I just pushed down harder. Black blood, as thick as 40W70, high viscosity motor oil, pumped out of his heart, and with this taste, I could feel it flowing through my fingers as they struggled to muffle his screams. He struggled a few seconds longer, but I kept twisting the knife until I could see his red pupils dim and finally fade away. Without skipping a beat, I yanked out the knife with a sickening pop and began sawing off the vampire's head. As I did so, I had a moment of empathy for the young man. He was someone's son, maybe someone's brother or boyfriend, another victim of Alexandria's bloodlust, an unwilling sex slave for her evil desires. When I was done, I stood up and looked at Steve. His face was grim, but he gave me a nod and an encouraging squeeze of the arm. After wiping the knife off with my bandana, we started making our way further into the cavern. What I was pretty sure now was Alexandria's lair. As we walked, scanning the floor and ceiling of the cavern carefully, we began to see several more objects showing evidence of long-term occupancy. A random boot, a woman's stiletto heel, a man's jockey short, 
a girl's halter top, some shorts or blouses, even a ragged Stetson, all littered the area. Alexandria had been a busy girl. I saw something shine in my light, and I bent over to take a look. It was a pinback badge for the Wells Fargo Security Services. I put the badge in my pocket. It was numbered, and I figured if any security guard went missing, the badge could confirm that person's fate. Then, without warning, something flew out of the darkness and landed on Steve's back, slamming him hard to the ground. His headlamp went flying and degraded our visible light by half. Steve started struggling with what sounded like a snarling dog. I could hear snapping and growling. Steve, hang on, I shouted as I ran over to him. I got a good hold on whatever it was and yanked it off of him. The thing flailed and started screaming like a banshee. As I fought it, I could feel breasts and realized it was a woman. A long mane of dirty blonde hair obscured her face, but I could get flashes of a snarling mouth filled with sharp incisors. I finally was able to throw her down on the ground, and I attempted to pin her arms down without getting bitten. Then, as her hair fell back, I looked upon her face in total astonishment. For a moment, I couldn't process who I was seeing. It was Kate. But Steve and I had seen her dead, in Dale's apartment, with her throat torn out. She must have turned. It must have come back. The once immaculate valley girl that I knew was now a filthy, reeking Nosferatu. Kate's eyes also registered recognition, and she stopped struggling. She smiled wide, fully revealing her new set of teeth. Why, Jack, she purred. I didn't know it was you. What a pleasant surprise. Of all places to bump into each other, and I'm such a mess, too. You must think I look like a real troll. I didn't respond as I looked over to see how Steve was doing. He was only now slowly coming to his senses, struggling to sit up. You know, Jack, Kate whispered seductively, I always had a thing for you, for a long time. Dale never could satisfy me. A woman needs a real man, like you. You can fuck me, Jack, right here, right now. I need to be fucked, Jack, hard. As I watched, Kate extended her tongue and ran the tip seductively around her full lips. My head started to swoon. I tried to tune Kate out, but her eyes were so compelling. I couldn't control my hands as I released her arms. She smiled wider as she brought her hands up to her blouse. She undid her buttons, revealing her breasts. You like them, Jack? I want you to kiss them, Jack. Lower your head and suck my breasts. Now, Jack. I knew it was wrong as I felt my head coming down towards hers but the thought of ravishing her on the dirty cavern floor somehow filled me with a decadent, animalistic lust. Jack, you lost your rosary, Jack. I heard Steve shout. I didn't care what he was saying. I lowered my head further. I could see Kate's eager anticipation in her eyes. Then, suddenly, I was violently pushed off of Kate. As I shook my head, Trying to regain my senses, I could see Steve now on top of Kate. You fucking prick! I could hear Kate growl. I'm gonna rip your heart out! Steve took out one of his green water grenades. I don't think so, Kate, he said. And I always thought you talked too much. With that, he jammed the ball into Kate's mouth and slammed her jaw shut. Her incisors did a quick job in puncturing the thin plastic, resulting in five ounces of holy water exploding down her throat and up her nasal cavity. Within seconds, her beautiful face turned black and her skin sizzled off. Her eyes popped out of their sockets and liquefied brain poured out of her nose and ears. Her chest caved in, 
and what was left of her internal organs turned to mush and poured out over the floor. Steve, the knife, I said as I tossed it over to him. I didn't know if Steve would show any hesitation, not having performed the gruesome task before, but he did not. He kissed the blade and began decapitating what was left of Kate's corpse as he recited the sacred words. In a few minutes, he was done. We sat there on the cavern floor, exhausted, and looked at each other. How many more of our little group are we going to lose to that bitch, Jack? Steve asked, an obvious reference to Alexandria. It's just you and me now, Kimasabi. I smiled. But she picked the wrong group of friends to pick on this time. Steve smiled back. True. But one word of advice, from one friend to another. You really gotta learn to control your horny impulses. Another few seconds and Kate would have made sure you came and then went. With a groan, I helped Steve to his feet and picked up his miner's cap. The light was broken, but we had extra flashlights. We moved on towards the unexplored side of the new cavern. At one point, we could see a very wide crevice that was only a black void when we shined our flashlight down the hole. It seemed to be bottomless. We continued to find personal effects and clothing strewn across, but we didn't encounter any more undead. About ten minutes later, we discovered another tunnel that exited the main cavern. It was fairly narrow and also had a downgrade, indicating that we were heading even further underground. I had no idea at this point how deep we were, but it had to be thousands of feet below ground. Then, suddenly, we could hear a sound coming from somewhere further down the tunnel. The sudden transition from total quiet was completely jarring. The sound was faintly melodic, like someone singing. Steve and I looked at each other, and then continued down the tunnel. Step by step, the sound became clearer. It was definitely someone singing, and it was a woman's voice. A few more steps, then I abruptly stopped. Steve whispered, Jack, those lyrics, is that... His voice trailed off. Yeah, I answered. It's Joan Jett. Do you want to touch me? One of my favorites. The verse of the song I knew so well wafted down the tunnel, raw and sexually erotic, yet at the same time beautiful and melodious. We've been here too long, trying to get along, pretending that you're all so shy. I'm a natural man, doing all I can, my temperature is running high. Crying at night, no one in sight, and we got so much to share. Talking's fine if you got the time, but I ain't got the time to spare. But when it came to the chorus, the singer changed the lyrics. And then there was no doubt who was behind the siren-like voice. Do you wanna touch Jack? Do you wanna touch me there? Where? Do you wanna touch Jack? Do you wanna fuck Jack? Do you wanna touch me there? Where? There? Yeah. It's Alexandria, I told Steve. She knows we're here. We've lost any element of surprise. Steve squeezed my arm. Kinda figured we'd never be able to sneak up on the likes of her. Direct confrontation. The way I like it anyway. He said. All right, I replied. Into the lion's den we go. More like the vampire queen's den. Steve corrected. Just be careful, Jack. She's got a real hard on for you. It's just my rugged good looks. I shot back. Sorry. She's obviously not turned on by it, blonde surfer boys. We gave each other a hug, not knowing if it would be our last. We then double-checked all our gear. I poured holy water on Beth's knife. Steve made sure the water rifle was pumped and ready. 
I pulled out my crucifix and kept it at the ready. With everything in order, all we needed to do was follow the music to where it would lead us. I would like to tell you now that Steve and I, with our righteous might, defeated Alexandria. After all, we are taught that good always triumphs over evil, right? Well, I can personally attest that that is total bullshit. Sometimes good does not triumph over evil. Have you often wondered why an inherently bad person, say a narcissist or sociopath who bullies their way through life at the expense of others, lives to a very old age, whereas a godly or inherently good person who has nothing but love and forgiveness for their fellow man and woman happen to die of cancer at thirty? History is replete with examples of evildoers getting away scot-free, living long lives without retribution. We don't like this inconvenient fact, but it's often true. Steve and I entered the last cavern, this one more of a chamber, very small and circular in shape, maybe only a hundred feet in diameter. We took a few steps inside. Again, crevices littered the floor, no doubt with bottomless pits below. Near the far side of the room, there was an elevated slab of rock, forming a platform up near the ceiling, making a throne of sorts. And there, on her throne, was the queen of the vampires herself, Alexandria. Not dressed in any royal attire, nothing befitting her status as the queen of the undead. No, rather, she was wearing a pair of blue jeans, tight and sexy, with holes in the thighs. On top, she wore a black half-t-shirt, which exposed her flat and well-toned belly, and being sleeveless, showing off her muscled biceps. I could see the nipples of her braless breasts thrusting against the confines of her shirt. Her wrists were accentuated by several bands of leather bracelets. Her black, feathered shag hair accented her beautiful face, her dark brown eyes rimmed with mascara. If there ever was a Joan Jett for my wildest wet dream fantasy, this was it. Even without her vampiric powers, it was enough to turn me on. And she fucking knew it. Welcome to my boudoir, boys, Alexandria announced. You should be honored. You're the first humans to ever set foot here. Alive, that is. She chuckled. Jack... I'm partially pleased to see you. You know, you've been a real thorn in my side, sticking your nose into my business from the day we met. I think maybe you're the best adversary I've faced in several hundred years. I admit, you coming here to face me takes guts. You have a fierceness, a tenacity that I admire. You're a fighter. I respect that in you, Jack. I even forgive you for hitting me with that fucking Bible. I was trying to protect my friend, I retorted. Why did you have to attack Mike? Why did you pick him? What did he ever do to you? Well, he's free from you now. I killed him. His soul can now rest in peace. You've lost him, Alexandria. The smile immediately left Alexandria's face. Yeah, added Steve. Along with your other trophy boy, the kid in the nice business suit, and the two goons who greeted us on the way in. Upon hearing that, Alexandria jumped up from her perch, visibly shaking, hands balled into fists. Her Joan Jet brown eyes now radiated a fiery red, like coals on a hot grate. That was when I knew we definitely had a pissed off vampire on our hands. Well, well, she hissed. It seems like the old adage is true. All work and no play makes Jack a very dull boy. Then, Mike was mine, she shrieked. In the confines of the cavern, her scream reverberated like a thunderclap. I was in fear that it would be enough to bring the whole place down on top of us. 
one of the stalactites broke off and fell to the cavern floor. Then, with the sound still echoing down the corridor, she pointed her finger at me and said ominously, Well, Jack, you kicked me in the side yet again. I keep underestimating you, but it's the last time, and someone has to replace Mike. You do very nicely, Jack. You'll be my sex slave forever. Think about it, Jack. Until the end of time, you'll be my lackey, taking care of my every need. It's only fitting. And Stevie Boy here can be my scout, finding fresh meat for me amongst the beach crowd. I was planning to leave Los Angeles, to head south to those countries where people disappear every day with little notice. But now, I think I'll stay. And of course, I'll have to turn everyone in your families as well. That will be your ultimate punishment, Jack. Your mother, your sister, they will join you in everlasting servitude to me. She then broke out in a wicked laugh that chilled me to the bone. That was enough for me. With my blood boiling, I pulled out my crucifix and the water pistol. Steve slung the water rifle to the ready. We advanced on Alexandria. I was going to cut off that bitch's head and enjoy every minute of it. After a few steps forward, Steve let off a burst of holy water. Alexandria moved like a cat, jumping down from her pedestal before the stream could reach her. We were too far away. Alexandria moved quickly over to a corner of the chamber. We had her trapped with her back towards the wall. In a few moments, we could blast her point-blank with the water. Once that happened, she'd be immobilized. My rage was so intense, and my tunnel vision so complete, that I failed to realize that something as cunning as she, something that had survived for thousands of years, wouldn't have some kind of escape plan. The smile on her face should have been a warning, but I had her in my sights, and victory was at hand. My hubris was our undoing. Another step forward, and under my foot, I felt something depress, followed by an ominous loud click. It was just like in the movies, when some soldier fighting in the jungle steps on a landmine. I barely had enough time to realize my mistake when I was suddenly lifted up off the floor, smashing into Steve, our arms and legs becoming intertwined. It took a few seconds to realize what had happened. We were both in some kind of a snare net trap, a well-placed and well-disguised man trap. Both Steve and I ended up dangling helplessly ten feet in the air. The net was so small, probably designed for one person, that we were compressed together so tightly it was hard to reach anything. My crucifix and water gun had flown out of my grasp and now were at the bottom of the net, beyond my reach. We were compacted together so tightly that Steve was unable to bring up his water rifle that was trapped down at his side. We were, in effect, totally helpless. Alexandria cautiously approached the net, then determined we were immobilized. She let loose with a maniacal laugh. Jack, she cooed. My pretty boy, you didn't stand a chance. I will never die, Jack. You should have realized that. It was a good game, and I enjoyed it. But the game is over now. Time for you to die. Don't worry. Soon you'll be at my side, ready to serve me. With that, her incisors grew and extended forward. Suddenly, from the entrance to the chamber, Something ran across the room and tackled Alexandria. The shape was a blur, but I heard Alexandria grunt hard as she was thrown to the floor. I heard her scream in pain, frustration, or anger. I couldn't be sure. The two rolled around on the cavern floor, clawing and fighting each other. Finally, they broke apart and both staggered back. I couldn't believe my eyes. For a moment, I couldn't process what I was seeing. It was Bethany. How could that be? How did she get past Tom? Why was she here alone? 
She couldn't possibly take on Alexandria by herself. It was suicide. Before I could think further, I heard Alexandria scream and point her finger at Beth. Ramnoisia, I thought that was you the other night. You finally tracked me down, eh? How long has it been? Four hundred? Five hundred years? I could hear Bethany calmly reply. I just missed you after your mess at Hinterkaufik. Yet another family you completely decimated for your own enjoyment. It ends now. I could see Alexandria smirk, but not with her usual cocky self-assuredness. She looked like she was actually scared of Bethany. How could this be? I wondered. My mind was spinning. Why did Alexandria call Bethany Ramnoisia? That name was familiar, as something from ancient mythology. In a now shaky voice, I heard Alexandria say, You don't need to be involved in this, Ramnoisia. You could just leave. Let bygones be bygones. This human is my affair. He's mine. No, Bethany replied. You've done enough damage to mankind, Alexandria. You treat the Earth like your personal playground, killing with absolute wantonness for your own physical gratification. You and your clan have brought such evil into the world. My sworn duty is to destroy you. With that, Bethany turns to look right at me, and she said, Jack, I'm sorry it had to end this way. I so much enjoyed our life together. Please remember me, and know that I will always love you. As Bethany acknowledged me, I could see surprise and confusion flash across Alexandria's face. Then, to my horror, I watched as Bethany, the love of my life, stepped forward, wrapping her arms around Alexandria in a parody of a lover's embrace and hurled herself into one of the bottomless crevices, dragging a screaming Alexandria along with her. The last thing I remember was screaming. I screamed and screamed until, at some point, I passed out in blessed oblivion. I don't know how long I was out, but my next cognizant thought was being lifted down from the net. Steve filled me in later, that Tom, being the impatient man that he is, had finally decided to descend on his own to the lower cavern to search for us. Steve said it was a good thing he decided to do so, too, because there was no way he was able to cut through the nets on his own. As soon as I regained my senses, I pushed away from Tom to run over to the hole where Bethany had disappeared. Even with my light, all I could see was a black void. I yelled Bethany's name for minutes, tears streaming down my face. Eventually, Steve put his hand on my shoulder and simply said, She's gone, Jack. I don't understand exactly how she knew Alexandria from the past, or what the relationship was, but she sacrificed herself for us, for you. I know that for damn sure. She saved our lives. Come on, man. Let's get the hell out of here. The trek out of the cavern was a blur. When we emerged out of the birth canal, it was like being born again. The late afternoon sun was a welcome sight after the darkness of the cavern. Do you feel that? I asked Steve. The Santa Anas. They've stopped blowing. After two weeks, the winds have stopped. It feels like an oppressive weight has been lifted off the city. It's because of Bethany. She saved the city as well. Steve gave me a knowing smile. I think you're right, bro. It feels like a new day. Come on, let's get you home. Later that evening, I sat staring out my living room window where Bethany and I used to enjoy the view of the San Fernando Mountains. Steve and Tom were in the other room, having mutually decided to not leave me alone. My sense of loss was devastating. 
but worse yet was my need to know who Bethany really was. I knew I would go insane if I didn't have any answers. I had a few clues, though. After a return, Tom made a few phone calls to his contacts in the law enforcement community, and after being linked up with Interpol in Europe, followed up on Bethany's reference to the mess at Hinterkaufeck. He discovered that Hinterkaufeck was a small Bavarian farmstead located about 43 miles north of Munich, Germany. On the night of March 31st, 1922, five members of the Gröber family and their maids were brutally murdered. The perpetrator used a mattock, or a pickaxe, to kill the victims. Evidence showed that the killer then lived with the corpses of the family for three days. Their Hinterkaufeck murders, as they are known, are considered one of the most gruesome and puzzling unsolved crimes in German history. The case remained unsolved to this day. As I brought up my eighth, or was it my ninth, cold Henry Weinhardt's to my lips, I mulled over this information. Obviously, Alexandria must have been at the Hinterkaufeck farm that fateful day in 1922. It would have been just like her to massacre an entire family for the hell of it. But what of Bethany's revelation that she had just missed Alexandria at Hinterkaufeck? That was 58 years ago. Bethany, my Beth, was only 20 years old. Or was she? Before our local library closed, Steve made a trip to do some research. He found out that Ramnausia, the name Alexandria had called Bethany, was the name for the Greek goddess of vengeful fate, right for retribution or revenge, more commonly called Nemesis. Nemesis had a rogue translation of to give what is due from Greek language and dialect to English. Nemesis is usually depicted as having angel-like wings and holding a sword, but in some images, she can be seen holding a balance, scales, or measuring rods. Greek mythology, Nemesis, or Ramnausia, is the goddess who enacts retribution against those who succumb to hubris or arrogance before the gods. I took a shot of peppermint schnapps and chased it with the beer. I was getting drunk but I felt I was getting close to something. If Bethany was indeed alive in 1922, was she then immortal? Was she actually Romnausia, a goddess, or was it just simply a name? Whatever she was, she felt like flesh and blood. And she could love. One could say if Alexandria represented evil, then Bethany was the good in a person. It now seemed obvious that she had a mission to find and kill Alexandria, and had been pursuing her for years. It now made sense why she had such a vast knowledge of vampirism, and how they could be destroyed. The encounter between the two were like a showdown between good and evil, and in this case, the good prevailed. Good defeated evil, but at what cost? Why did she have to sacrifice herself? Why did she have to die? Why, I thought selfishly, did she have to leave me? One question nagged at the back of my mind more than any other. If Bethany was pursuing Alexandria, then why did she let me, Steve, and Schmidt face her alone? Why did she give us the tips on how to kill her, and even give us the knife, rather than do it herself? That is, until the end, when she came to our rescue... I finished the Henrys and started to get up to get another. As I moved, my foot kicked against something. I looked down, and there was the little wooden chest that Bethany had brought, the one that contained the vampire killing knife. I reached down and picked it up. The other night we were more focused on the knife, and I hadn't the chance to take a closer inspection of the chest itself. It was definitely made of some ancient wood, light yet strong and very smooth from no doubt centuries of wear. The lid had a unique grain to the wood as well. It almost seems to form an image. Then I saw it. Of course, I thought. The wood grain of the lid wasn't natural, but rather, it formed an image. 
an image I knew only too well. That of a hibiscus flower superimposed over two crossed daggers. Bethany's tattoo. I still had the knife, so I went over to my backpack to get it. Once in hand, I opened the lid of the chest to put the knife back inside. There, sitting on the pink velvet, was a note. I knew it hadn't been there the night before, when Beth took the knife out. I picked it up and unfolded it. It was in Bethany's own handwriting and read, Jack, my love, if you are reading this, then something has happened to me. I want you to know, first and foremost, that you have been the only good thing to happen to me in my rather joyless existence. I hope when you read this, Alexandria is also dead, as that was my goal. She and I go way back. She is much older than me, as I wasn't turned until the year 1624 in Jamestown, what was then the colony of Virginia. Yes, Jack, I am also a homo nosferatu empirus. Didn't you ever wonder, during all the time we were together, why my school and classes did not allow me to see you during the day? I always arrived in the evening and left before dawn. However, I am nothing like Alexandria and her kind. My clan is dedicated to live amongst the human race and coexistence and peace. There are more of us than you can imagine. We have been charged with rooting out and destroying those of the vampire clan which we call Vampir Mortis, enclaved mostly in Europe and Asia, that kill and feed on the human race. In recent decades, my clan has noticed more of the Mortis vampires setting up nests in America, where they are increasingly killing humans with wanton disregard. My clan leaders charged me, and some select others, with hunting them down. The worst of them being Alexandria. Her history is centuries long, leaving a trail of death and destruction from the Mediterranean through Germany, France, the UK, and now, finally, to America. Through the centuries, to aid us, tracking down and killing the vampires, we have also enlisted the aid of your fellow humans. Only those with the inherent goodness of soul, purity of character, and strength of resolve are chosen. You, Jack, have these qualities. I have noticed it very early on in our relationship. Believe me, it was pure coincidence that Alexandria chose Mike. She had no idea about the relationship between you and I. But once she ensnared him, your love and loyalty for Mike, and the fire in your belly to fight the evil that was Alexandria, was final proof to me that you are one of the chosen ones. I decided to give you some of the tools necessary for your vengeance, but not to get in your way. You have to do it yourself, Jack. I resolved to only step in if your life was in immediate danger. If you are reading this because I am dead, Jack, please do not grieve for me. Instead, you must carry on in my place. It is your destiny now, Jack. Honor me by continuing to pursue the Vampire Mortis. There are enclaves throughout the country. You will see the signs. You will be contacted by other vampire hunters of my clan. They all have their own distinctive mark or tattoo over crossed daggers. Mine is the hibiscus flower. If in doubt, look for the mark. Please remember, I always did love you, Jack. I had planned to tell you the truth about me, but I admit I was scared of what you would have thought of me and whether you would have accepted what I truly am. Please forgive me. Love, Bethany. As tears rolled down my face, I put Bethany's letter back in the box. After a few minutes of contemplation, I stood up and walked into the other room. When Steve and Tom looked at me, I simply said, Gentlemen, we have a lot of work to do. That was 40 years ago, and I'm a much older man now. A lot of water has gone under the bridge, 
I still love my rock and roll, and I'm a firm believer that Mr. Mojo Horizon's going to return someday. After the 4th of November, 1981, I never listened to Joan Jett again. And although it's hard to believe, in recent years, I've actually taken a liking to the old disco songs. Maybe it's nostalgia, the memories of simpler times. I still love my peppermint schnapps with a beer chaser, but sadly, Henry Weinhardt's original brewery went out of business in 1999. I was married once, but it didn't last long. My wife couldn't put up with my, well, unorthodox lifestyle. And in all fairness to her, my heart just wasn't in it. I think a piece of my ability to love fell into that same pit as Bethany all those years ago. I dedicated my life to hunting down the vampire Mortis, trying my best to honor Bethany's legacy and her last wishes, as well as to avenge the death of my childhood friends. Steve remained at my side, always my best confidant and supporter. Tom took early retirement from the police department and took on the role of researching unexplained disappearances and murders that provided leads to the Mortis enclaves. Over the decades, we tracked down members of the Mortis clan all throughout North and South America. We had many victories, although, as with all things, some losses. I've decided to chronicle these hunts in future diary entries. They need to be recorded for posterity, and to serve as a warning to those who scoff at the idea that vampires really do walk among us. This is where my current story would end, except for an event that happened to me just yesterday, and I was still putting these thoughts on paper. I've been residing in northern Michigan for a few months, since our last encounter with the Mortis. I've been enjoying the solitude of Lake Michigan from a small rented cottage on a strip of beach near the small township of Glen Arbor. The cottage came with a powerful telescope on the deck overlooking the lake. I sometimes used it to get a closer look at the boats that would pass by or to admire the night sky. Yesterday, by happenstance, I was sitting on the deck close to midnight enjoying the lake breeze with a glass of schnapps. I noticed a small sailboat, or a schooner, drifting lazily out on the sea. It was unusual to see a boat out on the water so late at night. I looked through the scope, and with the help of the bright moonlight, I could make out the name of the boat. The Chippewa. A light from the cabin illuminated a young girl, maybe around twenty, she was standing on the deck, seemingly looking towards the shore. She wore what looked like a wide-brim Panama hat, so I couldn't see the details of her face. But I could see she had long blonde hair and a lean and athletic figure. She was wearing a light-colored bikini top, revealing a flat and toned stomach, and cut off denim blue jeans, showing off her long and slim legs. She was a real looker, and even at my age, I can appreciate a pretty girl. As I kept looking, she turned back towards the cabin. There, above her right shoulder blade, was a pink hibiscus flower lying atop two crossed daggers. Knock, knock. Renz knocked on the door of his aunt's house with his index finger's knuckle. The ring he was wearing hitting the aluminum caused an echo on the small porch. He didn't wait for a reply before opening the door gently. I brought your favorite. The first thing he saw upon entering the home was his aunt posted in her usual spot. Her recliner, no doubt, had an indentation of her body perfectly, but it was hard to get her out of it most days. He had the light duty of keeping her company and bringing her food when he could. Luckily, he skipped the bathing duty, for now. Adobo, the older woman feebly answered. If Renz would have been breathing any harder, he could have missed it. I, no, he sighed, but quickly donned a smile. Your second favorite. I brought fresh pork barbecue. Because it was the only thing still open. 
He sat the bag of food next to his aunt, knowing she'd probably wait until he left to eat. That's how it seems to work these days. But he was sure she was actually eating, so that was an improvement from a few weeks ago. He told himself he'd rather take out the trash a few more times a week versus cleaning the molding food from the fridge again. I'd eat it while it's still fresh, Renz teased. I'm starting to get hungry. His aunt mustered a raise in the corner of her mouth, reaching for the back. The smell of cooked pork filled the living room immediately, overpowering the scent of dust accumulating. His family did the best they could to come by and clean so his aunt wouldn't have to, but nobody was able to be there every day. Losing her husband five years ago definitely changed something within her. She took a little longer to get out of bed some days, and stopped showing up to the family events for a few months. Eventually, she learns to find a way without him, because she still had Tito. Until she didn't. It wasn't but three years, nearly to this day later, that she lost him as well. Unlike his father, Tito decided to end his own life. Ren set a shiver down his spine, just recalling the phone call Aunt Kim made to inform everyone. He was sure she meant for one of his parents to answer, as he didn't live with them anymore, but a part of him is glad that he was the one to receive the news first. That way he could spare everyone the complete details. The truth is, yes, Tito did take his own life. His mom wasn't sure if it was the constant jumping in and out of rehab, or his recent bankruptcy status, or even still coping with the loss of his father. Renz was sure she most likely went through every scenario at least a thousand times. But what he would never share with his aunt was the last meaningful conversation he had with his cousin. Not only was he trying to come to reality with his business venture failing, which sent him into a rehab, which he promptly checked himself out of, but his girlfriend left him after that too. From what it sounded like, she had just had enough with his addiction battle. It was less of a battle, and more of him saying he would get better and failing to do so. Renz said he can't blame her, but it was definitely the catalyst. He smiled at his aunt eating in front of him, and took it as a small victory. His reward was a seat on the nearby couch. His train of thought was, if he acted like he had one foot out the door, maybe his aunt would eat sooner. And it seemed to have worked. His mind jerked him back onto the less-than-pleasant train of thought, that last conversation he had with his cousin Tito. I don't know about that, man. He could tell his cousin needed moral support, but it was 3 a.m. in the middle of his work week. Some of us still had jobs to get to. That's just how I see it, Tito scoffed. I knew you'd find some sort of silver lining. I just think you should cut her some slack. Renz rolled over, shoving his head under his pillow, as if that would magically end the phone call. You've both been through a lot. Yeah. His response was met with a harsh silence on both ends. Thanks anyway. And that was that. The last time he would hear from his cousin before taking his own life. And it was spent with Tito trying to convince Renz that his mother Kim was at the root of all of his misfortune. The only thing that Renz could pinpoint that she even had a hand in was refusing to lend Tito money again. It was out of both love and principle, because she didn't know whether it would go to rents or drugs, and chose to play it safe. It made Renz sick that this was the thought process his cousin took to his grave. He took a quick glance to the mantle, the final resting place to both his uncle and cousin now. This was quickly picked up by his aunt, who conveniently sat right across from him. She let out a sigh, placing the food she had in her hand back in the box. She offered it to him without saying anything, but upon declination, set it on the coffee table, exhausting what energy she did have. Not that he could blame her. It has been only four months since the passing of her son, and three years since the loss of her husband. He had put himself in her shoes many times, and remains thoroughly impressed with where she is now. Still, it hurts seeing his aunt like this. There was very little improvement from day to day, 
and Renz made the conscious effort to see her at least three times a week. It was the least he could do, but no amount of food he could provide her washed away the guilt he felt for having to do it in the first place. Renz went home that night much later than he intended. He waited until Kim was audibly snoring before covering her with a blanket and planting a kiss on her forehead. He thought he saw a twitch of her mouth turning upward, but chalked it up to his imagination and quickly exited just as he had come. That was the new normal for now. Renz would bring the food that was once his aunt's favorite in hopes that her appetite would return over time. For the most part, it had, but not until almost a year later. It was around that time that she was starting to get her mobility back, and the other family members stopped coming by as frequently. Despite his aunt's protestations at times, Renz still visited just as often. Periodically, he would take an extra day off of work or call in late just to stay overnight with her during the tragic anniversaries. There are things you don't think about until you have no other choice. What to do when it comes to the deceased's birthday, marriage anniversary, or even when they should have graduated college. Still, she had a long way to go. The loss of her immediate family has left her fragile, to say the least. Her night terrors were a bit less frequent as the time has moved on, but they were still present. Renz had gotten used to them by now, but the sound of his aunt wailing after screaming herself awake wasn't something he would soon forget. A main concern that her closest friend addressed was the fact that she still lived in the residence she shared with her husband and son. She had primarily taken up the residence in her living room, so her bedroom and son's room would remain virtually untouched. It was all Renz could do to convince his Aunt Kim to allow him to move in a futon so she would have another option for sleeping other than her recliner. She fought with him every step of the way, but started using it as soon as it was set up. That was enough to win for him. That's why, when his aunt called him with the news, it was all he could do to not drop the phone. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. You want to sell the house? Yes. He could hear her smile from the other end. I just accepted an offer on it, dear. What? How? Normally he has no issue supporting the endeavors of his family, especially his aunt. But this was completely out of character considering how they spent the last few years. She was just to the point of being able to spend a few hours outside the house every so often, and now she wanted to sell it. There's no need to get upset, son. Renz felt the pit in his stomach every time his aunt referred to him as her son. It wasn't an uncommon occurrence, even before the death of her own, considering how close they were. But it held a different weight now. I'm thinking about moving closer to everyone. I think it's time. Auntie, I have no problem making that trip. It's time. She repeated. There are a lot of memories here, but I think it's come to an end. And I think it's what Jericho would have wanted. Well, we're inside, becoming increasingly aware of how sweaty his hand was while holding the phone. I can't argue with that. But what on God's green earth gave you this idea in the first place? Mila showed me a wonderful mobile home. The lightness in her voice was refreshing. I can have it moved anywhere I want. Are you trying to move in with me? He said, half-jokingly. He told his dear aunt countless times she should. I wouldn't burden you with that, sweet Renz. She meant well, but that sentence hung in the air heavily. Before he could argue, she said she had to go, and quickly disconnected the call. Whether or not that was necessarily true was up for debate, but they both knew she didn't want to get caught up in an argument. It wasn't before long the older woman stayed true to her word. She did sell the home she spent two-thirds of her life in rather quickly. Kim moved closer to the rest of her family, while still maintaining a distance. 
She was about an hour and a half away from Ren's home instead of three, so neither of them could complain. Not that she was able to stay home long. It was almost like a snowball effect. Once she was settled in her trailer for a few weeks, she got a second wind. She talked of traveling to places that she had once been with her family. Renz tried softly to talk her out of it at first, thinking it could do more harm than good. But after the first trip, it was apparent that it was exactly what she needed in order to grieve. While she did have a habit of springing the location of the trip on others, the family would get updates like clockwork. It was always a bittersweet phone call or message with the occasional postcard. She made sure to include pictures of her husband, son, or all three of them side by side with her in the present day. Funny though, even though the years have added sagging skin and more laugh lines, her smile remained the same. It was a comforting, albeit shiver-inducing thought. But nobody was able to successfully pinpoint why. The frequency of her trips died down when she started to run lower than she'd like on money. She still had a good bit set aside from what was left from selling the house, but she insisted on keeping it above a certain amount religiously. No one ever questioned it, at least to her face. When she revealed that she got a part-time job just down the block from where she lived, it was met with relief rather than apprehension. Nobody was able to object with the complete turnaround she had made. Healing is not linear, but her good days far outnumbered the bad ones. Life was able to carry on as close to normal as one grief-stricken family was able to. That was until the pandemic struck. The news was met with total chaos worldwide, throwing everyone into a frenzy if they had previously scheduled travel plans. Reluctantly, Kim's most recent trip to Thailand was going to be rescheduled for some unknown date in the future. The news seemed to get her down in spirits, along with needing to quit her part-time job in order to retain her own safety. That was done with a bit more pleading from her family than she would like to see, but she made the decision a mere week into the pandemic. Within three more, she was not given much choice than to move in with her sister and her family, which just happens to include her favorite nephew. While she was surprisingly hesitant at first to live in a full house again, she quickly adapted once she accepted that nobody was able to travel anywhere for the near future. It was not long after they moved his aunt in that Renz noticed the unfamiliar behavior she had adopted. At first, he was a little unsettled by the fact that she was insistent on setting two extra spots at the table each night. When first asked about it, she smiled that award-winning smile and replied, They're for my husband and son. And that was that. Nobody tried to argue the fact and simply agreed it was a method of grief. What was a few extra dishes in comparison to her happiness, anyway? It didn't take long for whoever was preparing the dinner that night to cook just a little extra for the two empty plates. It always looked so pristine next to the silverware and glasses that went untouched. One night, Renz was letting his mind get the best of him, and he found himself fixated on the plates that were across from him. His aunt, like before, was quick to catch wind of his gaze. They're for Jericho and Tito, she said in a not-so-hushed tone, reaching out to place her hand on his arm. This caught the attention of her sister and brother-in-law, but she continued. They're excited to be here with us. Oh, they are. Renz raised his eyebrow, trying hard not to let the disbelief show while making eye contact with his parents. Of course, we're with family. She gave his arm another pat before retreating back to her plate. They're with me everywhere I go and they've been happy to see you. It was hard to argue with her respectful nod and cheerful smile. There wasn't a doubt in his mind that she meant what she said. Could they really be around somehow? He shook the thought out of his head as quickly as it appeared. That's not possible. Renz quickly scalded himself for entertaining childish thoughts before excusing himself from the table. 
he did his best to put it past him, until things started to get a little too weird for him to ignore. A few months into the pandemic, the behaviors from his Aunt Kim escalated from more than just leaving a few extra dishes out. On more than one occasion, Renz caught her facing the wall and carrying on a conversation. He decided to not think much of it until his mother, who was growing increasingly concerned, let him know that she was an audience to this behavior too. Only, she had the need to address it with her sister. She gave a similar response to when she was asked about the extra places at the table initially. Except this time, her response was a bit more curt. This was enough for it, again, to be swept under the rug. Who was anyone to judge her grieving process anyway? That was the common consensus until things were escalating at a more rapid pace. In a passing conversation, Kim made mention to both Renz and his mother that her husband and son were willing her to do things. It's as if she was unable to make a decision for herself without consulting the thin air first. There were a few happenings told in passing that made Ren's hair stand up on the back of his neck. He wasn't sure which one was caused for more concern, or if they should have been equal. Kim made mention of a pair of cross earrings she found tucked away in the room she took residence in. It was a guest room for years, filled with various knick-knacks and the lone storage box. But something told her that she was going to find the pair of earrings in a box, and before she knew what she was doing, she already had them on. From that day, she hadn't taken them off, claiming it was a gift from her son, Tito. A little more out of the ordinary, the room was beginning to take up a foul smell. Upon a quick inspection while Kim was in the shower, Renz found a few McDonald's bags on the nightstand. He barely opened one before getting the fright of his life. Cho asks me to get him his favorite every Friday. And Kim's voice rang loud and clear, the only other sound in the room being the blood rushing to his ears from being caught. You know how he was about sandwiches. I do. Renz faked a smile, folding the bag back up and placing the moldy food back where he found it. I'm sorry for snooping. More like sorry I got caught. Why are you keeping this in here? He thought to himself. Don't be, dear. The now slightly eerie smile dawned on her face again. Just don't eat your uncle's food. This sentence definitely made him stop in his tracks. Or was it the fact that she now had a grip on his arm as he tried walking past? He loves you like his own son, you know. The eye contact his aunt was making while stating the fact was unsettling to say the least. I know, auntie. I loved him too. He quickly made a beeline for the exit, his heart still racing at what seemed twice the normal speed. Why would she say loves? There hadn't been anything present tense about his uncle for half a decade now. All of this was adding up to something, but he still couldn't place his finger on what bothered him most about it. Isn't nearly sixty too old for imaginary friends? Another month went by with something out of the ordinary happening at a frequent rate. It wasn't anything they couldn't handle, until it was. Renz awoke one night, hearing hushed murmurs coming from downstairs. He warred with himself on whether or not he should see what was going on, but he could tell it was his aunt doing the talking. He finally decided to go pay her a visit, with the ruse of getting a cup of water to drink. He tiptoed downstairs, being careful not to put all of his weights on his feet just yet. He even caught himself covering his mouth to ensure that he was able to control his breathing. Despite all the preparation, he wasn't ready for what he was met with when he reached the dining hall. It was his aunt, yes. Her hand was fixated tightly around a mug of what could only be tea at this hour. Renz watched as she seemed to carry on a conversation with someone, except no one else was there but her. 
She even went as far as to giggle like a little girl and swatch the absent air beside her, like she had just heard an amusing anecdote. As if this wasn't odd enough for him, she was sitting in complete darkness. There was just the light over the sink in the kitchen, which was barely enough to show any particular detail in their surroundings. He thought about calling out her name to grab her attention and bring her back to reality, but before he could, he heard his uncle's name escape her lips. It often did, but this was not the same. It's as if she was speaking to him directly. The laughter stopped on a dime as he inched forward. Once he entered the dining room, he was stopped dead in his tracks. Even though he swore she was just looking to her left, she was now facing completely forward and staring directly at him. The smile on her face was gone, and the most unsettling fact, she looked rather angry with him, as if he had interrupted an important conversation. Enough was visible to see the white around his aunt's knuckles from how tight she was now gripping the mug. He half expected it to shadow right before him with the force she seemed to be exerting. Instead of audible speaking, Renz merely motioned back upstairs feebly as a chill went down his spine. He kept eye contact with his aunts the entire trip back, aside from when he reached the stairs. What realistically took a few seconds felt like an hour with how tense the air was. He made a mental note of how she didn't even seem to blink the entire time they locked gazes. He wasn't able to get much sleep that night. Whenever he did manage to nod off, he was reminded of the expression he last saw on his aunt's face. This caused him to pry himself out of bed quite later than he normally would, but he felt more calm going downstairs, when he heard his family rustling about. Before he could even think about mentioning it to anyone, he took a quick note of his aunt still taking up residence in the dining room. But this time, she smiled warmly, and patted the empty seats next to hers for him to join. He sat next to her, albeit reluctantly. Even though she appeared to be in her normal state of mind now, there was an unsettling air about her that he now couldn't shake. He waited until his parents had gone to work before trying to address the matter with her, but it only seems to make the thoughts racing in his mind worse. Oh, I don't know, dear. I was out like a light last night. Are you sure? He pressed, making the effort to take her plate of breakfast into the kitchen for her. It was a nice gesture, but it was really to avoid being in the same room at the moment. I could have sworn you were enjoying a cup of tea. That sounds like me. She laughed with a cheerful smile to follow. But I'm certain I was asleep. Are you sure it wasn't just a dream? I guess it must have been, Ren sighed, second-guessing the last few hours and tracing his steps back again and again as he continued to keep busy cleaning up the kitchen. It had to have been a dream, right? That was a question he repeated to himself for a few days before trying to lay it to rest for good. He could find no reasonable explanation that didn't make him sound insane. Eventually, Renz found that he was finally able to get a good night's sleep as long as he locked his door before laying down for the night. It kept things in and out. Life almost returns to normal for a day, before the family was met with shocking news. Kim called a meeting at that same dining room table, informing her family that both her husband and son were getting a little restless. They need to get some fresh air, she explained. The rebuttal everyone had wasn't even about the fact that she was once again addressing her deceased family in the present tense but with the fact that there was still a global pandemic at large and someone of her age should not be traveling alone. I won't be alone, she snapped. I will never be alone. I'm telling you, 
Rance's mother placed her hand lovingly on her sister's shoulder. Her voice was sweet, but her gestures indicated how tired she actually was with trying to talk some sense into her sister. It's not safe out there right now. Please consider waiting a little longer. We've waited long enough, was the only response they got before she retreated to the guest room. Kim was wasting no time in packing her things, which was even more unlike the person she is. She always took her time, even if it meant packing a week beforehand. It was extremely out of character for those decisions to be made in such haste. She was intent on leaving the next day. Everyone stayed home from their jobs in an attempt to talk some sense into her, but it was futile. Renz was beginning to come to terms with her desire to leave. In fact, it was a little comforting taking her odd behaviors into consideration. Maybe a little time apart wouldn't be so bad. Kim managed to gather all of her belongings and have them waiting at the door before everyone was even awake the following day. But, as she told them, they shouldn't worry. She got a flight for that night so she could have time to treat them for an early dinner to thank them for their hospitality. Although Renz took note of the way it was speaking, it almost made it seem like this would be the last time they would see her. Just as she had done for the past year almost, she added two extra spaces at the table for her husband and son. But before Renz had time to finish even half his food, he noticed that the spaces across from him looked as if the food had been sitting there for weeks. The glasses that were full just a moment ago were now bone dry. The food on the plate was now green, covered in white specks of mold. He blinked his eyes, complete with rubbing them for a few seconds just to make sure he was seeing things correctly. Still there. His mother and father wouldn't look up from their plates, so he wasn't able to gesture over to the place mats in order to get a second opinion. His gaze was only met with his aunt's, with her same unnerving smile stretching from ear to ear. They are enjoying their meal, dear, aren't you? She asked, gesturing to his nearly full plate. Renz's eyes turned back to his plate, preparing another bite in order to appease his aunt. She had worked hard on this last meal for them, and it would be rude to let any more of it go to waste. But it took all of his will in order to not drop the fork on the plate, when his eyes registered what they were seeing. His food, too, was now riddled with mold. The only difference was he had a few maggots that appeared in the blink of an eye. With his heart now clear in his stomach and his heart racing fast, he took another look up at his dear aunt. He was met with that same cold, dead stare as he saw that night a month prior. Only this time, it was accompanied with that chilling grin. Immediately, Renz was hit with the realization that the night in question wasn't just a dream, was it? The rest of that evening and following weeks were all a blur. He wasn't sure if it was the inability to sleep or the fact that he wasn't even able to sit in a dark room anymore. His parents were growing ever annoyed and a little concerned that he kept his room light on every second of the day but his restlessness was apparent with the bags under his eyes and his lack of cognitive ability, so they let it go, just like they had with his aunt. He was opening the mail one morning, sorting through a thick pile, seeing as it's been a week since he was able to bring himself to fetch it. His heartbeat quickened while it sunk to his feet this time, when he caught the familiar handwriting in his peripheral vision. It was the latest postcard from his aunt. We miss you, dear, was written in bold letters up at the top, with a small bits detailing her most recent adventure. But the most unsettling part was the picture she taped to the postcard instead of the usual scenery. It was a picture of her, in front of what would normally have been a beautiful bridge. But the kicker was that Kim had that same terrifying and almost inhuman smile 
and glazed look in her eyes. The fact that it was caught on film solidified the reality of it all. Renz didn't even have time to think of who even took the picture for her before one daunting thought flashed across his mind. Maybe Tito was right. Maybe Aunt Kim was the cause of his misfortune. Ten years ago, I pulled my wife's scorched, lifeless body out of a Florida swimming pool. We had only been married for three days. You heard that right. Three days. I wish the story didn't start there, but it does. Avery Jones was my soulmate. She was funny, spunky, and cute as hell. I was so deeply, ridiculously in love with her, and for good reason. She was way out of my league, but somehow she liked me enough to marry me. After six months of dating and another six months of engagement, we got married in a humble chapel in the Wasatch Mountains, just outside of Salt Lake City. The next day, we flew out for a ten-day honeymoon at a beachfront resort in Fort Lauderdale, a wedding gift from my parents. On the second day there, while laying on the beach, gnarly clouds blew in accompanied by the heaviest rain I'd ever seen. We laughed at our luck, packing up quickly and ran with the rest of the beach and pool goers towards the hotel. Come this way, Avery said, pulling me down a narrow stone path through the landscape to a secluded cave installation under a bridge. Laughing hysterically, with the help of our rain-diluted Mai Tais, we shed our dripping wet clothes and towels and sat down on the pool chairs in the cave. You know, we could swim right here, Avery said, pointing to the portion of the pool covered by the faux rock. I pretended to think it was a bad idea, then tackled her into the water. We splashed and wrestled around for a few minutes by ourselves, the heavy rain clapping outside the cave. After a few minutes, I hopped out and grabbed a couple dry towels from a nearby chair. I kicked my feet up and sat back, sipping my drink. Avery began an interpretive, synchronized swimming routine in her bright blue bikini. She whipped her auburn hair back and forth and swung her hands above her head with effortless grace. Even though she was joking, it was mesmerizing. She was mine. I was hers. It was surreal. But then I got a feeling. A horrible feeling. One that said disaster was imminent. I didn't say anything to Avery, though. Since I prided myself on being rigidly pragmatic, giving credence to feelings on only our third day of marriage seemed like a bad idea. Whether it was a premonition or not, lightning struck the pool with a deafening crack. A deadly shockwave surged through the pool, killing Avery instantly and shooting me back against the rock wall. Once my heart and sight returned, I saw Avery floating face down in the pool, twenty feet away from the cave. I yelled for help and jumped in. Hotel staff ran over, and together we got her out of the pool. Medical staff arrived shortly thereafter, and then an ambulance. She was pronounced dead on sight. The next day, we flew home. One of us seated in coach, the other in a body bag stashed below deck. I fell into a funk after the funeral, and never recovered. I was convinced Avery was my soulmate, so when she died, the world fell out of working order. Nothing made sense anymore. I never dated again, nor had any interest in women, or men for that matter. I took a job in Texas, bought a town home, and quickly got into a routine. I talked to my parents occasionally, but only returned home maybe three times over the last ten years. Not a day goes by that I don't think about her. Hell, not even an hour. As our tenth anniversary approached, the data analytics firm I worked for was bought by another company, and I was let go. Though I was initially pissed, my tune shifted once the generous service check came in the mail. The night the check came... I drank a lot and stumbled through Avery in my wedding album. Sometime around one in the morning, I made a decision. 
I decided that a decade of mourning was long enough. I decided that the next ten years of my life weren't going to be steeped in self-pity. I would make something of myself. I'd read books again. I'd make videos again. I'd make friends. I'd pick up the guitar. The next night, with a drink in hand and money in the bank, I sat down at my desk and developed a plan with a vague goal of getting out of the country for a little bit. Somewhere around two in the morning, I fell into the rabbit hole called the Flat Earth Theory. I spent the next three hours reading and watching YouTube videos. For some reason, it all got funnier and funnier as the night went on. I didn't accomplish much that night, but by the next night, I had a solid plan. Over the next couple months, I sold my townhome, bought a camera, and booked an around-the-world trip in five flights. My objective was to document my travels and prove, once and for all, that the world was round. For the three weeks before my trip began, I moved back to Salt Lake City with my parents, who were surprisingly supportive of the endeavor. In my first video, I explained the rules. I would travel east until I made it back home. I would have a compass on me at all times. I would be awake and alert at all times of travel. Anyone who was staunch in their belief that the world is flat would likely think I'm faking the whole thing, but this wasn't really the point of the trip. I was trying to become a new man, remember? The day before I left, I was feeling nervous and oddly existential, more so than normal. This was big, traveling around the world by myself. I never dreamed I could have done something like this, especially since Avery died. Part of me was proud of myself, the other part of me was questioning what the hell I was doing. Whatever it was, I decided to leave something behind to commemorate my existence. I stayed up late scrolling through thousands of pictures, and ultimately choosing four for prints. Avery and I on our wedding day, my cousin and I on skateboards, my parents and I last Christmas, and a horribly awkward picture of me standing by myself outside my Texas townhome. I rolled the pictures up tight, stuffed them in a dry Guinness bottle, then took the bottle and a shovel up the mountain behind my parents' house. About a quarter mile up the hill, I found a nice clearing amongst the scrub oak and dug a hole two feet deep. With my headlamp, I could see Avery's eyes peering at me through the thick brown bottle. I cried for a good five minutes, then tossed it into the hole. I covered it the best I could and returned home to get a couple hours of shut-eye before flying out. My dad drove me to the airport the next morning. I flew from Salt Lake to New York. New York to Amsterdam, Amsterdam to Shanghai, Shanghai to Los Angeles, then Los Angeles to Salt Lake. I'm intentionally not getting into too much detail about the trip itself, because that's not really the point of me writing this. Okay, okay, I'll indulge a little bit. How long did the trip take? A little over a month. I spent about a week in each place and three days in LA. Did I have fun? Hell yes. I had the time of my life. I realized that being away from the drudgery of my routine allowed some of my old self to re-emerge, my pre-lightning strike days. I made friends, I was funny, I was charming. It was a little weird, honestly. Was it good for me? Other than what I'm about to tell you, yes, it was fantastic. I truly feel like a changed man. Did I gain a following? I actually did. I mean, I didn't go viral or anything, but as of this writing, I have about 50,000 subscribers. Most think the Flat Earth Theory is BS, but some are believers. I don't know if any of them will ever read this. How do you feel about that lame time capsule now? I know you probably didn't have that question specifically, but this is important to me. The longer the trip went on, the more embarrassed I felt about the time capsule I left in the grounds behind my parents' house. The life I conveyed in that bottle was tinged with regret, loss, and sorrow. Particularly my apathetic face standing in front of my stupid hometown or with my parents on Christmas. I decided on my trip that I wouldn't replace any of the pictures in the time capsule, but I would add some. Change the ending of my story, if you will. Okay, enough of that. 
So, is the world round? That's where things get complicated. I successfully stayed awake during all hours of travel, which was very difficult. Especially that Amsterdam to Shanghai leg, good god. But I can confidently say that I traveled east the whole time and successfully made it back to Salt Lake, which would rule out the whole flat earth thing. But I can't confidently say the earth is round either. Here's what happened. When I got home, both the front, back, and side doors were locked. I tried the garage keypad, but it didn't work. When I texted my mom, it failed to go through. Then I tried my dad. Same thing. I brushed it off, telling myself that a month is a long time. My parents could have switched cell carriers and could have changed the garage code. With no way into the house and nothing to do, I decided to make the planned modifications to my time capsule right then, even though it was dark out. I trekked up the mountain with a shovel from the back porch and found the spot twenty minutes later. I dug cautiously and successfully extracted the bottle. I saw Avery's eyes again peering at me through the brown bottle, this time a little foggy from sitting underground for a month. As I pulled the rolled up pictures out, I decided that merely adding new pictures wasn't going to solve my problems. I needed a ritual, a way to symbolize my rebirth. I thought about ripping up the old pictures or burning them. I thought about collecting everything I still owned of Avery's and throwing it into a bonfire. Perhaps I wouldn't be able to move on until I could erase Avery, the personification of my old, deceased self, from my life. Like I said before, I was a new man. Then I saw something at my feet. With a flashlight on my phone, I saw that I had dropped one of the old photos. It was the picture of me and my parents at dinner last Christmas at the Grand American Hotel. Only in this picture, there was a fourth person. A beautiful woman about my age, with fair skin and long auburn hair. It was Avery. I was confused at first. Uh, perhaps I had put a different picture in the bottle than I had thought. Uh, God knows Avery and I had gone to plenty of dinners with my parents when she was alive, but I wouldn't have done that. I already had a picture of Avery and me on our wedding day. That was enough. I remember distinctly thinking one picture of Avery was enough. Then I looked closer at myself in that picture. It was definitely from last Christmas. It was 33-year-old me, not 23-year-old me. I had a beard last Christmas, a feat I could not have managed when I was 23. Since I printed the picture only a month before, I pulled up the original on my phone with numb, shaky fingers and held them side by side. It was the same picture. I had before me two distinct realities. One in which Avery was alive and one in which Avery was dead. Everything else was the same. How the hell is this possible? I thought. The picture of our wedding day was the same. So was the picture of my cousin and I skateboarding. The picture of me standing in front of my Texas townhome was different, though. Instead of a townhome, it was a small red house, apparently still in Texas. And, of course, Avery was standing next to me, wearing a green plaid button-up shirt. Avery would have pursued her degree in nursing had she lived, I'm sure. The dual income would have allowed us to buy a house instead of a townhome, I figured. But still, what the hell was happening? My knees grew weak and I sat down, looking back and forth between the two pictures with Avery now in them. She truly was stunning more beautiful than I remembered. I stumbled into a new reality. I don't know how or when, but here I am, in a world where Avery lives. I'm sure that isn't the only difference, but it's the only one I'm aware of as of writing this. If I truly am in a new reality, what happens to the old one? Am I missing? Did I get duplicated? Did that old reality disappear? I laid my back in the crunchy snow and closed my eyes. Where did I go from here? A pair of headlights flashed through the aspen trees, and I sat up abruptly. 
a car was pulling up the driveway. I shoveled my way down the snowy banks, close to the house. I remained perched there for about five minutes, before the kitchen lights clicked on, and I saw four people emerge. Two of them were my parents, looking the exact same as they did in the other reality. Then in walked Avery. Then, in a moment even more unsettling than seeing Avery alive, I saw myself enter the room. My heart was pounding. Other me was wearing the same outfits I'm wearing today, even sporting the same scruff. The only difference was the little bit of grey hair above his ears. I slid further down the hill to get a closer look. For a moment, a long moment, I forgot about my replica and watched Avery. She was gorgeous in person, more gorgeous than in pictures. She had always been that way. This is what my life would have looked like if I hadn't been such a coward, I thought, feeling a tear trickle down my cheek. The four of them talked and laughed excitedly, eventually shedding their coats and moving to the front living room. I climbed down the rock wall and ran around to the front of the house, hiding behind a group of pine trees near the front stairs. My dad left for a couple minutes and returned with a bottle of wine and four glasses. I fell deeper into a daze watching them, mostly Avery. They had a great time chatting for at least a couple of hours while I sat like a fool between the pines, my toes and hands freezing. She was so effortlessly charismatic, so charming. The way she talked with her eyes, the way her teeth flashed when she smiled, the way she leaned in when she was engaged. Everything about her was perfect what I wouldn't do to steal this man's reality. I watched other me and Avery say their goodbyes and exit through the kitchen. Their car doors slammed shut, and I realized that I was going to lose them. In my reality, I was living at home while I did my around-the-world trip. Where would I have lived if I was still married to Avery? We had always talked about returning to the Salt Lake area eventually. Maybe they did. As they rolled down the driveway in their 2019 Honda Accord, nice choice, I ran to the side of the house and found an old bike from my childhood rusted against the wall. Both tires were flat and the front brakes didn't work, but since my parents lived way up in the mountains, wherever other me and Avery were going was downhill. Even though I went as fast as I could, they were long gone. Obviously. My 25-year-old junkyard bike didn't stand a chance. But I kept going, rolling past the church, the junior high, then through the Oak Hills neighborhood, all the while racking my brain. If Avery and I were still married, where would we have lived? It wasn't a fair question to ask myself. After all, we had known each other for a little over a year, and had only been married three days when she died. In this other reality, other me and Avery had been married ten years. That's a lot of time to know someone. People change, opinions change, circumstances change. I can't read other me's mind, so all I could do was hope for a miracle. As I was about to turn the corner onto Orchid Drive, I saw a pair of taillights in a driveway off a side street. Fair Oaks Drive. Of course, I thought. Avery and I talked about renovating an old home on Fair Oaks one day. But man, that was one conversation when we were engaged. Impressive that they, uh, we, pulled it off. My vision was blurry from biking almost a mile downhill in freezing temperature, but as I got closer to the house, I recognized the car to be theirs. I snuck around the back of the house where I had a view of the living room and kitchen. I smiled, looking at the renovated, uh, well, mostly renovated, home. Pictures of Avery and other me lined the walls. There was even an old stand-up piano in the corner, just like the one Avery had always talked about. I found a little slice of heaven. This is everything my life would have been had I acted on that inner voice to pull Avery out of the water ten years ago. Instead, I'm a depressed bum living with my parents. They made their way into the kitchen and took off their coats. 
Other me started on the dishes, and Avery sat on the couch, eyes glued to her phone. I figured they were exhausted. It was midnight, after all. After a minute, Avery stood up and walked down the hall. I ran to the other side of the house to try and get a view of her, but as I turned the corner, an outdoor security light came on and I ducked down in some bushes. Other me put the dishes down and walked to the back window to inspect. Then I heard a crash from inside, where Avery was. Other me jerked around, then stopped in his tracks. Go help her, I thought. You coward. I returned to my original position in time to see Avery stomping down the hallway and into the kitchen. She was red-hot furious. She walked right up to the other me with a piece of paper in her hand. I couldn't hear exactly what she said, but she screamed something and threw the paper at his face. Other me put his hands up as a weak defense. What did you do to Avery this time? As other me tried to explain away whatever was on that paper, Avery grew more furious. She paced to the kitchen and barked something else, then picked up a glass other me had been in the middle of washing and threw it across the room, shattering on impact. Who the hell is this woman? Other me continued to speak calmly in defense, but there was no slowing Avery down. She grabbed a picture off the wall and threw it hard on the ground. The wooden frame crunched. Other me backed away slowly, moving to the other side of the kitchen island. Then, Avery pounced. She ran at him with unrestrained vengeance and shoved him hard against the kitchen cabinets. He held his hands out again, pleading for her to calm down. She grabbed a plate from the sink and swung it at him, but he moved out of the way, and it shattered violently against the cabinets behind him. This only made her madder. She shoved him again, then clawed at his face. Other me got tangled in his feet and stumbled against the fridge. She slapped him hard against the side of the head, and he yelped in disbelief. Again, he begged for her to stop, but she didn't. She hit him three more times in the face while he slumped to the ground. After the third hit, one of his eyes was already swollen shut, and the blood was streaming down his face. Avery walked to the other side of the kitchen island, and I breathed an audible sigh of relief. Avery, the girl of my dreams, the girl that I made all my friends jealous, the girl that I had on a pedestal for the last decade, a monster. I know that we tend to forget people's negative attributes after they've passed, but there was not a violent bone in Avery's body when I knew her, not even an aggressive one. She was sweet, kind, and loving. Not like this. Not at all. What happens to her? As I watched the other bruised and bloodied version of myself weep on the kitchen floor, my world crumbled. All this time I had hated myself for not listening to that voice, for not pulling her out of the pool and saving her life. If only I had done that, we could have gone on to create a beautiful life together. Finish school, build careers, buy a house, get a dog. We'd do it laughing and playing the whole time, like two kids in love. I'd be complete forever. But with that one lapse in judgment, Avery died, along with the entire vision for my perfect future. But no, that's not how life would have been. This is how life would have been with me crying on the kitchen floor with blood running down my face and shattered dishes all around me. Is it possible that my reality, the one I came from, was the better life? There was another crash and a scream from the bedroom. Avery rounds two. She stomped back into the kitchen and other me stumbled to his feet. Again, he tried to calmly plead, but again, she wasn't having it. She yelled at him for another minute, then threw a coffee mug at him, shattering against his shoulder. He backed away from her, moving to the back door close to where I was hiding. I ducked down further. The door burst open, and other me went sprawling past me, tripping and falling into the snow. Avery stopped in the doorway and scoffed. You think you're better off without me, don't you? 
That's what all this is about. She said. Avery, please, think about what you're doing. Look what you've done to me just now. We can't keep living like this. I can't keep living like this. I put up with it for far too long. Other me said and stood up. Avery began sobbing quietly, her arms folded tight. Other me took a step towards her. Don't get any closer to that thing, I thought. You're right. You're right. Avery said, tears running down her cheeks. God, I'm so horrible to you. You don't deserve this. You deserve someone better, far better. Someone who will love you no matter what. Other me stayed composed while she cried. Will you ever forgive me? She said. There was a minute of silence. I tried to steady my breathing despite feeling like I was going to explode. Other me swallowed hard and widened his stance. No, Avery. This is it. I'm doing this. It doesn't mean we're over. It just means... It, it just means I need some time. Away. He turned his back to her and walked to the front of the house where the car was parked. Avery huffed and slammed the back door, returning to the kitchen. I peered my head up and saw her going to the knives next to the stove. I thought about intervening, but didn't know how. She carried a knife to the front door. I ran around the side of the house, past the security lights to the front. Other me had just turned on the car and was starting to back out of the driveway when Avery appeared with the knife. Stop! She screamed at him, trying to block his path. Other me continued backing out, his eyes growing wide when he saw the massive knife in her hand. Stop this car, right now! She screamed and tried stabbing one of his tires, but its rotation kicked the knife out of her hand. She quickly picked it up off the driveway. He pulled into the street and sped away, leaving Avery standing in the driveway in her pajama shorts with a giant knife dangling by her side. When the headlights were gone, she dropped the knife and began crying again. My first instinct was to comfort her, an instinct that I quickly overruled. I only watched her in pure bewilderment. I never should have left Texas. After a few minutes, she returned inside, and I could hear her cleaning up the mess. That's when something dawned on me. I made a time capsule because I was about to do something big, something life-changing. For me, I was about to embark on an around-the-world trip. But why would other me make a time capsule? Was he also planning something big? Before I could follow that train any further, I realized that the paper that set Avery off a few minutes before was now sitting in the middle of the driveway. I stood up carefully, making sure I was out of sight, and grabbed it. With my phone as a flashlight, I read the paper. SLC to JFK, 1228. JFK to AMS, 1-4. AMS to PVG, 1-12. PVG to LAX, 119. LAX to SLC, 123. I let the crumpled paper fall to the ground. He was planning the same trip I just came from, which meant he was going to experience what I just experienced, probably. If he makes it around the world and returns to Salt Lake, he would be stepping into a new reality. If anyone deserves a new reality, it's that guy, so I didn't try to stop him. Lightning struck a tree nearby, knocking me to the ground and killing the power to the rest of Fair Oaks. It began to rain. I walked to Orchid Drive and followed it to Dee's, the only 24-hour diner on this side of town. I'm writing this on a borrowed laptop in a booth that Avery and I had occupied many times when we were younger. I don't know what happens to the reality I came from, if I'm now missing or dead or what. I don't know what will happen to other me, if and when he makes his trip around the world. I don't know if there are other other me's planning around the world trips too, 
thereby disrupting who knows how many more realities. How many other realities are there? Infinite? Frankly, I don't even know what will happen to this post once I publish it. I assume it will be trapped in this reality forever. But who knows how this works? Just a few hours earlier, I smugly thought I had figured out the answer to the embarrassingly juvenile question, Is the world round? My cab just got here, so this is the end of the line for me. There are plenty of unanswered questions here. Questions I hope I'll eventually find answers to. All I know now is that I don't like the reality I came from, and I don't like the reality I am in now. So there's only one way to go. See you in New York, other me. Call me tasteless, but I enjoy running Southern Fried Murder. Growing up, I loved horror movies, especially slashers, but as I got older, I became more drawn to true crime, to the real-life monsters walking among us. Like most people, I was instantly drawn to the sensationalized Bundy and Dahmers of the world, but the local cases scared me more. The murders and vicious crimes that happened in my neck of the woods here in the American South, the ones I covered in my blog. Born and raised in Albany, Georgia, I lived far from the mean streets of Chicago or New York, but that didn't mean my home states and the southeastern region didn't have our fair share of horrifying psychopaths. I was drawn to many cases, ranging from the Atlanta child murderers to the Wolf Folk Massacre. As I got closer to my thirties, I put my English degree to good use, and instead of cranking out novels that barely sold, I delved deeper into blogging. And while I wasn't the most popular, I knew I had my own niche right here in my own backyard. The Deep South's most terrifying murders. Only I took it another step forward. I visited all the crime scenes. Whether it was the FSU Chi Omega sorority house Ted Bundy attacked in Tallahassee, Florida, or the sites where the 16th Street Baptist Church in Alabama was bombed by a racist Klansman, I explored all the spots I could. As a result, the site got more successful with all my video and photo uploads. There was something to be said about visiting such sites. Sometimes they were pretty, sometimes they were sketchy, but they were always eerie even the ones that didn't have paranormal rumors attached to them. On Southern Fried Murder, I could flex my literary talents while also getting to travel. The combo of writing and these experiences also contributed to the betterment of my mental health, especially after the recent end of a four-year relationship. But what I liked most was that I could stay local. I made decent cash while doing what I loved and while being near my mom and dad. I didn't have to move anywhere too far off or do a soul-sucking job with soul-sucking hours in order to live my version of the American dream. That being said, I had my haters. Certainly, dealing with them was no easy task when I was single, and the only true support system I had were my baby boomer parents. But I survived the insults and morons accusing me of crass exploitation uh, considering the fascination I had with the subject, nothing could bother me. I genuinely enjoyed what I did, and even more, I enjoyed learning about forgotten cases or legends in each small southern town. If anything, I was bringing a spotlight to these tragedies. I was creating a legacy with which they'd be remembered forever. But there was one site, the holy grail for southern fried murder and all things Georgia true crime the Arnold Family Murder House. These were sickening, senseless murders, ones without any real rhyme or reason, but were no less terrifying. Back in the late 1960s, two brothers and their wives were murdered one by one in their little farmhouse on an ideal morning that turned into an intense bloodbath. Both Mike and Sean Arnold were living in the home they inherited from their deceased parents for the last decade. Mike's wife, Annie, and Sean's wife, Elizabeth, were just as hard-working and wholesome. In fact, the four of them worked hard to preserve the Arnold's farm's decent, albeit modest, farming business. While only in their early thirties, the couples put off raising children in favor of building their savings. 
There was a responsibility, a maturity in them quite uncommon for young couples in the small town they lived in. Above all, the Arnolds seemed like good people, honest folk from what I understood. Granted, I hadn't read much about them or seen many of their photos, all my information gleaned from what I'd read in brief blurbs about them in all the books and articles about the case. I'd say there was nothing flashy about the family or the small farmhouse they lived in, but that still didn't stop the Katz brothers from ambushing them. The horror started around 11 a.m. on a peaceful work day. Ted and Bruce Katz, John Passman and Benjamin Jones, all of whom were prison runaways from Atlanta, rode down Lackey Road, a dirt road right on the outskirts of town. They saw no houses, and nothing but cornfields and cotton fields, that is, until they stumbled upon the Arnold Farm. Running on empty, the convicts had no choice. At first, their luck looked to be perfect when they saw not only no other cars in the driveway, but also a gas pump parked right beside a pine tree. Out in the summer heat, the group got to work on stealing gas, but quickly realized the pump didn't work. And as they started to sweat, a panic set in once they saw a pickup hurtling towards them. Mike Arnold was on break. The convicts made up their minds right then and there. With nowhere to run and no escape vehicle, they watched Mike step out of the pickup. Mike confused by what they wanted. As Bruce Katz kept him occupied with lies, Ted withdrew his firearm and shot Mike right between the eyes. The oldest of the group at 32 years old, Ted was a natural-born leader. Ted was also the strongest and handsomest between him and Bruce, albeit both brothers were rather muscular, with some college education. Ted was also the one who pushed for the group to stay put. At Ted's command, the others hid Mike Arnold's body out back behind a barn. Then, they busted inside the home, eating the leftovers and drinking whatever beer was in the fridge. The convicts felt invincible at this point. They'd conquered a new home, a place to lie low for quite a while considering its sheer desolation. Only none of them knew how big the Arnold family was. A little over an hour later, Annie Arnold drove up to the scene. She parked her pickup right next to her husband's. Her curiosity and concern carried her right up to that front door. Bruce, John, and Benjamin all panicked, but Ted didn't. As Annie entered the trailer and confronted the killers, again, Ted's brother and comrades struggled against her anger. John and Benjamin, each of them only twenty-one, especially crumbled. Benjamin, a wiry kid with glasses and hair down to his shoulders. John, an African-American who, like Benjamin, was also a frail hippie. He and John were both serving similar light sentences for marijuana possession. Ted knew neither of them were going to step up. Moving like a stealthy assassin, Ted snuck up behind Annie and wrapped a stocking around her neck. He stared down into her horrified eyes as Annie squirmed. She didn't have a chance. None of her punches landed. Her gasping became more and more painful. During the trial, everyone involved said Ted toyed with her, extending the long, slow death as long as he could before suffocation finally settled in. The second death of the day only resulted in a more sickening confidence that spread throughout the gang. At this point, they didn't bother burying the bodies, but left Mike and Annie out to rot in the sun. Their corpses positioned side by side for an above-ground, conjoined grave. The group got more adventurous, so much so that they had no interest in leaving at this point. Ted's sadistic confidence drifted into Bruce, John, and Benjamin, helping them become a rabid wolf pack. Together... They were more than ready once Elizabeth and Sean came home that evening. The killers saved their most brutal murders for last. This time, Ted made the others do the dirty work. He held Sean in his arms as he made Bruce slit his throat. Ted made him do it slowly while a weeping Elizabeth watched. Restrained by John and Benjamin, Elizabeth stayed at the mercy of the killers. Elizabeth was forced to see her slaughtered husband hit the floor in a pool of blood. 
Supposedly, steam practically rose up off the blood due to that long, hot summer. Under Ted's sickening spell, the other men turned their attention toward Elizabeth. In that farmhouse of horror, they sexually assaulted her in the living room. These monsters did so, while she lied in Sean's blood, while Sean's dead body was a mere few feet away from them, and while her brother and sister-in-law's corpses rotted outside. Such a reprehensible act was one that a true crime junkie like myself had trouble reading. So much so, that when Ted finally had John shoot Elizabeth five times in the stomach and face, her death almost seemed like a mercy kill. Regardless of the carnage, Ted had the runaways stay at the Arnold farm for a few more days. They ignored the stifling sun and the way the weather made those bodies stink. But soon enough, their need for Florida and escape won out. They stole Sean's Ford truck and made their way out on the dirt road and then on to Highway 27. One of the creepiest parts about the case was what would have happened if the four murderers weren't so dumb. Later on that week, friends and family discovered the disturbing crime scene on the Arnold farm and a manhunt ensued. But I still couldn't help but think, what if they hadn't stuck with Sean's truck so long? After all, there were no witnesses. Maybe at some points when they were away from Ted's leadership, one of the younger convicts would have confessed. But when? However, some justice did prevail. Ted and the others were caught down in Tallahassee and later tried and convicted in Maycomb, Georgia. Ted deservedly got the death penalty. The sinister smile at his sentencing arguably the most iconic image from the entire case. Meanwhile, the other killers got life without parole. Over the decades, Ted was executed via lethal injection and John and Benjamin passed away in prison. But from what I understood, Bruce Katz is still alive and well in the Atlanta State Penitentiary. Bruce is well past 80 years old. To the state's collective relief, he will never get out. The Arnold murders were horrible. Hell, they still are after 50 years. But what I found most stunning was that these murders, one of the largest and scariest mass murders in Georgia history, occurred in Bainbridge my parents' hometown. These murders happened less than an hour away from me. I've been to Bainbridge many times, obviously. After my parents' divorce, my dad moved back there, so I made my fair share of visits to see him and play cards with our poker buddies. But ever since I'd begun Southern Fried Murder and delved more into the Arnold murders, I'd become more interested in learning more about this heinous crime particularly visiting the crime scene itself. To Bainbridge's credit, they never shied away from murders that were essentially a part of the community's DNA for over half a century. There was no way Bainbridge could ignore it, not with the amount of press and coverage such a crime creates. Rather than hide, Bainbridge chose to confront the horror head-on, and in a classy move I had nothing but respect for, Bainbridge had a glorious memorial for the Arnolds placed downtown, right in the heart of Willis Park. Amidst the gazebos and antique shops, there stood the large marble monument. The plaque on it was clear, an emotional tribute to the Arnold family both heartfelt and sincere. In a town like Bainbridge in 2021, much less in the 60s, such a tragedy sent shockwaves through every church, bank, and downtown festival this town had to offer. Never mind that everyone knew everybody, but hell, most of the Bainbridgeites were related to one another in one way or the other. My dad, one of the few not related to the Arnolds. The monument included many impressive engravings, a large tractor, and a heavenly sky amongst them. The memorial also mentioned how beloved and great the Arnold family was, and how they now resided in heaven. There was no mention of their killers or any explicit details of the family's deaths. This was strictly for the victims. Needless to say, I'd traveled to that spot several times. Only I'd never seen the actual crime scene. 
Whether it was through Bainbridge, censorship, or the Arnold family's understandable wishes, no actual Arnold House address was available online. This left me with few options for tracking down the spots, or even any information on whether or not the house was still standing. No one on the internet was eager to talk about it, and any local historian I reached out to never replied. Not even my father, arguably my biggest southern fried murder fan, could give me a clue. But granted, by the time the murders happened, he was off in Atlanta for college. So when I went to visit Bainbridge once more in June, I got to kill two birds with one stone, spend time with my dad, and further investigate the Arnold crime site. The time with Pop went great. We had yet another epic drunk poker game, followed by yet another drunken YouTube marathon of all things Beatles and Bruce Springsteen. But after all that, curiosity compelled me. Where the hell was the Arnold farmhouse? Certainly, all my usual resources offered me nothing. My latest lead from a mysterious other blog resulted in me ending up at a cornfield on the edge of town. Maybe not too far off base, but way too vague for me to take a selfie at, or better yet, publish an entry over. Again, I ended up back at the memorial, defeated. As much to my pleasant, albeit morbid surprise, I saw where the anniversary of the crime was that particular day. June 29th, 1967. The sun never felt more stifling, yet I still caught a chill. That night... I retreated to Gretna, Florida, where a poker room awaited me, one that was a mere twenty miles away from my dad's house. At eleven p.m., I'd already lost a couple hundred on the hold'em tables before I made my way over to Pi Go. Holding my fifth Miller light, I was either going to stay all night to sober up or phone a friend for an impromptu ride home, in which I'd pay them back. But screw it. I had to get smashed if it was going to be one of those loser nights. So I sat down amidst a small crew of one dealer, one banker, and one other player. With a meager hundred dollar stack in front of me, my skinny frame leaned over, my green eyes scanning the dealer's slick shuffle. The other player on my left seemed like the chill country type, a tall skinny guy in his fifties, his angular features not hurting his handsomeness. Is the table hot? I quipped to him. Smirking, the guy waved me off. Hell no. But you came at a good time. His southern drawl replied. Why's that? Can't get any worse. I've already lost five grand. Jesus, I thought internally. But it turned out the guy was right. Over the next hour, I proceeded to have more drinks, while the stranger and I must have cleared over $500 each. Sure, we were in the dim, sterile lighting of Gretna rather than the spotlight of Vegas. We were amidst a casual sea of regulars rather than the swarm of tourists and celebrities the bigger rooms offered, but I was having fun. This place felt like home. Similar to Bainbridge, the Grenza poker room offered familiar comfort. Everybody knew everybody, so much so that the current dealer, Amanda, was one of my Facebook friends and one who was well aware of my southern fried blog. At the table, Amanda and I got to talking about my latest plans, the latest scary sights on my never-ending road trip. When I mentioned how hard it was to find the Arnold family house, we shared a laugh until the other player looked right at me. His sharp glower instantly made my dimples disappear. You are really trying to find that house, huh? He remarked, an unusually cold detachment in his tone. I, yeah, I nervously stated. Even with what happened there, the man sneered. His meat-hook hands readjusted his FSU baseball cap. You got some kind of sick hobbies, huh? Put on the spot, I turns to Amanda. But she too was watching. Amanda stayed at a professional silence, quiet and a bit uneasy as she got to work on dealing the next hand. That old family got wiped out, you know, the man continued. Yes, sir, I said, my chill vibes and humor long gone. I motioned toward Amanda. 
Like I was telling her, I just check out places like that for a blog I write. I don't mean to disrespect, sir. Yeah, well... The man fixated his stone stare on me. Mike and Sean were my older brothers. My blood froze. Hell, I think I saw Amanda's tan skin turn a ghostly white. So yeah, it just bothers me when people take it lightly, the man said. He shrugged with a war-woven weakness. Not saying that you are, but just, just folks in general. I didn't say anything. I decided a funeral silence was the best response. Especially on the anniversary. The man added as he looked down at his cards. To my relief, there wasn't so much disdain as a somber streak in his mood. I looked down at my own Paigao hand. The destruction welcome, albeit not welcome enough, judging by the King High Paigao I'd just gotten. That's why this is the first time I come out here in a while, the man said, just to get my mind off it. Yes, sir, I faced him, but I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring it up like that. Nah, son, you're fine, the player said, his voice somewhat friendlier. But I tell you what, he turns toward me, I can take you out there if you really want to go. Struggling under his stoic spotlight, I hesitated. I mean, you really don't have to. I just... I mean, I'm sorry about your loss. I'm, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. You're not. The man quickly replied. He laid his seven cards on the table. I can tell you mean well. He gave me a weak smile. I think it'd only help preserve my family's legacy. Keeping his cool, he motioned over at Amanda, like you and her were saying. With a trembling hand, I laid my own cards down. I try to, as long as you're not one of those leeches making clickbait. The man's lingering smile reassured me. No, sir, I replied with a half grin. I wasn't lying either. I was a writer more so than a blogger, but definitely not a reporter. I usually explain what happened and provide some background on the tragedies. Yeah, he really does, Otis. Amanda vouched for me. Both Otis and I faced her, reaching for Otis's cards. Amanda nodded towards me. Henry's been coming here for a long time. His blogs are good. Thank you, Amanda. The southern fried murderer writer in me screamed with joy. I see, Otis replied. He stuck a hand out towards me. Otis Arnold. For a moment, the name, especially that last name, unsettled me. But then, I gladly completed the exchange. Henry, and thank you. Otis nodded at the seventh beer I held just as the waitress placed my eighth one on the poker caddy next to me. Ah, I figured you could use the ride anyway. Uh, fair enough, I said, as Amanda and I chuckled. Of course, Otis and I lost that hand. Amanda just got hot. Once Otis and I lost about a hundred each, we both knew our time was up. Lady Luck could be pretty temperamental. Before I left with Otis in his red F-150, I talked things over with Amanda. I knew Otis looked familiar, and I'd seen him around on the poker tables the past couple of years, but still I had to be sure he wasn't a nut. To the relief of both my anxiety and creative drive, Amanda did confirm Otis's last name was Arnold, and that he was a pretty good dude from what she knew. Obviously, I kept my cell phone on standby, Amanda's number and 911 at the ready should this midnight road trip turn into a horror film. The plan was for Otis to bring me back after visiting the house, then I could just crash on a card table for a few hours until I sobered up enough for the 20-minute ride back home. Before we left, Otis let me bring a few of the bud ices I had in my trunk, then we were off. 
Along the way, Otis reassured me it was a quick fifteen-minute drive. If anything, he was chattier now than he ever was on the felt. There was talk of Pai Gao strategies, but once we made our way from the paved highways to the back dirt roads of Bainbridge, Georgia, Otis became more introspective, much more reflective. Yeah, once it happened in 1967, we stayed in this city, but sure as hell stayed far away from that neighborhood. Otis rambled on, vague emotion entering his drawl. These back roads... Like a lethargic tour guide, he waved off at an abandoned, overgrown lot we passed by, a stray sight amidst the many cornfields and forests we were riding through. They bring too much pain, especially for Mama. Hanging onto my bud ice, I gazed out the windshield at what was a starless, soulless night. No full moon in sight. But regardless of the excitement, I felt an uncomfortable dread, one that I did my best to suppress. Otis kept the AC and the radio on low, but I wasn't going to complain. Not when he was the tour guide leading me to a site I'd been chasing for over a decade. Do you still come here? I asked. I looked over at Otis as we passed an abandoned trailer. You don't have to answer if it's too personal. I'm... Otis waves me off. Nah, just sometimes I come out here. He faced me. You can't ever forget, you know. Something like that, no one will forget. I nodded and took another swig. Otis deserved the moment of silence. But how old were you? I asked. I'm guessing you were much younger. I was only ten. He made a left turn. The dirt road took a dive. There was a bump that I felt, but Otis sure didn't even flinch. But I still remember. I was close to my brothers, Elizabeth and Annie. They were pretty girls, but real nice. They all were. He cracked a nostalgic grin. I was like a little brother to all of them. They'd take me to the county fair with them, the stores even the old White's Bridge on Halloween. That sounds fun, I chuckled. Yeah. Otis' smile disappeared as he returned to a somber state. When Mama and Daddy passed, I was only five, so Sean and Mike, they wanted to help raise me. They wanted me to be raised like my daddy raised them to be. Good, honest people to be the great man that they were. Now we were in a darker space. Woods loomed all around us, the towering trees hiding whatever lurked out there. The nocturnal creatures were so loud, the owls and whatever else doing those eerie howls. I could hear them over the popular country music channel Otis had on. But I was mostly living with my aunt and uncle at the time. Otis went on. He shook his head about the only thing he could do to stop the tears from forming. Even the darkness couldn't disguise his emotions. If I'd been there with Mike and Sean, I guess they'd have killed me too. I took another uneasy sip. Of course, in a way, they already did. Otis continued, his voice cracking, his hands gripping tighter to the steering wheel his glower stuck on the endless dirt road sprawling before us. They killed my entire family in one day. I lowered the can. Sympathy rather than the usual fascination with fear and horror shot through me. I'm sorry. All I could muster out in what was fast becoming an uncomfortable car ride. You know, there are some days... Otis told me, some nights where I just... In one quick swipe, he knocked off the tears he wouldn't dare show. I just think about ending it all. I think about just taking myself out and joining him. Hey, uh, don't... I started. No, it just... Otis waved a hand towards me. Just hear me out. 
His gaze drifted back to the road. It's not easy when you realize the cast boys, Passman and Jones, all those monsters won. They didn't even get the chair. A sickened sneer escaped Otis. They beat us. They took away everything I had in life. My family. They made us into freak shows. He threw a flustered hand up. All those reporters and morons obsessed with those murders. They never once cared about my family. Trying to intervene, I put the beer in the cup holder. But what about the memorial? Otis just scoffed. I mean, it's pretty nice. I struggled to reassure. Bainbridge made it really pretty. It's a nice tribute. His glare lingering, Otis stared on at the road. It ain't bringing them back. Caught between the nerves and an empathy I wasn't sure how to express, I felt myself recoiling further back in the seat. I turned my attention toward the windshield, my heart crushed by Otis's monologue, this outpouring of feeling he probably hadn't shared since that fatal, fateful day. I spent all my life trying to move on, Otis said. I blamed myself for not moving on at first, for not getting over it like everybody else. But how can I? He hit a momentary silence. It's nearly impossible. Up ahead, I saw the trees give way to a dirt driveway on the road. Security lights beckoned us like heavenly beams in this heart of darkness. This far out in isolated Georgia, I knew we were close. Otis hit his right blinker. They stay in my mind all the time. They're in my heart, in my soul. I just hope they're okay. He looked over at me as he slowed down. Wherever they are. Before I knew it, Otis had pulled into the driveway. His navigation was smooth, even if the constant bumps spilt some bud ice on the floor. To my relief, Otis waved the accident off. He was too focused, too intent. And soon, I saw why. A decrepit wooden post held a hanging metal sign. Black, hand-painted letters from yesteryear spelled out, Friendship United Methodist Church. The church itself stood tall and gothic. The long cross, standing at the very top, was a gargoyle glaring down upon Otis's F-150. Regardless of the church's age, the building itself wasn't dilapidated. Its stark white paint turned it into an eternal ghost, haunting the outskirts of Bainbridge, Georgia. Only no congregation was walking through those doors any time soon. Not when the windows were boarded up, and a large wooden bar barricaded the front door. I just didn't know if this was to keep trespassers from breaking in, or to keep bad vibes and spirits trapped inside. The signs, letters, and the entire church would have been impossible to see had it not been for those bright security lights glowing behind Friendship United Methodist. Surely the lights and their towering poles were there to further discourage teenagers from chasing scares. But they sure didn't phase Otis. He put the truck in park. In one quick glance, I saw trees surrounding us in what was a church clearing amidst this deep, vast forest. Once I hopped out, I saw stray cornfields scattered about across the street. Most of the crops appeared withered from the agonizing heat. The dirt road hadn't looked traveled in years, the tall grass around us having no tire marks, no cigarette butts, or empty beer bottles from those brave enough to come out to this spectral scene. No sounds were heard save from my own heartbeat. Otis and I were alone. So, is it out here? I asked Otis. I turned towards him, Otis taking his time getting out of the vehicle. Yeah. Otis pointed out the windshield, out toward the security lights. It's behind the church. It's abandoned, you know. Smiling, he took the key out of the ignition, for obvious reasons. Gotcha. 
I forced a smile, even if I wasn't drunk enough to revel and notice his dry sense of humor. His stilted sense of humor, that is. Growing restless and desperate for another beer, I fidgeted outside, still waiting for Otis in the hot night. It's pretty quiet, I commented. Oh, I know, Otis responded. It always is. He pointed me toward the church. Just go on and way over there. I gotta get some real quick. Following his command, I nodded. After all, why piss off a designated driver? I shut the door and staggered through the weeds and humidity. Stopping a few feet away from the church's brick front steps, I looked back at the truck. Otis was now making his way towards me. Relieved, I wiped sweat off my brow swooped bangs. How far away is it? Otis motioned me off towards a small pathway leading behind the church. Each of the stepping stones were more vivid the closer they got to the lights. Right over there, was all Otis said. Most people wouldn't have followed him. Maybe sober, I wouldn't have. But my curiosity won out. The whole point of this journey did. Southern fried murder and all my riding dreams compelled me. I followed Otis out toward the back. Beneath all the security lights lurked a graveyard. The church cemetery was full of grave markers and headstones, all of them ranging from pristine to decrepit. There were rows and rows of Friendship United's eternal residents. The graves extended from the overgrown lawn all the way to the forest in the very back. I only saw dead flowers. The tall pines full of Spanish moss were the most recent mourners. In the hot midnight air, I caught another chill. What the hell is that? I asked. I watched Otis lumber past me. Where the hell's the house? Keeping his cool, Otis waved me after him. It's behind the cemetery. He gave me a reassuring grin. What the hell did you expect behind a country cemetery? I couldn't argue when he was exactly right. So I caught up to him, letting Otis lead us out closer toward the forest. The security lights illuminated the increasing decay of each passing grave marker, and the lights started to fade the closer we got to the forest and its valley of mystery. It's right behind here in these woods, Otis added. Soon, we got well out of eye shot of the lights, but I still recognized graves on the edge of the cemetery. Border graves that had been long forgotten, long been neglected. And it was right here that Otis came to a sudden stop. Otis? I said nervously. I watched Otis just stand there. His stare was pointed straight down, his hands right at his sides. Uh, where's the house? I reached out and grabbed his arm. Otis turned and faced me. It's right here, he yelled, a fire flowing in his veins. Otis pointed straight at the closest grave, the one right in front of us. There's the house, Henry. I followed his gaze. The large grave marker was pretty from what I could tell. There were angel engravings, pretty flower imagery, and a large state of Georgia carving that stood out amongst the collection of cracks and dirt covering the marble. This far out, though, the lighting was sparse, but the marker had several names that were all too clear. Their last name especially. Arnold. The chills I felt earlier intensified. I felt myself shake even though I was still sweating. I bet you didn't even know where it was. I heard Otis hurl at me. And he was right. I didn't know Annie, Mike, Elizabeth, and Sean shared the same plots, much less know where their graves even were. I'd never come out here before. I'd never bothered researching the family's final resting place. This moment brought clarity. A sobering reality settled in. I felt tears form. All the times I spent studying the Katz brothers and seeing their pictures flickered through my mind 
and through the sad self-introspection, I realized I wasn't sure just what the Arnold family looked like. Hell, I wasn't even sure what color their hair was, what their smiles looked like, how attractive they were. I had no idea. None of y'all cared about this part, I heard Otis say, his voice weighed down by grief. Finally, I forced myself to face up. Weeping, Otis angrily waved me towards the pitiful grave. You all know about the murders, but not this, he said, bitterness the only thing holding up his yell. You want the murders? Again and again, he waved at the Arnold grave for emphatic, emotional emphasis. But he didn't care about them. I know y'all don't. I'm sorry, I said. The sad sights made me struggle. My body just kept trembling. Otis didn't respond to me. Instead, he looked down at the marker as he took a few steps closer to it. His steps soft and weak. Sobbing, I ran a hand through my hair. I just... I didn't know. Otis still didn't reply. He stared straight on at the grave, confronting a tragic past that haunted him to this very day. I didn't know they were out here, I said. I shook my head, giving Otis all the space he needed. I'm sorry. I know the whole thing's just... terrible. It's terrible. The silent Otis held his head up and gazed off at the forest. He looked lost in thought, a most eerie contemplation. I started to approach him. Hey, I started. Before I could get any further, Otis reached towards his waistband and pulled out a firearm. I came to an uneasy stop. The pistol froze me dead in my tracks. Fear jolted my nerves. It's too much, Otis said, his voice almost a whisper amidst such weeping. He held the pistol tightly as he returned his focus back to the grave. I can't do it anymore. Now I knew Otis never intended to take me to the house or whatever that fifty-year-old crime scene had become. He had this plan all along, this compulsion, a final car ride that was both poetic and violent. Otis started to put the pistol to his temple while his eyes remained on the marker. I'm sorry, y'all, he said to his family. Wait, I cried, snapping out of my scared paralysis. I ran straight towards Otis. I stumbled through the grass. The moment the gun touched Otis's flesh, more fright struck me. The moment his finger touched the trigger, my panic intensified. But I got there just in time. I lunged out and tackled Otis. My hand pushed his arm back just as a gunshot roared through the night. Together, we hit the ground. Both of us were in tears. Both of us were alive. I turned to see Otis's gun lying on top of the Arnold tombstone, the pistol well out of reach. Deep down, I was just glad it was the weapon rather than Otis himself being added to the grave. Mike, Sean, I heard his voice sob. I'm sorry. I looked down at Otis. Like a scared child, he stayed cowered in the cemetery's high grass, his eyes shut, his body shivering. The teardrops kept rolling down. I could go on, Otis said, carrying on his conversation with ghosts. I miss y'all. Christ, I miss y'all. Unsure what to do, I squeezed Otis's shoulder. Amidst all the anxiety and adrenaline, I offered a supportive touch. I tried, anyway. It's all right, I said. Otis opened his eyes. They know you love them, man, I said to Otis, somehow keeping my voice calm, or at least sounding calm. They know. Leaning up, 
Otis then wrapped an arm around me. I hugged him back. There was nothing romantic, nothing familial. The embrace was only brought about by that necessary human component in times like these. Companionship. I reassured Otis as best I could. Soon, we both stopped crying. Otis went on to tell me more about his brothers and their wives. I was a willing audience, my questions actually driven by an interest in the victims rather than an interest in the evil. During this banter and budding friendship, I knew I'd gotten my newest entry for Southern Fried Murder, an account on the incredible lives of the Arnolds, how nice they were, how they worked hard to maintain their Bainbridge business, and how much the Arnolds genuinely cared about family. I knew I had a new series on my hands as well, a spotlight for other victims and a chance to honor their legacies beyond indulging in their autopsy reports. Thanks, Henry. Otis would go on to tell me, as we held on to one another, his southern accent back to full strength. No, I replied. Thank you. Otis took me back to Gretna around 2 a.m., but that was far from the last time I saw him. After all, I could always use a designated driver for the card room, and my dad and I could always use another player for those house games. How will I die? If I stay put, there will be no pain. I will finish typing this out and go into the kitchen to fix one last gin and tonic. I'll pop one last pill of Z into my mouth, wash it down with a cocktail, and have a seat as the warmth rushes over me. I won't see them coming, and I won't know how they do it. But it will happen mercifully quickly, like flipping a light switch. And then there will be nothing. But if I run, it will take much longer and the pain will grow so large that it will crawl through the calming embrace of the Z and fill my last moments alive with the sounds of my own anguished screams. The Miracle Rock The rock that fell one evening from outer space and landed in Andre Phillips' backyard didn't look particularly unusual, but it cured the man of cancer. Stricken with stage four lung cancer, Andre had been sitting on his back porch, drinking a beer against his oncologist's advice, staring up at the sky, pondering his own death, when the object dropped down into the grass a few yards away from him. Right away, I felt it in my head, he later reported. Felt it all over, like I'd been purified, mind, body, and soul. A second chance, a gift from God. Andre bought a special display case for the meteorites that had saved his life, and kept it in his bedroom to pray beside every night. However, the Miracle Rock did not stay there for long, as a week after it landed in Andre's yard, it went missing, along with Andre himself. Before his disappearance, Andre had contacted a number of new outlets with the story of his miraculous recovery. Only one reporter had taken him seriously and not for very long. When she followed up with doctors who had treated Andre, they all denied that anything out of the ordinary had happened. They insisted that the cancer had not been that far advanced, which was a lie, and that, while rare, lung cancer was sometimes able to be cured, if caught early enough. The reporter, though not very experienced, got the sense that the doctors weren't telling her the truth, and further, that they wanted to tell the truth, but something was preventing them. Still, there was nothing she could do, and her producer killed the story the day before Andre went missing. And so the public never heard the story of Andre Phillips and his miracle rock, and that was very much by design. Strange Elements The invitation was passed on through my former mentor, an old and distinguished professor. They had asked him for the best chemist he knew, and, much to my embarrassment when he told me, he had named me. Who they were wasn't entirely clear to him, 
nor was the exact nature of the project. But the man he had spoken to, who called himself the director of the project, had seemed deeply knowledgeable and with easy access to deep resources. To demonstrate his resourcefulness, the director had apparently placed a tidy sum of money in my bank account without my knowledge. The money's yours either way, Sally, said my mentor over the phone. He says, There's a lot more where that came from, if you accept. And beyond that, a scientific mystery unlike the world has ever known, plus a state-of-the-art lab to work through in it. Sounds pretty intriguing if you ask me. If I were fifteen years younger, I'd be all over it myself. I was, indeed, intrigued, and so agreed to travel to Maine, where the research was to be conducted. The facility where I would end up living and working for the next three months was located in Brooks, Maine. A little township only a few miles off bustling the coast. But those few miles made all the difference between some semblance of civilization and the deep wilderness. After a drive down a long dirt road cut narrowly through a forest, I arrived there in my rental car. It lived up to all the clichés of a top-secret research facility. There was a guard station in front of a gate with barbed wire on top. Beyond that, the building itself, looking cold and lifeless, juxtaposed before the rolling, lush green hills. The guard there was conspicuously armed. I handed him my ID and looked up into the video camera that was glaring down at me. He let me pass, and I drove on to the parking lot. There, a second armed man escorted me to the entrance of the building. I waited while he entered a code into the keypad, swiped his access card, and finally proffered his eye for a retinal scan. When all of that was done, the door clicked open, and we went inside and down a sterile hallway to a conference room. Wait in there, the man instructed, before clacking his way back through the hallway. I looked in through the open door to see a dozen eyes peering at me, and stepped inside. We don't know what it is any more than you do, offered an attractive-looking man leaning back in his office chair, in case you were wondering. He put me at ease, somehow. I'm Sally Matthews, I announced. Chemist. Charlie Bohr, said the man. He smiled warmly. No relation to Niles, except I'm a physicist with a special interest in quantum mechanics. Go figure. He says the exact same thing to every person who walks in the door, observed a woman sitting on the other side of the table. Are you saying that I'm a bore? Asked Charlie, raising his eyebrow. I have only myself to blame for that, said the woman, trying to suppress a grin. Anyway, Denise Chang. I study the stars. Nice to meet you, Sally. Stop me if you've heard this one said Charlie. A chemist, a physicist, and an astronomer walk into a secret research facility, along with a geologist, an oncologist, and a... Uh, oh, uh, sorry, uh, Miles. I remember your name, but I'm drawing a blank on your field of interest. Psychology, said the man named Miles. Something about him weirded me out the moment I noticed him. Maybe because I was already so tense and he had an icy demeanor, in stark contrast to Charlie's cheerful gregariousness. Uh, right, said Charlie. A psychologist, of course. What project doesn't have a geologist and a psychologist working side by side? Those rocks, you know, lots of other issues to work through. Miles looked down at his fingernails, and then up to an empty corner of the ceiling. The geologist opened his mouth to introduce himself but was cut off when another man entered the room, carrying a stack of hazmat suits. He set the suits on the conference table, said, Put these on, and left. I never did find out the geologist's name, or the oncologist's. They were both gone within a week, and I never saw them again, either in the physical world or what we came to call Z-world. Perhaps I'll see them again soon in the afterlife.
After we had suited up, somebody rolled a cart into the room. There was a small rock on the cart. It's a meteorite, said Denise, her voice sounding sharp and clear despite the coverings around her head and mine. I noticed the sound was coming in high definition from all around. I was suddenly aware of every little hum in the room and could pinpoint its precise location. The meteorite has special properties, I realized. Right now, it's somehow heightening my senses. They want us to figure out how that is, and see if they can harness that power to their own end. This meteorite has special properties, said the man who had wheeled the cart in. It has cured a man of stage 4 lung cancer. It's your job to figure out what it is, how it does that, and what else it's capable of. Impossible, muttered the oncologist. I remember thinking, that guy's not going to last long. Charlie, Denise, and I ended up getting along splendidly. We each did our work separately, but would get together later to talk about it. It was hard to not be excited. It was unlike anything any of us had ever encountered. It did not take long for me to grasp this. On my first day of work, I ran an X-ray fluorescence XRF analysis on a sample of the meteorite in order to determine which chemical elements it consisted of. On the first run, it was apparent that there was an abundance of nickel and iron in the sample, as Denise had told me to expect. But there was also two sets of energy peaks that didn't quite correspond to any known elements. One was close to the K line of thulium, and the other was close to the L line of arsenic, but not quite close enough. It was a baffling result, especially since, as the director had promised, the equipment was a state of the art. I ran a second test on the same sample, lowering the setting of the generator and increasing the low-end resolution. The same two unidentified sets of peaks were there, but now nickel and iron were gone from the picture. In their place was titanium and zinc. It was as if, when I wasn't looking, the elements had suddenly changed into something else. The same thing happened on the third analysis, and on three more tests using a different sample. Finally. I used a different portable machine on a third sample, and it too returned the same results. The two sets of peaks indicated an unknown element remained, while the other elements kept shifting their fundamental natures. After pursuing the possibility that I was looking at a completely novel chemical element, I realized that the energy peaks I was looking at would have to be coming from outer shell movements, and that inner shell movements were literally off the charts. This would make the mystery element far heavier than any known element, which meant that it should have decayed in an instant, but it didn't. This novel element, if it really existed, would violate many of our most fundamental assumptions about physical science, and I found myself increasingly certain, much to my own surprise, that it did, in fact, exist, and had come to Earth from outer space. Element Z. For their part, Denise and Charlie were making progress in the same direction. That is to say, they were gathering evidence that we were dealing with something that we had never encountered before, in a way that cuts to the marrow of our respective fields. Denise, for example, had been able to trace the meteorite back to the point where it had appeared seemingly out of nowhere. When I asked if that was just because it was small enough to evade satellite sensors, she assured me that we weren't talking about a point in space at the edge of the galaxy, or even just outside of Mars. It was only a few thousand miles outside of Earth's atmosphere. It had just appeared there, and data from satellites were cross-checked and all told the same story. At the same time, she said, there was every indication that the meteorite had come from very far away, and had likely been created and propelled through space by a massive event that had occurred a very long time ago. This led to speculation on our parts about wormholes or faster-than-light speed travel. Somehow, things that we had never given thought to in a long time, and maybe never gave serious thought to, became the frequent subjects of conversation and speculation. One day, while we were sitting at a cafeteria table eating bland food, 
Charlie summoned up his thoughts like this. Reality would rather blow itself up than change. And when it does change, it blows itself up beforehand anyway. I guess as a sort of protest. But that's not what's happening here. You got protons hopping from bed to bed like swingers on a Saturday night. Usually when that happens, something goes boom. And that atom of yours, Sally? Same deal. That thing should be as unstable as a swinger on a Sunday morning after a coke binge, but it's not. What are you calling it anyway? The Atom? I had, in fact, thought of a name. Z, I said. I'm a periodic table kind of girl, and since we don't know the number, I've been calling it by the stand-in for the atomic number Z. That's very charming, said a flat voice from behind me. I turned and saw that it was Miles, the psychologist. Element Z. I rather like that. After speaking, Miles walked off, disappearing into the hallway. Jesus, that guy gives me the creeps, said Denise, echoing my thoughts exactly. What's he even doing here? I found out a partial answer to Denise's question the following day, when I received a message on the internal server instructing me to report to Miles' office at four o'clock that afternoon. It was the first of what would be mandatory bi-weekly sessions with Miles. I would sit there for an hour, my skin crawling almost the entire time while he probed me with questions. For the most part, they were fairly straightforward about how I was feeling on a day-to-day -day basis, and my discomfort was mainly due to Miles himself, who I came to think of as somehow reptilian. But he would also always throw in a few questions that chilled me directly. Sally, if it meant saving many lives and progressing the common goals of humanity, do you think you have it in you to slit Charles's throat in the night while he slept? Or... Suppose Denise grew jealous of you in some way, and attacked you from behind with a heavy object. Would you be able to neutralize her? I don't mean physically. I mean, would you have the psychic fortitude to kill somebody who meant to kill you? Or, tell me about your sexual fantasies, Sally. Whom do they involve? Are you sexually attracted to anyone in this facility? Those questions made me deeply uncomfortable, but I wasn't sure what to do about them, so I always gave non-committal answers and tried to change the subject. There was no HR department to complain to. By then, it was just the four of us. Charlie, Denise, Miles, and me. Living there, together. There was a small kitchen staff and a custodial staff, and, of course, the armed guards, who prowled the halls at all times. Somehow, I felt that they weren't there to help me. And then there was the director, wherever and whoever he was. But the director was the one who insisted that we all have sessions with Miles twice a week. I got the sense that complaining to him via the internal server would get me nowhere, except maybe off the project, which was the last thing that I wanted. As high as God. I came under mounting pressure to produce results. That was the word that the director used in his communications with me, and it meant that he wanted me to get Element Z into a form where one of the four of us researchers could ingest it. He insisted that it be one of us, since we were the only ones who knew the details surrounding the project. This is far outside the scope of the FDA, Sally, he wrote one day. To tell the truth, that wasn't the part that bothered me. I was ready to go all the way with my exploration, including swallowing a pill of Z, without knowing what exactly it was, without having the faintest idea about what it was. I also had an almost mystical confidence that such a pill uh, by itself would do no harm. After all, I had experienced some of its effects simply by being near it already, and had heard the story of how it had cured a man of cancer. 
The difficult part was that I couldn't physically separate element Z out from the other elements, which were often toxic to people, and could be lethal in the doses required to carry with them even a trace amount of Z. I couldn't separate out the elements from each other, because I never knew which elements I was supposed to separate. They were in constant flux, the atoms always transmuting. It was an intractable problem, until Charlie had a breakthrough one day. He laid it out over the lunch table. You ladies know what an interference pattern is? When two or more waves cross each other's path and so create a new pattern of peaks and troughs? Sure, said Denise, popping a tater tot into her mouth. What about it? Well, I took the liberty of charting out some of Sally's data this morning, and, best I can tell, Element Z is emitting a constant series of interfering energy waves that is somehow responsible for which other element turns up at the time of measurement. Using the wave function, one can calculate the probability that any given sample of a meteorite will contain, say, arsenic and lead, at any given time. Thought that might be useful to work out, no? I wanted to kiss him. I can work with that, I said. And I did. Now that I had a set of probabilities to work with, I was able to devise a method of separating the chemical elements from one another that, while dooms to fail 99 times out of 100, would strike gold on that 100th time. Or, rather, would strike element Z. By the end of the week, I had a pile of the stuff, in powder form, 100% free of impurities. From there, I discovered that the substance was soluble in water. I also knew, according to Charlie's chart, that the lighter elements, like carbon and oxygen, were outside of element Z's wave function, which meant that I was able to safely combine it with sugar. And so, I was able to easily create a pill that contained only a single nanogram of element Z. It was decided, by the director, that we would hold an impromptu drug trial in Miles's office. I protested to no effect, and so the four of us gathered together early one morning to draw straws. The short straw would take the pill. I felt emotion in both directions. My curiosity was at a fever pitch, and I wanted to be the first person to test the drug, but I also felt a deep fear gnawing at my stomach the fear of being launched so completely into the unknown. Miles wasn't helping ease my discomfort. He sat icily behind his desk and showed no emotion. Behind him was a video camera set up on a tripod. I felt, somehow, like the camera had more humanity in it than Miles did. I wished that he would leave the project altogether. We drew straws, and Charlie came up short. Hell yeah, baby, he said. He immediately plucked the pill up from Miles' desk, popped it into his mouth, and swallowed it with a pull from his water bottle. Blast off. Miles pushed a button on the video camera, and then we waited. I'm higher than a Georgia pine, said Charlie ten minutes later, grinning. Oh, this feels so good. Like ecstasy, MDMA, but like times a hundred. You're experiencing intense feelings of well-being, asked Miles, scribbling in his notebook. Charlie looked at Miles with pupils that nearly crowded out his irises entirely. Well, I was, dude, until you started talking. Why don't you give me a few minutes alone with the ladies, huh, bud? He laughed. No, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. It's sort of, man, I'm horny. Write that down, Miles. The subject's horny as hell. I had to admit to myself that I was feeling rather heated, too. It was like Charlie was emitting a raw, animalistic sexuality. I wished that I had the proper equipment to measure his hormone levels. In fact, I wished that I had any equipment to measure anything. As far as trials went, it was shoddy work, but I reminded myself there would be more trials. 
Wait a second, said Charlie. Then I heard him inside my head. Sally, can you hear me? Don't answer out loud. Listen, I'm here. I promise I won't look at anything I'm not supposed to. But I want you to know that I can see inside of your mind. I can enter it like a room and look around. And don't say anything. I can't get inside of Miles' head for some reason, and I don't want him to know about this. Not yet, anyway. Not until you and I can talk about it with Denise. I'm there inside of her mind, too. I'm everywhere. Sally, I'm as high as God. The next day, I made a batch of pills, and Charlie, Denise, and I gathered together in my room after work to take them. My hands shook as I brought the pill to my mouth. I knew that it would feel wonderful, but I was also terrified of the prospect of having an experience so far outside of anything I had ever known. I began to feel the effects ten minutes after taking the pill. A rush of warmth coursed through me along with a feeling that everything was exactly how it was supposed to be, and that it was all so beautiful. My chest swelled with contentment. A restless energy took over my body, but I also had the sense that I could sit still and do absolutely nothing and be completely happy. This is amazing, said Denise, pacing around the room. Absolutely amazing. Just you wait said Charlie, smiling. He was so beautiful. So was Denise. There it is, said Charlie, inside my mind. I was there, in his, too. And Denise was there with us both. We were psychically entangled. And then, before very long, we all took each other's hands and settled down on my bed to become physically entangled. We explored each other all night, in pure bliss, body and mind. Each caress felt deep in our souls, each moan sounding lovelier and more nuanced than a Mozart symphony. After that, there was no going back. In the morning, there was no physical hangover. There was only a sense of loss, in returning to our ordinary senses. And so, we each took another pill before heading off to go about our work. On Z, everything was better, including our work. I hardly needed to use the high-tech equipment in the lab anymore. I could see the energy waves emanating from the meteorite samples with my own eyes. When I was close enough to the samples, I could feel what it was like to be hurtling through space at unknown speeds. I saw glimpses of deep space, far beyond the edges of our galaxy, and perhaps near the very edge of the universe, or beyond. It was a strange place, an endless void spotted with occasional pockets of intense energy, twisting around on itself, coming into existence, becoming existence itself. We took Z every day. We would go to work, then meet in the cafeteria at lunch, where we sat silently eating, communicating telepathically. Even the drab food tasted wonderful, and we savored every bite. Then, back to work, and finally, we would meet in somebody's room to make love all night. A few days into it, we were at the lunch table, discussing Charlie's progress on faster-than-light-speed travel, when Denise interrupted the conversation. Creep alert, she said. I could feel it too. A cold presence in the hallway, getting closer. Miles. He was like a dark spot in our joy. Every other person, down to the security guards carrying their loaded weapons, was beautiful to us. Their insecurities, their desires, their kindness and cruelties. They were all evident to us, like an open book, and we came to view them all as perfect creatures, 
exactly as they were supposed to be. But Miles was something else. He was closed to us, and we trusted him less than ever before. I would like to try a pill, Sally, said Miles, now standing behind me. I know that you three have been taking it, and are on it right now. I'd like to try it for myself. The director has requested my first-hand account of it as well. No, no way can we let him have this, said Denise. Can you cook up some MDMA and give him that? He won't know the difference. I'll have to make one for you, I said. After lunch, okay? Excellent, said Miles. Bring it by my office, if you would be so kind. After all, it's Tuesday, and you'll be coming by anyway, right? I'll see you at four o'clock, I said. Just go away, Miles, said Denise. You're a frightening thing. Very well, said Miles, stalking off towards the hallway. Later that day, I brought Miles an MDMA pill that I had produced, and sat down for my interview. I was still a little high on Z, and it was my first interview in that state. Thank you, Sally, said Miles, putting the pill in a drawer. Let's begin. If I told you that Charlie and Denise weren't really your friends, would you believe me? No. I said, without hesitation. I wouldn't. They're my friends. And if they tried to kill you, would you still consider them friends? They would never try to kill me. I understand, but that doesn't answer my question. Why would they try to kill me, though? That matters. Sometimes killing somebody is a mercy. Interesting, said Miles, scribbling in his notebook. Very well. So if they had good reason to kill you, you would find that acceptable. I shrugged. I don't know, Miles. I don't know what to tell you. You've done well, Sally. Thank you. That's it for today? That's it. I left the room hastily, feeling queasy. Something about that meeting, and Miles in general, cut through all of the warm feelings of Z, and left me in a state of panic. I went straight back to my room and locked the door. I didn't want to see anybody. I just wanted to feel good again. So I took two more pills of Z. I felt Charlie and Denise approaching my room. I didn't want to see them, and I realized that I could hide from them. I could cloak my mind so they wouldn't know where I was. And in this state, I could still look in their minds. Can you feel her? Charlie asked Denise. No, said Denise. She's not in her room. God, I wonder what happened. Do you think Miles did something to her? She's probably in her lab working, said Charlie. I guess she wants to be alone right now. We should respect that. Come on, let's you and I go back to my room. I felt their presence receding down the hallway. An hour or so later, I felt their presence again. Can you feel her? Charlie asked Denise. That's when I realized that Z could show me the future. The Director Five pills, I soon discovered, were too much to take at once. The body would shut down before the Z could show the mind what it had in store. The human mind was not equipped to glimpse such mysteries, and to protect itself, the body convulsed and shut the minds down too. That's how Charlie and Denise found me, with my eyes open wide, staring at the lab ceiling in the depths of a seizure. 
After I had recovered, I decided to tell them what I had experienced. Two pills at once showed me the future. Three pills at once let me leave my body and travel the corridors of the facility. And four pills brought me to Z-World. In Z-World, it was as if I were floating above a three-dimensional game board. I could travel down to different places at different times, the past, the present, or future, and observe everything going on there. I could enter people's minds if I wanted, and see the hidden energy waves all around us, like a shimmering rainbow. My range of travel was limited. I could go further back in time than I could go forward, and I could only go to places within a few hundred miles radius. But it was incredible. Unheard of power. My friends admonished me for so recklessly putting myself in such danger without telling them, but admitted that they wanted to enter Z-World for themselves. Not right now, though, said Denise. You have to rest up, Sally. You look like you're on death's door. Charlie and Denise stayed with me the rest of that day, and all of the next. I had planned on abstaining from Z, but the withdrawal was too intense. Again, it wasn't a physical withdrawal, but rather a feeling as if the world had suddenly closed up, and you were no longer a part of it. It was like a living death. And so, I was permitted a half a pill, just to regain equilibrium. We decided to drop four pills each that weekend. It was difficult to get through the week. Even taking one whole pill didn't quite do it for me anymore. Sure, it felt good, but nothing could compare to that feeling of near omniscience. Meanwhile, while we were waiting, we spent our lunch breaks and after hours talking about something we'd never talked about before. What exactly we were doing there, and what exactly were the implications of unlocking the power of Z. It cures, it cures cancer, cancer, I said one day, to get the conversation going. It grants the power of telepathy, and lets you see the future. What's going to happen with these powers? Are they going to be released to the public, for free? Would they be a good thing or not? And if they're not going to be released to the public, then who will hold them, and to what end? We need to find out who the director is said Denise in response. Is he a part of the government? The military? Is he a venture capitalist? If we can find out who the director is, that will answer a lot of our questions. Something tells me we're not going to like that answer, said Charlie. Think about it. The first time we heard about this thing, and the fact that it could cure cancer, was right here. What about the guy whose cancer was cured? How come he didn't tell the story to everybody he knew? How come it wasn't plastered all over the nightly news? Because somebody wanted to suppress the story. Because somebody was able to suppress the story. By the time the weekend came around, we had a plan. The sensation of entering Z-World was terrifying if you weren't expecting it, and even if you were. You went from feeling every nerve in your body light up with pleasure to feeling yourself being pulled away from yourself. It was like your brain was being pulled apart into two aspects. The physical one, that regulated body functions, and the extra-physical one, where consciousness lived. You were split in two, and felt yourself lifting up, even as you knew that you were sitting still. The three of us met in the clouds, high above the research facility, looking down on the sprawling hills of Brooklyn, Maine. The plan was to travel back to the place and time where the meteorite had first landed, of which information Denise knew well. We reasoned that if we followed news of the meteorite's landing, we would eventually run into the director. Focus, I said. Repeat the coordinates and the time over and over again, together. We did this, 
and soon found ourselves on a porch next to a man who was drinking a beer and staring up at the sky. He was thinking about all of the mistakes he'd made in his life, and all of the people he'd hurt, and how much he wished he could make it all right. About how it was impossible to do that, but there was time enough to maybe make a few things right. That was all he wanted. The meteorite fell, and we sensed the change in him right away. We knew what it was, but he didn't. We stayed with him that night, and followed him to the hospital the next day. There, we split off. I went back with Andre Phillips to his home while Denise and Charlie stayed at the hospital and traced the news as it spread among doctors. The whole time I was with him, I could feel the utter joy pouring out of Andre. He truly did view his cure as a second chance at life, and made good on his plans to make amends wherever he could. He was a beautiful soul, and a lonely one and I ached for him the entire week I followed him. On the last night of Andre's life, Charlie and Denise appeared next to me in Andre's room. It's, it's Miles, Miles, said Charlie. Miles is the director. He's part of a secret military branch involved in developing mind control techniques, among other things. And he's here, now. We watched. Helpless to change anything, as Miles crept into Andre's room and smothered the man with a pillow. Power Trip When we came back to our bodies, Miles was sitting there, in my room, swirling a glass of scotch around. I tried, as I had many times, to penetrate Miles's mind, and I was met only with a cold spot. That was when I realized. That's right, Sally. I've been on Z since the day you figured out how to make it ingestible. He smiled and took a sip of scotch. You could all be dead, you know. It would have been very easy at any time. Truly, I didn't need anything more from you. I have Z. That's quite enough. So, why are we still alive, then? Asked Charlie. Well, despite what you think, I'm not a monster. What the three of you managed to achieve is remarkable. I'm not one to steal the fruits of someone's labor without due compensation. So here's the offer. If you stay here and see if you can extract anything else you saw from this substance, then you will have a lifetime supply of Z. Regardless of if you manage to make further discoveries or not. But you must never tell anyone about anything remotely related to Z. That's the offer. And if we refuse? Asked Denise. What do you think? Said Miles. He took another sip of scotch. What are we going to do with it? I asked. Will you release it to the world? Nothing too dramatic. I will serve United States interests. And no, the world will never know it exists. It can cure cancer, I said. Surely that's in the interest of the United States. We can't have the public going around reading each other's minds, Sally. We can't have people knowing that's possible. Maybe there's a way to separate out the effects, said Denise. Maybe we can cure cancer without the mind reading. Then stay and work on that, said Miles. I didn't need to be a mind reader to know what Miles was thinking. But even if we could do that, you'd never allow it into the world. Because somebody could take the cancer drug and work from there to produce a mind-reading drug. Miles scowled. It was the first time I had seen any trace of emotion on his face. It's your choice. Stay here and get high and fornicate each other all day. Or die. 
His face relaxed back into a default icy posture, and he stood up. Discuss it amongst yourselves if you must. Meanwhile, I have other business to attend to. Miles left, but the tension remained heavy in the room. Denise and Charlie had closed their minds off from me. Sally, said Charlie, there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do about it. Just stay with us. We can have a lot of fun. You're on a power trip, Sally, said Denise. You want to save the world, but can you even be sure that the world would be better off if there was widespread access to Z? Haven't we talked about this? We just don't know what would happen. I blocked off my own mind. I suppose you're right, I said. Yes, I'll stay, but that doesn't mean I'm happy about it. I... I need a little time alone, to process it all, okay? Just a day or two alone in my room to make peace. Tell Miles, okay? I tell him I'm on board, but need some time off. Charlie took my hand. I understand. I don't feel great about it either. But it's the right call. The only call. Then they left me alone to hatch my escape plan. How I will die. I had to train myself to act without thinking. It was not easy. I practiced in front of the bathroom mirror by, say, clipping my fingernails while talking about something else. I picked out my clothes without thinking about them and got dressed that way too. By the end of the second day, I was not at all certain that I had actually achieved my ends, but I knew that my time had run out. I had to open my mind back up, or the others would grow suspicious. During the day, I squirreled away pills of Z in my lab coat. I would eat lunch with Charlie and Denise, as usual, and then meet up with them after work for our usual erotic routine. They were thrilled that I had apparently accepted my life together with them. The escape itself was trivially easy. One night, I waited until Denise and Charlie had collapsed from exhaustion and then crept out into the hallway. There were three guards on duty inside the building, and I knew where each one was and what they were thinking. I waited until one of them was isolated and then snuck up behind him and injected him with a 5 nanogram solution of Z, enough to put him out of commission. I carefully dragged his body to the entrance. I knew the code well enough, and after swiping his access card, I only had to lift his hand up and point his wide open eyes at the retinal scanner. I knew from floating above it that there was a gap in the fence surrounding the facility. It led out into the forest, where I would have to make a long journey through the hills. As soon as I crawled out into that gap and into the dark night, I was struck by two certainties. First, that I was free, and second, that I would soon be dead. In every future I have seen, I am murdered. There is no escaping it. This course I've been on now is the one where I live the longest. I also know that this is the only channel through which I can tell the world about Z. I won't be alive to know if you'll believe me, or if you'll be able to do anything about it. I only know that any channel, other than telling the public directly, is closed off by Miles' far-reaching stranglehold. My mentor, the one who initially reached out to me about the project, has gone missing. In an hour, I will be dead. How exactly I die is my choice. After I finish typing this and sending it out, I can go into the kitchen of this little cottage and mix myself a gin and tonic. I will pop one more pill of Z and feel the warmth rush over me. 
They'll come in, somehow, and kill me quickly. My guess is that it will be a bullet to the back of my head. Or I can run. If I do that, a dark blue RAV4 will ram into the side of my little Civic. The impact of the crash will crack several of my ribs and send shattered glass flying against my face. I will play dead. Charlie will exit the RAV4 and open the door to douse my corpse with gasoline. I will stab him in the guts with a kitchen knife. He won't see it coming, because in his vision of the future, I'm already dead from the crash. He'll stagger back, and I'll leap out of the car, through the pain, and grasp Denise around the neck. I'll strangle her as hard as I can, but before I can kill her, Charlie will have pulled the knife from his stomach and will bring it down into my back again and again. I will roll off of Denise and look up at them, unable to stop myself from screaming in pain as blood pours out of my mouth. My last moments of life will be filled with pain and anguish unlike I've ever felt. But before I die, I will look into the eyes of my former friends and I will see misery there. Guilt and doubt and despair. They will have to face up to what they've become. I will know. And then it will all go dark for me. The Civic is gassed up and ready to go. When the realtor said that this Victorian listing had history, I didn't doubt her for a second. But when I found an old wooden box nestled behind the chimney, it was a bizarre feeling, sorting through these yellowing postcards and letters from decades ago, centuries even. The archaic passage and dates were fascinating to me. Surely this is a gold mine for stamp collectors, I thought. After curiosity got the better of me, I opened one of the brittle envelopes and examined the contents within. I have no words to describe my discovery. The letters will speak for themselves, I think. You might question everything you've known, for they seem to contradict what we accept to be true. While I only put two before you, there are countless others waiting in that moldy chest. The more I read, the more I start to wonder if this wasn't a mistake. Maybe I should have left that trunk to collect dust, or set fire to its mysterious contents. But I need to find some reason, the source of these haunting transcripts. Who was collecting them? What purpose do they serve? Can they be true? I'll let you decide. If you wish to know more, I will do my best to publish the remaining documents when I'm able. May 14th, 1893 where my colleagues were concerned, the unassuming missive was nothing more than an elaborate hoax at my expense. Surely it was the butt of some crude and inexorable drawn-out joke, a bizarre prank, humorous to those masterminding this entire affair, and equally amusing to the fellow detectives who freely mocked the unfortunate recipient. I must confess, there was plenty of belly laughs to be shared in the beginning, guffawing at outrageous details and scoffing at the attempts to convince me of the letter's veracity. All mirth died, however, once the photograph slid out from the envelope. I took that square mystery to several specialists, experts in the fledgling field of capturing light and darkness. They pored over it, examining the texture, musing over the grain, tossing about foreign concepts like daguerreotype and the Talbot salt process. At great length, I was able to locate an individual who proclaimed it to be an ambrotype, hand-tinted. While he was a proverbial fount of knowledge, I was unable to discover any pertaining details surrounding the unknown photographer and the subjects in question. What I did discover was that I did not process a forgery or duplicate. Ambrotypes, he was keen to inform me, were distinctly unique from their genesis. One could never replicate the results. This only troubled me further, 
forcing a great manner of unpleasant questions to rear ugly heads and taunt a battered cerebellum with inconceivable answers. While my search had led me far and wide, I am no closer to uncovering the whereabouts of the two, or three, that set me on this doomed venture many years ago, exhausting every possible lead, picking up cold trails and even colder corpses, which medical examiners fail to explain. Is this an admission of guilt, cast through the fantastical viewpoints of a feverish mind? Or is it an even grimmer prospect? An admonition to be vigilant against the shadow realms which dance at the corners of our perception, never materializing, yet reminding us in the dead of night that there are mysteries we will never fully comprehend, walking paradoxes that defy reason, lurking in the quiet moments when the world holds its breath, and not even insects dare disturb the asphyxiating blanket which pulls neck hairs and quickens hearts, hearing knocks but finding no guests seeing faces in the window, smelling odors with no source, feeling strangers lie beside you, and turning to find nigh but empty sheets. Even as I write this, I wonder what my true quarry is, what fiendish figment I chase after. Is it stalking me while I follow dead ends and false tracks? I cannot deny the existence of its presence. It clouds my judgment, warping perception as I clutch my pistol beneath the pillow and endure the long waits for blessed dawn. Forgive me, Mary. I had no inclination this venture would strain our marriage, testing the utmost limits of our love. My waking thoughts ever linger on your beauty and the little cherubs that crawl about our homestead. I know not if I shall ever see them again. All sanity has rapidly frayed since the morning I received this accursed letter. I hope, oh, I dearly wish, that you glean some wisdom from its contents, for all I have found is anguish. Percy Shelley, Detective, 12th District of Columbia. October 21st, Anno Domini, 1870. Today my brother and I beheaded our devoted mother. Twas not in cold blood. Papa insisted it was a mercy that leaving poor Mama in such a state would be tantamount to neglecting a defenseless child. She couldn't bathe herself, had trouble speaking, and possessed a positively frightful appetite for red meat. So monstrous was her craving that she set upon our beloved Jack and savaged the wretched animal in front of the maid, who promptly withdrew her services from the household and fled, clutching a crucifix. Papa was forced to wrench what remained of Jack from Mama. She snarled and growled, behaving no better than a wild beast whose meal was rudely interrupted. Once Caleb and I locked her away in the linen closet, Papa fetched the shovel. I rarely wept at funerals, but Jack was more than our family dog. He was a true friend and companion, having survived the coldest of winters and succeeded in fighting off black bears and mountain lions alike, only to succumb to the embrace of his beloved mistress. Caleb shared in my tearful grief, though afterward he was quick to deny any such attacks on his stoic nature. What's to become of Mama? I questioned Papa. His sunken eyes seemed to retreat further still, shadows deepened in that gaunt desperation that would slowly consume us all. I must consult my research, he confessed, stroking a beard which held more gray than brown. Whatever happens, you must keep everyone away from your mother. That includes you both as well. I know not if this malady is an infectious one. The request was certainly reasonable. Simple, one might even say, for the only action required was inaction, leaving the door closed and barricaded should her inhuman strength overpower the wooden defenses. Papa abandoned us. He needed to consult an occultist, unearth some rare herbs, seek out a possible cure, 
Whatever excuses were made, it was increasingly clear to Caleb and I that our progenitor was not returning as swiftly as we'd like. Leaving us to turn away visitors and craft elaborate explanations to associates and well-wishers of our elders. Some provided difficult to convince. How long will they be on holiday? Gertrude interrogated a hapless Caleb, who looked more uncomfortable with each indignant question. She sniffed sharply, displeased with his clumsy responses. Wizened hands clutched her Sunday bonnet, doubtlessly keen on sharing some gossip with our ailing mother. I interjected to the relief of my perspiring brother. We understand that she has fallen ill on the journey, and is currently recuperating at a local sanitarium. My feminine grace was met with suspicion, Gertrude fixing me with a gimlet eye and refusing to depart until her troubles were satisfied. Might I ask where they are now? I should like to Agnes a postcard encouraging her speedy recovery. Swallowing slightly, I shook my head regretfully. I do believe it is a terrible season for mail. Father complained of tempests and hurricanes besieging them. Doubtlessly, it was the reason Mama has taken so poorly, but I believe they should be making the return journey as we speak. Still, I should like to give her my regards. Do be kind and help an old woman out. This matter weighs on my conscience so. Gertrude craned her head through the doorway, trying to glimpse the reason behind our growing deception or notice a fatal crack in our defenses. Where's Millie? She frowned. The living room could use a dusting. Caleb cleared his throat politely. Millie's taken a few days off. It seems her sister is visiting. At least, that was my understanding. Well, Gertrude huffed. Isn't that just the most peculiar thing? Appears the entire household has up and gone off on a lark, leaving the children to fend for themselves. We are not children, I remarked coldly. I will forward those concerns to our parents, whom I might remind you are due to arrive any day now. Thank you for coming by. Next time we shall be more equipped to entertain guests. After I closed the door, Caleb began gnawing on his knuckles in the most horrid way. We can't keep spinning these stories, he lamented. It's been weeks, Clara. The whole infernal town will be standing on our lawn if that old bat starts spreading rumors. I scolded him for the unsightly biting and rubbed my head, sensing a thunderous ache approaching. We were in dire straits, caught between a murderous mother and busybody neighbor. Perhaps we could allow Mama a visitor. Gertrude might be a savior in disguise, presenting us a few more nights until Papa decides to haunt our doorstep. Caleb whirled, eyes popping and jaw flapping. Did... did you just bandy about the idea of feeding someone to Mama? What of it? Surely it would be a boon to the community, and silence Mama for a while. Her groans are becoming awfully tedious. I could see nothing wrong with my suggestion. Reading this now, I realize how the transformation affected our family in different ways. Caleb was the only one to resist the inhumanity of our circumstances, but even he fell prey to that insidious darkness in the end. Has everyone gone mad? He stormed off, ruddy-faced and heavily disturbed by the whole affair. I had my fair share of troubles, but saw things in a rather impersonal light. Perhaps it was the sleepless nights that warped my perception, the hours of pondering endless scenarios, actions I could take, wondering what on earth to do with Mama and the nosy townsfolk. The next morning, Caleb and I breakfasted on stale toast and gooseberry jam. They were the only thing left in the cupboard, having eaten nearly everything else we could find and not daring to make a trip to the grocer's, where we could be subject to a barrage of inquiries. At least the milkman still made deliveries, yet even that would cease after the monthly bill went unpaid. 
My head seemed to swell, threatening to split open both skin and skull. Sweet Caleb fetched a wet towel and bade me lie down, rest a spell while he kept watch for father. But my peaceful respite was ruined by the incessant moaning echoing up the stairs. I placed a pillow over my head, wishing those feathers would shut out the guttural sound arising every minute with metronomic precision. Father never arrived. My headache was as punctual as he was not, arriving early and outstaying its welcome. Eventually, I asked Caleb to pour me a healthy snifter, hoping it would bring temporary relief. It worked marvelously. Now I understand the appeal that liquor has on adults, why it is a poor man's cure-all for any ailment. Caleb didn't hesitate to join in the revelry, claiming a bottle of absinthe for his personal use. If Mama were in her right state of mind, it would have appalled her to see me belching like a sailor as Caleb drunkenly danced atop the dinner table. I remember wishing that night of Bacchanalia wouldn't end. Never before had we had such delights, having grown too old for childish play and forced to adopt stiffly formal behaviors as a prerequisite for adult life. I'm sorry, Mama. In my inebriation, I cursed at you for being such a burden. I voiced many a great and terrible thing, which only Caleb knows, but I surmise he scarcely recalls most of that night. The parts he does recollect are the ones I wish to forget. That was when our precarious house of cards came tumbling down. While my besotted brother was deep in the throes of that Chartreuse concoction, an unfamiliar sound resulted. Pricking my ears, I turned my head towards the linen closet. Our mother was still grunting in that horrid, toneless voice, starving wails rising from our makeshift prison. Caleb waggled hands before his eyes, wholly absorbed in alternating motions and giggling at the unseen amusement which Wormwood provides. Interlocking fingers, he cast dancing shadow puppets upon the walls. Gobble, gobble, quoth the turkey, Caleb slurred. I closed my eyes to his antics and devoted all attention to listening. Ever so faintly, the scraping began again. Did you hear that just now? I blinked owlishly at him, half wondering if I wasn't experiencing hallucinations as well. Startled from his reverie, Caleb rubbed unfocused eyes and glanced about half-dazed. Hear what? It's only Mama. She probably wants a drink as well. He chuckled at his jape. I shook my unsteady head and gestured towards the kitchen. I'm quite certain it came from there. Scratch, scratch, scratch. The odd rhythm returned, filling us with disquiet. My brother could not deny the existence of this new mystery, reluctantly agreeing to approach it. Perhaps it's only a rat, he murmured doubtfully. I've never known a rodent to make such a clatter. I wobbled to my feet, nearly tripping over my silken nightdress. After regaining my precarious equilibrium, I carefully reached for the blunderbuss mounted over our sooty hearth. Is it loaded? Caleb grunted, attempting to find his own sense of balance. Brushing a tangle of messy hair away from my flushed face, I peered at the flaring muzzle. If it is, I pray Papa didn't neglect to clean it. Tentatively, we crept towards the kitchen. Despite our furtive efforts, we moved with the grace of a drunken elephant. If it was a rat, the commotion would have sensed the vermin skittering off in fright. Scratch, scratch, scratch. It clawed at the back door and grew more impatient by the minute. Leaning against the waste bin, I dared a glimpse through the window, hoping to catch sight of the unwelcome guest. It proved impossible to discern anything behind the filmy veneer of dried suds and grease, viewing nothing but the inky gloom outside. The abrasive clamor ceased. A low whine sighed, warped with unnatural pitch. 
Goose flesh prickled my skin, hairs standing taut as the eerie yowl began again. Mama answered, moaning louder than ever. Her cries harmonized with the creature, forming a hideous melody that increased in timber before fading into a haunting whisper. Caleb snatched a meat cleaver, an ashen pallor spreading over his countenance. The blunderbuss quivered in my grasp. Inch by harrowing inch, we neared the wooden portal. My palms sweated, the heavy rifle threatening to slide away as I raised the weapon to eye level. Wordlessly, I pointed toward the door handle. Reaching for the brass knob, Caleb paused to take one last shaky breath. I nudged him with my foot. He nodded grimly and swallowed. The silence seemed to stretch on forever as his fingers cautiously wrapped around the metal crank and twisted it. Creaking softly, the door swung open. Caleb turns to me, face beaming with wonder. Jack came back to us. My eyes widened at the sight before me, unwilling to share in his newfound joy. Not daring to move, I entreated my brother quietly. Close the door, Caleb. That's no dog of ours. A gray tongue lolled in a breathless snout. Milky retinas shifted in a moldering skull as Jack observed his masters. He keened miserably, canine whimper oozing from a torn neck, ivory bones glinting where decaying viscera fell away. One ragged ear dangled, swaying in a midnight breeze. The former pet sat upright, alert and attentive, even in death. But it's Jack, Clara. Can't you see? Caleb grinned at the reanimated sentinel guarding the terrace. He put a hand out, seeking to embrace the beloved companion. Rotten lips slid away from teeth blackened with necrosis. Jack hunched, emitting a burbling growl. Stop, I rasped, blunderbuss shaking unsteadily. Stay away from Jack before I blast your head off. The living carcass opened its crumbling maw, unleashing a famished howl. Scales fell from Caleb's eyes, seeing through the wormwood illusion as Jack lunged at his neck. Caleb screamed, flinching back from snapping jaws. Thunder boomed with a deafening roar. Pain blossomed over my shoulder, making me stagger back as the rifle kicked harder than any mule. Buckshot tore through the fiend, sending Jack sprawling back into the yard. It twitched, muscles spasming. A leg jutted out, bending unnaturally as the beast slowly clambered to its feet. Caleb! I gasped winded by the detonation. Kicking the door shut, Caleb locked it and slumped to the tile floor, shuddering. My legs refused to support me any longer. Sliding down the wall, I joined my shaking brother and hugged him as our frayed nerves tried to make sense of what transpired. It's hard to say how long we lay there. Was it minutes? Hours? Time has no meaning after death brushes by. A sobering reminder that days are numbered, so we must count each breath as a blessing. There was no such relief for Caleb and I. For scarcely had our hearts eased hammering when the front doorbell clanged. It might be Papa, I mused, not daring to hope. My sibling refused to believe it insisting that we should not allow any more visitors until the sun was out. Truly, it was the wisest choice. Yet I couldn't drown the longing to see our father once again, to hear his booming laugh and let that dry smile wash away this ordeal as if it were nothing more than a horrible vision. I'll see who it is. Don't worry, I won't answer unless we know for certain it's Papa. I gave Caleb an encouraging smile. He didn't respond to my forced cheer, glimpsing beneath that cracked mask of optimism. 
the doorbell chimed incessantly, spurring my feet towards the parlor window. Who else would come at this late hour, if not Papa? He was wont to midnight adventures, regaling us with tales of graveyard excursions and meeting between fellow practitioners of exotericism. Spiritualists would consult his advice for seances, alchemists would come by to sell powders, and even the odd mystic would read our palms in exchange for Mama's mincemeat pies. The bell fell silent. An impatient rapping echoed through the oak door, matching the fearful tempo beating in my breast. I squinted through the lattice window. A thin outline loomed against the starry sky, wearing a familiar bonnet. Open the door, child. I demand to know what mischief you two are doing at this wretched hour. Gertrude growled at me behind the diamond panes. I groaned, not unlike our ill-fated mother. He hasn't come back for us, has he? Caleb leaned against the parlor hutch. His wan face scanned my crestfallen expression, gleaning the answer but wishing it wasn't so. I shook my head, wavy locks swaying. Let me in, I say. If there isn't an explanation, I will go to the authorities at first light. Her shrill voice pierced the thick wooden barrier. My headache returned, as did my temper. Seeing the malice burning in my eyes, Caleb gently placed his hand upon my shoulder. Let us go, Clara. She can wrap her knuckles till they turn bloody for all I care. Leave it for the morning. A wicked smile twitched at my lips. I believe, I mused. That dear Gertrude deserves her answers. Snatching my arm, Caleb stared aghast at my machinations. No, I will not be party to this foul scheme. Haven't there been enough horrors for one night? The damnable crone struck the door repeatedly, the reverberations echoing within my throbbing cranium. I will have you put in an orphanage if you do not present a suitable reason for this madness. Unlock the... Her threats were cut off with a strident cry. Caleb paused, dreaded comprehension haunting his haggard countenance. My smile deepened into a broad grin. Beneath the discordant wailing, a low growl emanated. Help! Let me go, you insolent beast! Sobbing fearfully, the old woman struggled to escape Jack as I listened with voyeuristic delight. Caleb rushed to her rescue. This time, it was I who held my brother back. Our problem has sorted itself, I muttered, and drew him away from the entrance. Rebelling against my grasp, Caleb thrashed and fought while the screaming escalated. She will die if we sit idly by... Yes, I remarked gleefully. Seems that faithful dog has our interests at heart. Gertrude shrieked in agony. There was a tearing sound, cloth shredding. Footsteps retreating as the screeching faded into the distance. Jack howled mournfully. Seems your help wasn't required, I remarked sourly. Caleb pushed away from me, breaking free. Chest heaving, he wiped tearful eyes and fixed me with a scalding glare. Face darkening as fury contorted adolescent features. I waited expectantly for him to recollect his whirling thoughts. But no words came. The flames burned away, leaving the ashes of despair. He shook his head, lips pressed tightly brown orbs glistening with disappointment. Then he silently tread upstairs. I remained standing in the foyer, listening to our deceased pet prowl about the tulip bed. What possessed me to behave in such a manner? I searched my soul for remorse and found no trace of regret. Why did my brother look at me as though I was the true monster lurking in this house?
Couldn't he see that we must adapt our sensibilities to this unconventional situation? Or was it only I who could harden my heart in the face of evil? The next morning brought soothing sunlight, bird songs, and long due explanations. At long last, Papa returned home. I rushed to his side, embracing the woolen overcoat and pungent scent of pipe tobacco. Caleb remained atop the stairs, unwilling to join my jubilation. Papa didn't seem to notice. His cheekbones stood out sharply. The lines on his brow deepened, fixing me with a hollow stare. Yet a twinkle still glimmered inside that rattled gaze. Oh, my darling daughter, Papa exhaled, wrapping arms around me. I'm glad to see you still have your health. He glanced up to see Caleb watching above, jaw clenched grimly as he viewed our affection with disdain. Nostrils flared as spite fell from an acid tongue. What news did you bring, father? Have you finally come to cure Mama of her affliction? Or will you leave us again for another fortnight? Papa released me and leaned on his cane. I have much to tell you both. None of it is good tidings, I fear. Several years ago, he began. A polar expedition to the Arctic reaches returned with a startling discovery. After taking samples of permafrost, the British crew unearthed a prehistoric worm deep in the frozen soil, laying dormant for millennia. Curiously, the invertebrates began to move upon thawing. It found itself in the possession of a Swiss scientist who discovered the organism did not seem to have the faculties of life. It survived without oxygen, sustenance, or anything which earthly beings require. The worm was strangely aggressive and carnivorous, feeding upon mice in a most unsettling fashion. After observing the rodent's remains, it was soon apparent that the unknown morphon was able to spread the symptoms to its prey, which rose and crawled about after a few days. Victor, as my father referred to the scientist, is a close friend and colleague. He wondered if there was a connection between this inexplicable revivification and the Haitian voodoo I was studying at the time. Upon receiving one of the mice, I proceeded to dive into various tomes on the subject. The Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Kabbalah, Ars Gotia, none of which could provide any satisfactory answers. Caleb interrupted the story, narrowing his vision with contempt. You let the mouse bite Mama, didn't you? Was this all part of your experiment? Were we to be the next victims on your list? The armchair seemed to swallow Papa as he sank into it, wholly defeated by the accusation. I... I never intended for any such outcome. Who could have expected the fiend would dislocate its bones to slip from the cage? Agnes had little inkling of the threat, and by the time I reached her, he withdrew a kerchief from his pocket and wiped foggy spectacles clean. When he resumed speaking, his voice was thick and strained. This tragedy rests upon my shoulders. You need not blame yourself for my sins. Never intended to, Caleb snarled. How could you do this to us? I spoke up, using soft and gentle speech to counter my brother's outbursts. Is there any hope for a cure, Papa? Burying his face in weathered hands, my father unleashed a disconsolate sigh. On every account, he bemoaned, I have failed. We said nothing, as Papa grieved for our mother, and perhaps for us all. Caleb softened slightly upon seeing the remorse on Papa's face, perceiving that we also had ill news to share of our confinement. 
After burdening him with the return of Jack and Gertrude's midnight visitation, a pained expression flit across his brow. Alas, Papa murmured, it is worse than I feared. Lifting himself from the armchair, he paced about the room. There is no time to waste. We must excise the corruption before doomsday approaches. I glanced at my brother, sharing a dreaded realization. There would be no return of our carefree lives. No halcon days of summer. No flights of fancy amidst the approaching disaster. We were now thrust into a shadowed world, cursed with loathsome knowledge. Jack was the first to fall beneath the axe. Our father insisted that he should be the one to strike that fatal blow. The severed head wriggled in the dirt, eyes rolling as the animated body part resisted discarding its mortal coil. It ceased after the axe descended a second time, bashing the brains in. I urged Papa to let me put Mama to rest, fearing he would be too overwhelmed with emotion. To my astonishment, Caleb agreed. He purported that was one burden to share, that we must come together as a family, else risk the misfortune tearing our bonds apart. How quickly you've grown, little brother. If only it were under more blissful circumstances. We bound dear Mama to a chair as she protested, gray skin blooming with decay while her head thrashed about, teeth clacking hungrily. I held the bloodied axe as Caleb crouched behind our mother, holding her still. Goodbye, Mama, I whispered. May the angels bear you to paradise. I didn't dare dwell on her memory. My arm moved on its own accord, neatly delivering that final, painful collision. Father decided to capture our act of matricide with a photograph, so that we might not forget the evils which befell our household. He needn't have bothered. Caleb and I will never let that bitter experience fall to the wayside. A movement caught my eye after the flash powder ignited. There was a little cottage beside our home, a window looking across the backyard where these events transpired. Lace curtains shifted, a figure hurriedly rushing from the glass. When it was time to confront our elderly neighbor, we discovered that Gertrude had fled in panic. She boarded a train to New Burnswick and left behind all her worldly possessions, rightfully fearing that her lunatic neighbors would come for her head next. Papa bade us to pack our bags, that we might give chase and bring this tribulation to a conclusion. I wondered when the symptoms might overtake her frail body. Would she transform on the train? Who would fall victim to her insatiable appetite, repeating the endless cycle of violent death? and execrable resurrection. I know not what awaits us on this fated journey. Together we stood atop a brown hillside, dry grass tickling our legs as we witnessed the orange flames consuming our ancestral home. My thoughts lingered on Mama lying in bed, prone form blanketed with lilies, her favorite flower, Smoke rose over the town, figures rushing to put out the fire. When the ashes drifted over us, Papa announced it was time to depart. Caleb remained where he was, jaw grimly set with determination. Yet I saw his eyes waver as he took one last look at the ivy-covered house, where we raced through hallways squealing as we slid down banisters, pilfering the pantry while Millie scolded us, playing hide-and-seek with Mama, exploring the woods under Jack's watchful eye. I slipped my hand into his. He squeezed it once, then followed as we turned backs on the smoking remnants of our past. 
Caleb insisted that I pen this letter to the authorities, so that the world might understand the reasoning behind our unspeakable actions. You might think this nothing but the ramblings of a mad woman. I have provided the only proof I can. Enclosed in this envelope is the photograph of Caleb and I standing beside our mutilated mother, he holding her head as I brandished the axe. If you think us lunatics, so be it. But we are the ones who will ensure the dead remain so. Papa said there will be a new chapter in our lives, becoming the last bastion against the growing dark. Do not seek us out. You shall find nigh but fragments and rumors, ghosts in the wind. For to hunt beasts, one must cast aside their humanity and embrace the primal nature lurking within. We are nothing more than creatures of the night. The fact that I am sitting in my computer right now, writing this out, is an absolute miracle. My hands won't stop shaking, but I have to get this out. If I can prevent even one person from experiencing what I have just been through, then it will be worth it to push myself through writing this. For as long as I can remember, the Church of Sight has towered over my neighborhood, perched upon a grassy hill. Before I stepped foot into that tall, cylindrical building, I did not know its name. Everyone in town just called it the Tower. Most of my friends, including myself, paid very little attention to it. From my house, you could always see cars in their parking lot, but I'd never actually met or spoken to any of the people that had been inside. I could have gone the rest of my life never knowing what went on in that godforsaken place. That is, if it hadn't been for my friend, Kelsey. Kelsey was much more adventurous than I, always looking for ways to make me uncomfortable or nervous. I swear she was addicted to my reactions to the stupid things she would inevitably get us into. It was 10 a.m. on a Saturday. The sun was just now breaking through the clouds, shining a golden beam directly on the towering church on the hill. I was sitting in the passenger seat while Kelsey drove. We were on another one of her surprise adventures that I had grown accustomed to unwillingly participating in. I say I was unwilling, but in truth, I loved going on adventures with her, even if it drove my anxiety through the roof. She had a way of getting me to keep riding with her time after time. Are you ready for this? Kelsey said with a smile as she looked over at me. She was relatively short, with brown hair, held back in a tight ponytail. Am I ever ready for these? One of these days I'm going to end up in a padded room because of you, I said, half-joking. She narrowed her hazel brown eyes at me. Oh, stop being so dramatic. It'll be fun. The sound of tires crunching gravel hit my ears as Kelsey pulled off the paved road. At first, I really didn't know where we were. Sitting on my phone while she drove helped calm my nerves, but I'm sure I would have been able to tell where we were going if I hadn't been doing that. That's when we turned the corner to reveal our destination. Wait, wait, no, we're not going to the tower, I said in protest as we pulled into the gravel parking lot. Oh yes we are, Kelsey said pulling into a space and putting the car in park. It's got to be a church of some kind. I bet they'll be so thrilled to have new visitors. And besides, I've always wanted to see what's inside this place. I tried to protest further, but Kelsey had already gotten out and started walking toward the entrance. There she goes again, doing that thing she does. How do I always give in to her? I opened my door and hopped out of her sedan. It made a thud and a latching sound as I shut it, before I started jogging to catch up with her. I had never really gotten a good look at this place before. I had never been this close to it. Was this place really a church? It didn't look like any I had ever seen. This building looked more like a lighthouse without the glass windows and lamp on top. In fact, this thing had no windows at all. 
just bare concrete all the way up to a presumably flat roof. If I had to guess, I'd say it was about 150 feet tall. Hey, let's get moving. Kelsey called over to me from the large double doors, what looked like the only way in or out. I looked down from the tower to see her waving at me. Taking a deep breath before deciding to follow, I jogged over to her. There were words on the door, written in a flowery golden script. For I was blind, but now I can see. What was that supposed to mean? I didn't have much time to ponder it before Kelsey pushed open one of the doors and walked inside. I followed quickly after, against my best judgment. Once inside, I was shocked to find the interior to be well furnished. The smell of stained oak filled my nostrils as I looked around. This place was for sure a church. Pews lined both sides of an aisle, carpeted in an ornate red rug, running from the door up to a pulpit. Perched atop it was a golden statue of an unblinking eye. There must have been fifty or so people seated throughout. A tall man in an expensive fitted suit stood in front of his congregation, preaching with a booming low voice. It did not appear that anyone inside had noticed us. I looked over to Kelsey and she just smiled at me with pure delight. She waved for me to follow her before taking a nearby seat. I followed. Brothers and sisters, we are gathered here today once again to celebrate the light and love of our Creator. It is a good day to have the sight, to see beyond the norm and into the heart of our Maker, which is all around us. Let us not. The pastor stopped suddenly, his eyes darting to meet mine with a snap that was almost audible. It seems as though we have two that have not been awakened, my brothers and sisters. My heart stopped. The man at the pulpit would not break his gaze, and I was so shocked that I couldn't look away. Not until I felt a tug on my arm. Kelsey was trying to get my attention. I looked over to her. She looked at me, and then looked forward, pointing. I looked back to find that everyone in the room was staring directly at me. The air in the room felt cold and still. Something was not right. It seemed as though we were not welcome here. I think we should go, I said to Kelsey in a low voice. She nodded, and we stood up to leave. We didn't make it to the middle aisle before I felt a strong hand on my shoulder. Not so fast. Pastor Jeff would like you to come up front. The voice behind me was smooth and honeyed. If not for our current situation, I would call it pleasant. I looked over to Kelsey, and another man had hands on her too. The grip he had on me was strong, and I knew I could not fight it. Before I could think of anything else to do, we were being marched up the center aisle towards Pastor Jeff. I darted my eyes left and right to find everyone still staring us down with no expressions on their faces. Looking forward, I saw Jeff with his arms wide, now standing down and in front of the pulpit. The walk seemed to slow time, and my heart raced faster and faster. The only sound apart from our footsteps was the echoing tick-tock of the large clock on the wall behind the pulpit. It has been a long while since we have had any new visitors, Jeff said as we finally made it to the front. Kelsey suddenly burst into tears as she fell to her knees. Now, now, child, there is nothing to fear. We are here to give those who are worthy of it the sight. Kelsey looked over at me, eyes red with a look of panic in her face. My throat went cold at the sight, and my hands started shaking. Two men appeared out of a doorway to our right, carrying silver plates with matching goblets. White steam rose from them as they approached us. All will be explained in due time, but right now we must administer the test. 
Jeff motioned for the two men to start. The man holding me pulled my arms behind my back, tying them together with a large zip tie. The same was done to Kelsey before I felt a foot in the back of my knee. Falling to the ground with a thud, I let out a yell before promptly being pulled back up to sit on my knees. Listen, man, I'm sorry. I think we're at the wrong place. It just let us go. I pleaded, my eyes now starting to swell. Oh, but you are mistaken. You are exactly where you need to be. Jeff spoke with a harsher tone. I will open your eyes. Administer the test. The two men holding the goblets approached Kelsey and I, setting down the plates before bringing the goblets to our lips. I won't drink it, I shouted before getting another kick, this time in the back. I promise we will let you go once you drink, Jeff said coldly. I looked over at Kelsey, and she nodded at me. Maybe he's telling the truth. I looked back and nodded. Before I could think on it any longer, I had the goblet up against my lips. It smelled terrible. The man holding it raised it, and the liquid went in my mouth before I swallowed hard. It tasted like black tea, not as bad as I imagined. For a moment, I felt nothing. Then it hit me, fire in my stomach, worse than any I had felt before. My head began to spin as the room seemed to go dark. Everything around me disappeared except for Jeff, who was now face to face with me, his hand under my chin. His eyes went black and his skin started to smolder. The smell of burning flesh made me instantly sick and I began to vomit. Falling to the floor, I retched over and over before puke turned into dry heaves. I could hardly breathe between my stomach reflexes, desperately trying to expel anything that might still be in sight. Jeff stood up, looking off to his congregation. It appears as though the boy is not worthy. The only thing left to do is to prep the girl for her secondary initiation. Jeff's words echoed in my head as I drifted in and out before finally blacking out. The sound of rusted chains swinging slowly back and forth woke me. At first, I did not remember what had happened or where I was. Slowly, my vision returns to me. What I saw dropped my heart into my stomach. Corpses rotting all around me. The sound of insects slowly feasting on dead flesh filled my ears. The smell was unbearable. I was lying face down in a pile of dead bodies. I pressed my hands into the pile. A sickening wet suction sound filled the room as I pressed against them to pick myself up. Stepping carefully over the bodies, I made it out of the pile. My hands were covered in blood and my stomach soured. The memory of all that had happened started coming back. Where's Kelsey? I jumped to my feet and started looking everywhere that I could. My hands no longer bound, I started rattling the gate, holding me in this strange chain-link cell. To my surprise, the gate was not latched in any way. It swung open right away. Who the hell captures someone and places them in an unlocked cell? I didn't stop to ponder. I had to find Kelsey. In front of me was a hallway. It looked as though I was in an old World War II underground concrete bunker. Dim bulbs on the ceiling gave little light, casting ominous shadows on the walls. Lacking any other options for paths to take, I started walking slowly toward whatever may lay at the end of that hall. The corridor that I found myself in was not very wide. I never knew that tight spaces terrified me before then, but as I kept moving, I felt those walls closing in. Suddenly, I heard footsteps. My heart started racing at the thought of finding more of those people down here. Then it happened. Everything was black. Pitch black. 
My breathing quickly got out of control. My stuttered, panicked breath now filled my ears. Lights out again. Oh my. That soothing, honeyed voice filled the space around me. Guess I get to pay my friends a visit while no one's watching. Oh Christ, he's gotta be close by. I covered my mouth with my hands to try and quiet my panicked breath. With how loud it sounded in my ears, there's no way he would not hear me. More footsteps getting closer and closer. Every inch of my being wanted to scream and run as fast as I could. I held the urge and hugged the wall next to me. It's completely dark in here. If I could just sit still, maybe he will walk right by me. Step after step, closer and closer. I stopped breathing. That's when I realized how close he was to me. I could feel his breath on my neck. He had to be right there. The blood pumping through my ears sounded like bombs going off. It was so loud I thought he might actually hear my heart beating. Never fear. I'm here to keep you all company, my friends. The man spoke as he walked by. His friends? Does he mean all the bodies in my cell? Wait. He just passed me. With that realization, I drew a quick breath and started walking slowly in the opposite direction away from him, my hand running alongside the wall for guidance. I can't believe I actually pulled that off. I don't know where I'm going, but I have to find Kelsey. It felt like I wandered in the dark for hours before I found what looked like light coming from under a door. I had laid down to try and peek through the bottom. Through squinted eyes, I could barely make out a room that looked like an office. A pale man sat at a computer desk, looking at a screen full of security camera displays. I heard a door open, and another pale man walked in. Tom, we got that girl locked up in the vision chamber. Jeff wants to get started soon. The pale man waited for Tom to nod before turning around and exiting the office. I laid there and watched Tom for a few minutes before he got up and started walking towards the door I was looking under. Oh Christ, of course he has to come this way. I popped up and started looking around for a place to hide. The only light came from under that door and it was very difficult to see. I heard him insert a key and turn the lock to open the door. There I stood in the open. There was no place to hide. He pulled the key out and began turning the knob. I'm so screwed. I'll have to try and defend myself. Thoughts of how I would try and fight this guy ran through my head as cold sweats poured down my back. God, what do they want now? I heard Tom say letting go of the door and walking back to his desk. Jesus, saved by a phone call. You have to be kidding me. Tom speaking. Yes, I... Okay, I'll be there. Tom said, before hanging up the phone. I dropped to the ground again to see where he was going. I just barely caught a glimpse of him as he exited the room through the door on the left. Thank God. I think he left the door unlocked, too. I jumped up and opened the door in front of me. The room was small and smelled of piss. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust to the light, but I started searching Tom's desk as soon as they did. The first drawer I opened had a pocket knife and a manila folder. I shoved the knife in my back pockets and sat down to start looking through the files. Inside were profiles with pictures of people I did not recognize. I kept flipping through the pages until I jumped. There, looking back at me, was a photo from Kelsey's social media. Age, hometown, and a bunch of other personal information, including her social security number. I flipped the page again and found my profile. With all the same, very accurate information. There was a spot for notes at the bottom of the page. Written in red ink were the words, Terminated. Terminated. 
Do they think they killed me? Maybe that's why my cage was unlocked. They just threw me in with the other bodies. Dried blood flakes off my hands as I turned back to Kelsey's profile. The notes section for her read in black ink, ready for initiation. Thank God she's still alive. Or at least there's a chance. I looked up at the screen with the camera footage. I couldn't find Kelsey on any of the feeds. All I could think to do was try and follow Tom through the door on the left. I just sat there for a moment, trying to come to terms with all that had happened. I never thought I would ever see anything like this happen in my life. No point in dwelling on it. I had to find my friend. She may have brought me to this place, but it was up to me to get her out. The hallway connected to this door was just as cramped as all the others, but it was dimly lit like the first one I found. It seemed to go on forever, twisting and turning, finding dead end after dead end. That is, until I saw a red light coming from a vertical shaft, housing a metal ladder. After getting a closer look, I found where the light came from. An exit sign, and above that, a hatch. Was that really the way out? I could have climbed that ladder and ran out of that place like a bat out of hell. I would be lying to you if I said I didn't consider it for a moment. But no. Kelsey wouldn't leave me behind, and I wasn't going to leave her. After some time, I came across another door. This one with a barred window at head height. I peered inside to see Kelsey, strapped to a chair, bruised and unconscious. Next to her was a table full of sharp-looking surgical instruments. Kelsey, I found her. The door opened when I turned the handle. Unlocked. My god, what luck. Rushing inside, I tried to wake her up, gently at first. Then I shouted. Kelsey, get up. We have to go. She stirred before opening her eyes. Jason? Is that really you? My god, what happened? I don't remember anything. Except that drink, the visions. They were horrible. She said, with great effort, before throwing a coughing fit. I don't know, but I know a way out. We gotta hurry, though. I said, removing the ropes that bound her. I helped her up slowly, having to catch her as her legs collapsed beneath her. After a moment, she found her footing and gave me the look that said to me, Let's get the hell out of here. I looked around for a way out, before my heart stopped. Pastor Jeff was standing in the doorway. Jason, you are more resilient than I thought. I've never seen anyone wake up after that drink knocks them out. Kelsey fared far better than you. She was awake through everything until one of my men got a little overzealous with a club. Jason started walking towards us with a smooth stroll. You interrupted the ritual. You have robbed her of the opportunity to have the sight. She must now endure the third initiation. A leap of faith from the top of our church. If she survives, she will become one of us and gain the sight. It's a shame no one has ever survived that fall. Before I could react, I felt a searing pain in the back of my head from something blunt. I was out again. I awoke in that same room, head pounding. I sat up and looked around to find the room to be empty, save for that chair, table, and the ropes. A high-pitched squeal hit my ears, like a train ramming a car stuck in a railroad crossing. The sound cleared up, and I could hear a voice. It was Pastor Jeff. Sleeping on the floor while your friend is in trouble. What kind of friend are you, Jason? Never fear. You can still save her if you hurry. Out of that room, take your first right. There's a spiral staircase. It will take you right to me. You better hurry, though. Jeff laughed coldly before the sound cut out. Without thinking, I followed his instructions. 
out the door to the right, up the staircase. My god, there were so many steps. The steel steps clunked and echoed as my feet hammered them one by one. I was completely drenched in sweat and out of breath. Pure adrenaline was the only thing fueling me to keep climbing. Faster, you swine. The trial is about to begin. Jeff's voice came through the speakers again, taunting me. My legs were as heavy as a bag of bricks, the burning sensation overwhelming. I started shouting frantically as I climbed more steps. Don't you hurt her, you psychopath. Don't you touch her. You must really not care enough to save her. I can see that now. Oh well, seems as though you will miss it. Jeff taunted me over the speakers again. Just when I thought I would collapse, I made it to a door. I burst through to find myself on the roof of that monumental tower. Kelsey was on her knees, crying. The sound of my kicking open the door alerted Jeff, who was reciting something from a book in his hands. So you decided to show yourself, after all. You will get a front row seat, then. Jeff closed his book as he said this, before reaching to grab Kelsey. Stop! I shouted as I broke out into a run, pulling the pocket knife out. I lunged at him, blade out. Jeff dodged to my right and grabbed my wrist. I dropped the knife and my heart sank. I blew it. Twisting my arm, he jerked me to the ground and started dragging me over to the edge. The wind started to pick up and I felt cold drops of water hit my face. My back against the ground and my head leaning over the edge, I saw dark storm clouds move in to cover the sky in a frightening spiral. The clash of thunder, followed by white lightning, filled the sky. Jeff now stood over me, laughing. You were better off dead in a pile. What I'm going to do to you... You will beg me to throw you off the edge. The rain started coming down with force, water dropping off of Jeff's face as he twisted my arm harder. Pity you can't even save your friend. You are pathetic. Jeff said in a mocking voice when I heard a loud thud. I watched as Jeff fell forward and off the building. Looking back down, I saw Kelsey standing over me, hand stretched out to help me up. Screw that guy, Kelsey said, soaked in rainwater and blood. I took her hand and stood up. Oh my god, I can't believe you did that. I looked at my savior and she looked at me. It's my fault we ended up here. It only makes sense that I get us out of it. She said with a forced smile. Okay, we have to go. Jeff took me up in an elevator. He told his men to wait for him at the bottom. They probably don't think anything is up yet. How did you get up here? There's some stairs. Let's go. I made for the stairs, and she followed. The journey down was much easier than the one up. But with how exhausted my legs were, I still almost fell a few times. We started searching for a way out. I couldn't remember where that exit sign was for the life of me. Hey, over here, Kelsey said, pointing at a door. I followed, and inside we found shelves of bottles filled with black liquid. I grabbed a bottle and motioned for Kelsey to follow me back out. What are you going to do with that? Kelsey asked as she followed. I don't know, but it can't hurt to have it. I think this is the stuff they gave us. A panic grew in me as we searched hallway after hallway, desperate for a way out. Just when I was ready to give up hope, I saw that red light. The exit sign. I pointed to it, and Kelsey nodded. Climbing up and out of the hatch put us behind the pulpit in the main room. Thank God we found the way out. Leaving so soon. The party has only just begun. That all-too-familiar, smooth, honeyed voice rang through the empty room. 
The man that had grabbed me and dragged me up to this pulpit was standing in front of the double doors. He reached over and pulled a switch on the wall, sounding a very loud alarm. Everyone will be coming back to stop you two. There's no escape. He started walking towards us with no sense of urgency. I looked to Kelsey, and she looked at me. How the hell were we going through him? A quick survey of the room and a bit of luck gave me an idea. The gold eye statue sat on top of the pulpit. I set the bottle down and grabbed it, moving up on my attacker. The man laughed and broke out into a run. We made contact and he tackled me to the ground, statue still in hand. I struggled to fight back. He wasn't nearly as big as Jeff and I found him easier to push back. I tried to roll over, but he hit me in the head with a sharp elbow, knocking me back down, the statue out of my hand. Kelsey, help! I shouted as she ran up and jumped on top of him. It threw him off balance, and he fell off of me. Thinking quickly, I got up and grabbed the statue. Kelsey had positioned herself behind the man and put him in a headlock. Without hesitation, I hit him as hard as I could with the heavy golden eye. A few strikes was all it took for him to go limp, still awake, but very much out of it. Make him drink what they gave us, Kelsey said, still holding him in a headlock. I nodded before running back to get the bottle. I grabbed it and ran back to hold the bottle to his lips. I forced the whole bottle of liquid down his throat. Kelsey let go of him and ran by my side. I could now hear shouting over the sound of the alarm as Jeff's men caught up to us. The man we had just defeated started to convulse and spasm on the ground. He clutched his stomach and started wailing like a child throwing a tantrum. I turned to see Jeff's men appear from out of an archway opening. No time to watch him suffer. We have to go. We both broke into a run and got through the double doors. It was raining harder than ever as we ran to Kelsey's car. Jeff's men were not far behind. Both of our doors slammed shut as Kelsey fired up the car and backed out of our parking space. By then, we were surrounded. You have to run them over. They've killed so many people. You have to. I shouted at Kelsey, and they drew nearer. I can't. I can't. Kelsey shouted as she watched them get closer to us. Go, Kelsey, just go. Gravel spit out everywhere as she hit the gas. The sound of their bodies going under the car was horrible. One of a thousand things that I'll never forget. She's been staying at my house for a few days. We haven't told anyone about this yet. I don't know who I can tell without getting ourselves in trouble. So I'm telling you, stay the hell away from the Church of Sight. The Creature of the Night fully attuned to the environments and low-light conditions, sniffed in short, quick bursts to check his surroundings. The nose was pushed high in the air. Well-developed nostrils inhaled deeply and blew air from the slits beneath them, which stimulated the olfactory senses to make the creature aware of all around it. One ear rotated to the right as it detected a sound in the tall grass. The other ear faced forward, the eyes, which reflected the full moonlight above, were laser-focused on one instinctual urge. I held my breath, waiting for it to make a move. This was the moment I had waited for, for more than twenty minutes. Macho, my well-adjusted five-month-old chocolate lab puppy, cocked his leg and urinated on the fire hydrant. His eyes remained focused on the squirrel, which had descended the massive oak tree to fetch a midnight snack in the tall grass just off the sidewalk. This was the first time Macho had ever cried to go outside to use the bathroom, a good sign his potty training was coming along. He kicked and tore at the grass near the hydrant with his back feet until I tugged at the leather leash for him to cease. 
He wagged his tail as I groggily administered a pat on the head and a treat to reward the behavior. I yawned deeply and checked my phone. It was just after eleven. I had to be awake for work in seven hours. Come on, macho man. Time for bed. Again. I rubbed him behind the ears and began to walk back home. The park at the edge of my neighborhood was beautiful and cared for by the city. Elegant street lamps, created to match the image of old oil lamps, illuminated the pathway for safe traversing even in the dead of night. My neighborhood, known as Millennium Park, sat just off the edge of downtown proper. Just over 100 two-story homes full of families lined each street, nestled between rows of ancient oaks which were never cut down when the city was built. The cool breeze of autumn ripped through the forested park around me. A mountain of orange and red leaves cascaded down around me. Macho did battle with one as it tumbled down onto his nose, until he tripped over his own feet and cartwheeled onto his stomach. I couldn't help but smile as he looked back at me in confusion. I passed a park billboard, nothing more than cork and a wooden frame. I examined the warnings and photographs tacked and stapled around it. Unsure of if the breeze or the sight caused me to shiver, I turned away. Over the last six months, three children and more than a dozen pets had gone missing in Millennium Park. It started with Joseph Umstead, a nine-year-old boy who disappeared in his own backyard. A month later, Two twin girls and their pug vanished from their backyard during an evening barbecue. Every month, someone or someone's pets went missing. Four cats vanished in one evening. The fact that every disappearance occurred on the night of a full moon led to the local dubbing of incidents the Full Moon Murders, even though no body had been found up to that point. That is, until little Timothy Timmy Garland turned up. Timmy was found seven feet off the ground, wedged between the branches of a birch tree where the park abutted Sanders Street. His liver had been ripped from his body and the corpse mangled beyond all recognition. He was only identified after his mother located his identikid card for a fingerprint match. The brutality of the kill had shocked the city and gave the parents of the other missing children less hope for a safe return. And yet, here I was, on the full moon, walking my dog while I scrolled on my phone. But I was an adult, not a child, and certainly not an overweight house cat locked outside in the night. Still, the thought of those poor kids, all missing after so much time, disturbed me. I stepped awkwardly as I stared down at my phone and tumbled off the concrete sidewalk. I landed directly on my butt. Pain radiated up my back as I jammed my coccyx and wrenched my hips at an awkward angle. Macho stopped and looked back at me, then trotted over to nudge my hands. I looked around to make sure no one saw my embarrassing gaffe, then remembered the time. A chilly breeze crinkled the leaves on the ground and caused the skin on my left elbow to sting. I raised it up, but felt the warm trickle of blood before I saw it. Macho bounded around me, making sure to nudge and lick at my fingers. I'm okay, macho man. Really, cut it out. I told him, but I couldn't be mad at him for checking on my safety. I stood up, cautiously, and stretched my body at the hips. I tried to pat the very good boy on the head, but he continued to bob and weave. Macho's ears nipped straight up, and he suddenly ceased all movement. His entire body became rigid, and he stood in front of me, fur erect. He lowered his head and tucked his tail between his legs. He stared intently across the open expanse of the park into the swirling blackness of the night. The breeze blew directly into our faces as Macho froze in place. We were downwind of something he didn't like. What is it? What do you see? 
Macho whimpered and retreated towards me. He pawed at me to pick him up. I narrowed my eyes to gaze beyond the sidewalk where the warm embrace of the street lamps could not reach. At first, I could see nothing. The darkness enveloped everything in a smothering coil. Then, I caught movement. I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me at first, but the more I stared, the more I realized it indeed was someone walking across the field. No, not a someone. It was something. It was slumped low, slinking like a beast. My blood ran cold. I was being stalked. I couldn't make out what the form was, but it moved carefully and slowly, with precise, delicate motions. Macho cowered and growled weakly. I quickly checked the distance between the thing in front of me and the path to the stone bridge which led to the park's exit. I scooped up the little puppy in one arm and made a break for it. In full sprint, I didn't dare look back as my mind raced with what it could be. Coyote, I thought. It had to be. But it looked much too big. Bears had been seen in the area, frequently migrating between the mountains and the coast. But was I being attacked by a black bear? I reached the bridge and stopped to catch my breath under a street lamp. The creature was still there, maneuvering from one shadow to another. It was smart. Very smart. I was less than a block from my home. I ran as quickly as I could to the street. I heard the soft pitter-patter of bare feet on the pavement as the thing kept pace with me. I spotted my brownstone-style home, the warm, safe glow of my front porch lamp to guide me. I raced up the steps and inserted my key. Crap. Wrong key. I fumbled to remove it as I looked back. The shadow was closing quickly. Macho, slung snugly over my shoulder, looked back at the incoming threat and cried incessantly. It was close. Why did I have so many keys on my ring? I found the correct one and pushed the door open and practically fell inside. I kicked the door shut with my right foot as Macho fell onto the floor and scurried down the hall into the den. A loud thud echoed through the door as the creature rammed it. It really was after us. I couldn't believe it. My heart pounded through my ribcage. The full moon, which had shone brightly during the walk, was now covered by clouds. The interior of the home was shrouded in complete darkness. Another impact to the door. It groaned slightly. Then another. And this time the door creaked as the wood weakened. Christ, it was going to break the door down. I heard metal being sheared apart. The creature rammed the door a fourth time, but this attack was much weaker. Had it injured itself? It collided once again. This time it was soft, muted, and more like a dull thud. I waited for the next impact, but it never came. I sat, motionless, in the black foyer of my home, scared to death. Hello, mister? The voice came meekly, like it was exhausted. Help me. It's cold outside, and really dark. The voice sounded like a child. I steadied myself on my feet and reached for the doorknob, hand trembling. The soft click of Macho's nails on the hardwood floors told me he was carefully creeping back towards me. I gripped the old brass knob and turned it slowly. I allowed the door creaked open just a crack to reveal a small child, maybe five years old. He was naked and covered from head to toe in dirt, grime, and filth. His matted hair clung to his head and neck. Some of his toenails were missing, and his hands were raw and bled openly. His arms were wrapped around his chest against the cold. I stared into those small blue eyes, and suddenly my mind clicked. Joey. Joey Umstead? Oh my god! I exclaimed 
as I fully threw the door open. I had just seen his photograph on the board in the park. He had been missing nearly six months. He was the first. He stared at me with vacant eyes and shivered. I'm hungry, he said, tiredly, and rubbed his emaciated frame. I placed my left hand on the front door, but recoiled quickly. Ouch, what the hell? I stuttered as I looked at the solid oak wood. Four deep gouges raked across the front, reaching corner to corner. Several smaller slashes ripped through the blue paint and deep into the untreated portion of the wood. The wrought iron railing which lined my stoop was bent and twisted like a pretzel. The damage was unfathomable. Macho crept to my heel and bowed his head, then began to growl viciously. His tail was tucked under his legs. I stared at him, completely perplexed. My dog cowered. A filthy missing child was at my door, and something had destroyed my front door. Hey, kid, did you see? The clouds broke overhead, and the pale light of the full moon beamed down on my porch. The child twisted and convulsed violently. He let out a pained scream as his voice broke. He fell to all fours and pounded the concrete patio. I heard a deep, sickening snap. His shoulders rocked back and his hips jutted backwards. His bones were breaking. His fingernails fell from his hands and clattered against the cold concrete, but they were quickly replaced by massive claws. Little Joseph Umstead ripped the flesh from his naked torso in chunks. Macho trembled and pissed himself. He tipped over and rolled down the seven steps to the sidewalk. Massive gouts of blood poured from his body as large clumps of fur jutted viciously from his exposed flesh. His jaws dislocated as massive teeth pushed through the lips. I stood there, frozen in abject terror. His bones continued to break and pop and he appeared to balloon in size right before my eyes. Joseph reached up to his eyes with his gargantuan, swollen hands and peeled his face off from scalp to jawline in one clean swipe. He beat his head repeatedly against the cobblestone sidewalk, letting blood trickle into the gaps like little crimson rivers. Muscles twitched and ripped and healed, as it contorted to grow, until the child was fully transformed. After a moment, the thing rose and turned to face me. I stared deep into the light blue eyes of an enormous wolf, or at least what I could closely approximate to a wolf. It easily stood more than six feet in height. It was thinly built, but I could see long, sinewy strands of muscle tissue beneath the ragged skin. Mange riddled the creature, reducing what should have been a thick coat down to mottled mess of patches of brown fur. The monstrous canine bared its teeth and rotated its ears back. What little hair remained along the nape raised in a thick ridge between the shoulder blades as the tail extended straight out from the body. It stamped a hind leg against the stone sidewalk, tearing what used to be the skin of the child's face in two. Jesus Christ, I said to myself. I slammed the door shut and sprinted towards my kitchen. A terrifying bang rattled the frame of the house. I slid to a stop near my kitchen counter and peered down the hallway towards the foyer. The mammoth wolf was framed in the soft moonlight, his silhouette striking a nightmarish image. Macho quickly tailed behind me, quickly losing traction on the slick floor. It took a step inside my home, then another. The crushed door frame fell away as it wrenched the door free from the hinges and tossed it against the wall. I scrambled my block of knives. 
I yanked the largest one out roughly, which knocked over the entire block to the tiled floor. I quickly scooped up a steak knife and threw it like a ninja in an action film. It clattered uselessly against the floor. The wolf never flinched. It continued forward in a slow, methodical pace, clearly still healing from the transformation. The creature extended its right arm and dragged the nails against the wall of the foyer. They sliced through the walls easily. It continued forward, and the talons cut into the old mirror which hung on the wall. The glass shattered, and after a moment, it recoiled in pain. It checked its paw and shook tiny flakes of metal from it. Anger seethed over its face, and it regained focus on me. The kid did say he was hungry, I thought to myself. I checked my surroundings for a way out. The basement was a one-way ticket to certain death. The only way out was up. I slid over the island and raced for the staircase. The route took me within two feet of the monstrous wolf child, and it took a hard swipe at me with its deadly claws. They missed my head by inches, and I flew up the steps two at a time. I reached the upstairs landing and looked back. The wolf leapt the entire distance in one bound and smashed into the drywall beside me. It tumbled into the spare bedroom. I slid into my bedroom as a drawer from the spare room chest was launched in my direction. It crashed to the floor and spilled excess linens. The wolf ripped through the door in one powerful motion and tore through the tattered remains violently. I slammed the bedroom door shut, but I knew it was futile. The creature was impossibly strong, and it would take mere seconds to get to me. I cut a glance at the bedroom window. It was a long way down into the backyard and parking lot. I placed the knife down on my bedside table and tossed my lamp aside. I undid the locks and yanked the window up. I felt the buzz of my mobile phone in my front pocket. I fished for it instinctively, like an idiot. Hey, Tony, now isn't a good time, I said breathlessly. You okay over there, buddy? Sounds like a brawl for all in the house. I never said suspiciously. I hung up on him and grabbed the knife as the bedroom door was hacked at. Four long, jagged nails ripped through it with ease, slashing a set of two-foot gashes into the wood. The wolf's stare burned a hole into my brain as it hungrily set its sight on me. The door fell limply to the carpet below and rolled aside. The creature gently pushed the door open. There was nothing between us but fifteen feet of carpet and open air. This was my only chance, I thought. Macho! I had forgotten him in my rush to get away. He stood defiantly behind the wolf verbally berating it for the intrusion. Large globs of drool poured from the open jaw of the wolf as it set its sights on my little puppy. Macho recoiled in fear and backed down the hallway towards the landing. He fell down the staircase hard, tumbling head over tail until he crashed onto the floor. I leapt at the opening and plunged the kitchen knife into the back of the wolf. The blade sunk deep into the flesh. It didn't even flinch. It turned its head and glared at me menacingly. My eyes bulged from their sockets as I realized I had only made it angry. Thinking on my feet, I quickly removed the blade and began to stab the wolf in the back repeatedly. Large sprays of blood crisscrossed the room. Finally, acknowledging my attack, the creature backhanded me with its left paw and I crumpled against my bed. Macho took flight down the stairs, the wolf approaching me and towering over me. I regained my composure as best I could, even though I felt like I had been smacked in the head by a heavyweight boxer. Scrambling over my bed, the wolf slashed at the mattress just a foot from me. It traversed the frame in one leap and slammed into the headboard, fracturing it. I skidded along the carpet and slid across my bathroom tile. The monstrous wolf was in hot pursuit. I didn't even bother closing the door this time. 
The beast lost traction on the tile and ran headlong into the shower, crashing through the wall. I backpedaled for a moment. I realized the beast had gone completely through to Donnie's town home. I peeked through the massive hole, but couldn't see any sign of the creature. Donnie! You there? I stuck my head through the shattered drywall and toppled brick. Bits of insulation fluttered across the floor like tumbleweeds. What the hell? I heard Donnie scream from downstairs. An audible double bang shattered the eerie silence of the home as a shotgun discharged. Donnie screamed a horrible, blood-curdling scream. The scream was cut short by a long, baleful howl. Nope. Bye, Donnie. Sorry. I muttered as I retreated back to my home. I hopped the staircase back to my den and scooped up Macho, who was crouched low behind the couch. Let's go, Macho. Time to leave. As I ran through the half-frozen kitchen, Macho in my arms, a flurry of leaves blew down the hall through my ruined door and frame. I stumbled to a halt in the hall as the wolf stepped into view on my sidewalk. It dragged a headless corpse by the ankle. Donnie. His entrails had become extrails, dangling from his gutted torso across his chest. The monstrous thing stepped across the threshold again and pounced. It crushed me under its sheer weight. I held up my arms to defend myself as the gnashing teeth bore down upon me. It clamped down on my right forearm, separating the ulna and radius from the elbow. I thought I could hear the fascia tear away from deep beneath the flesh. I screamed in pain and made the terrible mistake of trying to pull my arm away. The teeth sunk in deeper and the thing lifted me off the ground. It shook its head side to side, shaking me like a toy in the mouth of a vicious dog. It slammed me on the ground, and both sets of claws sunk into my back, tearing my skin. I laid on the ground, fully expecting to die. I saw my own reflection in the floor, albeit ruined and crooked. My eyes focused in, and I realized I was standing at the broken shards of the antique mirror the wolf had damaged earlier. It had recoiled from the mirror when it scratched it. But why? The wolf released me from its grip and howled. The answer slapped me in the face as I saw the ruined piece of faded metal. Silver. Old mirrors were backed in a thin layer of silver. My trembling hands slid through the chunks of glass. I winced as they riddled my hand in cuts, but grasped it eventually. I rolled over to see my attacker face to face. It snatched me up in both hands and lifted me high off the floor. I rammed the sliver of silver between the ribs, targeting where the heart of a human would be. The deep blue eyes widened in surprise, and the beast stopped mid-growl. The skin sizzled around the wound. It gasped and gagged a bit, but didn't release me. I removed the shard and stabbed the wolf repeatedly, like a shank in the side. Each new hole burned and smoked, and boiled blood fell out in chunky pieces. We both stumbled backwards out the door, and tumbled down the staircase onto the sidewalk of my neighborhood. It released me, and I landed with a harsh thud on my back. The air was forcefully expelled from my lungs, and I gasped to regain my senses. The wolf landed beside me on its face, bleeding profusely. It whimpered quietly like a dog in pain. I crawled to the wounded beast. The feet feebly twitched and stopped. The distant wail of a siren resounded from somewhere in the distance. I closed my eyes for a minute. A horrible, crunching sound began. I was exhausted, and I couldn't bring myself to open them. I gripped the shiv in my hands tightly, but didn't think I had the strength to fight any longer. After a long two minutes, it ended. I'm sorry, mister. I was hungry. 
I peeked through one eye to see I was staring at little Joseph Umstead. He was face down on the cold ground. His eyes were open, but he didn't move. A pool of blood formed around his body as he bled to death a foot from me. A screech of tires sounded somewhere nearby, but I faded to black, probably from blood loss. I woke up more than a week later in a hospital, handcuffed to a bed. I was angry at first, but I couldn't do much. A concussion, shattered forearm, and more than one hundred cuts told me to stay put. After a day or so, I began to realize why I was cuffed to a bed. A missing child was found dead next to me, the murder weapon in my hand. Donnie's headless corpse being nearby didn't help, but there were too many unexplainable things. The damage to my home, Donnie's home, and the injuries. I lied through my teeth. I told them I couldn't remember anything. They eventually released me, and I went to stay in a hotel. I picked Macho up from the animal shelter. He was so excited he peed on the floor when he saw me. That was where the excitement and happiness ended. The next day, he wouldn't come near me. He cowered in a corner and growled whenever I came by. No more cuddling, no more playing, no more going outside together. Three weeks after the attack, I started eating my steak undercooked. Last night, I had five raw chicken breasts. I took Macho to my parents' house and asked them to keep an eye on the little guy for a few days. No matter what I ate, no matter what I drink, I am constantly in pain. My stomach roils and groans for more. The full moon is tonight. I cleaned the entire fridge of everything edible. Please, stay indoors tonight. I don't know what I will be forced to do to satiate the hunger. They warned me not to write this post, but I have evidence, and I can't live with myself knowing about this and not exposing it. I'll upload proof in an edit as soon as I'm done posting. If you know any reporters, please send this to them. Okay. I am an urban explorer in NYC. I'm just getting my Reddit started, trying to build an audience, etc. And a few of you know I went to Heart Island last week. That's the tiny scrap of land in the East River that was a prison camp during the Civil War, then a psychiatric institution, then a TB sanitarium, now a mass grave for poor people. You get it. The island is mostly abandoned now. So I went out there. There's supposed to be about a million bodies buried there, so that would get me views. It's close, it's creepy, and I assumed it would be empty. It's run by the Department of Corrections, but after asking around, I got a few DMs saying it's pretty easy to avoid them if you stick to the buildings and stay away from the mass graves. At first, things seemed fine, you know. I was supposed to be getting the creep-out vibes, but Heart Island is actually kind of a beautiful place. It's mostly nature now. Lots of trees. Half of the buildings that are still standing are the kind of old where they're charming and rustic. So I checked some of those out and took some pictures. Then I heard a helicopter closing in overhead and saw a black SUV winding up the road in the distance. At first, I just thought, Oh, great. Security. So I ducked inside a building and took cover. But as I kept track of the helicopter through a window, it got lower and lower. It wasn't just surveying the island. It landed just over the hill next to me. The SUV was also closing in, but the people in the car didn't look like cops. It was like a bunch of laughing women in fancy dresses. For the life of me, it looked like they were going to a party. I looked around. Where the hell had they come from? Were they already on the island this whole time? 
The thing is only like a third of a square mile, and there's no bridge to it. And where were they going? I wondered if it was some thrill-seeking billionaire trying to impress his friends, or one of those high-end theme parties you hear about. They drove right past me and over the hill. Then another helicopter came and landed. And another, and another. I decided to check it out. That was a bad call. So I stayed inside the tree line, trying to keep hidden, but I started following the car over the ridge. Over the hill was a squat, gray building. My stomach kind of churned when I looked at it. It just looked like a sanitarium, or a hospital, or an asylum. Something. Possibly a prison. But there were all those people milling about outside of it. Cars. Helicopters. Plural. All disgorging men in black suits and women in cocktail dresses, like it was the Met Gala or something. Then, I started inching a little closer. Urban exploring doesn't normally involve sneaking up on people, but I noticed that no one was hanging about the back of the building. Just caterers coming in and out, most of them not in uniform, just white aprons, which was perfect. Maybe I could blend in there. I went around the back and crept as close as I dared. By now, the stream of caterers was starting to trickle off. Whatever it was was about to start. I waited for the last caterer to disappear and prayed they wouldn't lock the door behind them. I got lucky. The creak of the rusty door seemed like the loudest noise I'd ever heard as I pulled it open. This place clearly was not built for luxury which just piqued my interest further about what in God's name all these people were doing here. My heart pounded as I wove through the kitchen. It was dark, but definitely in active use, filled with pots and pans, delicious smells bubbling up from them. I started down the hallway. It was way too narrow. There was nowhere to hide if I needed it. I had crept through dozens of buildings older and emptier than this one, but this was worse. I'd never broken and entered anywhere inhabited before. Pretty soon a hush of whispers came to me. Men and women, low voices, excited. Small talk. Some of them, the younger ones, were giggling. Some of the older people sounded very serious and worried. Like at any party, where some people have business and others just have gossip, I guess. But I kept hearing the word... Skinner, which was weird. The Skinner situation. The Skinner incident. What happened in Skinner? Is Skinner a place? If that means anything to anyone, let me know. I was actually in a pretty good spot for stealthy eavesdropping, until something ran up the leg of my pants. I managed to muffle my scream, but I did not contain the flailing. I stumbled forward, directly into the open doorway. A terrified little mouse flew off of me and scurried away. A hush fell over the entire room when I stumbled in. This was a massive room, with rust-colored cracks running through the yellowing paint. But it was made up to look like a giant party atrium, with tables of snacks lining one wall and balloons hanging from the ceiling. What the hell? About two hundred people wearing Prada and Gucci stared at me. I stared back at them. An older woman in a cocktail dress took a step towards me. Um, hello? The woman smiled, uncertainly, nervously. Great, I thought. Are you with the gardening staff? Hallelujah. Yes, ma'am. I looked down apologetically, maybe too enthusiastically, at my mud-covered boots. I was told to find a superior, and uh, I did my best to look lost and clueless. It didn't occur to me that Hart Island doesn't have a gardening staff. Then the woman smiled a wide, unnerving smile. Oh, it's no trouble at all. She glanced at the two men next to her who looks decidedly more concerned. In fact, why don't you join us for a spell? I'm sure you've been working very hard. 
The bigger guy's eyes widened, and he was suddenly smiling too. Yeah, get yourself a snack, kid. He enthused. Big, bad vibes energy. But the lady behind me gave me a playful little shove forward. Enjoy yourself. You're in for a show. So I stood around, surveying the room as subtly as I could. This was a weird place for a party. The upper floor overlooking the atrium was lined with doors that looked like steel, and I didn't want to think about who they might have held. I couldn't record discreetly, surrounded by all these people. So my plan was to wait around until they started to leave, and then hide in a bathroom or something to film the aftermath. Until then, I was alone in this mass of disgustingly rich people, chattering on about increasingly unsettling things. What about the intentions for January? One woman asked her friend. They're saying it's going to be a big one. A good time to ask for big things. You don't believe that amplification crap, do you? The man at her side asked. That stuff's all in your head. Cognitive dissonance. Channeling works the same way all the time. We just like to imagine there must be a trade-off when things go to hell. Look at 1929. The woman insisted. Major gains, major losses. They always come together. It's the balance. So when things get really bad for a while, it must mean something really good is coming. We just have to take advantage of it when it does. Cognitive dissonance, the man insisted. Pattern seeking, all of that. With all the suffering in 2020, we can hope. Another woman raised her champagne flute in a gloved hand. I look forward to many years of long life and good health. I'll drink to that any time, the man agreed. Every bone in my body told me something here was wrong. Really wrong. But then again, I was curious, and maybe a little flattered. I'm not the kind of person who gets invited to big events, and some of these people seemed kind of nice. Ignoring the fact that I was wearing an outfit that could be best described as Antifa loses at mud wrestling, I thought to myself, what the hell, why not? But an hour later, serious alarm bells were starting to go off in my head. Gaggle after gaggle of rich people came up to me like I was some kind of celebrity. They asked about me. What was my name? Uh, I lied, obviously. Then told me how it was just so good to meet me. I was too flabbergasted, and possibly also too freaked out, to ask them anything about themselves. People like me don't have long-term relationships with people like them. I felt like an animal in a zoo. Maybe this random poor person who has walked into their midst was their excuse to feel good about themselves for being magnanimous. About an hour in, the sound of clinking glass filled the air. Everybody fell silent, almost instantly, and I followed their expectant gazes to see a taller man with a thick salt-and-pepper beard. The woman who invited me in stood at his side, smiling fondly. Esteemed Magister and Members, from Cielo to St. Charles, from 71st to Georgetown, we welcome you. He had a voice for radio, and now it echoed throughout the cavernous room. Thank you all for your presence here tonight. I know I, for one, have been anticipating this occasion for the better part of a year. Thank you for the opportunity to host. This is an spacious time indeed to renew our collaboration. All signs are that the energy of this alignment will be particularly auspicious. The world has seen terrible suffering in this past year, but we all know the greatness that will follow. Magister. The hairs on the back of my neck were starting to stand up. Auspicious alignments sounded like some harmless rich people thing, like astrology or maybe the secret, but Magister sounded like something out of the craft. Then he looked directly at me. We have an unexpected guest with us tonight. I looked around, 
The eyes of the rich folks nearest me were fixing on me, too. Yeah, no. No, 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 no. I started trying to inch towards the door to the kitchen, but the group around me tightened a little, smiling at me. Smiling, like they were afraid I'd run. Yeah, I'm gonna head out. Sorry to intrude. I tried to push past them, politely, but a little insistently. But they didn't budge, and one guy even went to grab my shoulder. So I bolted. I tried plowing through the crowd, hoping that they would be too delicate to try to tackle a crazy person who was clearly having a nervous breakdown in the middle of their gala. My hopes were disappointed. Whispers like hisses filled the air around me, and suddenly my feet were in the air. Somebody must have spilled champagne, because I hit the tile floor with the full force of my weight. The party guests gathered around, giggling and exclaiming in awe. Jeez, you okay? I looked up to see an unrealistically cute girl kneeling over me. I really think I've seen her in something, but for the life of me, I can't place what. Hey, your leg is bleeding. I looked down, and the pain hit. I think you cut it on my glass. You gonna bolt on me again if we go and get you a band-aid? I looked at the champagne flute shattered beneath me and the champagne all over her dress. And suddenly, my fear was mixed with a twinge of sheepishness. She took me over to a side area and found a towel. We chatted while she held it against my leg, and I tried to shake off the embarrassment of fleeing in terror from what was so obviously just a gala. There was a lot of blood, which for some reason made it even more embarrassing. But she really was chill about it. Saw right through my gardening stuff story, but she offered to keep the secret if I'd stay and help them out with something they were about to do. It's just like a dumb show thing that happens sometimes, but it means a lot to people. All you'd have to do is sit on stage for a few minutes. I wasn't feeling very motivated to say no to her. Just one thing. I'm going to have to blindfold you while we walk in. Wait a minute. Why would I need to be blindfolded? Is that like an eyes wide shut kind of thing? <sighs> Get your mind out of the gutter. And the next thing you know, there I was, being led through the dark. I felt the girl's hands leading me down a hallway. Then another set of hands. Then another. At least four people had their hands on me, steering me towards something I couldn't see. Suddenly, an older woman's voice, the woman who initially beckoned me in, was in my ear. Take a seat, dear. They sat me on a chair, but the hands stayed on my shoulders. Suddenly, I felt rope swing across my left wrist, then my right. They pulled tight with a violent jerk, burning my skin and crushing my arms against the arms of the chair. I yelled out in pain, then the blindfold came off. I was sitting in the middle of a dramatically lit, circular ballroom. The paint was flaking, but the chandeliers were burning like it was a hundred years ago. I was surrounded on all sides by the party guests, watching me, waiting for something. What the hell? The cute girl was standing in the front. She winked at me. It's really awesome that you're doing this. I stared at her, while everyone else looked at me like a movie star. I didn't know if I was the hero or the victim. I swung my gaze around the balloon, trying to calculate just how much danger I was in. I was flanked by four huge brass bowls. Two of them were filled with what looked like water. The other two billowed bright orange flames. Two people stood on either side of the four bowls. They wore white ceremonial robes embroidered with black symbols. At the edges of the crowd were about ten people with uh, scepters. Is that the right word for it? Some kind of staff with big, heavy-looking knobs on the end. These were also engraved with symbols. What the hell had I gotten myself into? 
The chandeliers dimmed, and the ballroom was cast in eerie, flickering orange light. The crowd around me fell silent. It didn't seem real. They just stared right back. And then, they screamed. All two hundred of them screamed at me, carnal, their faces contorted into grotesque snarls of rage. I screamed too. I couldn't help it. And then, they stopped. Instantly, they were silent, and stared at me again. I was shaking. One of the men in robes stepped towards me. He had something in his hand. It was a towel, with my blood on it. He held it up for the crowd to see, and walked with it over to one of the flaming bowls. He caught the towel on fire, and dropped it at my feet. The crowd hissed at me as the flames licked dangerously close to my jeans. I tried to pull my legs up and away from it, but the heat was still singeing me through the denim. I waited for my pants to catch fire, but the rag burned itself out. The spotlight went on, then the singing started. A low murmur, perfect synchrony, perfect harmony. The acoustics of the ballroom magnified their voices until the air itself seemed to vibrate. I could feel the vibrations in my chest, even though the voices were still low and gentle. Whatever words they were singing weren't English. They weren't Latin, either. I've never heard anything like it. The volume rose, but in a way that felt excruciatingly controlled. The harmonies remained intact, the voices perfectly synchronized. This was a religious act for these people. I could see the faces of the front row in the light of the fires nearest me, and their eyes were closed. People didn't achieve this kind of harmony unless it meant something to them. My skin began to crawl. The volume and pitch were rising slowly. My ears were ringing, and my chest was aching from the force of the noise. The people in the front row were shouting now. Then they were screaming again. But this time, it wasn't normal screaming. The voices kept their synchrony, their pitch, building a weird chorus of competing and harmonizing screams. They sounded like they were about to kill somebody. All at once, the screaming stopped, thank God, but it was replaced with hissing, an aggressive, hungry chanting. The hair was standing up on my arms, and then I realized it wasn't just from emotion. The air around me had grown very, very cold. A sudden gust of wind ruffled my hair. I looked around. Wind. Then something tickled my face. A gentle rain of dust. Plaster dust. I looked up. Directly above me hung a huge, ancient chandelier. I threw myself, still tied to the chair, away from it. At the same moment, a thunderous crack echoed through the ballroom. I hit the marble floor between two of the flaming cauldrons at the same time the chandelier impacted with a horrific crash. And then, nothing. I woke up alone in the back of an SUV. My body hurt, my head hurt, the cuts on my legs stung, my shins still burned, and I was covered in deep bruises. I glanced out the window. Where are we? But I knew the answer. We were in Queens, only a few blocks from my apartment. Almost home, sir. How did he know where I lived? My wallet was in my pocket, so was my phone, but I left my ID at home. You're lucky we found you when we did. The driver passed me back a bottle of water and a packet of aspirin. And that it wasn't worse. Those buildings can come down at any time. There's a reason people aren't allowed out there. I stared at him in the mirror. What was that? You got hurt exploring. 
That's all. Who were those people? Who were you? The driver pulled over and turned back towards me. He stared at me, gravely serious. No one. You saw no one. You got hurt while trespassing and we found you. And as long as that's what happened, you're going to have a healthy and prosperous life. Do you understand? I thought I did. Maybe. Prosperous? How? He didn't answer. But if that's not what happened... His demeanor changed. I saw bits of fear come into his eyes. Don't. I've seen what can happen, okay? Don't tell anyone what you saw or who you saw. Just, please, you don't deserve what will happen to you. And for the last week, I haven't. But I recognized one of them on CNN yesterday. And like I said, I can't handle knowing about this and not alerting people. So, I'm almost positive it was... And I think if I shared these pics, you could help me ID the others. So, here we go. Sorry for the typos. I'm getting a terrible headache. Uploading now. Sorry for the delay. The imagers being really weird. Still trying to upload. Wow. Head hurts. What the hell? Still having trouble uploading to Imgur, but gotta start with description. Fits Google with somebody I saw on the news. He was a Canadian politician named... But because I recognized me face... Pretty sure I got them in Hollywood. I'm gonna try one more time. It was out on Imgur. I don't know what's happening to me. What does one define as a god? If I were to go from a personal standpoint, I would define it as a being of immense power that is not capable of being comprehended by mortals. That is why I can only speculate the true definition. Despite what you may think a god truly is, it is undeniable that we as humans hold a special trait that most gods may never hold. That trait is death. At least, that is my personal opinion on the matter. I see death as a release after we've lived our mortal lives. Unfortunately, many people face death before they are ever ready due to situations out of their control. A god could never have such glory of eternal rest. However, there is a question that many have probably never considered. What would happen if a mortal were to partake in the essence of a god? The year is 1873. I was a young lad with his whole world ahead of him. I lived in a small village where everyone knew everyone. No one in our village had much, but we had each other. Father had told me there was a strong snowstorm coming in a few days. He'd sent me to the woods to collect lumber. It was nothing I was a stranger to, though. I'd gathered lumber hundreds of times before. I may not have been good at much as a young man, but I knew how to use an axe. It was a cold day. The wind was strong. Father warned me to wear lots of warm clothing for the trip. Even the strongest of men would freeze in minutes in this weather. I knew it was serious when I saw the river was completely frozen. Dead fish were numerous among the frozen waters. At least they won't spoil, I thought jokingly. No matter how many times I'd done this, the sweet smell of pine never got old. I found a nice set of trees and picked the best one. I didn't need anything crazy. I just needed something big enough to provide a lot of wood, but small enough to not be a hassle to move. I settled on a small tree close by the river. It wasn't exactly a sapling, but it had clearly not reached its full potential. I guess there was some irony in that. Trees are living things, you know. 
This tree was young, yet here I was, chopping it down for the benefit of myself. It was too cold to get philosophical. I hacked away at the tree. It took a few more swings than I was expecting, but it eventually came down. Snow poured over me as it fell over the river. Now I was certain this was really serious. The ice over the river didn't so much as crack from that. Mother Nature impressed me yet again. I began chopping the tree into smaller sections. My nose was running uncontrollably. Great, I thought. Last thing I need is a cold. After a few trips bringing lumber home, I felt we were settled with what we had. I gave myself a firm pat on the back. This was some of my finest work, if I do say so myself. As night came, the wind began to pick up. The temperature dropped lower than it ever had. Father stayed up all night to keep the fire going. This was nothing new to me. I was used to Father staying up all night. As long as he had his trusty bottle of whiskey, he could do anything. Except be coherent. That night, something felt so off about the night. This cold was not only dangerous, it felt unnatural. I hardly got a wink of sleep that night. As I stared out my window, I began to wonder about my own mortality. Is there a world where things are simple? Does Mother Nature have something against us? Is this a punishment from God? Is there a God? Though mother and father were always incredibly religious, I always had a small sense of doubt in the back of my mind. Either way, wondering about this was not going to keep me warm. I turned over in my bed and attempted to sleep the frosty night away. The next morning was almost historical in nature. Ice and snow cascaded every house, every roof, and every tree. Father informed me that there was news that one of the village's residents passed away of pneumonia last night. People in my village always took the death of one of their own seriously. Not saying that death isn't serious. It made me wonder yet again. That just goes back to my quarries of mortality again. Did that person want to die? Why must life be taken in such ways? I just hope it was painless. I decided I was going to go for a walk down the trail. While I was out there, I decided I might as well grab some more of that wood. I layered up, grabbed my axe, and proceeded out the door. Of course, Mother warns me not to freeze to death out there. My mother was always a careful woman. I loved her. Sometimes I swear she saw me as the only man in her life. Father was always too busy downing a bottle to care about Mother. On the walk, I noticed something strange. The sky seemed a bit weird. Every few minutes, the sky looked like it had colors morphed into it. Have you ever heard of the Aurora Borealis? Well, it kind of looked like that. It was strange. I'd never seen anything like that here. Regardless, I merely dismissed it as a beautiful phenomenon and proceeded on. I returned to the area where I'd originally cut down the tree. To my confusion, the tree was gone. As a matter of fact, it felt like I wasn't even in the same location. I swore this is where I'd been through. I began going in a different direction. It was like the woods were shifting as I traveled. The trail became unfamiliar. Some of the trees began to not make sense. I became disoriented. This is when I began to realize something was dreadfully wrong. Suddenly, I began to hear a low voice. It sounded as if something was calling me from a far distance. I began to feel a warm sensation. The feeling was so warm, soothing, and comforting. The voice was luring me in. The worst part is, I couldn't resist. My legs began to move in the direction of the warmth. All I could think in the back of my mind was that I was going to die. I'm lost, and I'm going to freeze to death out here. Before I knew it, I found myself at an unfamiliar pond. I wanted to call it a pond, but it looked as if it stretched on forever. The sky was an array of colors over the pond. The trees seemed to almost warp away from the body of water. That's when I saw it. A large creature 
lay beached on the embankment. I didn't even know how to describe it. At first glance, you'd think it was a beached whale. It was as big as one. However, it had human-like arms, somehow too many tentacles at the rear, and the face was all wrong. Its face was far, far too human for what it was. Even through my warped vision, I could see it clearly. I was practically burning up in its presence. Somehow, this thing was letting off a massive wave of heat. Though I should have been afraid, my brain could not process fear. All I felt was the same feeling I get in the presence of my mother. It was the feeling of safety and comfort. I began to approach the beast, despite my attempts to turn back. Before I knew it, I was standing mere inches from the creature. The thing did not move, but I could see that it was still breathing. Every few seconds, fingers and tentacles would twitch. This creature was dying. I began to hear something in my head. The same voice I'd heard in the woods was now circulating around me. Though the creature never moved its mouth, it spoke to me. In my head, I heard it utter only one word. Partake. It uttered. This creature must have had some sort of mind power, because I subconsciously knew what it meant. I knew what it wanted me to do. I looked down at my axe. Was I really about to do this? The query that I wondered about all this time began to resonate again. This creature was dying, but here I was about to bring down an axe upon it. Was this truly a killing of mercy? My heart skipped a beat as it spoke again. Consume my heart and become the heir, it said. I raised my axe over my head. I hesitated for a moment. The sky began to warp more and more. The water became more disturbed. The trees almost seemed to sing a hymn in the wind. With one strong strike, the creature's head detached from its body. The head rolled to face me. Just before life ceased from its eyes, it looked at me and smiled. Now, there was only one thing left to do. I dropped to my knees and gazed upon the corpse. My stomach began to growl. My mouth began to dribble uncomfortably. What was happening to me? I felt like a starving animal. I began to hack at the corpse over and over, cutting it into smaller portions. With each chop, my hunger became more and more insatiable. At some point, I no longer felt cold. The idea of freezing to death meant nothing to me. Finally, the body was chopped, finally. It took a moment to get used to the taste. The first bite reminded me of raw fish. With each chunk I ingested, I began to enjoy it more and more. The sweet hymn of the trees became louder and louder. My body began to warm up. The sweet, delectable flavor was almost sensational. My eyes began to water from the euphoria. I was eating so much of it. This creature was far larger than me. How was I eating so much of it? After about ten minutes, I'd had enough. What came over me? I'd just done a disgusting thing. I felt like a sickened animal. I sat on the ground for several minutes, trying to regain my composure. That's when I began to feel it. I felt stronger, smarter, and more aware. It seemed like I just opened some sort of sixth sense. Simultaneously, everything stopped. The trees no longer sang. The sky's colors ceased entirely. The world no longer warped around me. That's when I began to see them. I witnessed as several strange creatures began to crawl out of the water. The only way I could describe these things is as horrific. Some looked human. Some looked far from human. Some were indescribable. They slowly proceeded towards me. I gripped my axe, bracing for the worst. However, 
These creatures were not a threat, it seemed. All of them, in succession, pointed up to the sky. I looked up and saw what they were pointing at. Within the sky, there was a massive vessel of sorts. It merely floated there. There was no noise, no movement. I felt my heart stop for moments. I could not bring myself to say a word. I passed out from shock almost immediately. After everything up to that point, I finally passed out. I woke up in my bedroom. At first, I thought it was all just some horrible dream. That was until my father informed me that he'd found me unconscious not far off the trail. He told me that he believed I'd slipped on a patch of ice and hit my head on a stump, knocking myself out. Though father insists what I told him was a dream, I swear it wasn't. I remember everything that happened that day. Years after, I was never able to find an explanation for what happened that day. No matter how many people I've told, no one ever believed that I, for some reason, partook in the consumption of a god. How do I know it was a god? Ever since the event, I've had dreams that I can only describe as divine. I partook in the consumption of a god. Ever since, I've been able to stare into the cosmos and see what awaits beyond. My questions of mortality no longer exist. This is why I see death as a mercy. I understand why mortals are such blessed beings. It's hard to believe that this took place in 1873. Even after centuries, it still feels like it happened just yesterday. Centuries have passed, yet my age has not changed. Time has lost its effect on me. I've had to watch everyone I've ever known come and go before me. In the last days of my mother and father, I saw them stare me in the eyes. I've had to suffer with the fact that they, somewhere down the line, saw me as a curse. I never wished to consume godly flesh. I really didn't have a say in the matter. I was essentially forced into the matter. Or was I? If I had stronger willpower, could I have changed things? Could I have resisted the temptation? I recently discovered some books that go over the idea of what I may have done. Some of these books go over the idea of interstellar beings with immense power. Some of these are discussed as beings from other worlds or dimensions. Others discuss the idea of cosmic horrors. These more relate to some sort of otherworldly gods. Perhaps that may have been what happened. Either I consumed the flesh of some form of alien entity, or I consumed the flesh of one of those cosmic horrors. I'm not any closer to finding an answer. One thing I know for certain, I have not gotten closer to death. I currently reside in a time period of which I should not belong. I've witnessed the creation of things such as automobiles, television, and phones. In a world where I was familiar with writing letters and visiting in person as the only means of communication, it can now be done while in the comfort of your own homes. Wherever I go, I know that it will only be temporary. I live with the dread that I will probably outlive everything. When the world ends, it will be the end of everything except me. I have tried to kill myself hundreds of times at this point. No matter what happens, I'll just wake up the next day unscathed. Many people may see immortality as a blessing of divinity, but it is not. The so-called glory of immortality is truly a nightmarish hell. I can feel things that no one else can. I see entities that walk among common people. I hear as the trees sing their ominous hymn in my honor. I can see the sky changing over and over again. There it is again. Just above the clouds, I can see that massive vessel floating. It hides so cleverly in plain sight. These poor mortals are none the wiser 
about what watches them. Now I get to the final point as to why I have written this. I don't know how many of these gods there are. Truth be told, I may not even be the only one out there like this. This is my theory of what I think happened. I believe I was the victim of an unfortunate circumstance. The creature I came across that day was some sort of otherworldly being on the verge of death. It coerced me into eating its flesh, and as a result, I gained a great deal of its power. Now I have become one of these monsters. Though I do not look like one, I maintain the visions and power held by one of these beasts. Many see immortality as a gift. I now know it as a punishment. It is punishment for the gift of divine cognitive thought. It is the punishment for omniscience. It is a punishment for the gift of things that could never be possessed by mortals. At least it shouldn't be. I hope that one day I will be released from this hell. There's nothing I desire more than for this nightmare to end. Over the past few days, something has been wrong. The trees have begun to sing louder. The sky has become a permanent shade of dark pink. That massive vessel in the sky is beginning to move farther and farther away. I think something is coming. I currently sit here with my axe in hand. I'm afraid. I get the distinct feeling something is after me. Those accursed trees won't shut up. It's making me wonder if something is about to happen to me. I know I've made my mistakes. I know I eagerly yearn for death. However, I'll be damned if I let something take me out. If I'm going to go out, it's going to be on my own terms. If something wants me, it's going to have to fight for me. Who knows? Maybe it's another god creature coming after me. Just in time, I was getting hungry. My favorite story as a child was called The Hideous Hare. Of course, it went by other names, depending on who was telling it to you, and what kind of mood they were in. My father never liked that name. When we were snuggled in bed, and he sat on our nightstand with his fingers running over the grooves in our dollar store lamp, he called it the Hag and the Hare. If he felt especially adventurous, he'd replace Hag with a word we weren't allowed to say, as the scrawny little ten-somethings we were. The story in question was a well-loved one, passed down from our thrice-great-grandmother to her son, and from there to her daughter, and so on, all the way to our father. The lesson was simple enough to grasp, but it wasn't one learned by the glass slipper fitting on the princess's foot, or the frog shedding his slimy skin for that of a prince. Once upon a time, my father would say in a hushed tone as if he were telling us some secret tale that was only for Jacob's and my little ears. There was an old hag who lived in a tiny house in the middle of nowhere. The hag in question did live in the middle of nowhere, and behind her house was a vegetable garden. Rabbits would come and steal bites from her carrots and lettuce, and she didn't like it. Not one bit. She hated rabbits. So when fall raked the last of the trees bare, and winter's cold fingers crept up ever so slowly, she sat in her rocking chair, reading how to get rid of the little pests. That's when she heard the very first knock. It wasn't an ordinary knock, mind you. It was a thump knock. She knew it must be an animal at her door. When she moved to the door and threw it open, there stood a hare. It was white as the driven snow, but was by no means perfect. It bore mangled ears and an empty, bloodied socket where his eye used to be. The poor creature had seen some hardship, that was for sure. But, of course, the old woman had no sympathy. Miss, if you might spare me some warmth for the night, I would be forever in your debt. My warren has flooded with the autumn rain. My father would always pitch his voice up an octave and soften his eyes when voicing the rabbit. The hag's voice was always a low, snapping tone, 
like dry twigs in a fire. For a moment, the hag laughed. It was the laugh of a mean old woman, the kind that made you think of ruby slippers and gingerbread houses. You think I'm going to let a silly old rabbit stay the night in my house? That's a gag. A gag indeed. You better get off my porch, or I'll get my gun and splatter your freaky little face all over it. The hare, terrified for its very life, bounded away into the thicket. The next evening was colder still. The thump knocking came again as the hag was embroidering a small fox into the middle of a flower ring. She loved foxes. Foxes eat rabbits. Of course, they also eat chickens, but all of hers had disappeared several winters ago under mysterious circumstances. She stood and threw the door open yet again. She met the chilly air with disgust, just as she did the rabbit's renewed pleading. Miss, surely you can spare me a night's shelter. My body is so weary, and I don't think I can stand another night in the cold, hungry forest. I will repay you however I am able. There was no laugh from her lips this time. She only stared down at the little bunny. You do better in the forest than you will if you keep tottering around my doorstep. Get gone, you hideous hare. With that, she made for the broom closet. Before it could feel the bite of straw, it scrambled away into the thicket once more. The next evening, the first snow of winter had just began to grace the ground. The hag sat by a roaring fire with a pot of tea and a small platter of cheese and bread. When the thump knocking came for the third and final time, she stormed over to the door and wrenched it open. She could barely contain her fury as the rabbit pleaded. Please, miss, the snow has come, and I'll freeze to my very death. One night out of the cold is all I ask, no more. She stomped her foot, barely missing its paws. At that part in the story, my dad would jump to his feet and stamp his foot into the ground, spooking us without fail. Then freeze. If I see you on my doorstep again, I'll skin you good, you wretched little thing. With that, she slammed the door, nearly crushing the poor hare in the process. The rabbit began to squeak with desperation. She snatched the cheese knife from the small end table and made for the door. The hare opened its mouth to speak, but the hag gave it no time. She angrily stepped out to snatch it up and skin it into a nice fur hat but she missed. It ran inside, slamming the door behind her. Let me in. Let me in, she cried as she heard the lock click into place. You better get off my porch or I'll skin you to a bloody pulp. The rabbit sneered. After banging for several minutes and a string of curses that would make the devil blush, she realized she was not getting back in and walked uncertainly into the night to beg for shelter, just as the hare had done. And the hare, well, it sat right down and finished her meal. Sitting on the old oak steps of the front porch, I remember wondering if my dad would tell us the story that evening. He wasn't up for telling stories much nowadays. Now, all we heard was his soft grieving from down the hall. That, and fire in brimstone, and the word of God from our aunt. There were many things our father wasn't up for anymore. Holding a job, feeding us, clothing us, caring for us when we were sick. That duty fell on my aunt, at her insistence. I read the passage over and over, absorbing almost none of it. My thoughts, scattered as they were, were interrupted by the crows of my aunt's rooster. I closed the Bible, placing it to the side to watch the snow gently fall. Snow was an odd sight in November around these parts, but the weatherman on the old, fuzzy TV had said a cold front was coming in from the northwest. The corn stalks swayed in the gentle dusk breeze, and amidst it all sat the scarecrow. It was no ordinary scarecrow, I didn't know who made it, but it bore the face of a malnourished rabbit. 
a ridge above where each eye would have been cast deep shadows on its face, and its burlap skin was pulled tight, giving it a gaunt face to match its tattered eyes. The body was painfully low effort compared to the face, consisting of only two tree branches and a burlap bag stuffed with hay, all tied to a post. As the snow continued to fall, it dusted its limbs gently in white. My childish brain was struck with the notion that the scarecrow might be cold. I stood then, walking back into the house. My steps were light as I crept to the front closet. In the time I'd been living in that old farmhouse, I knew that the less noise I made, the less my existence mattered. Generally, one would view that as a negative thing, but to me, it meant avoiding confrontation. I wasn't so lucky that night, though. I couldn't always be avoided. Just where the hell do you think you're going? My aunt snapped as I reached for the spare winter coat in the closet. The smell of sap clung to her skin and stained her fingers like blood. I considered myself lucky she did not still hold the axe. I was so caught off guard that I gave her my honest answer. I'm getting a coat for the scarecrow. It's cold. She let out a mirthless laugh. It was her way of saying, no the hell you aren't, without wasting her words. She slammed the closet door shut, nearly catching my fingers. I jumped. Where's the Bible I gave you? I realized a moment before the back of her firm, bony hand hit the back of my head that I was still sitting outside on the porch. Go get that Bible. You should be ashamed leaving the good book out in the elements like that. Rotten girl. So, like the rotten girl I was, I immediately ran back outside to retrieve the Bible. The snow was falling thicker now. The graceful flakes smashed into blustery gray. The air tasted like dirty ice and pine. I pulled my jacket tighter around me as I clutched the Bible. The scarecrow was still standing at its diligent watch. For a moment, I imagined it shivering in the cold. That's when I made up my mind. The yellow grass crackled under my feet. It was the kind that stayed perpetually crunchy, even in the lushest of spring. Hello, I said meekly, as I came to a stop right in front of it. I thought you might like a little company. The hare crow gave no reply. I found myself relieved that it had not spoken back, as if that were a reasonable thing to fear in the first place. You look lonely and cold, so I came to give you this. I shrugged the jacket from my shoulders and stood on my tiptoes to affix it to his branchy ones. The breeze that swayed the corn stalks slowly died. The quiet was serene until it went on for too long. I felt the cold fingers of observance creep up my back. Something was watching me. How can you watch the fields if you don't have any eyes? I asked it, mostly to break the silence. Here, let me fix that for you. Everyone deserves to see, especially you. You have such a nice view of the sunset. I took out the permanent marker left in my overalls pocket from when Aunt Rachel had made me copy Bible verses earlier after I couldn't find her misplaced axe. I was nearly unable to reach, but I managed. I gave it the best rabid-looking eyes I could. We stood there for a moment, observing each other. Finally, I turned back. I'll see you again soon. I tossed over my shoulder as I began my brisk walk back to the warmth of the house. My aunt was mercifully drooling in her rocking chair, some late-night program droning on behind her snores. My father was awake in his room, even though I couldn't hear his voice. His grief was loud enough. I sat the Bible down on the china cabinet. My shoulders hadn't stopped shaking, and I blew into my red hands, trying to bring the feeling back to them. You really are one of a kind, Pandora. The scent of cocoa rose from the pot Jacob was stirring, warm and inviting. 
He was the one lucky enough to be allowed use of the stove out of the two of us. I watched you out the window, you know. My shoulders relaxed. They've been tense since meeting the Scarecrow for no particular reason. It had only been Jacob's eyes on me. I don't know why you'd get so close to that Scarecrow, much less give it your jacket. That thing, it freaks me out. He confessed, as he poured the steaming chocolate into two silver mugs. I sighed. Nobody deserves to be alone, was all I could say. He rubbed his thumb over his bottom lip for a few moments, something he did when lost in thought, and then he smiled. Fair enough, but you better not go asking me for any of my clothes when yours are on that rabbit out there. You'll be running around yelling, My shoes! My shoes! The rabbit took my shoes! But you'll just have to be barefoot as that scarecrow tap dances all the way to New York City in Little Pandora's Chuck Taylors. We both howled with laughter at this until we nearly woke my aunt. Once we drained our mugs and my body had returned to its normal temperature, we moved up the creaking oak stairs to our bedroom. Worn white bed covers swallowed us whole, and we both fell into a comfortable silence. There was no bedtime story from our father that night. Just as the first rays of sun were creeping over the window sill, and the rats in the walls were beginning to quiet, Aunt Rachel woke us up for school with little more than a breakfast is downstairs, don't be late. She was a brash woman. Some would call her behavior abusive, and they'd be right. But in those days, it was all filed under the all-too-broad label of strict. Still, she did the bare minimum of keeping us alive and healthy. As I walked out onto the porch, where the thin layers of snow from the nights before had begun to melt, I saw my jacket. Jacob dragged behind me, and I wondered if it was him who'd retrieved the jacket and left it there on the porch, so our aunt wouldn't turn my backside inside out. I just shrugged and put it on. Jacob met me at the bottom steps with our school bags, and off we walked. It wasn't a long walk to and from school. The town had one bus and one route. It didn't end up in our neck of the woods, for one reason or another. Though school was a safe haven, I hadn't made many friends there. Today would be the day that changed that. That day was the day when the teacher stood at the front of the class with a girl clutching the black straps of her Lisa Frank backpack and introduced Naomi to the class. When I met the girl who showed me her favorite books among the middle school library shelves. When I met the girl who held my hand in the hallway and gave me a quick, innocent kiss behind the tunnel on the rickety playground. That day changed my life forever. I skimmed down the dirt road home. Jacob trying his best to keep up with me. The breath of honeysuckle flowers in the air felt sweeter that afternoon. What's got you about to fly away, Pandora? Jeez, you're like a kite. For the first time since getting to school that morning, I felt a note of hesitation. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened had I kept my secret, if I hadn't found validation in Jacob. I scanned around and then whispered, as if the very trees and dirt had eyes and ears. I kissed a girl today, Jake. Instead of a spiel about how it was wrong like some small part of me expected, an ooh rose from his mouth, the kind of jeering that fills classrooms when someone gets called to the principal's office. Pandora has a crush on somebody. Is it the new girl? We spent the last leg of our journey home lightheartedly bickering back and forth as all siblings tend to do. It was only when the house came into view that Jacob grabbed my arm and stopped me. There was a deep sadness in his voice. Pandora, listen to me. This is important. Whatever you do, you cannot tell Aunt Rachel about this. She... Uh, she won't like it. I want you to keep it a secret between us for now, okay? At the time, it didn't click in my mind why he'd say that. The bruises on Jacob's arms and legs, the cries of unclean for my aunt, 
and the sad look he often had in his eyes in that year we lived with her never truly hit me until the day it did. We got inside and were immediately put to work in the back garden. The afternoon moved slower than a slug in molasses until Aunt Rachel sent us to bed after a meal of watery chicken stew and a too-hot bath. My muscles ached as I pulled open our window. I paused, listening for Jacob's slow and even breathing. When he didn't stir, I climbed out onto the front porch roof. I slid down the wooden support and turned my eyes out to the field. There sat the scarecrow. The half-moon hung low in the sky above it, a yellow and slightly sour lemon wedge. I walked up to him as if approaching an old friend. Um, Mr. Harecrow? No, that's not right. You need a name. Everybody needs a name. How about Frith? The name had worked its way out of the corners of my mind from when I lifted Watership down from the high school-only section of the library. It fit in a way I knew nothing else would. The wind made the cornstalks sway, almost in approval. I smiled. I love names, especially Naomi. I love the name Naomi. I imagined that the scarecrow was giving me a knowing look. Okay, I know, I know. I'll tell you what happened. So just like my brother, I relayed my secret in a quiet tone, as if I was telling it the directions to some treasure deep in a swamp. Frith, for his part, listened patiently and quietly. I talked with him until the first hints of the sun lightened the night sky. Once I realized that dawn was fast approaching, I scrambled back onto the roof and into my bed. I thought you'd gone and gotten yourself killed. I heard him before I saw him. Jacob was sitting up with his eyes weak from sleep. Then I went and looked out the window. Why do you like that scarecrow so much? It gives me the creeps. I sighed as I began to change out of my pajamas and into my school clothes. I hadn't shut my eyes the entire night. School would be exhausting today, even if it was better than here. He looks lonely. Nobody deserves to be alone. And I know I'm the only one who's brave enough to go spend time with him. I paused to pull on my shoes before adding, No offense, Jacob. He pulled himself out of bed, and the cycle of school, chores, homework, and bed started all over again. Whatever free time I had was spent with my brother, my nose in whatever books I could hide from my aunts, or talking with my quiet friend, Frith. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and months turned into nearly a year. My aunt only got worse in her treatment of us. The nights we were sent to bed without supper, and the pages of Bible verses we had written gradually grew in number. We saw very little of our father during that time, only the ghost of his footsteps moving to and from the kitchen or bathroom at odd hours of the night, and the whispers of weeping for our mother and his wife. I never blamed him for turning a blind eye to our abuse, and I still don't. He was at the bottom of an inescapable ocean. That was why when we walked in on the night of Halloween after we'd been sent to bed without supper yet again, Jacob and I were shocked to see him appear in our doorway. He looked fragile, in the purest sense of the word. His perpetually sore eyes crisscrossed with red veins. He'd eaten very little food in the months since we'd gotten here, and his figure reflected that. He was more rake than man. He ran a hand through his matted orange hair and sucked in a breath through chapped lips. I held in my tears at the sight of him. You kiddos have time for a bedtime story. I saw the renewed joy in his eyes when our faces lit up. I think we can fit it into our schedule, Jacob said in a breathless, happy voice. He sat down on the end of my bed as Jacob flew across the room to us. 
our father started a tale about a little girl living high in a tower, but I stopped him. Dad, you should tell us something scary. It's Halloween, after all. He rubbed his scruffy chin as he considered my request. You two are awfully young for that sort of thing, aren't you? I laughed a little. Dad, I'm thirteen. For a moment, his eyes filled with sorrow. I knew now what that look meant. It was one of a man watching the lives of his kids slip by him, knowing he wasn't present for it. I guess you're right. After several long moments of deep thought, our father began to weave a tale about two little girls wandering in the forest on Halloween to find a magic well, only to find out it was haunted. It wasn't his best, but it kept us gripped until the very end. With his story concluded, he stood up and rubbed his face. I love you both so much. Don't ever forget that. He reached out a hand and offered us both a small brownie in the shape of a jack-o'-lantern. Our aunts didn't believe in Halloween, so there was no hoard of treats to be had for us. Jacob and I eagerly took the treats, and our dad smiled. As we filled our stomachs with the sweet chocolate goodness, he got to his feet and wiped at his perpetually weepy eyes. I'll be more around for you two now. I promise. I can't say for certain whether he would have kept that promise or not. I think that he would have. The weekend slipped by like a fish in oil. I stood at my locker just after lunch Monday afternoon, searching for my math homework. My face flushed when I felt two firm fingers press into my shoulder blade. You'll never guess what I saw, Naomi whispered, as if she had seen into King Tut's tomb. I stood turning towards her. Her eyes were soft but sly. She was hell on wheels, but she made my heart sing. What? Don't leave me in suspense. She nodded towards the block of lockers, where the obnoxious teen boys would often mill about, and said, You see that locker over there? There's something in it. A playboy. I was a sheltered child. She said the word playboy with a drama that didn't land for me. What's that? She took my hand as we crept down the hall. It was beginning to empty out as stir-crazy kids piled into the worn jungle gyms and swings outside. It's a magazine with naked ladies. My jaw dropped. Seriously? I think I can get it for us. She said with a grin. The concept of something so scandalous and private in my young mind being proudly on display along with my still-emerging sexuality made it an offer too tempting to pass up. We found the locker in question, and she held a calloused hand up to her ear as she worked the cheap blue lock. Naomi was an artist, and her medium was mischief. When the padlock popped open with ease, she handed it to me. You do the honors. No snooping. We just want the magazine. Naomi had a strange set of morals about such things. Thievery was fair game, but only in moderation. Nothing more than we came for. She would have made a wonderful Robin Hood. I pulled open the locker, and my heart froze in my chest. It was empty save for a large white hair, twitching on the metal floor. Its head bent sideways, and dark, frothy blood dribbled out of its nose and mouth, pooling onto the floor. Bile rose in my throat as a jarring noise grew around me, from everywhere and nowhere. The dying squeals of a rabbit were something I should have considered myself lucky not to have heard before then. The cry felt like a child's, one that was screaming for their life. Before I knew what was happening, I felt the lockers on the opposite side of the hallway against my back. I tumbled to the floor as a wave of nausea and dizziness washed over me. 
Pandora, are you okay? Naomi helped me to my feet and steadied me. I pointed at the locker, blubbering something about rabbits. She looked, and then so did I. It was gone. I wondered if it was ever there in the first place. I rubbed my eyes as Naomi nabbed the dirty magazine. I haven't been sleeping very well lately, I muttered. Bad dreams. She smiled and put a hand on my shoulder. That's what rabbits do, don't they? They disappear. I laughed, then she laughed. Then we laughed so hard I forgot about what we were laughing about. She pulled me into the bathroom, and we flipped through the pages of nude women and erotic poses as we huddled in the last stall on the right. When the bell rang, she pressed a soft kiss to my mouth and asked, Do you want to keep it? I stared at the outstretched magazine. The offer was tempting, yet so dangerous. Live a little. She joked in response to my hesitant expression. Open the box, Pandora. Okay, I finally relented. Wait, one second. She took out her favorite purple sharpie, the one she always kept on her. I watched her scribble at the very last page, right across the chest of a woman in a barely there bathing suit. It was an address and a phone number. As soon as I got home, I wrote it down in my journal. Had I not done that, Naomi likely would have been a middle school love, lost to the endless march of time and life. But that fate was instead replaced with a stream of letters that lasted well into my teens. Loving at first, but then only mutually friendly. I squirreled the playboy away under my bed, tucking it so it lay parallel with the frame. There, I assumed, it was safe. I dared not bring it out again unless I was sure I was alone in the deadest of autumn nights. Another week trickled by. The following Monday was calm until we returned home from school. On that day, Jacob had been stopped by our dog, Blue, in the yard. So much of my mental energy is spent on reflection and what-ifs. Wondering what would have happened had Jacob followed me like usual is one of the most persistent. The wind whipped dry red leaves around the front yard as I stared out the window in the kitchen. My stomach growled and I moved to fix myself a sandwich. Wondering why my aunt had not yet accosted us for chores or homework. Behind me, I heard the quiet, yet anxiety-inducing clacking of her shoes as she entered the room. I set down the knife I'd been holding, and for far too long, it was absolutely silent. Then, under her breath, I heard the words. Too many chances. And the devil in my house. I turned towards her and was knocked off balance by the backside of her hand crashing into my face. Her voice was full of cold fury. Do you want to tell me what this is, you wretched little thing? I whimpered as she knocked me to the hard kitchen floor. I knew exactly what it was. It was the Playboy. I thought I'd hidden it well enough. I was wrong. You sinful little harpy, with your book full of whores. She snatched up my hair and started dragging me out through the doorway and towards the stairs. I thrashed desperately. You disgusting little freak. I've tolerated this long enough. I've allowed Satan to take up residence in my home. I will not have it any longer. Your sin will not go unpunished. Her voice popped and cracked with an unspeakable rage, less curt than it had been before. My fingernails raked at the stairs and anything else I might try and gain purchase on as my head thumped against each solid wooden step. My nose hit the wall at one point, exploding with blood. I tasted dust and copper. By the time we were on the second floor, I was too dizzy to scream for help. She dragged me into the bathroom and slammed the door, locking it. 
you will both have to stand before the Lord and be judged. I will make sure of it. He will throw your wretched, miserable souls into the great inferno. I waited as she began to fill the tub with water. Urgent footsteps pounded around the kitchen downstairs, though I could not decipher their owner. Pulling myself up, I tried to throw myself towards the door. She caught me by the neck. Please, I begged. Please don't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She spit in my face. If you're lucky, maybe this water will purge you before you stand before God Almighty. She whispered as she plunged my head underneath the icy water, and my world went blurry. My body burst into uncontrollable shivers as I flailed desperately. I could feel my lungs filling with cold water as my aunt held her grip. As she slammed my face against the porcelain bottom of the bathtub, crimson bloomed out into the water. For a moment, I thought of death. I wondered whether fire and brimstone truly would be waiting for me on the other side. Then, I heard the screaming, the clatter of metal on metal, and the breaking of glass. Behind all that, I could hear another sound my delirious brain couldn't recognize. My aunt released me and stood up, storming out the bathroom door with a slew of curses. I threw myself from the tub, throwing up mouthfuls of frigid water before gulping in as much air as I could. I struggled on to weak legs and ran for my life. I rammed my shoulder into the back door and tumbled down the back steps. I could hear the cacophony of noises that had freed me from my watery grave better now. Jacob had heard my desperate struggle. That was why he was running around the front yard, shouting blasphemies and obscenities and banging our only two pots together. My aunt was chasing him with a knife. Behind that, there was an ever-present cloud of cawing. The swarm of carrion birds blotted out the sun. I slipped out into the barn out back and slammed the big wooden door behind me, pushing some dust-coated farm equipment in front of it. When the bangs started at the door, I climbed into the loft and picked the corner with the least amount of spiderwebs. I shivered there for hours, blood drying on my face as my mind created shapes in the dark. I watched figures made of shadow dig their claws into the sides of the loft and pull themselves up ready to devour me. I could feel the whispers of their fingers on my face. I didn't leave the barn until slivers of moonlight peeked in through the rotting wooden slats. My clothes were still damp as I trudged over to one of my only friends in this accursed place. My breath came out in frigid clouds as I focused on drawing air in and out. She tried to drown me. She tried to kill me. I was going to die. I collapsed against Frith's sturdy wooden support and began sobbing. I can't go back inside. She'll do it again. She'll do it again. I'm going to freeze out here. As I curled my knees into my chest and wailed in earnest, I felt something on my back. A thin scraping like the comforting touch of a mother, but in all the wrong ways. In my periphery, I saw it. The edge of a gnarled branch curled into knotted fingers. I couldn't move. The wind whistled around in the stalks of corn. It almost sounded like a whisper. I launched up off the ground and ran around to the back of the house. Jacob sat there, beside the crawlspace door where he'd no doubt been hiding. He looked up at me with a swollen black eye. Blood was caked into his deep frown, and his nose bent just a little too far to the right. A long slash ran across his chin and jawline, a battle scar for saving my life. Guilt seized me for not coming to his aid. At that moment, I felt like a coward. She's gone insane. Dad isn't in his room. I think she might have killed him. She hadn't murdered our father, of course. 
He'd gone into town that day to look for work. He wanted to turn our lives around. But as children suffering from the hands of an aunt in a murderous rage, there was little else we could come up with. I didn't tell Jacob about the scarecrow, how it had touched my back with its crackly tree hand and winked its marker eye at me. Too much was going on, and though I knew he would have believed me, there was only so much a mind like his could stand. We snuck back into the house, Jacob pulling me along and whispering reassurances as we climbed the stairs, our feet as close to the wall as possible to avoid making the old wood creak. I could only breathe easy once we were in our room and the door was locked. It was a small barrier between us and the madwoman that now wanted our blood spilled, but it was a barrier nonetheless. We have to run away. Dad can't save us now. Jacob was shoving things into a bag. I was still so tired, and so very cold. I stripped out of my damp sweater, desperate for dry warmth. Morning. Uh, can't we wait until the morning? I whispered. Jacob looked my way as I curled into the fetal position under my meager white blanket. His expression was heavy with a fight between fear and concern. Okay, morning, but then we have to go. I rubbed my eyes hard. We'll sleep in shifts. He paused before nodding quietly. Jacob coaxed me out of bed and helped me into dry clothes, keeping his eyes on the door as often as he could. My brother, my protector. You better wake me up, I mumbled as my eyes grew too heavy to stay open. He didn't respond, instead merely throwing his blanket over me and causing a deep shiver to rack me, the kind you get when the warmth is finally returning to your body. I knew he would end up letting me sleep. My dreams were plagued with dark visions, twisting animalistic bodies dipping in and out of shadows as I could hear the cries for help from my brother somewhere in the distance, accompanied by the wail of a discordant calliope. I shot upright in bed sometime in the early hours of the morning. Jacob lay against my bed, his breathing deepened in light sleep. Behind it, I could hear an odd sound, the creaking of the front door on its hinges, no doubt pushed by the wind. I slowly got to my feet and slid them across the wooden floor to the door. Against my better judgment, I disengaged our bedroom lock and slowly pushed the door open. The house was icy, and my shivers returned in full force. I coughed quietly into my hand as I came to the top of the stairs. As my bare feet descended the wooden steps as quietly as possible, I found myself reciting a prayer I'd heard whispered by my grandmother above my mother's pale body. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. I could hear thumps in the living room. It sounded like the movement of some sort of wild animal. Blessed art thou among men, blessed the fruits of thy womb. The air smelled foul, like rotting plants and urine. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now. Terror seized my lungs, making it hard to breathe as I neared the bottom, and at the hour of our death. I reached the bottom step and peeked into the living room, holding my aunt above the floor as her pink slippered feet swung frantically, was Frith. Its long, knotted branches hovered just in front of her face, and my aunt's skin looked paper white in the glow of the TV. How the scarecrow kept upright on its single support post, I couldn't tell you. Physics bent to the will of whatever this thing truly was. The burlap was pulled tight around whatever lay beneath it, 
and yellow eyes with wide black pupils bulged out of the ribs. Swathes of rough brown fabric hung from the mouth and cheeks, revealing a mouth filled to near bursting with white, dinosauric teeth. Before I could so much as blink, the scarecrow sunk its makeshift claws into her neck. A fountain of blood erupted from her mouth and then everywhere else, as it dragged its impossibly sharp digits through her neck like a sword through hot butter. Her headless body made a wet thump as it hit the floor. A small whimper escaped my mouth, and the hare's head snapped to look at me. She deserved it, make no mistake, but in the moment, I felt no sense of satisfaction. All I felt was insurmountable fear. I shrieked as I flew up the stairs. I could hear Jacob jump to his feet, and my body crashed into his as I flung myself into our room. Go, now! But we didn't have time to make it out the window. As the door opened, I flung Jacob towards my bed, and we scrambled underneath. We both heard steady thumps as the monster I'd formerly known as Frith crept into our room. Pandora, Pandora, what is that? Jacob's voice was quiet and urgent, and I pressed his face into my chest. Nothing, Jacob. Keep your eyes closed. Don't look, okay? He'd protected me. Now I was doing the same. It stood over my bed, staring down into my eyes with its wide, soulless ones, as I held Jacob close to me. That was all I knew until the sun began to creep over the cornfields. Its eyes and mine. I didn't know whether or not it intended for me to meet the same fate as my aunt. As dawn ran its fingers through the halls and forests of Tennessee, the scarecrow broke our staring contest. As soon as it began to move, I squeezed my eyes shut tight. I leaned down, and with a wooden claw, it stroked my right cheek. A thin trickle of blood ran its way down my neck, but still, I remained focused. It withdrew, and I heard the slow thumps as it retreated down the stairs and out the front door. I still have that scar. Despite the sun spilling into the room from the window, we didn't move from our spot under the bed. The terror and innocence both left my body in one great outpouring as the exhaustion of someone that's witnessed a murder took hold. I pulled Jacob closer as my eyes slipped closed. The sound of a scream woke me. It was the voice of a man, one that I hadn't heard in so long. It was our father, our real father, and not the ghost that had so long wandered the rough oaken floors of the farmhouse when we'd long since fallen into our beds. Before Jacob and I could fully get out from under the bed, he'd flown up the stairs and thrown open the door. His face was flushed, and his eyes were full of a vibrant sort of terror the kind only a father who sees dark blood staining the floor all the way to the back door, and his sister and children nowhere to be found, could feel. He was alive again, grief stamped out like a dying fire pit by fresh fear. Kids, are you okay? I hated seeing him so worried, but running into his outstretched arms felt like rising from the grave. Things moved extremely fast after that. Police were called. The farmhouse was cornered off with yellow tape that whipped in the late November wind. The cornfield where one scarecrow had gone AWOL was stripped bare. We found a temporary home in a dingy little inn on Main Street. The sanctioned search for my aunts didn't last long. On the third day, everyone went to sleep and when they brought their trucks back and assembled their grids, they made a grisly discovery. 
my father refused to tell me what had been found until I was much older. Sitting on top of the pole where Frith had once been was my aunt's severed head, her milky eyes still filled with a cosmic sort of horror, like she'd seen the very devil she'd preached so adamantly about. Laid out on the ground in front of it was a blood-soaked Bible, the same Bible that my aunt had made us read innumerable times. Every single line of text in the entire book was indecipherable, except for one verse. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Shortly after that, we were packing things away into boxes and loading them into our father's truck. After some slight pressing, my brother admitted to our father what our aunt had done to us. There were many emotions, and all of them crowded over one another for center stage. Despair at losing his sister, really losing her, in a way that death can't hold a candle to. Guilt for not seeing the bruises on Jacob, or the unspoken pleas in our eyes on the rare occasions he'd leave his room. Sadness that the love of his life was not here to advise him on where to go next or what to do now. But the greatest of those was rage. A boiling fury at the attempted murder of his children at the hands of someone he trusted. That anger has never fully gone away. We left town two days before the funeral. To this day... Frith's motives are still unclear to me. It's possible that the Scarecrow was some sort of unorthodox protector. I'd been an only friend to it, and it was returning the favor. Maybe it was never something to be feared. But sometimes, I find myself looking up places I'd been in the early hours of the morning, and Google takes me to that little town. Each time I see the slowly increasing amount of missing persons reports... It's hard not to feel that Frith was a hair of a darker color. I called him Bubba, but it was just an ironic moniker for the annual Grist Mill Festival. You see, we don't have Bubbas around here. They're a creation of another place, and maybe even another time. Bubba is a southern nickname. And this ain't the South. It's just that the tourists who come down for the festival don't know diddly about us here, and for some reason they think we're in the South. Let me tell you, when you perform for tips, you learn real soon that it don't pay to tell your audience that they're wrong about the local culture. That's why Al became Bubba, and I became Coy for the little Vaudeville-style show we put on every year. I guess the show's over now. It was a good run while it lasted, Live theater in the open air of the Ozarks was magical, and it gave all of us aspiring hillbilly thespians something to do for at least a few autumn evenings. For Al and I, it was a chance to escape the day-to-day -day drudgery of selling insurance in a small town. Somehow, over the years, we'd become the most popular act, so we got to close out the show under the lights of the harvest full moon, augmented, of course, by temporary stage lights. As Coy, the revenue man, I wore suspenders and trousers that were too short for me to emphasize my lanky frame. I overreacted, sneaking through the woods, looking for Bubba the Moonshiner's hideout in Bloody Crick Holler. As Bubba, Al wore a straw hat and bib overalls a size too small that accentuated his paunch. Bubba bumbled as he tended the sill, but whenever Coy got close to catching him, something would get in the way of the arrest. For the grand finale, Bubba would disguise his jugs of shine by labeling them Stump Water. Then, as Coy was sliding up the still through the underbrush, I would clutch my heel and declare, Lordy, I do been bit by one of them dare copperheads. I do declare I'm a gon' perish if I don't get the proper medication. Then Coy would drink a quarter of the moonshine, thinking it was Stump Water with potential healing properties. When Coy fell into a drunken stupor, Bubba escaped once again, 
and the show ended to laughter and uproaring applause. It was all fake, of course. Our people would have never talked like that, and you don't use stump water to treat snake bites. The tourists didn't know any better, though. They ate it all up and stuffed the money into Bubba's straw hats when the show was over. We grinned like idiots and made sure to draw a little extra when we said, Thank you, and mighty oblige to folks. I don't want to give the impression that Bubba, uh, I mean Al, and I were perverting Ozark culture just for the money. We were also doing it for the groupies. It was the funniest thing. Maybe it was something wafting in over the river, but every single night of the festival, there'd be women lined up after the show to meet Bubba and Koi. I can't for the life of me understand why pretty ladies would want to spend a night with small-town actors who portrayed a pair of adult hillbillies, but they sure did. To the vast annoyance of Stephen, the part-time pastor who worked as the festival director, Al and I would have a new lady friend every night of the festival. This year, Bubba's biggest fan was a little vague on where she was from, but her accent was from somewhere in Eastern Europe. Carmilla, that's what she said her name was, had slithered up to the stage the first night, squeezing through the tiny gaps between people in the crowd. She was tugging a little wisp of a woman behind her, and the poor thing kept getting bumped and jostled by the folks left in Carmilla's wake. When she got to the edge of the stage, she climbed right up on it and stared Bubba in the eye. My girlfriend and I will entertain you this night, she told him with a voice that purred mighty sweet, even if it sounded a lot older than the forty-five I judged her to be. Al probably should have been scared off by the way Carmela just announced what was going to happen without the least pretense of flirtation. I probably should have realized that something was wrong and warned him. But we were only ordinary men, and straight guys at that. Festival manager Stevens' disapproving stare from the edge of the stage was potent, but it stood no chance of stopping our libidos. When we looked at the pair of beautiful women, irrational desire overwhelmed whatever fear we ought to have felt. Both the women were far skinnier to the points of being pale, but other than their complexions, the two looked like total opposites. Carmilla's hair was as dark as the river behind our stage was at night. Just like the river, her hair tumbled and churned along a rushing course. She was tall, only a few inches shorter than me. She wore a low-cut, velvet dress that wouldn't have been out of place at an opera. She wore the evening gown well, but it certainly would have looked wrong on a lesser beauty out there, on the riverbank, beside the oldest functional grist mill in the Ozarks. Laura, as I later learned her name was, had blonde hair bobbed short. Despite the chill of the autumn evening, she wore a yellow sundress over her frail frame without so much as a shiver. She was fragile, somehow, like a timid sorority pledge who didn't know what she was getting into. At first I thought she was younger than Carmilla, but then I noticed the lines around her eyes and wondered. Laura's was a cold beauty that reflected the glowing inferno Carmela gave off. Bubba, I mean, Al, took Carmilla up on their offer. I'd harbored hopes that Laura would wind up with me, there being two of the ladies and two of us fellows, but the three of them disappeared into the nights before I even finished talking to the fans after our show. I figured I'd give Al hell about taking all the women for himself the next morning, along with ribbing him about how I didn't think he was man enough to handle the ladies at the same time. I took a red-headed girl from Potosi back to my house in town that night, and I did my best to keep her from feeling like a consolation prize. On the second day of the festival, Al was late. Really, really late. It was near sundown, and Stephen was powerful worried when I told him Al hadn't turned up and wasn't answering my calls or texts. Fortunately, before Stephen had to change the evening's program, Al staggered in, dressed like Bubba the Moonshiner, and looked like death warmed over. Stephen gave us both a disapproving glare and stalked off to shoo some cloggers off the stage. Dude, you're looking mighty rough, I said to my friend. 
He nodded, and I can see that beads of sweat were rolling down his pasty cheeks and disappeared into the heavy beard he'd grown for the festival. Then he answered me in little more than a whisper. Those women did something to me last night. Oh, I bet they did, I answered. Do you need a doctor, or are you just exhausted? He shook his head. No, I'll be all right. It was just weird. Then he summoned a wan smile and added, The show must go on, right? I nodded and got into costume. The show did go on that night, but only barely. Al's timing was off, bad. Half our corny jokes didn't land, yielding silence instead of the usual guffaws. The tips were slim that night, but we still made out okay. We also didn't have the usual crush of admirers after, but I did make the acquaintance of a pretty blonde woman named Felicia who'd come down for the show from Ashland. It being so long a drive home, she naturally needed a place to spend the night. As I was working out co-lodging arrangements for my new companion, I saw Al standing still and all alone at the footstairs down from the stage. Then Stephen turned off the lights, and it took a few moments for my eyes to adjust enough to the darkness. Fortunately, the moon was just shy of full, and the night was clear. As I led Felicia to my car, I saw a movement at the edge of the woods around the makeshift amphitheater where we performed. There stood Carmilla, shining in the moonlight. Behind her stood Laura, stark as a moonbeam. Both wore the same dress I'd seen them in the night before. My heart caught in my throat as the pale woman in black velvet raised her hand and pointed at my friend. She gestured, and Bubba the Moonshiner shambled towards her in the moonlight. The final night of the festival was a disaster. Al wasn't as late as he had been the day before, but he was still far from on time. When I asked him what the hell was wrong, he just mumbled something about the teeth of a big cat, which didn't make any sense to me. The crowd started shuffling out before we'd even finished our show. If our antics had been real, Koi the Revenue Man could have caught Bubba the Moonshiner mighty easily that night. Even if Koi was riding a box turtle into Bloody Crick Holler while yodeling at the top of his lungs, because Al mostly just stood in the center of the stage, sweating and oblivious to what I said and did as coy. I knew that we weren't going to be invited back next year. After the show, I still had a handful of female fans, but didn't have eyes for them. I was only interested in lighting into Al. He just stood there, blinking at me, while I yelled at him as Stephen shut off the lighting on a disappointing evening. After I'd blown off a little steam, I felt terrible about losing my temper. Something was obviously wrong with my best friend. I stopped in mid-holler. I'm sorry, I said. I know you're sick, Al. How can I help? He stood, sweating and swaying beside me under the full moon. Al! I hollered at him. No response. Al! Al! Then, finally. Al! His eyes focused on me for half a second, and he asked, Who's Al? Then, a shadow blotted out the moon, and he bolted into the woods with a sudden burst of energy. I started to chase after him, but the trail vanished amongst the trees. I hollered and I called, but I never got a response other than a screech that I hoped was a pant, not a holler, or worse. Finally, after about two in the morning, I gave up and went home. It was Stephen that brought me the news on Sunday morning. I appreciated that about the man. He didn't approve of me and my buddy womanizing, but even though he had a sermon to give later in the morning, he didn't want the sheriff to be the one to tell me. Al had been found in the woods face down in one of the creeks that fed into the river we'd been performing in front of. Stephen offered to pray with me, 
and I even let him, on account of I didn't know what else to do. He just said, Amen, and left when the police car pulled up. The deputy had a lot of questions for me. I didn't have any good answers after where I'd been the night before. At least not after I'd yelled at my buddy in front of God and everyone, and then chased him into the woods. The sheriff's deputy took it all down in a little notepad. When I volunteered that I thought the strange woman he'd been seeing had something to do with whatever happens to him, the fellow perked up. This woman and her friend, did I all tell you anything about their... The poor guy looked almost embarrassed as he trailed off. Then he gathered his strength and finished. Sexual interests. Not really, I answered. He just said it was weird, that they did something and that it was weird. He wouldn't tell me anything more than that. The officer shifted back and forth as he tried to look at me without meeting my eyes. Then he asked, Did your buddy have strange interests himself? Uh, did he ever talk about... He gagged and sobbed a little bit. After a few deep breaths, he continued. Did he ever talk about really heavy abuse with blood and stuff? I gulped a little and shook my head. No, I, I knew him pretty good, and I don't think he was into anything like that. I sat down quiet for a few seconds as the officer looked at me in an uncomfortable silence. Then I added, The thing is, what me and Al liked most of all was the chase. If anything, his kink was to always have a new girl every night. And it's hard to bust out crazy stuff that'll make a person bleed with a woman the first time you're with her, you know? The deputy blushed and nodded at me. I understand, he told me. Thank you for your time and your honesty. Then he got back in his cruiser and drove away. That night, I dreamed of Al. I need to be real clear about something here. Even though it sounds like a sitcom punchline, Al and I were best friends, not gay lovers. Not that there's anything wrong with being gay lovers, of course. So, I don't know why I dreamed of making love with Al, or maybe it was Bubba, because he was in bib overalls and wore a straw hat on his head. Only, in my dream, sometimes it was Bubba, and sometimes it was a giant black cat. Like a panther, only even larger and heavier. When I woke up in my dream, it stopped being lovemaking that we were doing and became something worse. He was on top of me, pinning me down. I screamed at him to get off of me, but when I did, he became more cats and less man. Then he threw his mouth open and screeched in that horrible, high-pitched way the big cats do, holding longer and longer, higher and higher. The sound of it was still cutting the night air clean in two over me when he sank his cat teeth into my chest, just below my collarbone on the left side. I felt something wet on my chest, and in my dream, I passed out. When I awoke for real, I felt like I had the mother of all hangovers, even though I hadn't touched a drop the night before. It was Monday morning, so I took a shower to get ready to return to the drab world of selling insurance. As I leaned against the side of the shower and hoped the hot water would clear my head, I noticed that the water flowing down the drain was tinged a dull red. I inspected myself as best as I could, and I found two holes in my chest, just below my collarbone, trickling blood down my exposed body. Stephen wasn't interrupting anything when he burst into my office Monday morning like a ball of fire, because I felt too terrible to be doing any work that he could interrupt. It's worse than I feared, he told me, before the door to my office had even swung all the way shut. I looked at him and tried to make sense of what he was talking about. What's worse? I asked, realizing as I spoke that I was slurring the words. At the sound of my voice, Stephen froze with his mouth dangling open. 
He sat down on the chair I kept for clients to use as I explained the benefits of whole life insurance after they've agreed to buy the auto policy from me. Then he pulled one of those little Bibles out of his shirt pockets and looked me square in the eyes. It came to you, didn't it? He said. That's much worse than I feared. I looked at Stephen with blary eyes, too confused to watch my language around a preacher. What the hell are you talking about? Stephen's eyes were full of concern. I came here because Al's body disappeared from the morgue last night, and that means you're in danger. Uh-huh. I wasn't at my most articulate. But from the look of you, it's clear that the danger has already found you. Mm hmm? I said as I slid out of my chair and oozed underneath my desk. The world went dark. I woke up in the back of Stephen's car as it pulled into my driveway. Then the next thing I knew, he and some guy dressed like a paramedic were gently pulling me from the car. What's going on? I asked. Good, you're awake. Stephen said. We don't have to break in. Then he added, This is Bill. The paramedic nodded at me. Just relax, and we'll take care of you, he told me. One supported me on each side as they drug me up the driveway. When we got to the front door, I was able to fish my house key out of my pants pocket in just three tries. Once we were inside, the two men laid me on the couch, and Bill ducked back outside. Stephen pulled a chair up beside my head. Al came to you last night, didn't he? I nodded. Did he? An unexpected tear trickled down my cheek. I blinked furiously as I nodded again. I thought it was a dream. Stephen put a hand on mine. I'm afraid it wasn't a dream. It was all too real. I just want you to know. I struggled to figure out how to explain that no matter what had happened to me, I wasn't gay. Somehow, this preacher I barely knew was taking care of me, and I was pretty sure that me being gay would be a deal breaker for any preacher I'd ever met. Before I could get the words out, the front door opened again, and Bill entered carrying a medical kit and a small cooler. I'm liable to get fired for this, babe, he said as he gave Stephen a quick kiss on the lips. Are you sure it was one of them? Stephen looked up at Bill with a tenderness I'd never seen on his face in all his years of managing the festivals. I'm all but sure, and we'll be certain once we examine him. Before I could object... Bill had unbuttoned my shirt and spread it open, exposing my chest. Both Stephen and Bill sucked in their breath when they saw the two puncture wounds below my collarbone. Bill put a hand on Stephen's shoulder. Oh my god, Bill whispered. We need to pray, Stephen announced. The blood felt strange going in, but it helped a lot. After Stephen had finished praying that I would be delivered from the evil that stalked me, which was a sentiment I could very much get behind, Bill asked me if I knew my blood type. I, oh, negative, I told him. Good thing. That's what I borrowed from the ambulance, he answered. He took a bag of blood and an IV kit out of the cooler he'd brought into the house, and in the blink of an eye I had cold, fresh blood trickling into my arm. As I shivered on the couch, Stephen set to work on the wounds on my chest. Instead of using anything in the medical kit, he went back out to the car and brought a bag of groceries in. He pulled out an enormous jar of minced garlic, opened it, and started to spoon heaping mounds of it onto my chest. Whoa, wait a minute here. I tried to holler as I raised a weak hand to stop him. What exactly is going on here? Stephen pushed my hand out of the way and slathered bits of garlic on my chest. You've been victimized by a creature that's more or less a vampire. 
The garlic will draw out the venom that remains in your system and help repel future attacks. I gaped at him. I think I'm going to need you to start with something a little more basic. Satisfied with the garlic he'd spackled onto me, Stephen was beginning to soak a dish rag with olive oil. What's a more basic thing you would like me to begin with? He asked as he began to dab the garlic with the olive oil. I took a deep breath and realized that between the fresh blood and the garlic, I was feeling a little less terrible than before. I jerked a thumb at Bill. Like, who's he? I asked. A paramedic, Bill answered for himself. And my husband, Stephen added. Excuse me? You're gay? Why didn't you tell us? Stephen snorted. Your fixation on me being married to another man, rather than your near-fatal attack by an old evil one, makes it very clear that I was correct to keep my orientation to myself. No, man, it's fine. I struggled to answer him. Was it fine? I thought it was fine, but a gay Ozark preacher was still a shock. I'm sorry, I added as my mind raced. It's just that I think my brain was fixated on the surprising detail instead of the impossible detail. Stephen felt my forehead like he was checking me for a fever. It's okay, he said. Jesus forgives, and so do I. Unfortunately, the old evil ones are very real. I knew they were in North America, but I never dreamed that they'd come this far. Bill came and stood behind Stephen. The paramedic put a hand on his husband's shoulder. So, preacher man, he said, what are we going to do now? It turned out that what we were going to do was use me as bait. I didn't like the idea one bit, but Stephen seems to know a hell of a lot more about the monster we were facing than I did. You can't run, he told me. Al was your best friend in his mortal life, and a welcome guest in your home. Because of that connection to you, the demon that has taken him will find you wherever you go. So what will we do? I asked him. We stand and fight. I went to bed more or less like usual, only Stephen and Bill were hiding in my closet. Despite being bone-tired, I couldn't begin to go to sleep, with two dudes armed with stakes, crosses, and Bibles watching me and what sure seems to be an honest-to-God vampire stalking me. Still, I tried to do the best I could to at least feign sleep. Sometime around midnight, a mist began to ooze in around the window sill in my bedroom. At first, it was too fine to be sure it was there, but before long, the moonbeam streaming in showed a cloud, then a vague shape, then a dark cat, and finally, Bubba the Moonshiner in bib overalls and a straw hat. He sniffed the air as he climbed on top of me. There was a wave of cold throbbing off of him into the air of my bedroom. Suddenly, I could see my breath as it fogged in the air. A tongue far too long for a human shot out of Bubba's mouth and licked from my stomach. I cringed and yelled, but Bubba expanded to block out all light and all reason over me. He lowered himself onto me with a feline pounce. I almost wanted him to have me, but I was glad when I heard Stevens shout from behind him. Bubba hissed as something pointed and wooden erupted from his chest. Black liquid dripped onto me and began to smoke holes into my sheets. The monster whirled, a cat now, screeching into the night. It took a swipe with a paw and tossed Bill across the room. Then the big cat leapt for the closest window as Stephen leapt after it. The cat seemed to just slip through the glass somehow, but Stephen shattered it as he hit it. As the shards flew everywhere, Stephen plunged another stake into the back of the beast. They landed together in a yowling heap in the bush under my window. Bill scrambled through the broken glass, and I mustered my energy to stagger after him. 
There, in the yard, Stephen was beating the creature with his tiny pocket Bible. The cat was shifting back and forth from mist to man to cat, until finally it became Bubba again. The man collapsed toward the street, but he was screeching like a cat. Then, Stephen declared, In the name of God, be gone. There was a gust of wind, the moon winked out, and I collapsed beneath my sweet gum tree. I stayed the rest of that night with Stephen and Bill. The next few days, too. They patched me up as best they could, but I'm not anywhere close to better. I'm not okay. I reckon that I'm as good as I'm going to get, though, so I'd best be off. Stephen says that vengeance is the Lord's, or some such thing. Stephen knows a lot, but there's something that I know, too. That woman is out there somewhere, and she's gonna pay. Hours away from 1999, it felt like the entire world held their breath, waiting for the world to come crashing down because of a computer bug. I was convinced I was not going to live to see the new year, and I wished it was for the same reason the rest of the world was worrying about. On that night, I found myself in a dimly lit warehouse, tied to a chair, desperately trying to get out of this situation alive. My father was a no-good human being that brought down everyone who ever came into contact with him. I was glad to be away from him the moment I was able. The only good thing he ever gave me was a bit of advice that kept me alive during my adult life. It doesn't matter if you have nothing. You just need to convince people you have something they need. And that's exactly what I did. I conned people thinking I was the right person for the job. Faking skills to get paid until I either learned a said skill, then got bored of the job and moved on, or got caught and fired. Soon I found myself not able to find respectable work that paid enough to keep me living. Slowly I started doing more and more little jobs on the wrong side of the law. It was a creeping downward slide. I didn't notice just how far down I'd gotten until I hit rock bottom. I was running too many plans. Too many promises to too many people. It only took one thing to slip up for me to land in boiling hot water. And it finally happened. I was jumped while walking to a bar, beaten and blindfolded. The long trip spent in a trunk of a car, unable to get free. I tried sweet-talking my captors, giving them more promises I swore I could keep until I was forced into a rough wooden chair and strapped down. The moment the blindfold came off, I knew I wasn't going to leave that building in one piece. I have many bosses, but the man before me was the toughest and meanest of the bunch. My sweet-talking skills may have gotten me the job at first, but was not good enough of a skill to get out of the mess I was in. I owed him money I did not have. That was it. That was all the facts. I should accept it, I just couldn't. I needed to believe in a good outcome, or else I really had no chance. No matter what I promised and said in my sweetest of tones, I was still worked over. I was alive, though, so he must have thought I had something of worth. I feared what would happen when they found out I had no girlfriends or sisters I could sell out. No hidden money and just a crappy car to my name. I didn't even own my own fridge. If I ever moved out from my apartment, it would stay with my penny-pinching landlord. The only way they could make money off of me was to sell my organs. My blood type was a rare, universal kind that meant anyone could use it for transfusions. In my darker times, I sold my bloods to get by, and that's how I knew. I wondered if that meant my organs could be used by more people, and therefore be worth more. I did not want to find out. Boss, I keep telling you, I didn't lose your money. I just invested it. If you just give me to the end of the month, I'll get it back in triple. If you off me tonight, you'll really be getting nothing. I said as coolly as someone who was strapped to a chair with a broken nose and a broken set of fingers could speak. 
That massive man of pure, intimidating muscle did not look moved by my offer. Even with all the pain I was in, I felt annoyed. Are you going to kill me or not? Torturing me isn't going to get your money back, so just let me go or be done with it. I don't think he's worth the time. We should just feed him to that thing and be done with it. One of the grunts said, looking at me in disgust. What thing? I knew the boss I made the foolish mistake of borrowing money from liked cats. Big cats. No one knew the number of illegal black market pets he owned. He liked them scattered throughout the country for safekeeping. Honestly, being eaten by a lion or a tiger was almost neat enough of a way to be killed. I almost didn't mind. Almost. The boss looked over at the man who suggested it, then back at me, deciding on my worth. Triple... I stammered out, but deep down I knew what my future held. Yeah, I'm done with him. Bring that thing in. Make sure there isn't a mess left behind. The boss said, giving a wave and walking away, completely ignoring me, begging for him to just stay and listen. I was frantic, almost out of my mind from fear. I started talking to the two men who stayed behind, while the third went off to get whatever beast that was about to make me a nice dinner. Come on, don't do this. I wasn't kidding about the money. If I can get this much in just a few days, just think of how much I can get in the future. You won't need to work for the boss anymore. Think about it, right? In a few months, you can just retire somewhere nice and hot, and the girls are dirt cheap. Isn't that the best idea you ever heard? I kept chattering on, hoping that if I threw everything to the wall, something just might stick. When the other man came back, dragging a creature on a chain, it shut me up. Nothing had ever shut me up in my entire life, but this did. I stared, body turning to ice and mouth open in mid-word, at the monster that had been literally dragged into the light. It was double the size as the lion I expected to see. Dark, and strangely enough, flickering. It walked on all fours, massive claws leaving deep tears in the solid concrete. The chains around its neck looked perfectly real and solid, but this thing kept going in and out of focus, like I was never meant to see it. As if those chains not only were dragging it along towards me, but also dragging it into our world. It fought hard against the chains that left a deep wound where they touched its skin. The beast let out a loud roar of protest, but that too sounded unreal and out of focus. It had a mane of dark fur that at some point must have been a proud feature of glossy black. Now it was just matted and dull. A sheet was over top of its head, leaving only a snout of jagged teeth exposed. Seeing the countless scars etched into the poor thing's body, I felt as if we were both in the same boat caught and tortured by these monsters. After seeing it, I was still afraid of whatever supernatural creature that had just been dragged in front of me, but I also felt sorry for it. I wanted to do something, anything to help it, even though I was not in a position to do so. Come on, you overrated mule. Behave. We have a nice little snack for you. Eat him, and he can go back to your cage. The man grunted trying to drag the thing even closer. With a quick jerk of its head, the beast tore the chain from the man's hands for a few seconds. The other two ran in and helped him get the monster under control. It shrieked in protest, just wanting to be free of them. One peeled away to grab my chair from behind to drag me closer. The chair legs made a horrible sound across the ground, like nails on a chalkboard. I tried making it difficult for him, but in the end, I couldn't do a single thing, as my chair was placed within reach of the dark monster. The monster stopped struggling when I got closer. It could smell my blood. I knew it. Its nose got right up close, nearly touching me as I felt hot puffs of air ruffle my hair. I expected it to smell horrible, but oddly enough, it smelled almost minty. It would only take one bite to end me. I really hoped that my head got taken first, and not my legs, to suffer through being eaten alive. 
Suddenly, the idea of being chomped down by some powerful animal didn't feel like a neat way to go at all. It just felt like the end. Drips of drool came from its mouth and dropped onto my jeans, soaking them through. It made my skin crawl. I tried backing up the chair, only to see a man was holding it in place. Come on now. Eat him. That's an order. Those words made the monster tense. Before, it just looked curious about me, but now it looked like a cat ready to pounce. It now had orders, and needed to obey them. I was hoping that wet feeling was because it drooled on me, and not because I pissed myself seeing the sudden change. I was so out of my mind in fear, I didn't even stop and think what the hell this thing even was. A crushing force came down on each of my arms strapped to the chair as the beast placed huge claws on them to stand up. Those countless teeth just above my head and jaw opening, ready to take one massive bite. In my last moments, I wanted to pray, but couldn't find any kind of thoughts in my head. I took a large inhale, waiting for death to come. To my shock, I didn't get my head torn off. Instead, the monster turned that deadly set of teeth on the man holding my chair from behind. The dark fur covered my vision. I only guessed he'd gotten his head bitten off instead of myself when screams of surprise and fear came from the other men. A flurry of motion started. The beast was dragged back, the claws digging into the flesh of my arms, leaving cuts, but also snapping the restraints keeping me down. My body moved before my mind did. My bleeding arms shot down, trying to get my legs free as I kept darting my head up to see the other two men trying to get control of the monster. One pulled a gun from who knows where and started shooting. The monster took some hits but darted away, so the other holding the chain received some friendly fire. The man collapsed and the dark creature was free. It thrashed, slamming its wooden boxes surrounding us. Packing peanuts, coffee grounds, and what I guessed to be bundles of drugs poured out. I really didn't care. I just had to get the hell out of there. The straps on my legs felt nearly impossible to undo. Because of the noise, more people came rushing in, trying to catch the monster. Soon, they knew it wasn't possible, and started to shoot at it. The entire scene was chaos, and I was trapped in the middle of it. The gunshots going off were deafening. I'm sure the monster was making noise of its own, but I couldn't hear anything beyond the gunfire ripping in my ears. Men were getting ripped apart while they tried shooting that creature down. Wooden crates exploded into pieces, flying around almost as dangerous as the bullets. It was a miracle I wasn't shot when I was just sitting out in the open trying to get free. Another miracle happened when I got my legs out of the straps and started to try and run off into a direction away from the bullets and the beast. My luck ended there. I started running on unsteady feet towards a tower of crates to hide behind. A man turned the corner into the fight, knocking me over. He was middle-aged, wide-haired, and had no weapon. I was furious he had kept me from escaping. I burned the image of his face into my mind as I fell. Then, the beast came closer to me. It was only a few feet away, but that meant bullets in that direction. What came next made it feel like everything just froze. I was glued to the ground, on my back, looking in the direction of the monster. The man with the white hair had his arm outstretched, a face of concern and worry, as the monster with its head turns to look at something that was just tossed towards it. I didn't hear the explosion from my ears already being shot. I felt the shockwave, and my head hit against the concrete floor so hard it knocked me out. There was no way to know how long I was out. A few seconds, or a few minutes. My ears rang, and my body was stiff. I couldn't move so I just tried looking around to see what just happened. Debris from the small explosion was scattered about. The overhead light flickering made it hard to see clearly. By how much my head hurt, I was thankful for the brief stints of darkness. In the small few seconds of light, 
I saw the white-haired man go over to the creature, carefully removing the chains. The monster looked as bad as I felt. Both back legs had been torn off. Countless injuries and bullet holes marred the dark fur. Even as I was on the ground, unable to move my head, body and head pounding, I felt bad for that thing. Whatever it was, it didn't feel right. It was hammered so badly, and most likely going to die. Don't move. I'll do what I can. I was shocked to hear the man's voice. I shouldn't have been able to hear anything so clearly after that gun battle and explosion. As much as I disliked him from knocking me over and causing me to get caught up in that shockwave, I had to admit, he sounded so worried as if he was talking to an old friend. Do not bother me, my king. This was my mistake. Wash your hands of this. That monster spoke. Tears came to my eyes. I couldn't stop them. That terrifying, yet injured creature almost sounded like a hurt child trying to act brave. That man, he was taken like myself. Can you save him? That was strange. Was that beast talking about me? I tried sitting up to get a better look, but my body didn't move. The white-haired man looked over in my direction. I could have sworn he clicked his tongue when he looked at me. No. He should already be dead. Humans cannot heal from vast injuries like that. Unlike you. If we could just get some virgin blood or flesh to patch you up, then... Maybe. The man trailed off, sounding as if his hope for the dark creature was fading when he saw just how badly it was hurt. I didn't want to think about what he just said about me, how I had less hope than the beast before me. Using every ounce of willpower I had, I looked down at myself, and he was right. I really should have been dead already. My legs twisted and broken, arm torn off and chest full of bleeding, ragged holes. How in the hell was I still awake? I tore my eyes away from my broken body and looked over at the two in front of me. I really wasn't going to make it out alive, but I could still do something. I tried to speak, only to cough and nearly choke on my own blood. I couldn't speak. Maybe they could sense it, though. The embarrassing fact that after living a life of crime, I was still untouched in a sense. If they needed virgin blood, they could take mine. You can laugh at the idea of me being so old-fashioned, of saving myself for marriage. The thing I discovered about my life early on is almost everything is out of my control. I was never going to live an easy life born the way I was, into the family I was raised in. No matter how hard I tried, my type never got anywhere in life. It was all beyond my control. So, I was so desperate trying to find things about myself that were entirely up to my own discretion. Not sleeping around was one of them. If you want it, take it, I thought, hoping they could hear me the same way I could hear them. I felt cold. My eyelids were fluttering shut no matter how hard I tried to keep them open. I wish I wasn't so cold at the end. That was it. I was going to die because I listened to my father's advice on life. He really never did leave me anything worthwhile, now did he? I let myself be overtaken by the endless darkness, expecting to never wake up again. For some reason, I did wake up. I had to be dreaming. My body felt stiff, but whole. I didn't know where I was. I didn't recognize the room in the slightest. A hospital room would make sense, not a high-end penthouse bedroom. I didn't move for the longest time, trying to understand what the hell happened. Did I dream the entire thing? That must be it. There's no way I could have survived those injuries. And yet, it felt too real to be just a dream. Sitting up in the bed, I looked down to see I was dressed in a very silky and very expensive sleepwear. 
I could save for a year and still not be able to afford these. Lifting the shirt up, I inspected my body for scars or medical treatments. A lamp was beside the bed, giving me enough light to see by. Looking down, I didn't think this could be my body. I was never fat because I could never afford to eat, but I never had a six-pack before. All right, it might not have been a six-pack, but it was much more tones than what my skinny body was before. I stared at it, then noticed my nails, each long and pointed like those ugly things women pay to have. I had to see my face, just to make sure I was still myself. Stumbling out of bed, I slowly made my way over to a bathroom on the other side of the vast plush room. Flicking the light on, I gave myself a good look over. My face looked the same, just healthy, as if I was getting the right amount of sleep and eating good meals. I've never looked like this. My hair was dyed a dark black instead of the mousy brown color I hated. And my eyes looked more golden than the brown that matched my hair in the past. Aside from the eye and hair color change, I looked about the same. A noise from inside the penthouse nearly made me scream. I jumped, crashing into the sink behind me. I couldn't find a weapon. Whatever was going on, I had to get the hell out of here. Someone else was here, and I didn't want to stay and find out who. Creeping along, the place felt like a castle. I shuddered to think of how much just renting it for a month would cost. Even with all my efforts going into not being spotted, a man I recognized came peeking in from the kitchen as I tried to make it as far away from this place as possible. Mason, I made you some coffee, and I can order some food. Go sit down, the white-haired man from before said to me. My knee-jerk reaction was to book it. This man knew my real name, not the false ones I've been using for years. I wanted to tell him to stuff it, and I was leaving. You really shouldn't have. My voice spoke, but I wasn't in control of it, nor was I controlling my body when it obeyed the man and sat on a couch in the living area. On the inside, I was screaming all sorts of protests, trying to make myself move, but on the outside, I was acting like a good little boy, sitting and waiting. Finally, that man sat down, setting a tray with two cups of sugar and cream in front of us on a small, polished wooden table. I could finally move, but needed answers. I stayed, sitting. Who the hell are you? And what the hell is going on? I asked, voice cracking from stress. Instead of being annoyed by my outburst, he just sat back on the couch, looking cool and amused. I hated him at that moment. I think you know the answer to the first question, he said, with a smile that got on my nerves. Sir, I have no idea what you're talking about. Wait, sir. I never call people sir, not unless I was busting out the sweet talk. I didn't like this man in the slightest, so what did I give him an ounce of respect for? What year is it? He asked, and I frowned. Two thousand, I think. What does that have to do with anything? How time flies. The last time Fex encountered me, I was much different. Went by a horrible name, too. It was a strange feeling. I somehow knew what he was talking about, and yet not at the same time. It was too frustrating. Liren, like... Glaring, that was your name before, but how would I know that if I didn't know who you are? And who the hell is Fax? My head started to pound as it felt like facts were shifting, getting shuffled in my mind. Fax is the beast you allow your body to possess. That is how you know of me. He didn't move only gave me another smile, trying to show off his handsome features, while my body felt like it turned to ice. I shot up suddenly, feeling like something was behind me. What stared back at me 
was that creature in the warehouse. Instead of being on all fours, it stood like a human, sheet over its eyes, but still looking down at me all the same. It was fully recovered, looking like a terrible beast, and yet held some kind of beauty that could make your lungs stop. I nearly fainted at the sight of it. Instead, I collapsed back into my chair, head between my knees as vague memories started to flood into my brain. The man beside me I knew to be important, to be a king of some sort. The beast behind me loved that man and was completely loyal to him. I was about to die when that king asked me to give my body over to the beast. We would both live and benefit from the agreement. Wanting to keep living, I let them do what they wanted. Do you need a few minutes? Uh, no, I just... I just need a straightforward answer. I said, not raising my head. All right, then. For who I am, I go by Silverman. I am the king of all the creatures of the dark. I was able to try and save Fex from those humans, and you saw how that turned out. Sadly enough, if rules are being followed, there isn't much I can do. They knew enough of Fex's true name to capture and control him. I wanted to do more. Rules are rules, though. Silverman sounded a bit distant and paused for a few seconds to collect himself. Fex was about to die. He could have just eaten you and lived, but this beast is far too kind on humans. Instead, he let you take him into yourself. In a way, now you are half-demon. I suppose that's a term for it. You shall not age. It's nearly impossible to kill you. Because half-breeds do not have true names, they do not have that weakness, and cannot be killed or controlled by it. Fex only wanted to kill the humans who captured him. Now that that is done, he has nothing else to live for, and gave up himself so you may also live. I sat up, looking behind me, trying to see the monster that saved my life. He wasn't visible, but I felt like he was still there. He would always be there. When did he kill those people? And isn't there, like, a way to split us apart? Silverman gave my questions a wave of his hand, as if I should know these answers already. No. Once you two are together, you shall always be one. Vex has the stronger will of you two, so he can take control of your body at any point. Like I said, he is kind. He took over, killed the ones who wronged you, and tucked you back into a comfy bed. You should have no memory of this, as if you were asleep. Although it is possible to be aware of his actions while he is in control. Fex forced you asleep because he guessed he would not wish to see humans dying by your own hand. I felt sick with each passing word. My hands shook and I grasped them together, feeling as if they were no longer my own. I wanted to be angry at what happened, to have my body just taken from me like that. In the back of my mind, now I knew he was there. I felt Fex stress and worry about my reaction. Slowly, I focused all the tension out of my shoulders to accept what was being said. Yes, it was pretty alarming to hear my body was borrowed to commit murder, but Fex really did right by me, considering he could have left me to die. He only wanted this one thing. I should really just let him have it. Fex also relaxed whenever he was hiding in the back of my head. The whole thing was very, very strange, and needed time to get adjusted to, but it was much better than the alternative. And now the issue is that you are wanted for murder. Drink your coffee. W what? I sputtered out. My body acted on its own. I knew that it was Fex taking over. He could not ignore any order from his king, so he took the mug and made me drink some. Fex did not have the forethoughts to cover up his crimes. 
After slaughtering an entire gang, you're on top of a few lists. But because you are now under my care, you shall not be arrested. I arranged a new identity for you. This place is just a temporary place to rest your head and get caught up. You'll need to be on the move, but I assure you, you shall not be caught for those murders. I still felt a little sick just from how much information I needed to go through. Murder wasn't right at all, but I thought about what they put Fex through. Yes, he was a monster. A creature that saved my life, and that's more than what I could say about the people he killed. I was sitting, trying to take everything in, when Silverman got my attention. Normally, he was the type of person I would never get along with. Handsome, and he knew it. A killer smile that could seduce anyone he wanted, and I felt like he abused that power fairly often. But Fex liked him, and those feelings were rubbing off on me. I really didn't like giving this man any of my time. You see... You can just spend your new life traveling, but how boring do you think that would become? Wouldn't you like a job? Something important? I knew that kind of tone he was using. I'd used it most of my life. He was selling something, and the beast inside my mind was dead set on listening. Don't try selling me something. Just say it, I said, and Silverman let his mask drop a little. All right, I want to use you as a hitman. Sometimes there is only so much I can do, like with Fex. I should have been able to save him sooner, but my hands are tied in some situations. That would not apply to you, because you are both human and not, and very hard to kill. You only need to let Fex take over to do the work, and you can enjoy the reward of being paid so much money you won't know what to do with. You'll live the easiest life by pretty much just sleeping through very profitable work. Also, this won't just benefit creatures of the night. How many humans do you think Fex had to harm based on the orders he could not refuse? Humans and these creatures should not mix. If you take my offer, you'll be doing a lot of good in the world. I sat and thought, suddenly wondering what the hell I'd gotten myself into. I was wearing silk, sitting on a couch that could cost a fortune in a world so far removed from my own. Murder was horrible. Even when I was doing petty crimes, I swore I would never get to that point for money. And yet, it was a very good offer. I shouldn't turn my back on humans. Still, at the same time, my mind kept going back to the image of that dark creature, torn and bloody. Against his will, he harmed people and fought against it. Fex killed the ones responsible so they could never do it again. The real beasts were the ones who caught him in the first place. What made me slowly start to nod my head was the idea of there being more Fexes out there. More creatures being used by evil for profit, and who knows what else. All right, I said, with a final nod. I felt even more sure of my choice as the seconds passed. I'll take the job. Silverman was right. Time does fly. That night was so long ago, and so many things have happened since. I do have more stories to tell based on what my job brought, but for now, just how I became what I am. Some memories I just don't want to bring back up just yet. Right now, I simply want to think about the worst, yet best, night of my life. <laughs>